Hello everyone, this is Siddharthan. This is the second part of the complete machine learning course and in total this course will be 60 hours long and this second part alone will be almost 12 hours in length. So in the previous part we have discussed about some of the basic concepts of machine learning and uh, Python basics of machine learning and so on. So in this section we will move on to some of the advanced topics like what is the mathematics behind machine learning and what are all the different concepts that are associated to machine learning models and later we will discuss about three machine learning use cases. So this will be the agenda for this second part and uh, before getting into the core concepts I'll just give you a quick recap of whatever we have discussed so far and what you can expect in this particular video. Okay so let's get started. So these are all the th things we have discussed before. So first we have understood like some of the basics of machine learning like uh, what is the difference between AI, ML and uh, deep learning and then we have discussed about the types of machine learning such as supervised learning and supervised learning and what is meant by deep learning and so on. And later we have uh, discussed some of the Python concepts that are required for machine learning like uh, if conditions, for loops, functions etc. So if you are like new to machine learning or if you don't know how to uh, you know code with Python so this model will, module will be helpful for you so we have discussed that and then we have discussed about some of the important libraries uh, in python that is required for machine learning such as numpy pandas matplotlib and seaborn and finally uh, this is one of the most important topics of data collection and pre-processing where i explained to you about how to collect the data where to collect the data and what are all the various uh, data processing techniques that's available in it and later we have discussed about three interesting use cases such as sonar rock versus mind prediction and then we have discussed about predicting whether a person will have diabetes or not using machine learning and then uh, the third use case was on building a spam mid prediction system in python so these are all the things that we have discussed so far and if you haven't watched these uh, topics, if you haven't watched this part one, please watch this before continuing with the part two video, okay? So I'll give the link for this part one uh, ML course in this video description, you can check that out. So now uh, let's see what are all the topics that will be available in this second part of this machine learning course. So the first topic will be mathematics for machine learning. So in this, I explained extensively on various topics that are like required for us. So first, the uh, you know there are several concepts covered on linear algebra. So it mainly contains topics on vectors and matrices. Like uh, what are all the various uh, vector operations and matrix operations available in it, and how you can uh, perform some vector operations in Python and again matrix operation on Python and so on. And then uh, statistics is again a very important uh, conceptual thing that is required for machine learning. And statistics concepts will be helpful for you when you are working on data science concepts or data science projects. So here I have explained to you about what are all the different types of data that is available so you know what are all the different types of categorical data what are all the different types of numerical data and what are all the different types of statistical study available population sample and all these things are covered in the statistics along with this measure of central tendencies and variance so all these are uh, integral part of machine learning and then uh, you know given some explanation on probability topics like uh, what is the importance of probability when it comes to machine learning what is this like distributions normal distribution and so on Okay, so this will be the major part of this section and uh, all these explanations will be very simple to understand. So you don't, you know, have to worry that this will be tough. So, I mean, I've explained this in simple terms and I'm sure that you will understand like most of the things. So once this mathematics module is completed, the sixth module is on machine learning models and what are all the problems or, or uh, you know, we would face while training a machine learning model. So first I explain, uh, you know, how does a machine learning model work? So what is the idea behind it? So that will be the first part in this uh, sixth module. And then like how you can perform this model selection so that and what is meant by overfitting and underfitting and how to solve these issues. And then like uh, what is this loss function? What are all the various model evaluation techniques available for us? And these last two topics are like very, very important. So this is about model parameters and hyperparameters. So which parameters contributes to model parameters and why we call these or why we call certain parameters as hyperparameters. And finally, we discuss about this gradient descent, which is an integral part of several machine learning models that are present. So I've explained in uh, simple terms on what is the math behind gradient descent and how gradient descent actually works and what is its purpose. So once all these topics are covered, uh, um, I've given like three machine learning use cases. So first is the R disease prediction, which is basically a classification problem where we train a machine learning model to predict whether a person will be having R disease or not. And the next one is a regression problem where we are predicting a certain value that is nothing but the Boston house price prediction. So this is one of the famous data sets that is available. So this will be an interesting one. And the third one will be loan approval prediction where we try to predict 
whether a loan will be approved for a person or not. So these are all the topics that is covered in the second part of this machine learning course. And there will be this, uh, you know, hands on part as well as the theoretical concepts explained. So wherever there are these hands on sections uh, in Python, please practice all these parts. Okay. With that being said, let's get started with today's video. And in this video, I would like to explain you what is the importance of mathematics when it comes to machine learning and what are the different uh, concepts that we will be covering in this particular module. Okay. So when it comes to machine learning, mathematics forms a very integral part. When people are uh, starting to learn machine learning, they tend to ignore the math part because uh, a lot of people uh, find it kind of difficult to understand. But at some point of time, you need to understand this because if you really want to master this machine learning or deep learning, the understanding of the underlying math is it, it becomes inevitable. So I'll try to explain you this in a very simple way. So all the math concepts and I'll try to cover all the things that you need to know about math behind machine learning okay so in this particular module there are four things that we will be covering they are linear algebra statistics probability and calculus okay so let's see where these four things are useful in machine learning so when we talk about machine learning there are three main pillars to it they are data the machine learning model and training this machine learning model right so when it comes to data we have to understand this data better for understanding this data we need to use some statistical measures. So in this case where statistics is very helpful for us and linear algebra is also used here where when we say that we have a data set of about um, 10 data points or 10 rows and uh, 10 columns, we can say that it is a matrix of 10 rows and 10 columns, right? So all the computations will be in the kind of matrix. So you need to understand all the computations that you, you will be doing in a matrix to understand how the training goes on inside the machine learning. Okay. So when it comes to model, again, all the computations are, uh, you know, based on the linear algebra. So the understanding of linear algebra becomes very important. And also several statistical concepts are also integrated in uh, a lot of machine learning models. And then there comes the training. So it's, it's not enough when we train the machine learning model with the data. So we need to optimize this uh, machine learning model. We need to do a lot of tweaking. And this is where calculus will help us. So these are uh, the various uh, you know aspects of machine learning where this math is very important. So now let me explain you what are the different uh, concepts that we will be covering here. So we will be dealing with four subfields of mathematics. And these four subfields are very important when it comes to machine learning. The first one is linear algebra. So in linear algebra, we will be dealing with vectors and matrix. So we would have uh, learned in our high school about vectors and matrix. And the understanding of this vectors and matrix is really important because as I have told you earlier, all the computations are based on this kind of vectors and matrix. So your data set, the data set you have is very similar to a matrix. And all the computations that we do in a matrix, if we can understand that, we can understand all the computations that can go on a data set. So this is where linear algebra is very useful. So. The next thing that we'll be dealing with is statistics. Statistics is also very helpful to understand our data. So how the data lies and what is the mean value of different columns and what is the standard deviation. It is also helpful to see whether we have any outliers in our data set and other kind of things. So it is very useful in this, you know, data analysis part and also several uh, machine learning models are built on top of this statistics. So there are two kinds of statistics. One is descriptive statistics and the, another one is inferential statistics. So we will be dealing all uh, about all of these things when we go into the videos. Okay. So the next one is about probability. So probability is all about, you know, likelihood of, uh, you know, some decisions. So let's say that we are going to predict whether a person has a diabetes or not. So our machine learning model will give us the probability that this person has a diabetes or this person doesn't have diabetes. So these are all based on this probability concepts. So this understanding is also very important for us to understand more about machine learning. And finally, we need calculus. So there are two kinds of calculus as we know. So one is differential calculus and the another one is in and uh, integration, right? So differential calculus is all about splitting the data into smaller pieces and uh, seeing what is the change that is going on in this data and integration is all about integrating small pieces into a larger one right so this particular calculus is very important when it comes to optimizing our model so there are concepts like important concepts in machine learning like gradient descent and it is completely dependent on this kind of calculus concepts okay so these are the four things that we will be covering in this module but you know there will be uh, 
so as a, a given you here 5.1 5.2 5.3 and 5.4 right so 5 represents the module number and uh, these are the subtopics that will be covering and in each of these categories there will be multiple videos for example in this 5.1 linear algebra we will be covering a lot of videos on several linear algebra topics and then in 5.2 there will be several videos again so those kind of videos will be there and this will be a kind of a larger module okay so i hope there will be a lot of videos here so because this understanding is really important for us to master machine learning and deep learning so i hope you are excited to to learn the mathematics part in calculus so let's start with linear algebra so linear algebra is all about dealing with linear equations and the building blocks for this linear algebra are vectors and matrices so in this video i'll try to explain you what is meant by this uh, vectors and what are the different approaches we can take to understand vectors and where we exactly use this vectors in machine learning okay so that's the agenda for this particular video so as i've told you the three approaches includes one is the physics based approach for understanding the vectors and the second one is mathematics based approach and the third one is about computer science approach where we will understand how we deal with vectors when it comes to computer science okay so the first is all about physics based approach so let's say that there is a car and we want to measure a physical quantity so a physical quantity that we can measure for a moving car can be the speed of that particular car let's say that the speed at which the car is moving is about 50 km per hour okay so this is a scalar quantity because when we talk about speed we don't mention the direction in which the car is moving we just tell the magnitude of the speed here the magnitude is nothing but 50 km per hour hence this is a scalar quantity whereas when we talk about the velocity of a car we will tell that the velocity is 50 km per per hour in the north direction so here you can see that we have both the magnitude as well as the direction in which the car is moving so this is an example of a vector quantity so in physics we come across these several scalar quantities and vector quantities so the examples of vector quantities are also you know force and other quantities where we deal with uh, the magnitude as well as direction so the other example is uh, you know mass so mass is an example of a scalar quantity where we just tell the magnitude of that particular mass whereas when we talk about weight it is all about the direction in which the gravitational force is acting on that object so in that case we mention both the magnitude as well as the direction so that becomes a vector quantity so this is all about uh, scalars and vectors when it comes to physics now let's try to understand how a mathematician sees a vector okay so for this we will take a graphical representation of a vector so we will try to take a coordinate system so x-axis and y-axis and we will try to plot the vectors in these uh, coordinate system okay so as i've told you earlier so vectors have magnitude and direction so this remains the same in all the approaches we take so vectors have magnitude and direction whereas scalars have only the magnitude okay so now let's say that we have this coordinate system where we have both the x-axis and y-axis. So let's say that I'm naming the x-axis as x1 axis and the y-axis as x2 axis. So you can name this anything you want, but I'll just name here as x1 axis and x2 axis. And here we have two points. Okay. So the first point is 2 comma 2 and the second point is minus 3 comma 2. So we have the points in the first quadrant and the second quadrant. Okay. So I have mentioned the points in this bracket, right? So this is nothing but the vectors. So vector is all about list of uh, the coordinates of a particular point. So if we draw a line from, sorry, if we draw an arrow from this origin, which is 0, 0 to this 2, 2 and minus 3, 2, we will get the vectors. Okay. So you can see the arrow here dear so this this is one vector and this is the second vector so let's consider this as the first vector which uh, starts from this origin and it ends in this point which is 2 comma 2 so this is example of a vector and you can see here that this vector has some magnitude here the magnitude is nothing but the length in which it the length it has in this particular uh, graph okay so you can see here the magnitude of this second vector is greater than this uh, first vector okay and we can also see that it is it has some kind of direction okay so it is not in the horizontal direction so it is inclined at some angle so that is the direction of this particular vector so you can mention the one second so you can mention the vectors as 2 comma 2 which is represents the coordinate of that particular point or else you can also mention it as 
2 i vector plus 2 j vector so in that cases we will take this x1 axis as i vector and this x2 axis as j vector okay so this is what we have this is the general uh, you know representation which we are used to in i schools so you can also mention this or else you can also mention uh, you know like this which is 2 comma 2 so this is how we can perceive a vector in a graphical uh, representation so two vectors can have the same magnitude but can have the different you know can have different direction similarly two vectors can have a uh, same uh, direction but different uh, magnitude say for example uh, let's say that there is a point here which is 4 comma 4 but it lies in the same direction so in that case the two vectors lie in the same direction but they have different uh, magnitudes okay so you can find the magnitude of the vector by you know using this formula so this formula is all about taking a square root of sum of the squares of the two coordinates so here x1 is 2 x2 is also 2 so let's try to find the magnitude of the first vector so you can see here so here x1 is 2 x2 is also 2 so when we do that we get the magnitude as root 8 so when you just use this magnitude formula for this particular vector vector so we will get uh, 9 plus 4 so this is how you can get magnitude of vector so the next thing is as i have told you we also have a direction for vectors right now let's see how we can find this direction so this is the angle in which this vector is uh, inclined from uh, the horizontal axis so now what i'll do is so let's draw a perpendicular line here from this point to the to this horizontal base so now this is a right angle triangle and we can take this tan theta so tan theta or tan angle is equal to opposite side by adjacent side right so here the length of this opposite side is nothing but two units and for this uh, adjacent side is also two units so when you do that you will get tan theta is equal to two by two and the value is one and the tan inverse of one is nothing but 45 degree so we can say that this particular vector is aligned at 45 degree so this is how you can find the magnitude and direction of a vector so this is how we deal with vectors in mathematics so this understanding is very important because uh, we take the data set and other you know data and uh, the computations of the data will be in the form of vectors and matrices so understanding of these concepts is really important because it uh, you know uh, helps us to understand what is the processes that are going under the hood of a machine learning model and machine learning algorithm because the machine learning models implement several uh, linear algebraic uh, equations and other statistical approaches as well so it is uh, paramount to understand these kind of basic things so next let's see how we understand vectors in a computer science approach so this is very similar to the mathematical approach we have taken but just you know uh, in a kind of different way so this is a scalar scalar is nothing but a number so it can be an integer it can be a float so it just tells a value but when it comes to vector it can be a list of numbers so you know in the previous slide we have seen that uh, it, it is a list of coordinates right similarly we can have a list of numbers and it can represent uh, vectors so in this particular case the vector is two dimensional because we have the x1 axis here and x2 axis here so two axis so we can also have multiple dimensions as well so so for in that case the vector will be you know 2i vector plus 2j vector plus 2k vector if we have three axes so it is also an example of uh, you know vectors but it is in three dimension so you can see here that we have three values here so a vector can be a list which has only one row or it can be a list which has only one column okay so it is very similar to arrays we have in python or c program or other languages so it is very similar to those arrays so let's see so let's say that we have a machine learning problem where we need to uh, find the salary of a person based on their work experience and we have this data set that contains the work experience the number of years of work experience of a person and the corresponding salary they get okay so the first element here represents the work experience so a person is you know five years of experience in a particular job and the salary they are getting is about five lakhs per annum okay so this is a, an example of a vector because it contains one list with only one column right so we can say that there is another person with 10 years of experience and that person is earning about 10 lakhs per annum okay so these are in examples of individual vectors and the data set we have in our machine learning approaches so it can have uh, you know 100 rows or 100 data points and each of these data points represents 
one vector so when you put all these data points together all these vector together we will get a matrix okay so this is all about vectors and uh, i hope you have understood what is meant by this vector and what is the you know uh, understanding that we take while we are uh, you know approaching a machine learning problem so in the next videos in the upcoming videos i will be explaining you several uh, vector operations like vector addition vector multiplication we also will deal with dot products of vector and cross product in uh, you know both in theoretical way and also in python so and then after that we can uh, deal with uh, matrices okay so i hope you have understood all the contents covered in this video so you can just let me know in the comments if you have any doubt model wise in that uh, playlist okay so with that being said let's get started with today's topics so these are the topics or the vector operations that we will cover in today's video so they are about vector addition so we will see how we can add two vectors mathematically and also graphically and how we can do the same for vector separation and how we can multiply a vector by a scalar and finally we will understand what is the significance of an angle between two vectors so these are the basic operations that we will be seeing in today's video okay so first of all you know i'll just give you a quick recap of what is meant by these vectors when it comes to computer science so First, let's understand about scalar. Scalar is nothing but a number. So it is just an individual number. So it can be 20, it can be 40 or it can be 100. It's just only one number. Okay. Whereas vectors are nothing but list of numbers. So it can be either a row of you know numbers or it can be a column of numbers. So we can have only one row or one column. We cannot have multiple rows and multiple columns. So if we have multiple rows and multiple columns, then it becomes a matrix. When it comes to vector, it contains uh, numbers or values in only one row or in one column. Okay. So this is not like, you know, uh, our physicist would describe a vector or a mathematician would describe a vector. So they would say that vector is something that has, uh, you know, both magnitude and direction, but we won't take that definition in computer science. In computer science, vector is something that has multiple numbers so or you can just consider an array as a vector okay so it is very similar to an array in computer science so now let me explain you what is the significance of vectors in machine learning let's say that there is a person and we want to find whether this person has diabetes or not and we have this data so this data represents so the first value here so you can see this uh, 89 so just a second so you can see this 89 so this 89 represents the blood glucose level and 66 represents the blood pressure 23 is about skin thickness and 94 is insulin and 28.1 is the bmi of the person so this is a single data point so you can see here all these values can be you know put in a list or it can be put in an array so this particular entity is an example of a vector because we have understood that vector is nothing but it is an array of uh, values so you can see here this is also an example of vectors so this is how data get processed in machine learning so we will feed this data set to a machine learning model so the difference is that we will use several data points but each of this data point or each of this uh, you know row or entity is an example of a vector hence it is very important to you know know about all the different operations that occurs in a vector to uh, understand how the computation works so all the computation that goes inside a machine learning model will be based on these vectors so understanding this is very important so now let's understand vector addition let's say that there are two axes so one is the x1 axis and x2 axis so in uh, machine learning we uh, you know sometimes the variable y is used for the target variable so in the previous case you can see here that uh, we wanted to predict whether the person has diabetes or not right so that prediction whether it is yes or no will be uh, the y variable so this is the target variable so we won't take the y axis here so instead of that we will take the axis as x1 and x2 instead of x axis and y axis okay so that's the reason so it is not that significant so in this uh, x1 and x2 coordinate we have a vector and this vector is 2 comma 3 so this is nothing but this point so you can see this arrow here, here. and if you take this point uh, it is uh, the coordinate of this point is nothing but the vector so 2 comma 3 so it means that there is 2 units in this x axis and 3 units in this y axis so it is this point so this is an example of a vector so there is another vector so this is nothing but uh, 3 units in this x axis in the positive x direction minus 2 in negative uh, y direction or uh, negative x2 direction so here there is a point and the coordinates of this point is nothing but 3 comma minus 2 so now we have 2 vectors okay and now we need to add two vectors this 2 comma 3 vector and the 3 comma minus 2 vector okay so now let's see what is the result we can get if we uh, you know add two vectors and the important point to note here is 
the vector should be in you know in a same shape to add uh, two values uh, let's say that we have uh, three values in one vector so two three and one let's say that we have three values in this vector and two values in this vector so we cannot add vectors which are you know which don't have a same shape so in this case the two vectors have same shape so both of them have two values so like that we can add vectors only if the number of uh, elements is the same in both the vectors okay so now what we will do is we will do element wise addition so this two will be added to this three and this three will be added to minus two so you can see here it is just elemental addition simple elemental addition and when we add it we will get this five comma one or five one as our uh, the uh, result of this addition of two vectors okay so this is the resultant vector now instead of doing this you can also get this result and the addition of these two vectors from this graph so what we can do here is you can draw this dotted line so you can take this point so this is a second vector point and just draw a dotted line and from here also you can draw a dotted line so now we can get this rectangle and then you can join this diagonal so this point and this point so this will be our addition of two vectors so if we if you take these two vectors and if you uh, just uh, you know join through dotted lines and if you take the diagonal and this diagonal becomes a uh, the resultant addition of the two vectors so you can see here if you take this point and the value of this point will be 5 and 1 so this is how you can add two vectors and you can uh, you know do this either mathematically or instead of that you can also find it graphically in, in plotting in a graph okay so this is how we can add two vectors so the main thing to note here is in vector addition the values will be added element wise and the shape of the vector should be uh, equal for both the vectors then only we can do addition okay so now let's discuss about vector subtraction so i'll just take the same two uh, vectors so 2 comma 3 and 3 comma minus 2 so we have this x1 axis and x2 axis and we have the first vector which is 2 comma 3 and the second vector is 3 comma minus 2 so it is very similar to vector addition and here also so when we do this subtraction so both of the vectors should have the same shape and uh, here also it is element wise subtraction okay so here it will this 2 minus 3 will be the resultant of this first value and 3 minus minus 2 you can see a minus of minus 2 and the resultant which we will get is minus 1 comma 5 so this is our resultant vector so and uh, there is another thing if you add two vectors you will get a vector you don't get a scalar okay and also if you subtract two vectors the resultant will be a vector and it won't be a scalar okay so these are very basic things but we may you know kind of forget about this but they are these small things which we need to uh, you know remember so when you add two vectors we will get a vector and also it is the same for subtraction okay so the resultant which we are getting is minus five. so now let me explain you how you can do this graphically okay so you can see here we are subtracting the second vector from the first vector right so when you have this minus sign you need to reverse this vector so you know when you reverse this vector what you will get is minus 3 and plus 2 so the reverse vector will be this so it should be the same magnitude but exactly in the opposite direction just 180 degree so it is the exact same vector but in the opposite direction now what you can do is you can again you know join these dotted lines as we have did before and this diagonal will give you the difference between the two vectors you know the subtracted value of these two vectors so the value which we got mathematically is minus 1 comma 5 and when you plot this you will also get this value which is this diagonal and that value is minus 1 comma 5 so this is how you can subtract two vectors okay so the next thing which we are going to discuss is multiplying a vector by a scalar so again we are taking this x1 axis and x2 axis and we have this vector 2 comma 3 now let's see what happens when we multiply a, a scalar so scale we know that scalar is nothing but an individual number so when we multiply this individual number with a vector so the resultant will also be a vector but what is the difference here is when you multiply a vector by a scalar your vector can in, can get uh, enlarged or it can get shrunk okay so we either enlarge a vector or we shrink a vector so it is all about scaling so i'll just explain you this graphically so when you just uh, multiply an integer or a you know a numerical value with this vector so this value will be multiplied with all the elements of this vector so the resultant which we will get is 4 comma 6 because like 2 into 2 is 4 and this 2 into this 3 will be 6 so uh, all the elements of this vector will be multiplied by this scalar so this uh, resultant is 4 comma 6 so when you plot this 4 comma 6 in your graph you will get this so this vector is enlarged so it is double the size of the initial vector and the main thing to note here is the vector which we got 
will be in the same direction as that of the previous vector okay because like the values are similar it is just enlarged okay so it will be in the same direction as that of the original vector so in case uh, let's say that you have multiplied it with 0.5 so in that case your value will be uh, 1 and 1.5 right so in that case so you will get a vector here okay so your uh, vector will be uh, you know reduced in size by half okay so when you multiply it by 0.5 now let's take another example so there is a vector this 2 comma 3 and now we are multiplying it with minus 0.5 so in this case what happens is as i have told you earlier when there is minus sign we need to reverse the vector so you know when you just do it mathematically the value which you will get is minus 1 and minus 1.5 so minus 0.5 into 2 is minus 1 and minus 0.5 into 3 is minus 1.5 right so when you just plot this in your uh, graph so this is the point which you will get so here you can see here it is in the same line but the direction is reversed because we have this uh, negative sign here so the, the negative sign will reverse your vector okay and as we have this 0.5 the size of the vector will be reduced so this is how you can multiply a vector by a scalar and there is so this is also another thing uh, that uh, when you multiply a vector by a scalar you will the resultant will also be a vector okay so it won't be a scalar value it will be a uh, vector value okay so this is how you can multiply a vector by a scalar and finally let's understand what is the significance of angle between two vectors so we have this uh, again have this x1 axis and x2 axis and here we have a vector so this is nothing but a vector so let's name this vector as a vector and there is another b vector and also x vector so the significant point here is the angle between this a vector and b vector so let it be theta and the angle between this x vector and a vector let it be alpha so here you can see here this angle this theta angle is very less than alpha so when the angle between two vectors is very very small then these two vectors are very similar to each other whereas in this case the angle between uh, this a vector and x vector is very large so in that case these two vectors will be very different whereas this a vector and b vector will be very similar so what is the significance of this is so when you have a when you have two data points so previously we have discussed about a person having diabetes right so when there are two person and if you plot those values in uh, in in graph and if you find that if the angle between those two uh, you know data points are like the angle between those two vectors are very small that means both of the person have similar kind of values so similar kind of you know health values that glucose value insulin values etc but if the uh, you know if you just plot the vectors and you find that if the angle is large then that means the you know the difference is huge in those vectors so you can see the inference here so i have just uh, mentioned it here that if the angle between two vectors is small then the two vectors are similar and if the angle between two vectors is large then the two vectors are very different so this is the important inference that we are getting so these are about some basic information about vectors and basic operations about vector in the next video what we shall do is we will uh, try to implement these vector operations in python so we will try to uh, visualize this vector so we will try to plot these vectors in python in some uh, plots and we will try to understand these vector operations in python so it will be a very interesting exercise because like it is an hands-on experience of these mathematical concepts that we have seen so we will try to uh, you know do this in uh, python after that we can uh, discuss about some more complex operations of vectors which are uh, nothing but the dot product cross product projection of two vectors and such kind of things so it will be a very interesting topics so uh, i hope you have understood all the things we have covered in this video all about mathematics for machine learning in the previous video we have discussed about some basic vector operations and in this video we will try to visualize these vectors in uh, some plots using python and we will also try to implement these vector operations in python okay so that is the agenda for today's video so in case you are watching my videos for the first time hi in this channel i'm making a hands on machine learning course with python in youtube and if you want to learn this course from the beginning you can go to uh, the playlist section of my channel there you will find module wise videos in a separate playlist okay so there you can start learning my course from the beginning with that being said let's get started with today's video so first of all let me ex import some libraries so first we need to import numpy library so this numpy library is useful for making arrays and we know that uh, vectors is vector, vector is nothing but an array in programming okay so we need this uh, numpy library to create these uh, arrays okay so these arrays will act as our vectors okay and then i'll import matplotlib library so we need to represent these vectors in some plots so we need this matplotlib library and i'll also import cbound 
So Seaborn as SMS. So Seaborn is also another data visualization library. So now what I'll do is I'll uh, use the function sns.set. So this will give some uh, default team to our plot. So it will, uh, you know, give some uh, grids for our plots and other things. So next what I'll do is I'll just put a text here as plotting a vector. So now let's see how we can plot a vector. So we know that we will try to plot vectors in, uh, in, in an arrow, right, in some graphs. So let's try to do that. So PLT, so PLT is nothing but I, I have imported this matplotlib.pyplot matplotlib .pyplot as PLT and I'll mention this as PLT.quiver. So this quiver is the function that will plot the vectors. So quiver, quiver is nothing but, uh, you know, we would have seen this in some war movies, which is, you no know, quiver is nothing but the case that holds the arrows, right? So here we represent the vectors in arrows. That's why I think they would have named this function as quiver, okay? So plt.quiver. Inside this, we need to mention the coordinates of our vector. So we need to give four numbers here. So I'll give 0, 0 and 4, 5. So I'll explain you what these numbers signifies. plt.show. So this will uh, print our graph. So let's run this. Now we will get our vector. So this is our vector. So and it is plotted in a graph. Okay. So you can see this grid here. So if you don't mention this SMS dot set, you won't get these grids. So it is some basic theme for our plots. So you can, uh, you know, note one thing here that you know, the x-axis is not, you know, in a correct way. So the uh, units we have is around 0 0.00, 0 0.02 and all. So we don't want that. So I want to create a vector of coordinate 4 comma 5. So we need to mention some parameters inside this quiver function. Okay. So plt dot quiver 0 comma 0 and 4 comma 5 and uh, I'll mention the scale units so you can see the details about the parameters which we want to give here or else you can also uh, you know, so these are the parameters which we need to mention you can also search in google as plt.quiver so it will take you to the documentation of this particular function okay so scale units is equal to xy and angles is equal to xy so these are just for having proper scales and units for our uh, graphs and the scale is equal to 1. Now we can give the x limit. So what is the uh, lowest limit for our x axis and what is the highest limit and what is the lowest limit and highest limit for our y axis. Those kind of things. Okay. So plt dot x limit. So this is the x limit. And let, let us have this x limit from minus 8 to plus 8. Okay. And let's also have the plt dot y limit from minus 8 comma plus 8. Okay. And now we can show the plot plt dot show now you can see that we get uh, a vector is plotted in our graph so this is the origin point which is 0 comma 0 so you can see the coordinate here so it is 0 comma 0 and then we have this uh, you know the x limit is minus 8 right so we have the values from minus 8 to plus 8 so similarly we give, uh, gave the y limit as minus 8 to plus 8 so it is given from minus 8 to plus 8 here so the vector which we have plotted is 4 comma 5 so if you take this particular coordinate you can see the x axis here is uh, 4 right so we gave an axis of 4 comma 5 so this will be the coordinate so x axis value is 4 and if you just uh, you know see this in the straight line here so the value here is 5 so we plotted a vector of uh, value 4 comma 5 okay so this 0 comma 0 is nothing but the base of this vector so the base starts at the origin point so we need to mention the base point here the base point is origin so we have mentioned 0 comma 0 so the important thing that we need to mention is the coordinate of this vector which is 4 comma 5 so this will plot a vector here okay so we can also change the color of the vectors which we are plotting so i'll just copy this and uh, we need to mention another parameter as color okay so color is equal to Let's uh, put uh, let's put B. So B represents blue color. Okay. So now we will get the same vector in blue color. Okay. So you can also plot multiple vectors in a in a single plot. So I'll copy this. So let us copy and paste this, and I, I'll just repeat this line. And let's create another vector. So let's change the you know value. So let it be. So let's let's put some negative values here. So 0 comma 0 and minus 3 comma minus 6 okay so this will 
create a vector of minus 3 comma minus 6 from the origin so let's run this okay so i'll just change the color of this vector let's change this to y y means yellow okay so now we will get two uh, vectors now you can see the starting point is same for both the vectors 0 comma 0 so it's both are starting in the same point which is the origin so the first uh, vector is 4 comma 5 so which is this and the second vector is minus 3 comma minus 6 so you can see the coordinates here so here the x coordinate is minus 3 and the y coordinate is minus 6 so this is how you can plot multiple vectors in a single graph okay so now let's uh, discuss about addition of two vectors so in the previous videos we have discussed about the theory on how we can add two vectors right so now let's try to implement this in python addition of two vectors okay so i'll just make a text here now let's create a two vectors vector one and vector two okay so we will try to add these two vectors and i'll just just open the previous uh, slides for our video so in the previous video we have discussed about these slides so we took two vectors and tried to add them and find uh, what is the addition product so we found the addition of these two vectors 2 comma 3 vector and 3 comma minus 2 vector is 5 comma 1 okay so now let, let us take this vector as our vector 1 and this vector as our vector 2 so 2 comma 3 so let me put 2 comma 3 in my first vector so I'll use this np dot as array so we know that vectors are nothing but arrays right so i'll create a numpy array so inside this we need to put this in square brackets so the first value should be 0 comma 0 which is the origin point and the second values is here we saw that the values are 2 comma 3 so let's mention 2 comma 3 here so this will be our first vector right and our second vector will be np dot as array and the second vector is 3 comma minus 2 okay so the first two coordinates should be the same which is the origin 0 comma 0 and 3 comma minus 2 okay so these are the two vectors and now i am going to add these two vectors so sum let's create a variable as sum and let's add these two vectors vector 1 and vector 2 okay now let us try to print this vector print sum okay so this will give us the sum of the two vectors okay so just sorry so print sum so this is the addition of two vectors so you can see in this slide that the addition product sorry the addition result which we got is the vector 5 comma 1 and which is the same we got here right so now we can plot these three vectors so i'll just copy this and now we need to plot three vectors so these are the two vectors so, so the first vector will be 2 comma 3 right so 2 comma 3 and uh, so you cannot just put a vector one here so as you can see here it is in the form of numpy array right this vector but this quiver function we should give these four values so that is its uh, syntax so we cannot just put vector one in this case so we just need to put all the values so 0 comma 0 2 comma Three and then the second value is for the second vector which is 3 comma minus 2 3 comma minus 2 is our second vector now let's try to print the sum of these vectors I'll copy this and let's plot the sum here so the sum is nothing but 0 comma 0 and 5 comma 1 so I'll change this as 5 comma one okay so yeah five comma one now let's try to uh, print this but i'll just change the color of this third resultant the resultant sum as r so r represents red color so let's try to plot this now you can see here the first vector which is a two comma three so you can see here the coordinates the x-axis is uh, x value is two and uh, y value is three which is in between this and you can also see which is 3 comma minus 2 is this yellow vector and the red vector is the sum of the two arrays so you can see the coordinate so if you just take a line here so the value is 5 so the x-axis value is 5 and y-axis value is 1 so which is which we get here right so you can just compare it with the previous slide so you can see here it is almost similar right so we have two vectors and the addition which we got is 5 comma 1 and this is how you can find the addition of two vectors and you can plot this in some graphs okay 
and now let's do the same thing for subtraction of two vectors we'll just make a text here so it is the same procedure so subtraction of two vectors so i have explained you in the previous video how subtraction works how we need to reverse the direction of one vector and and find uh, the difference between them i just copied this part let's do uh, the subtraction for the same two arrays so here i'll just change this plus sign to minus sign and let's change this to difference okay and let's try to print this difference as well so let's run this and see what is the vector we are getting so okay so when we subtract these two arrays the resultant array which we are getting is minus one comma five so i'll go to this one so we have already did this uh, vector subtraction so we took these two vectors 2 comma 3 and 3 comma minus 2 so if you are, aren't aware of like how you can find uh, the subtraction of two vectors graphically so you can watch my previous video um, i'll also give the link for this particular video in the description of this video okay so don't worry you can watch that video after watching this so when you subtract two these two arrays the array which we will get is minus 1 comma 5 right so which is the same we got here which is minus 1 comma 5 so now we can plot these arrays or these vectors so the change which we need to do is minus 1 comma 5 here okay so minus 1 comma 5 okay so I'll run this so this is our uh, difference vector so when you do when you uh, find the difference between the two vector this is the resultant difference we are getting so you can see it in, in uh, this particular uh, slide so it's the orientation of this array which is minus one comma five which is like very similar to this one okay so this is how you can find the difference of two vectors and put them in plots okay and finally let's see how we can multiply a vector by a scalar okay so multiplying a vector by a scalar so scalar is nothing but individual numbers so vectors are list of numbers but scalars are uh, individual numbers so uh, i'll copy this vector one okay and let's create vector two and this vector two is about two into so this represents the multiplication sign in python so two into vector one so this will uh, be the scalar multiplication so and i'll print this vector 2 as well okay so our ve vector 1 is nothing but 2 comma 3 so i have also mentioned it here in the slide so when you just take two arrays so this is the array which we took or the vector we took which is 2 comma 3 and when you multiply this by 2 there will be element wise multiplication so this 2 will be multiplied with this 2 and this 2 will be multiplied with this 3 so the resultant which you will get is 4 comma 6 so the resultant we will get is the vector 4 comma 6 and it will lie in the same direction as the original vector but its size will be double the size because we are multiplying it with 2 okay and when you take a negative value so negative value is like we are taking minus here and when you take 0.5 your size will be reduced because like we are just taking half the value of the original vector size so when you do that you will get a vector in the opposite direction because there is a negative sign here that will reverse your vector and due to this 0.5 your size will be reduced because the values is uh, you know reduced right so let's try to do the same here so when you run this you will get you know 4 comma 6 so it is also the same case in all the cases there so when you just add two vectors there will be element wise uh, addition and when you add two vectors the resultant is resultant will be a vector and it won't be a scalar right so this is one of the important thing to take note of and uh, like there will be elemental uh, addition so like 0 plus 0 is we know that it is 0 when 2 is added with 3 we get this 5 and when 3 is added with minus 2 we will get 1 so the important there are two things to note here so the first point is there will be elemental uh, addition element wise addition and element wise subtraction and also uh, these uh, values should be of the same shape you can see here we have four values in this vector and we have four values in this vector so if you have um, four values in this one vector and you have five values in the another vector then it won't work okay so the shape of the two vectors should be equal 
okay so that is another uh, main thing that we need to know so now we have found this uh, scalar product of a uh, scalar product of this vector which we got as 4 comma 6 so we can try to plot these two vectors just to take this so first vector is the same which is 2 comma 3 and the second vector is 4 comma 6 so i'll just change this to 4 comma 6 4 comma plus 6 okay so now i'll just remove this third vector okay so let's run this so you can see here uh, this is how uh, our vector look here so it is the same as the one which we have discussed so this vector will be double in size but it will be in the same direction okay so this is how you can multiply a scalar by a vector now let's do the another thing where we try to multiply it with minus 0.5 so in this case the vector the size of the vector will be reduced and its direction will be reversed so just copy this and now let's multiply this with uh, so previously we have multiplied with 2 plus 2 now let us multiply this with 0.5 that is minus 0.5 okay so now we can run this and the values which we are getting is 0 comma 0 and 1 comma minus 1 comma minus 1.5 okay so let's plot this and this will be minus 1 and minus 1.5 okay let's run this so like the half of 2 is like when you divide uh, 2 by uh, 1 by 2 so we, you, we will get 1 right so it is the same thing so we are just uh, multiplying it with 0.5 and minus 0.5 let's run this so you can see here this blue vector is our original vector and this yellow vector is the resultant which is the multiplied product of minus 0.5 and this vector one so in this case the direction will be reversed and the size of the vector will be reduced to half okay so this is how you can multiply a scalar value with a vector so these are the basic operations which we have uh, discussed in the previous video and we have implemented this successfully in this video and in the next video let's discuss about some complex operations such as uh, dot product and cross product and also about projection of two vectors i'll just give you a quick recap of what we have done here so first we have imported the numpy library and matplot and seaborn library numpy library is useful for making arrays in computer science uh, you know arrays are nothing but vectors so we are just try to plot this using this quiver function we try to plot this arrow so we have successfully plotted this vector here so we can change the colors of the vectors and we can also plot multiple vectors in a graph so, and we have seen how we can add two vectors and plot the addition product of the two vector okay and we also have seen uh, how we can uh, subtract two vectors and and plot the you know resultant of the subtraction of the two vectors and we have also seen how we can multiply a vector with a scalar and how you can multiply you know reduce the size of a vector and reverse it okay so in all the cases the resultant will be a vector so you know when you add two vectors the resultant will be a vector when you multiply a vector by a scalar then the resultant will also be a vector okay so these are very important thing because in the case of dot product when you you know take dot product of two vectors the resultant won't be a vector so it will be a scalar so we will be discussing about that in the next video okay so i hope you have understood all the topics you have covered in this video I all about mathematics for machine learning so in this module so far we have discussed what is meant by vectors and uh, what are some basic vector operations so in the previous video was about uh, some basic vector operations that included uh, addition of two vectors subtraction of two vectors and multiplication of uh, a scalar by a vector and this is the continuation of that video where we are going to discuss about some more vector operations okay so in case you are watching my videos for the first time hi in this channel i'm making a hands on machine learning course with python and if you want to learn uh, my course from the beginning you can go to the playlist section of my channel where you can uh, study my course from the beginning okay so there will be uh, videos module wise so with that being said let's get started with today's video so these are the topics which we will be covering in today's video so first we will discuss about dot product of two vectors and second we will discuss about the cross product of two vectors and the third topic will be projection of one vector onto another vector so these are the three topics so first of all let's discuss about dot product of two vectors so let's say that we have two axes two coordinate axes x1 axis and x2 axis and we have two vectors here so the first vector is 2 comma 3 so and the second vector is 4 comma 4 so 
in the previous videos we have discussed what these values represent so these values are nothing but the coordinates of this particular point and it represents uh, the uh, vector this particular vector so if you are not uh, sure about this you can uh, go and watch that video so i'll give the link for that video in the description of this video now let's discuss about this dot product so here we have the two vectors so 2 comma 3 and 4 comma 4 okay so now let's see how we can calculate the dot product so it is just multiplication of two vectors so a dot product is you know specified by just putting a dot between the two vectors and when you just find the dot product of the two vectors what we will do is so both the vectors should have the same shape here the you know uh, both the vectors are in the form of uh, two rows and one column right so we have two and three so two rows and one column so the second vector is also of the same shape okay so now we can uh, dot product this and what we will do is we will multiply both the coordinates both the first coordinate so here the first coordinate is nothing but 2 and 4 so this is nothing but the x coordinate right so if you take this point this is nothing but uh, the x coordinate here is 2 and y coordinate here is 3 so for this vector the x coordinate is 4 uh, this y coordinate or x2 coordinate is also 4 so what we will do is first we have to multiply both the x1 coordinates so here it is 2 and 4 so we have to multiply uh, these two values and we have to multiply the second coordinates which are 3 and 4 so you can see here so these two values values will be multiplied and it will be added to the again 3 and 4 will be multiplied and both these values will be added so you can see here so it is the sum of the products of the coordinates so it is 2 and 2 into 4 plus 3 into 4 and the result which we will get will be 20 so this is the dot product of two vectors here the main thing that you need to note here is when you uh, perform dot product of two vectors the resultant you get will be a scalar so scalar is nothing but a numerical value or a constant so it is not a vector but a numerical value whereas if you add two vectors or if you subtract two vectors the resultant you will get will be a vector whereas when you perform dot product the resultant will be a scalar okay so if you want to find this graphically let's say that you want to uh, find this from this kind of graphs there is a formula which we can use for finding the dot product so let's say that this represents the a vector and the second vector represents b vector and the angle between them is theta okay so in the previous videos also i have uh, explained to you how you can find the angle between uh, two vectors so once you have that angle the dot product can be given as so a vector dot b vector is equal to magnitude of a vector multiplied by magnitude of b vector into cos theta here theta is nothing but the angle between uh, the two vectors so as i have told you i mentioned how you can find the magnitude of these vectors also in the previous videos so how we will find the magnitude is so if you take a vector the magnitude will be square root of 2 square plus 3 square so it will be like uh, square root of 4 plus 9 which is equal to 13 so uh, this is how you you will find the magnitude of two vectors and for b vectors it will be root of 4 square plus 4 square which is 16 plus 16 so root square of 32 so that that is how you can find the magnitude of a vector and b vector and once you find the angle between these two vectors you can just plug in the values in this formula and the value which you will get will be very close to this value 20 so this is how you can find the dot product of two vectors now let's discuss about the cross product of two vectors so let's take the same coordinate axis and let's take the same uh, two vectors 2 comma 3 and 4 comma 4 okay so now let's say that this is a vector and this is b vector and the theta is the angle between them so if you want to write the formula the formula is a vector cross b vector is equal to same uh, a magnitude of a vector into magnitude of b vector into sine theta whereas in the case of dot product what we what we use is a cos theta so that is the difference in the formula let's say that we want to find the cross product of two vectors and another thing to note here is when you perform cross product of two vectors the resultant you get will also be a vector so it don't be a scalar as it is in the case of dot product so the resultant of cross product of two vectors will also be a vector so this is how you can find uh, the resultant vector so if you take a vector into b vector so we need to uh, write something called as determinant so this is called as the determinant which is you know similar to a matrix and uh, we have three axes here i j and k so let's say that this x1 is represented as i and uh, j is represented by this x2 and k is the third dimension so we don't have the third dimension value here the third dimension value is uh, zero so now we need to put the values of this a vector and b vector in this determinant so you can see here ax ay az bx by and bz so this first line so sorry this second line represent 
the a vector so the a vector values and this third line represent the b vector values so you can see here we have plugged in the values so we have this i j k which are the reference coordinate axis okay so here uh, x1 is i and uh, this x2 represents j and we don't have any values for k because this is the third dimension whereas we have only 2d view here okay so that values will be zero now let's put the values of a vector here so ax will be 2 and ay will be 3 so you can see here we have put uh, ax value as 2 and 3 and it is 4 for both the bx and by right so we have put the values here now you can just do uh, how we do a matrix multiplication so in in this case what we will do is so just finding the determinant value so for uh, this particular case so let's say we need to take this i so you can see here so we have took this i here now just remove these two uh, so this row and this column okay so remove that column and you can see here now we, we need to multiply these two uh, values so 3 will be multiplied by 0 and it will be subtracted from uh, this 4 and 0 so you can see here 3 dot 0 so 3 multiplied by 0 minus 0 into 4 so that value will be your i vector value okay so our i coordinate value and minus j so now you need to take minus j and uh, now this particular column this j column and this column should be uh, neglected now again we should multiply 2 with 0 and it should be subtracted from 0 into 4 so you can see here so we have took j so 2 is multiplied with this 0 and uh, 0 is again multiplied with 4 and it is subtracted so it will be our j axis value and finally we have k now we have to ignore this particular column and this row and you can multiply this 2 into 4 minus 3 into 4 so we will get k value as this so if you just find or calculate the values what you will get is so the i coordinate uh, coefficient will be 0 for j also it will be 0 and for k it will be minus 4 so this is the vector that we are getting so this is how you can find the cross product of two vectors so we would have studied this in our 11th standard and 12th standard how to find this value and if you don't get this also it, uh, there is nothing to worry because we will discuss in detail about this when we are discussing about matrix so once we learn about matrix this will make more sense to you okay so this is how you can find the cross product of two vectors okay so the next thing which we are going to discuss is projection of a vector onto another vector let's say that we have two vectors so we have this a vector and v vector okay and now let's say that we want to project this a vector to this v vector so the purpose of this is to represent a vector in terms of v vector so what we will do is we will try to project this a vector onto v vector and just represent it in the direction of v vector so i'll just draw a dotted line here and this particular vector so you can see this yellow color vector here and this is a projection of a vector in terms of v vector okay so this is called as projection of a vector on v vector and the formula for this uh, projection of a vector is a dot v so it is the dot product of a vector and v vector divided by the square of the magnitude of v vector into v vector okay so this is the formula which you need to remember so this particular formula will give you the projection of a vector in terms of v vector which represents like uh, we represent a in terms of v so in the direction of v so this is how you can project one vector to another vector so these are the remaining three important vector operations that you need to know so in this video we have discussed how we can calculate dot product of two vectors and then we have discussed how we can find the cross product of two vectors and finally we have discussed how we can uh, you know project one vector onto another and we can find it with a projection formula okay so these are the topics uh, which we have covered in this video i hope you have understood all the things we have covered here in the next video we will uh, try to implement all these uh, three uh, concepts in python and uh, see how we can do that okay so that's it for this video i hope you have understood all the things covered in this my course from the beginning okay so in the previous video we have discussed about some important vector operations such as dot product of two vectors cross product of two vectors and projection of one vector onto another vector. In this video, I would like to implement these vector operations in Python and we can understand more about this operation. So that is the goal of this video. Okay. So if you haven't watched, watched that uh, video, just uh, go and watch it so that you can understand the concepts of dot product, cross product and projection of that uh, projection of vectors. Okay. So I'll give the link for that video in the description of this video. Okay. So now let's get started with today's video. First, I'll import the NumPy library and we are going to use this NumPy library to make NumPy arrays. We know that in uh, Python, in programming, 
vectors are nothing but arrays arrays are like list of uh, numbers okay so that what represents vectors in programming and for creating these arrays we need to create this numpy so i have explained you all about this in my previous videos what is meant by the vectors and uh, how we can implement this vector how we can create vectors in programming and other stuff okay so now let's understand the dot product of two vectors i just make a text here as dot product of two vectors so let's create the first vector as a vector and this a vector is equal to so i will show you the slide which we have used in the previous case here we take we uh, took two vectors and the a vector here is 2 comma 3 and b vector is 4 comma 4 right so we will take these two vectors and let's do the dot product of these two vectors so a is equal to np dot array and inside this so this np dot array function will create a numpy array and we need to mention the values in square brackets here in okay so the two values are nothing but two and three so which represents our uh, a vector and let's take the b vector as mp dot array and these values should be four comma four as we have seen so you can take any values you want so this is a two dimensional array because it contains uh, only two values x value and y value right so a vector and b vector now we can find the dot product of two vectors and let's store the dot product in the variable called as a dot b so this represents the dot product of a and b and we can use np dot dot so this dot function will calculate the dot product of these two vectors and inside the bracket just mention the two vectors a comma b so what we are doing is first we are creating the two vectors the a vector which has the values 2 and 3 and b vector which has the value 4 and 4 okay and now we are finding the dot product of a and b so i'll run this so to run this cell and go to the next one just press shift plus enter okay now you can print this a dot b so i'll print a dot b okay so you can see here that the value is 20 so you can uh, see this slide where in the previous video i have calculated the dot product and the value which we got is 20. so i have mentioned you in that video that the dot product of two vectors will be a scalar whereas if we add two vectors or subtract two vector or cross product two vector we will get a vector but in the case of dot product when you perform dot product on two vectors the resultant will be a scalar scalar is nothing but a constant or a value instead of a list of numbers or array so we will get a single value which is 20 in this case now what I'll do is, so we just took a two dimensional value, right? So I'll take some other arrays with three values. So let's create the array as C and C is equal to NP dot array. And let's take some random values. So let's take some uh, bigger values as let's say 40, 20. So take any values you want. So I'll just take these random values 40, 20 and 35. So this may represent the, uh, you know, I coordinate value. This represents J coordinate value and 35 represents K coordinate value, which, you know, we represent in uh, mathematics, right? So I, J and K. So let's take these three values and uh, let's take the D vector values as some values. So NP dot array. So this will create an array. And inside that we can mention some other values as let's say 53 and 24 and 68 so any values now let's again calculate the dot product so c dot d okay so it will be given by np dot dot so np is nothing but the numpy library so np dot and mention the two arrays which are c and d so let's run this and now we can print c dot d so the two products and the resultant we get is 4980 so 4980 and here you can see here that the dot product of these two vectors is a scalar which is a single value right so this is how you can find dot product of two vectors in python now let's discuss about cross product so as we know that the resultant of uh, cross product is actually a vector and not a scalar right so let's understand this cross product of two vectors and in this case let's create two arrays as a is equal to so just let's create the same arrays a is equal to 2 comma 3 and b is equal to 4 comma 4 okay so i'll just copy this here copy and paste it now i'll create another variable as a cross b and let's calculate the cross uh, a cross b and uh, put it in this variable called as a cross b and for this we need to use the function np dot cross so this will calculate the cross product of the two vectors 
in this we need to mention a comma b so a and b are the two vectors and we are finding the cross product of the two vectors a and b so i'll run this so uh, i'll just go to the slide and show you so we add the same uh, vectors so 2 comma 3 and 4 comma 4 and this is the formula to find uh, the cross product of two vectors and there is another way to find the cross product where we multiply the values so i have explained you how this works and we calculated that uh, the i vector or uh, i coordinate as the coefficient of zero and j also has the coefficient of zero whereas k has the value of minus four so you can see here zero zero and minus four so in that i have explained you how we can get these uh, values so the resultant value which should we should get is minus four right so let's uh, see whether we are getting it and now let's print a cross b so this should give the value as minus 4 right so we get the value as minus 4 so this is how you can create the cross product of two vectors now you can say that uh, I, I i told you that the resultant of a cross b will be a vector right but we just got a single value actually this is a vector value we don't have other values because the value of i and j will be 0 and 0 hence it is not mentioned in this particular line now what we shall do is let's take some other values and let's take three values so those three values represent this i j and k so a x uh, a y a z so i'm going to take three values as i took in this particular case okay so i'll just take two vectors c and d so again i'll just put some random values so c is equal to n p dot array and inside this mention uh, some values so i'll just put 5 comma 10 comma 20 so these are the three values that i take so this is a three dimensional vector because it has three values so in the previous case it is a two dimensional vector because it has only two values the x coordinate value and y coordinate value whether it is a three dimensional vector so it is nothing but x coordinate value y coordinate value and z coordinate value we can also represent them as i j and k so both of them are same and I'll create another vector as d vector, which is equal to np dot array. And the three values in this case are, you know, just take some random values. So 18, 32, and let's take 50. Okay, so these are the three values. And now let's find the cross product. So c cross d is equal to np dot cross. So this will find the cross product of c and d. So let's run this. And now we have to get a vector with three values right so as i have told you the resultant of cross product is a cross product sorry a resultant of cross product is a vector instead uh, in the case of dot product it is a scalar so i'll print this c cross d so now you can see here we got a vector so as i have told you vectors are nothing but arrays and this array contains three values so the resultant which we get is also a vector and this vector contains the value as minus 40 110 and minus uh, 20 so what you can do is you can just substitute these values so we took uh, these values right 5 10 20 18 32 50 and this 5 represents uh, ax ay and az and this represents bx by and bz so these values so you can substitute these values in this determinant and uh, you can just put it in this formula and find what is the value and you will get the vector value as minus 140 i 110 j and minus 20 k so this is how you can find cross product of two vectors in python okay so the third uh, concept which we are going to see is about projection of one vector onto another vector so i'll just make a text here as projection of so a vector on v vector okay so it can be e vector b vector or any vector i'm just naming this vector as v vector so i have mentioned you so i mean i have explained to you in the previous video that uh, projection is all about just projecting one vector onto another vector so let's take two vectors a vector and v vector so in this case what we are doing is we are representing a vector in terms of v vector so we just draw a dotted line and this uh, yellow color vector line becomes our projection of v ve a vector on v vector and the formula to find this is a projection of a on v is equal to dot product of a vector and v vector divided by magnitude of v square into v vector so this is the formula which you need to remember to find the projection of vector so i'll just uh, include that picture also so the formula picture so this is the formula so 
this is quite big so you can see so this is the formula so what we need to do is implement this function in python now okay so we just need to find the dot product of a vector and v vector and then we have to divide it by uh, square of the magnitude of v vector and multiply it with v vector so this is the uh, formula so now let's try to implement this so i'll take two vectors as a vector and v vector so a vector is equal to np dot array and let's take the values as 2 comma 5 so any values so but i'll just take two values two dimensional value and i'll take other vector as v vector so i'm taking this v vector because in formula it is represented as v otherwise i would have taken it as v so it doesn't make any difference so it is just the representation so let's put v vector is equal to np dot array and let's mention the values as b 8 comma minus 6 so i'll just take a negative value so these are the two vectors which we have so a vector is 2 comma 5 and b vector is 8 comma minus 6 now we need to create this formula okay so first let's find the magnitude of v vector so this is the magnitude of v vector uh, and whole square right so i'll just find the magnitude of v vector now so i'll just make a comment here as magnitude of v vector okay so i'll create the variable as magnitude of v vector and this is equal to np dot square root sum of i'll explain you what is meant by this line of code v square okay so this particular line of code will give us the magnitude of v vector so i have also explained in the previous videos about finding the magnitude of a vector and this is the formula so magnitude of v vector is equal to v1 square plus v2 square here uh, v1 represents the first coordinate value which is 8 and uh, v2 value represents the second value which is minus 6 so this is v1 this is v2 and the magnitude of vector is square root of v1 square plus v2 square if we have three values it becomes v1 square plus v2 square plus v3 square right so this is what we are just finding here so we are just uh, taking the square of v that means we are just squaring each of this value so 8 into 8 and minus 6 into minus 6 and we are adding the two values that's why we are mentioning sum and we are taking the square root so we are just implementing this so this you can see this square right so v square 2 so this means a v power 2 that means uh, we are multiplying each value so taking square of each value so square of 8 and square of minus 6 and we are adding those two values so using this sum function and finally we are taking the square root so this will give us the magnitude of v and then Let's find the projection of a vector on v vector. Okay, so we can implement this uh, particular function now. So I'll mention np dot dot. We know that np dot dot function will give us the dot product of two vectors, and in this case, I want to find the dot product of a vector and v vector. So mention a comma v. Okay, so it will find the dot product of a and v, and this should be divided by magnitude of v vector so magnitude of v and it should be uh, we should take a square of this magnitude so you can see the formula here so it is dot product of a dot v divided by square of magnitude of v so here we just found the magnitude of v and we need to take square so in python if you just uh, put two star sign it represents rise to the power so it is uh, v magnitude magnitude of v rise to the power 2 and this should be multiplied with v so this is this formula okay so you can see here so a dot v which is represented by this np dot dot a comma v divided by so we are just mentioning this uh, division symbol here divided by magnitude of v into whole square so magnitude magnitude of v whole square into v so this is the formula to find the projection of a vector on v vector so now i'll just print this so i'll just put a text here projection of a vector on v vector so is equal to so we can just put this value which is projection of a on v okay so let's run this 
so it will give us the projection of a vector on v vector so this is the value in which a vector is represented in terms of v vector so if you go to this slide so you can see here so this large red, uh, red line represents the v vector and this blue line represents a vector and you can see this yellow line which is the projection of a on v similarly this uh, projection of v on a sorry a on v is represented by this uh, particular uh, value which is minus 1.12 and 0 0.84 so this is how you can find the projection of one vector onto another vector so now what i'll do is i'll just copy and paste this so here also the resultant which we get is also a vector right so it makes sense now let's let's put three values here so three dimensional vector so I'll take the values as you know some random values so 23 so I'll take some larger values 23 45 and 62 so it represents x axis y axis and z axis or i coordinate j coordinate and k coordinate so similarly I'll take three values in this case so both the shape of the vector should be same so you cannot just have a vector as two dimension and v vector as three dimension so if it is two vector so if a vector is two dimension v vector should also be in two dimension if a vector is in three dimension that means if it has three values v vector should also have three values so the shape of the vector should be similar in both cases so now let's take some random values as 45 82 and 67 so you can cross check these values by plugging it in the projection formula okay so you can put the values in this projection formula and find what is the value you are getting so now we have the two vectors and we have some random values here now you can run this to find the projection of a vector and v vector now we get a vector with three dimensions so first value is 30.18 54.9 and 44.9 so these are the three values which are getting so this is the projection value of a vector on v vector so this is how you can represent one vector on in terms of other vector so these are the things which we have covered in here i'll just give you a quick recap of what we have done so first we have just imported this numpy library so this numpy library is used to create arrays and perform these vector operations and this np dot dot function will help us find the dot product of the two vectors and uh, we first took two dimensional vector where we have only two coordinates x coordinate and y coordinate later we took three coordinates x y and z or i j and k anything you can tell and uh, we found the dot product and the dot product is a scalar and then we found the cross product uh, using this np dot cross of two vectors so we again took uh, two dimensional vectors and three dimensional vectors and we found that the resultant of cross product is also a vector and finally we have uh, implemented this projection formula in python using this uh, numpy functions so we first found the magnitude of v vector using this np dot square root function and finally we have implemented this projection of uh, vector formula and we found the projection of one vector onto another vector so these are some important vector operations that are uh, very necessary while we are learning the mathematics for machine learning so i hope you have understood all the things covered in this video we posted on monday evening and wednesday evening okay so that's it about my channel and let's get started with today's video so these are the contents which we will cover in today's videos so first is we will understand the difference between scalars vectors and matrix okay so once we understand that we will discuss about the shape of a matrix so we can find the shape of a matrix and uh, what are the different matrix based on the shape okay and we'll also you know try to find the you know general representation of a matrix after that we will uh, discuss about different types of matrix so there are some special matrices matrices and we will discuss about it and uh, then we will you know discuss how we can find the transpose of a matrix okay and the fifth will be you know uh, i'll be explaining you what is the role of matrix in machine learning so these are the topics that we will be covering in today's video okay so just one more thing so you know for a singular form we call it as a matrix and for plural form it is it is called as matrices okay so now let's try to understand what is the difference between a scalar a vector and a matrix okay so we know that a scalar is nothing but just a number so it is a single value so this value can be this numerical value can be in or it can be 100 or it can be 1000 or it can even be 100,000 okay but it is just a single number so a scalar is something that represents only one number okay and now let's try to understand vectors so vectors is a list of numbers so in programming we deal with arrays so arrays are an example of vectors so vector either contains only one row or it contains only one column okay so it contain it may contain a row or column but it cannot have more than one row or it cannot have more than one column so it either contains one row or it either contain or it contains one column so that is about vector 
and the difference between scalar and vector is that scalar is a single number whereas vector is a single list of numbers okay and matrix is something that contains multiple rows and multiple columns so you can see here here the matrix contain uh, three rows and three columns right so you can see here so we have uh, three elements in the first row three elements in the second row and three elements in the uh, third row so it contains multiple rows and multiple columns whereas vector contains either one row or one column so that is the difference between scalar vector and matrix okay so now let's try to understand uh, what is the shape of a matrix or how we can find the shape of a matrix so consider this as a matrix so we know that uh, this matrix contains two rows and two columns right so you can see here two and five so this represents so this horizontal line represents the first row and this represents the second row and uh, if we just take a vertical line two and four represents the first column and five and eight represents the second column right so we call this a two cross two mat matrix okay so this two cross two represents the shape of the matrix where uh, this first number represents the number of rows and the second number of the shape represents the number of columns so if you take this we know that this contains one and two two rows and one and two two columns so we represent it as two cross two where the first number is row number and second number is a column number okay so this two cross two will be the shape of our matrix so this is how you can find the shape of a matrix let's see some more examples so if you consider this now let's see how many rows and columns we have in this particular matrix you can see here now we have three columns sorry three rows and three columns so the first row is nothing but eight six and one second row is two nine two nine and two and uh, third row is three four and three if you consider the columns we have eight two three six nine four and one two three right so uh, rows are horizontal values and uh, columns are vertical values so we know that and the shape of this matrix will be number of rows into number of columns here the number of rows is equal to 3 and number of columns is equal to also 3 so we have a 3 of 3 matrix okay so now let's uh, see another example so here you can see here this matrix contains three rows so two three is the first row six and four is the second row and seven and eight is the third row but it contains only two columns so it is important to note that a matrix can contain different number of rows and different number of columns here you can see here this matrix contain equal number of rows and columns here it also contains equal number of rows and columns so it can also contain different number of rows and columns here we have only two rows but sorry uh, three rows but we have only three columns okay sorry i made a mistake there so this particular matrix contains three rows and two columns here the number of rows and columns are not equal right so this is an example of a three cross two matrix so we can also have matrix with a different number of rows and columns so this is how you can uh, find and represent the shape of a matrix okay so now let's see how we can write a general notation of a matrix so this is a huge matrix and we have several elements here so this is the general representation a 1 comma 1 okay so we have some values here right so let's try to understand this here so this is an example of an m cross n matrix where m represents the number of rows let's say that there are about 100 rows in that case this m value will be 100 and let's say that we have about 200 columns so then then the value of n becomes 200 so m represents the number of rows and n represents the number of columns so it is just similar to it here m value is equal to 2 and n value is equal to 2 and in this case m value is 3 and n value is 2 so this is how we generally represent the shape of the matrix as m cross n now we have this a 1 comma 1 a 1 comma 2 right so here a i j represents matrix element so each you know a 1 2 or a 1 1 a 1 2 represent that matrix location or the element uh, location in that particular matrix and i represents the row number and j represents the column number so let's consider an example let's say that uh, let's take this a and we have these two subscripts right i and j so i'll just put this subscript as 2 3 so i is equal to 2 and j is equal to 3 now just put it there so a 2 3 so you can see where is a23 so this is a23 which is represented by the element present in second row and third column so this is the second row and when you just consider this uh, columns this is the third column so you can see this uh, subscripts here a i j here i represents what is the uh, row number that particular element belongs and j represents the column number to which that element belongs so if you consider this element so this element uh, present in third column right so one two three third column sorry third row 
and it present in third column so it will be a3 comma 3 so this is how you you know generally uh, represent a matrix where a ij is nothing but element in that matrix and ij is used to locate an element in that particular matrix so this is about shape of a matrix and how we uh, generally represent a matrix now let's uh, discuss about two main important types of matrix so these two types of matrix are null matrix or zero matrix and the second one is identity matrix okay so let's try to understand them a null matrix or zero matrix is a matrix that contains all the elements are zero here you can see here that we have a two cross two matrix and all the values of this two cross two matrix is zero so this is an example of a null matrix or zero matrix and then we can similarly have a three cross three null matrix where uh, we have three rows and uh, three columns and all the values are zero in this three cross three matrix similarly we can have four cross four matrix where all the elements are zero so you may wonder what is the significance of this so in several cases in python and in machine learning we have to initiate the matrix so we will initiate the matrix as uh, either null matrix or identity matrix so it is important to remember and important to note what is meant by this null matrix where all the elements will be zero so the important application is we need to initiate uh, these null matrix okay so it is you now in some cases we used to uh, initiate empty list right so it is similar to it so in several cases we may need to do this so this is an example of a null matrix now let's discuss about identity matrix an identity matrix is a matrix in which all the diagonal elements have the value of 1 and all the remaining values are 0 if you see here we have a 2 cross 2 matrix and all the elements are up in the diagonal uh, you know direction so here this is the diagonal right uh, from left to right so not this diagonal so from uh, right to left but this diagonal left to right all the values in this diagonal should be 1 and all the remaining values should be zero so this is an two cross two identity matrix and let's see this so this is an example of a three cross three identity matrix where all the diagonal elements have the value of zero and all the other elements have the value of sorry all the diagonal elements have the value of one and all the remaining elements have the value of zero so this is about three cross three identity matrix and we can also have four cross four identity matrix and it goes on which contains all the diagonal elements value as one and the remaining values will be zero so these are import two important uh, types of matrices and uh, we will use this null matrix and identity matrix to initiate matrices okay so the next topic which we are going to discuss is transpose of a matrix so let's say that uh, you know let's first try to understand this transpose with a definition so transpose of a matrix is formed by turning all the rows of a given matrix into columns and vice versa so what we will try to do is if we take a matrix and if we want to find the transpose of a matrix we will uh, convert all the rows into columns and all the columns into rows so this is all about the transpose of a matrix let's try to understand this with an example let's say that we have a matrix and the name of the matrix is a so a is equal to 2 5 4 8 so this is the a matrix if we take transpose of this a matrix so this 2 and 4 this first column should, should be transformed to row and uh, this second column should be also transformed to row let's see this this is the a transpose where you can see here 2 4 is the first column so it will be transformed to row where we have 2 4 here and the second column 5 8 will be uh, converted into this column will be converted into second row okay so you can see here it has 5 8 so this first column will be transformed to first row and the second column will be transformed to second uh, row okay so this is how you can find the transpose of a matrix and now let's consider a 3 cross 3 matrix let's say that uh, we have a b matrix and b matrix is equal to uh, 8 6 1 2 9 2 3 4 3 so here uh, it is the similar case where rows will be converted into columns or columns will be converted in, into rows and this is how uh, transpose of a matrix is uh, represented where p is written as a superscript of that matrix okay so if we take b transpose we will get so a 2 3 is the first column this will be written in the form of first row where we have a 2 3 in the first row right so similarly 6 9 4 is in the second column now we will transform it to 694 in the second row similarly 1 2 3 is present in the third column now it will be transformed to the third row where 1 2 3 is present so this is how you can find the transpose of a matrix okay so this is the last topic in our uh, matrix basics video and now let's see what is the role of matrix in machine learning so we know that in machine learning we often deal with uh, data sets right so our data set 
you know contain maybe uh, hundreds of rows and it may also contain you know uh, tens or twenty number of columns right and this data set can be considered as a matrix so i'll just give you an example so we have already did a project on house price prediction in our, our channel and we have used a data set right so that data set contains a lot of data i've just uh, took just four data points here so one two three four so we have four data points here and we have several uh, columns so totally in this particular example there are 14 columns and this particular data set is an example of a 4 cross 14 matrix so 4 represents rows and 14 represents columns so we have 4 rows and 14 columns so you know all the data sets that we use represent some form of matrix okay and this is the importance of you know learning vectors and matrix in machine learning because like all the processing that happens in a machine learning algorithm all you know how it uh, you know uh, calculates and computes the input data the data set is completely based on the matrix operation because you know this data set just represents a matrix just a larger matrix that's the difference we are generally used to matrix of 2 cross 2 3 cross 3 and the 3 cross 4 so, you know such small dimensions of matrix where when it comes to data set we may contain you know 15000 a number of rows and or uh, you know 10 columns so there the matrix size will be huge but the concepts are similar the data type is similar which is a type of a matrix right so this is why uh, the understanding of matrix is very important because all the processing computation that goes on inside the machine learning algorithm will be based on the operations that we do on a similar or a simple matrix okay so these are about the important basics of matrix in the next video let's uh, just go into python and try how we can uh, make matrix in python and how we can find this transpose and other things in python okay so that's it for this video i hope you have understood all the contents we have covered in this video and start learning my course from the beginning okay so with that being said let's get started with today's video okay so the first step is to import numpy library so import numpy as np okay so numpy stands for numerical python okay so it is you know very useful for creating arrays so we call these arrays as numpy arrays so we would have also studied about or you know practiced arrays in c programming and other programming languages so arrays is nothing but it is a list of numbers so you know something that contains multiple uh, numerical values so something like that okay so that is uh, meant by arrays and uh, we can create exclusive numpy arrays using this numpy library so it is also very useful for doing some uh, mathematical computations okay and we will use this numpy library to create our matrices so i am doing this programming in google collaboratory so if you are not aware of this google collaboratory it is a cloud based uh, you know programming environment for python so you can just go to google and search as google collaboratory so once you go to this site so you can see the site here so it's collab.research.google.com so here there will be a connect option so you can connect your system from here after that you can run your python programs in these cells okay so if you want to run this cell so if you want to execute this cell just press shift plus enter so if you press shift plus enter it will execute that cell and go to next one so you can also press this play symbol which is to run that cell okay so this will import our numpy library okay so now i'll just make a text here so in this text you can just uh, give some description of what you are doing in your code so here i want to create a matrix right so this is about creating a matrix using numpy okay so let's name this matrix as matrix 1 matrix 1 is equal to np dot array and okay so inside this parenthesis we need to give the elements of the matrix that we want okay so i'll just make a square bracket here so in this square bracket we need to mention the rows of our matrix separately okay so inside this square bracket i'll create two other square brackets okay so you can see the you know uh, the square brackets i'm making so in this first set of brackets so inside this i need to mention my first row so let's say that the elements of the matrix are 2 comma 3 and the you know second row of the matrix contains the values let's say 6 comma 7 so you can take any values so this 2 and 3 will be the first row of our matrix and the 6 and 7 will be the elements of our second row in our matrix so you can press shift plus enter so I'll, I'll also just print this so let's print matrix one okay so let's print shift plus uh, let's 
press shift to plus enter you can see here now it uh, it has created our matrix which has first row as 2 comma 3 and the second row as 6 comma 7 so this is how you can create a matrix in python using this np dot array function okay so np refers to numpy so we generally uh, import numpy in the short form as np so in, so that we can use this in a short form as np instead of using this numpy in numpy every time we you know uh, use that particular library so it is just the general convention of importing a library in a short form okay so now let's see how we can find the shape of a matrix so we call a matrix as a two cross three matrix if it contains two rows and three columns and we can call it a four cross five matrix if it contains a four rows and five columns right so now let's see how we can find the shape of this particular matrix so matrix one so mention it matrix one dot shape okay so let's run this so here you shouldn't mention the uh, parenthesis so like for example so after putting this uh, shape you cannot uh, just include this parenthesis so it will uh, you know give us an error because like tu tuple objects is not callable so whenever you see you are using this shape function just uh, run it without that parenthesis and this shape will give us the shape of our matrix so here it is 2 comma 2 so 2 comma 2 represents 2 rows and 2 columns so the first element represents the number of rows and the second element uh, represents the number of columns so here we have two rows and two columns right so two and three will be our first row and six and seven will be our second row and two and six will be our first column and three and seven will be our second column so this is how you can find the shape of a matrix so now let us create another matrix with different shape so i'll name this as matrix 2 and matrix 2 is equal to np dot array okay so np dot array inside this we need to mention the rows we want right so we need to mention those arrays inside the, these square brackets so let's create three sets of brackets one for each row okay so now we can mention the elements that we want in our matrix so you can just take any random numbers so i'll just take the values as 10 35 45 anything you want so let the values in the second column be 50 64 80 okay so now let's put the values in our third column so 20 comma 15 comma 90 okay so now let's try to print this matrix to okay so now we can see here that we got a 3 cross 3 matrix so the first row contains the values 10 35 45 so you, so you, can, you can see here right so the second uh, row of values that we gave was 50 64 and 80 so you can see that here so this is how you can create a matrix with three rows and three columns so similarly you can just find the shape of this matrix as matrix 2 dot shape okay so let's run this Okay, so it is a 3 cross 3 matrix which means it contains 3 rows and 3 columns. Okay, so now let's see how we can create matrix with random values. So I'll just make a text here as creating matrices. So the plural form of matrix is matrices with random values. Okay, so in a lot of times when we are working in matrix in python so we need to you know initiate our matrix so in that case we will initiate uh, these matrix sometimes with random values and sometimes with all the values as zeros and such kind of matrices now let's see how we can create matrices with any random values so i'll just name this matrix as random matrix and random matrix is equal to np dot random dot rand so this is the function that will give us uh, you know uh, matrix with random values so inside this parenthesis we need to mention the shape of the matrix that we want here let me put as 3 comma 3 so that means i want a 3 cross 3 matrix a matrix with 3 rows and 3 columns and i want all the values to be some random values okay so this is how you can create it so in the previous cases we have just given the values right so we didn't men didn't mention the shape so in this case we can mention the shape and it, it will just give you random values now let us print this so print random matrix okay so now you can see here we get a matrix with random values but the important thing to note here is 
all the values are floating point values and all the values are less than one right so it is in the range of 0 0.8 0 0.4 etc and it is less than one right so this is what the values that we will get if we use this mp dot random dot rand now let's see how we can create a matrix with random values but all the values should be integers okay so let's see so this is about creating creating matrix with random integers okay so we can just name this as any name you can give so i'll just name this as random integer matrix okay and this is equal to mp dot random dot rand int so in the previous case we have used random dot rand right so this rand gives us floating values whereas this rand int gives us integer values so one second i'll just check whether it is recording okay so now you can see here we have used this rand int function so inside this again mention uh, you know we need to mention the shape of the matrix and there is another parameter that we need to mention so i just put here the value as 100 so 100 means i want uh, you know random values but all the random values should be less than 100 okay so and there is another parameter called as size so this size is nothing but the shape of the matrix that we want so here i'll just create a four cross five matrix that means the matrix should contain four rows and five columns and you can print this random initial matrix sorry random integer matrix so the two parameters that we gave are the number so like if we if i just give this number as 50 all the values will be less than 50 so if i give this as the value as 1000 all the random values will be less than 1000 and the second parameter is nothing but the shape of the matrix that we want so let's run this now you can see here we got a matrix with random integer values and all the values are less than 100 okay so this is how you can create a matrix with random values uh, you know random integer values right okay so next let's see how we can create a matrix with all the values as one okay so let's see so let me put a text as matrix with all the values as one okay so let's name this matrix as um, matrix 3 okay so just give any name you want so for this we need to use the function in library in numpy library called as mp dot ones okay so mp dot ones and inside this we need to mention the shape of the matrix that we want two comma three okay so and let's also print this matrix two comma three okay so here you can see here i have just mentioned two parentheses here so i have enclosed the shape in another uh, parenthesis so in some cases we need to do that so some function requires that okay so I'll just go here you can see the uh, description here so mp dot ones okay so you can see the parameters here so it it has the values as shape right so shape is nothing but the shape of the matrix that we want so it is an integer or sequence of integers so we need to give it in the form of uh you know um as a list okay so here i'll just mention the shape of the matrix as two comma three and let's run this and this will create a matrix with uh, two rows and three columns and all the values will be one okay so this is how we can do this and here you can see here it is in the form of floating point right so it is given us one point so it is in the form of decimal value now let's see how we can create a matrix with all the values as one but all the values will be in the form of integers so it, it is just the same thing but we just need to uh, mention one parameter here which is a d type so d type represents the data type okay so d type and d type is equal to int so integer int represents integer so let's run this so this will create a matrix and all the values will be in the form of integers and all the values will be one of course so this is how you can create a matrix with all the values as one okay so you can just copy this and try it for different shapes so i'll just uh, give a bigger matrix here so bigger shape for this matrix so I'll just put this as 10 comma 10 okay 
okay so this is how you can create a, you know a matrix with more number of rows and columns now let's see how we can create a matrix with all the values as zero okay so this type of matrix is called as a null matrix or so null matrix or zero matrix okay so let's name this matrix as null matrix so null matrix is equal to mp dot zeros so mp dot zeros is the function that can create this kind of uh, matrix and inside this uh, parenthesis mention the shape that you want so you know let's create a 4 comma 4 matrix so which has 4 rows and 5 columns and all the values should be 0 so print null matrix ok so let's run this so now we can see that we got all the values as zeros for a 4 cross 4 matrix ok so similarly we can just uh, you know change the shape of the matrix you want so I'll just put here as maybe uh, you know 7 comma 7 so anything you want so this is how we can create a null matrix with a different shape so for just you know getting a matrix with a different shape you just need to change this uh, shape parameter okay so next let's see how we can create an identity matrix so identity matrix is another important matrix uh, so let's name this as identity matrix so as I told you earlier, so in some cases we need to initiate our matrices, matrices with all the values as zero or all the values as uh, you know in the form of an identity matrix. So identity matrix is something that has all the diagonal values as one and the remaining values will be zero. So you can understand this better after we implement this identity matrix. So identity matrix is equal to np dot i. So this i is the function that gives us an identity matrix. So we can just mention the shape we want. So here I'll create a 3 comma 3 matrix and let's print this identity matrix. Okay, now you can see here we have all the values as 1 for this diagonal. So it's not the diagonal from right to left but it is from the diagonal from left to right so all the values will be one in this uh, you know left to right diagonal and all remaining values will be zero so this is one of the important types of matrices so similarly you can create identity identity matrix with different shapes so we know that we just need to change the shape of the matrix so here i'll just give it as 5 comma 5 so we will get a uh, 5 cross 5 identity matrix where all the diagonal values are 1 and the remaining values are 0 ok so and we are in the final step of this video where we will try to find the transpose of a matrix so let me put a text here as transpose of a matrix ok so transpose is nothing but a matrix which in which the rows are converted into columns and the columns are converted into rows so it is just like interchanging the rows and columns in a matrix okay so now what we shall do is i just create a random matrix so we have already seen how we can create a random matrix right so i just put a comment here as matrix with random integer values okay so let's name this matrix as a okay so a is equal to we know that we need to use the function np dot random dot rand int right so rand int and inside this mm, we need to mention a number so if we mention under that means all the integer values uh, all the elements of the matrix matrix will have the values as less than 100 right and the second parameter is size and this size is the shape of the matrix so size is equal to um let's let's take a 4 comma 5 matrix okay so you can also print this a matrix okay so we got a random 4 cross 5 matrix a matrix with 4 rows and 5 columns with all the values less than 100 right now let's see how we can find the transpose of a matrix so in the transpose of a matrix if we consider this first column so the first column has the values as 39 49 40 and 19 right so this first column will be converted to first row where the first row will contain the value as 39 49 40 and 19 so let's see this so let's name this matrix as transpose of a so transpose is actually it is also a matrix so it is not any other different type of uh, you know data type so transpose of a is equal to we can use the function np dot transpose 
okay so inside this parenthesis mention the matrix for which you want to find the matrix so sorry for which you need to find the transpose here i want to find the transpose of a right so i need to mention uh, mp dot transpose a okay and now let's print transpose of a okay so let's run this now you can see here so the first column will be converted into first row here so the first column the values are 39 49 40 and 19 now the first row has the values as 39 49 40 and 19 so this second column starting from 18 and 17 will be converted to second uh, row and this third column will be converted to third row and so on okay so this is how you can uh, find the transpose of a matrix so that's it for this video i hope you have uh, understood all the contents we have covered in this video thanks multiple videos so with that being said let's get started with today's video and these are the four topics which we will cover in today's video and the first topic will be on matrix addition and the second topic will be on matrix subtraction and the third topic will be on how to multiply a matrix by a scalar and the fourth topic will be on multiplying two matrices so these are the four topics which we will discuss today and there is another important thing which i need to tell you so I have created a quiz based on the, these topics so it will be in the in a google form so i give the link for this google form in the description of this video and i have made the questions completely based on the topics that i have covered in this video and once you completely watch this video you can uh, try the test and uh, see how you are uh, you know getting this concepts and how you are understanding this and this will be a very good exercise for you to understand what are the different operations that can be performed on a matrix okay so let's get started with today's video so before starting with these operations so let's try to understand about matrix a little bit so i'll just give you a quick introduction so we know that there are three types of data the first type of data is scalar and the second type is vector and the third type is matrix right so scalar is nothing but a single number single numerical value so here we have we took an example as 24 right so this value can be 24 this value can be 100 or 1000 or any numerical value but a single numerical value and there is this second type of data called as vector a vector is a list of number or it is you know it is similar to an array in programming so in programming we are used used to arrays right so arrays are nothing but list of numbers that contains you know multiple values multiple numerical values or other data types so a vector contains a single row or a single column of multiple values so here you can see here this vector contains one row with multiple values and this vector contains one column with multiple values right and there is matrix matrix is something that contains multiple rows and multiple columns so here this matrix contains three rows and three columns so this is about scalars vectors and matrix so i'll just give you a quick uh, you know another introduction on where we use matrix in machine learning before uh, going into the matrix operations right so in machine learning everything is about data so what we do in machine learning is feed a data set to our machine learning model and our machine learning model can find the pattern in this data set so this pattern will be used by our machine learning model to make future prediction and other analysis so consider this example so this is an example of an house price data and uh, so here you can see here this particular data set so this uh, sample data contains four rows right so one two three four four rows and we have multiple columns so when you count this we know that this is a four cross 14 matrix so it contains four rows and 14 columns so any data set you take in machine learning can be considered as a matrix so all the processing and computation that goes in a machine learning model over this data will be in the form of the matrix operations which we are going to discuss so this is how the concepts of vectors and matrix is very important in machine learning because all the data and their computation will be in the form of vectors and matrix operations so we have already discussed about vector operations and now let's discuss about matrix operation so the first operation which we are going to discuss about is addition okay and there is one main thing which we need to take note of when we are adding two matrices so this is the addition rule which states that two matrices can be added only if they have the same shape okay so that is both the matrix should have the same number of rows and columns so what this tells is we can add two matrix only if they have the same number of rows and columns okay so if they have uh, you know different number of rows and columns then we cannot add those two matrices so let's try to understand this with an example so now we have two matrices here so let's try to find the shape of the matrix 
So this is a two cross two matrix because it contains two rows. So two and three represents the first row. Ten and five represents the second row, right? And it contains two columns. Two and ten represents the first column. Three and five represents the second column. So this is a two cross two matrix. Similarly, this is also a two cross two matrix because it contains two rows and two columns. So these two matrices can be added because they have the same shape. Shape represents the number of rows and columns. So they have the same number of rows and columns. So when you add these two matrices. we get a resultant matrix so what is the resultant matrix is so the values will be added element wise so here what is the first element what is the element in the first row and the first column so 2 right so 2 is the element in the first row and first columns just consider row wise so this is the first row and uh, consider this first column so when you take this 2 2 is the element in the first row and first column here the element in the first row and the first column is 10 so the corresponding element will be added so this is called as element wise addition so whenever you are doing matrix addition we have to do element wise addition okay so similarly 3 will be added to 5 10 will be added to 20 and 5 will be added to 4 so this is a simple element wise addition so when you add 2 plus 2 we know that we get 12 and we know that 3 plus 5 gives 8 so similarly uh, element wise addition will be carried out now let's take another example so uh, there is another thing so when you add two matrix the resultant matrix also has the same shape so it is logical right so when you add two matrix of same shape the resultant will be also in the form of uh, the same shape and now let's consider this example so now let's try to find the shape of this matrix so this is a 3 cross 2 matrix because it contains three rows so 2 and 1 represents the first row 4 and 2 represents the second row 6 and 3 represents the third row and columns so it has two columns 2 4 6 is the first column 1 2 3 is the second column so this is a 3 cross 2 matrix and this is also a 3 cross 2 matrix 3 cross 2 matrix because it contains three rows and two columns so as the number of rows in the first matrix is equal to the number of rows in the second second matrix we can add these two matrices so when you do element wise addition this is the resultant you get where 2 will be added to 5 1 will be added to 2 4 will be added to this 3 and 2 will be added to 6 and so on so this is simple element wise addition so this is how we can add two matrices and the main thing which we need to take note of here is the shape of the two matrices should be the same and the addition should be element wise so these are the two main things regarding matrix addition now uh, yeah we know that the shape should be the similar corresponding to the other two matrices now let's discuss about matrix subtraction so it is very similar to matrix addition where the number of rows in the first uh, matrix should be equal to the number of uh, uh, rows and columns in the second matrix so it is the similar case where the shape of the two matrix should be similar okay so let's consider the similar example we know that uh, both of these are two cross two matrices and when we subtract this it is very similar to matrix addition where we do element wise addition in this case we do element wise subtraction here there will be you know 2 minus 10 so will be the first element and the second element will be 3 minus 5 so similarly 10 will be subtracted with this 20 and 5 will be subtracted from 4 so and the resultant will be this so 2 minus 10 is equal to minus 8 and 3 minus 5 is minus 2 10 minus 20 is minus 10 and 5 minus 4 is 1 so two cross two matrix and two cross two matrix so they have the same shape so we can subtract them and the resultant will also have the same shape okay so this is how you can uh, subtract two matrix and if you take uh, another example which i have uh, taken before which is a three cross two matrix and a three cross two ma uh, two matrix so the first thing which we need to check is whether the shape of the two matrices are equal so here the both the matrices have the same shape so we can do element wise subtraction okay so and the resultant is uh, the one which we get here which also has the same shape so 2 will be uh, subtracted from this 5 so 2 minus 5 which is minus 3 1 minus 2 is minus 1 and so on so it, it is a simple element wise subtraction okay so this is about matrix subtraction the third operation which we are going to discuss is multiplying a matrix by a scalar okay so let's take this particular matrix so this is an example of a 3 cross 1 matrix so 3 cross 1 matrix represents a matrix with three rows and one column right so 2 is uh, the element of the first row 4 represents the second row and 6 represents the third row so it contains three row and the three rows and one column and let's multiply this by a scalar we know that a scalar is a single numerical value in this case let's take the scalar value as 5 so when you multiply a scalar by a matrix so sorry when you multiply a matrix by a scalar what happens is all the elements inside the matrix should be multiplied by this uh, scalar 
so this is what we get so this 5 should be multiplied with 2 and 4 and 6 separately okay so this will be the resultant uh, which is like 5 into 2 we know that it is 10 and 5 into 4 is 20 and 5 into 6 is 30 so this is simply magnifying a matrix by a factor here we are just magnifying a matrix by a factor of pi so you know just increasing the size of a matrix so the value of a matrix and this is how we can uh, you know multiply a matrix by a scalar so if you you know uh, we know that this is a 3 cross 1 matrix and the resultant matrix will also contain the same shape which is 3 cross 1 and if you take a 3 cross 2 matrix and let's again multiply this by a factor of 5 so we are magnifying by a factor of 5 so we can represent it as multiplying a scalar multiplying a matrix by a scalar here we are multiplying a 3 cross 2 matrix by a scalar which is 5 and the resultant is 10 5 20 10 and 13 and 15 so we are multiplying all the elements of the matrix by a factor of 5 okay so this is how you can multiply a matrix by a scalar and uh, the resulting will contain the same shape and there is another main thing which i want you to note here so you can see here i have mentioned a line here as vectors are a type of matrix with either one row or one column you might got a doubt here so in the previous slide i have mentioned you that vector is something that contains either one row or one column of values right so here you can see here this is actually a vector because it contains only one row it doesn't contains multiple uh, sorry it contains only one column right so it does not contain multiple uh, columns it contains only one column so we can uh, call this as a vector but i have represented it as a matrix so it is a three cross one matrix so what is the main thing which you need to note here is vectors are also a type of matrix with either one row or one column so this is this is a very important you know key thing to note so vectors are a type of matrix with either one row or one column okay so this is about multiplying a matrix by a scalar now let's see uh, another important operation which is multiplying two matrices okay so this is one of the important matrix operation and the main rule here is the number of columns in the first matrix should be equal to the number of rows in the second matrix so the multiplication rule is very different from what is the rule we have seen in uh, matrix addition and matrix subtraction so in matrix addition and matrix subtraction if we take two matrices the number of rows and columns in the both the matrix should be same the shape should be exactly similar but it is not the case in the case of multiplication so it is kind of different and the resultant matrix will have the same number of rows as the first matrix and the same number of columns as the second matrix so you may not understand this particular line now but when i explain you the example you might get it better okay so let's try to understand this with an example so let's say that we have two matrices so we know that this is a two cross two matrix because it contains two rows and two columns so two three represents the first row ten five represents the second row and two ten represents uh, the first column three and five represents the second column so similarly this is also a two cross two matrix so here see the rule so here we can see that the rule states that the number of columns in the first matrix should equal the number of rows in the second matrix so we know that this is the shape of the matrix and the second value so here this is the the second value so this second value represents the number of columns and the first value represents the number of rows so here so when you when you want to multiply two matrices as uh, stated in the rule these two values should be similar where this value represents the number of columns in the first matrix as stated here so the number of columns in the first matrix and this value represents the number of uh, rows in the second matrix which is stated in this rule so these two values should be equal then only the values can be sorry these matrices can be multiplied so these values can be multiplied and we have the remaining shape right so this two and this two so this will be the shape of our new resultant matrix so this two and this two so if we if uh, just consider this we have uh, other matrix with a different shape and the matrix uh, shape is 3 cross 2 and 2 cross 3 in that case the resultant matrix will have a shape of 3 cross 3 so the main thing which you want to note here is both these values should be similar which represents the number of columns in the first matrix and the number of rows in the second matrix just take a note of this and this is very important okay and the resultant will be the number of rows in the first matrix so this will be the number of rows in our resultant matrix and this will be the number of columns in our resultant matrix let's consider another example so this is a 3 cross 2 matrix and this is also a 3 cross 2 matrix and now let's check whether this rule is satisfied so let's see whether this condition is satisfied and if you uh, you know check this 
the number of columns in the first matrix is not equal to the number of rows in the second matrix right so these two values are different so we cannot multiply these two matrices so this is the main thing which we need to uh, take note of where if we want to uh, multiply two matrices the number of columns in the first matrix should be equal to the number of columns in the second matrix so this is uh, the main condition for multiplying two matrices so now we have understood what is the condition for this now let's see how we can multiply two matrices so this is the general notation that represents uh, multiplying two matrices okay so here you can see here we have the first matrix as uh, a b and c d so this is a two cross two matrix and this is e f and g h so this is al also a two cross two matrix so we have uh, discussed in the previous slide that two cross two matrix and two cross two matrix can be multiplied because it is satisfying our condition right so now what happens here is so just don't uh, look at this just take this first value let's see what this first value is take the first row of the first matrix and the first column of the second matrix i'll explain you this again we need to take the first row of the first matrix and first column of the second matrix so a will be multiplied with e and b will be multiplied with g so i just uh, mark this in this slide so a will be multiplied with e okay and b will be multiplied with g and both these values will be added and that will be our first row and first column values here you can see here it is a e so a is the product so a e plus b g so a will be multiplied with uh, e and b will be multiplied with g and the, both these values will be uh, added now let's take this second value let's understand what is meant by this second value here consider this first row and second column here a will be multiplied with f and b will be multiplied with h okay so and both these values be added again so the resultant which you get is a into f plus b into h similarly when you take this particular value here uh, take the second row of the first matrix and first column of the second matrix so here ce plus dg similarly the next value will be cf plus d into h so this is how you can multiply two matrices so i'll just remove all of those uh, scribbles so i hope you have understood what i'm uh, you know explaining here so we need to take this first row and first column for this first value and for second value we need to take this first row and second column so similarly we need to take this particular row and this particular column for this value and this c and d row and f and h row for last column so this is the general notation of how we multiply a two cross two matrix and let's take this uh, numerical example and the first thing which we need to check for multiplying two matrix is their shape so we need to check whether the number of columns in the first matrix is equal to the number of rows in the second uh, column so if we have this kind of condition only we can perform this kind of operation that why that's why we have this kind of condition okay so when you just uh, you know use this uh, particular notation particular formula this is what we get so 2 and 4 will be multiplied with this 5 and 3 respectively and that value will be added so 2 will be multiplied with 5 and 4 will be multiplied with 3 and both of these values will be added similarly for this second value the this element sorry this value will be the element in first row second column right so for this value we need to multiply 2 and 6 and uh, 4 and 4 and these two values should be uh, added so similarly 3 and 6 and 5 and 3 so 3 should be multiplied with 5 6 uh, 6 should be multiplied with 3 and both of them should be added and 3 will be multiplied with 6 and 6 will be multiplied with 4 and it will be our fourth value so this is how you can carry out a uh, matrix multiplication and the resultant will be these two remaining shape which is 2 cross 2 in this case right so it will be our resultant shape so this is how you can multiply these two matrices so i hope you have understood how we can multiply these two matrices so if you uh, if you have any doubts please let me know in the comments fifth module is all about mathematics for machine learning in the previous video i have explained to you about what are the different matrix operations that we can do and in this video we are going to implement those matrix operations in python so this will be a very interesting hands on video where we will try to implement all those things which we have learned conceptually in python okay so in case you are watching my videos for the first time hi in this youtube channel i am making a hands on machine learning course with python and if you want to learn this course from the beginning 
just go to the playlist section of my channel where you will find videos module wise so each module contains multiple videos so start learning from the module one okay so with that being said let's get started with today's video okay so the four matrix operations that we have discussed are matrix addition matrix subtraction multiplying a matrix by a scalar and uh, multiplying two matrices so these are the four uh, operations that we are going to do in python okay and uh, i'll also give the link for a quiz in the description of this video and this quiz contains uh, several questions based on the programming and based on the codes that I'm going to do today. Okay, so you can answer that questions once you watch this video So if you watch this video completely, you can answer all those questions correctly Okay, so it will be a very good exercise for you and also after watching this video practice all these codes by yourself So this will be like an assignment for you to practice. Okay, so let's get started The first step is to import the library that we need. So for creating matrix we need numpy library so I'll just make a text here describing what I'm doing in this code. So the, in the first step, I'm going to import the NumPy library. So importing NumPy library and NumPy stands for, so NumPy stands for numerical Python. So it is useful for making several arrays called as NumPy arrays and we are going to use these NumPy arrays as matrices, okay? So this particular environment is called as Google Collaboratory in case you are not aware about this. So in this Google Collaboratory, this is a cloud based environment where we can run Python programs. So you can connect your system from here, then you can run your Python program in this cells. OK, so just go to Google and search as Google Collaboratory. So you will uh, go to this site collab.research.google.com. Here you can run your Python programs. OK, so this is very useful for machine learning, deep learning and data science projects. So now let's uh, get started with our code. So the first step is importing NumPy libraries. So let's import NumPy as NP. Okay. So what we are doing is importing NumPy in a short form as NP. So instead of mentioning NumPy every time, we can mention this short form as NP. Okay. So the first operation which we are going to discuss is matrix addition. So matrix addition. So I'll just make a text here. So in order to run a cell and go to the next one, so in order to execute a cell and go to the next one, you can press shift plus enter. Okay. So I'll just make this as bold and you can press shift plus enter. This will automatically run the cell and go to the next one. So there is one main thing which we need to take note of in matrix addition. So we can add two matrices. So two matrices only if they have the same shape. So I'll just make a text here as two matrices can be added only if they have the same shape only if they have the same shape okay so we have discussed about this in the previous video i'll also give the link for the previous video in the description of this particular video so uh, shape is nothing but the number of rows and columns so now let's create two matrices so i'll just make a comment here as creating two matrices okay so let's name this matrices as A and B. So let A matrix be uh, A is equal to NP dot array and NP dot array. Inside this, we need to uh, put some square brackets. So this is the overall square bracket. And inside this, we need to mention the rows of our matrix. So we need to open two other matrix. So I want to create a two cross two matrix. So two cross two matrix represents a matrix with two rows and two columns. Okay. And the values of the first row should be, uh, you know, put in this first square bracket and the second value should be enclosed in this second square bracket. So let's uh, put this values as 2 comma 3 and uh, 4 comma 5. So 2 comma 3 will be the values of the first row of our matrix A and 4 comma 5 is the values of second row of our matrix A. So now let's create another matrix as B and B is equal to NP dot array. So np is the numpy library which we have imported and array is the function that creates this numpy array which we are using as matrix. So numpy array and uh, similarly we need to create two uh, square brackets for two arrays of matrix. Let's uh, put the values as 6, 7. So you can just give any values you want. Okay. So I'll just take this uh, simple values. So 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6, 7, 8, 9. Okay, so these are the two matrices. So A matrix and B matrix and you can print this matrix and see. So I'll print A first. So let's take this as capital A and you can see here now we have a matrix with uh, the values as 
two and three, which uh, comprises of the first row, and four and five are the second row. So similarly, you can print uh, the B matrix, which has the values of six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, so you can see here. So the first set of values, two and three, will be the first row, and the second set of values will be the second row. So this is how you can create two matrices using this uh, num np dot array function. Okay, so let's say that we want to find the shape of this matrix. So mention the uh, name of the matrix. So in this we have named the matrix as A, right? So A dot shape. So this shape function will give us the shape of uh, our matrix. So here it it tells us that it is two comma two. Here the first value represents the number of rows, and the second value represents the number of columns, right? So here we have two rows and two columns. So that is what it has been given here. So this uh, particular matrix contains two rows and two columns. So I have already mentioned here that two matrices can be added only if they have the same shape. So the shape of A should be the same as shape of B. So let's also check the shape of B. We know that it's uh, two comma two, but let's check this anyway. So it is a good practice. So if you can see here, both of these matrix have the sh same shapes. So we can add these two matrices. So what happens when you add two matrices is that all the elements so or all the values will be added element wise say for example in this case if you add a and b this 2 will be added with the 6 and this 3 will be added with this 7 4 will be added with 8 and 5 will be added with this 9 so element wise addition will take place so now let's uh, add these two matrices so i'll just put a text here as adding two matrices so let's name this addition matrix the resultant sum as sum so this will be the resultant matrix which we are adding okay so just change it in. okay so now you can just can mention it mention it as a plus b so this will give you uh, the matrix addition product or the resultant of the matrix addition so a plus b and then you can print this uh, sum to see what is the answer you are getting okay now you can see here, so we know that the, there will be element wise uh, addition and 2 plus 6 is 8 and 3 plus 7 is 10. So you can see here it is 8, 10, 12 and 14. So we got element wise addition. So this is how you can uh, perform matrix addition in Python. So there is another way of doing it. Okay, so let's see how we can do this in a different way. And uh, for this, let's take two matrices with random values. So here we just gave the values, right? Now let's take values or uh, let's take mat matrices with random values. So I'm going to create two matrices with random values and uh, let's name this as matrix 1 will be our first matrix and uh, this first matrix is equal to np.random.randint. So this random.randint is the function which will give us a matrix with random values and inside this you need to mention a value. So in this I'll mention 10. So this means all the values will be less than 10. If I mention 100 here, all the values will be less than 100. So I just take a smaller value 10. Okay. And there is another parameter which we need to mention, which is equal to size. Okay. So size, let's put the size as 3 comma 3. What happens here is, so this is the shape of the matrix. So it is a three row and three column matrix. And what happens is it will create a matrix with three rows and three columns with all the values as a random values but all the values will be less than 10. So this will be our first matrix. Let's create the second matrix as matrix 2 and matrix 2 is equal to np.random.randin. So rand int means we are just getting random integer numbers. If you just mention random.rand, you will just get floating point numbers. So those values will be less than 0. So it will be like uh, 0 0.01, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, some things. Okay. But if you mention rand int, it will give you random integer values. Okay. So I want random integer values. So rand int. Now let's say that I want all the values to be less than 20. So that would be our matrix 2. And uh, we know that the shape of the two matrix should be same if we want to perform matrix addition, right? So in the previous case for matrix 1, we took the shape as 3, 3. So it should be the same 3, 3. So let's run this. Now you can uh, try to print this matrix 1 and matrix 2. So I'll print this matrix 1 and uh, matrix 2. 
So here you can see here it contains random values. So we didn't give these values. So we just mentioned that all the values should be less than 10. And I want a 3 cross 3 matrix. So we got a 3 cross 3 matrix with random values less than 10. In this case, we got a random values less than 20. So this is how we can get matrices with random values by mentioning their uh, shape and the values under which we want the values to be. Okay, so now let's see how we can add these two matrices in a different way. So in the previous case, we have just used this, uh, you know, addition symbol, right? Instead of this, we can also do this. So I'll create uh, this uh, also as the sum. Okay, so sum is equal to np dot add. Okay, so np is nothing but the numpy library. So it has the function add and inside this parenthesis mention the two matrices which you want to add. So I want to add matrix one and I want to add the matrix two. Okay, so let's run this and now you can print sum. So this will give us an element wise addition of these two matrices. So 2 plus 18 is 20 and 7 plus 17 is 24 and so on. So this is how you can add two matrices using this numpy uh, or np.add function. Okay, so I have already mentioned you right the shape of the two matrices should be similar to perform this addition. Let's change this shape and see what we are getting. Okay, so I'll just copy this uh, code here and now I'll just change the shape of this matrix as 3 comma 4. Here we can tell that the shape of these two matrices are not equal, right? So this is a 3 cross 3 matrix and this is a 3 cross 4 matrix and this cannot be added. Yet we can check this. So I'll just put sum. So sum 2. So let's name this as sum 2 and uh, I'll just name this matrix as matrix 3 and the matrix 4 okay so this is sum 2 which is equal to np dot add matrix 1 and ma sorry matrix 3 and uh, matrix 4 okay so let's run this now you can see here we are getting an error as operands could not be broadcast together with shapes 3 comma 3 and 3 comma 4. Operands is nothing but this matrix 3 and matrix 4. Here the plus symbol, the addition is called as the operator and the two values are two matrix which we are adding is called as operands. So operands cannot be broadcasted. That means like these two matrices cannot be added because they are not of the same shape. So the shape of the first matrix is 3 comma 3 and of the second matrix is 3 comma 4 hence we cannot add these two matrices okay so this is the proof which we have been uh, talking about so this is how you can add two matrices with uh, similar shapes now uh, i'll just mention this uh, reason for this error so I'm, I'm not going to clear this error so it is helpful for us to understand why we are getting it so i'll just make a text here as we get this error because uh, shape of matrix 3 and uh, matrix 4 are different okay okay so the next thing which we are going to discuss is matrix subtraction so we know that matrix subtraction is also similar to matrix addition right so everything is similar about it so uh, subtraction Okay, so now similarly, I'll just go ahead and copy this uh, code and let's subtract the values. So I'll paste it here. So we will get two matrices A and B. So we have already printed and seen how uh, A and B looks like and what is the shape. It is a 2 cross 2 matrix. B is also a 2 cross 2 matrix. And uh, let's create a variable as difference okay so this is the value so difference difference is equal to a minus b so a minus b so we are just subtracting the two matrices so let's run this and print this difference um, before that i'll just print this a and b as well so that we can understand this so print a and print b Okay, so here we can know that we are just uh, a minus b, right? So that means 2 minus 6. So the first value should be minus 4. 3 minus 7, the second value should be minus 4. Let's see uh, whether we are getting the answer. So let's run this and print the difference. Okay, so the name difference is, okay, so I just made a mistake here. 
okay now you can see here uh, 2 minus 6 is minus 4 3 minus 7 is minus 4 4 min minus 8 is also so everything is minus 4 okay so we know that uh, element wise subtraction is done and this is how you can find uh, the matrix subtraction of you know when you take two matrices and the important thing to note here as well is the shape of the two matrices should be similar so in this case what we shall do is similarly we can just copy this uh, two random matrices i'll just paste it here and now we are creating similarly two random matrices with the three cross three matrix with all the values less than 10 on the all the values less than 20 okay so let's run this you can print this matrix one and matrix b so matrix one and matrix b so this will be different from the one which we have created before so because like every time it creates new values so the same values won't be created so that's why it's called as random values so it will create random values and here you can create another method so here we have used this mp dot add right so we have used this mp dot add similarly we can use another function from numpy as diff is equal to let's uh, short let's give a short form for difference as diff diff is equal to mp dot subtract Okay, so np dot subtract mention the two matrices which you want to subtract. So matrix one and matrix two. Here the matrix one are these two matrices. Okay, so matrix one and matrix two. So let's run this and print the difference. So this is how you can subtract the two matrices using this np dot subtract. So one way is using this a minus b. So just using this uh, you know minus symbol here the subtraction operator here or you can just use this mp dot subtract uh, you know function to do this subtraction so similarly if you just uh, go ahead and change the shape of the matrix if you just give uh, you know two matrices with two different shapes you will get this similar error with this mp dot subtract function so you can try that out so the next uh, operation which we are going to discuss is multiplying a matrix by a scalar so we have discussed this in the previous video right so when you multiply a scalar scalar is nothing but a single value single numerical value uh, let's say that we are taking a scalar value like 5 so when you uh, multiply a matrix by a scalar value 5 all the elements in the matrix will be multiplied by this value okay so let's understand this in python so i'll make a text here as multiplying a matrix by a scalar okay so uh, i'll take two variables here x and let's put x is equal to 5 okay so this will be our scalar because it is just one value right so scalar is nothing but which contains only one numerical values and matrix contains rows and columns of values and uh, y will be our matrix so np dot array so we know that we can create uh, arrays or matrix with using this np dot array function right so np dot array and we need to mention the rows of this matrix so uh, i'll mention the square brackets here let's take some random values or else so instead of this we can just take some random values that's better so np dot random dot randin so random dot randin and uh, i'll take the values less than 10 so let's take smaller values itself so 10 size is equal to Mm, let's take uh, 4 comma 4 so you can take any uh, shape you want so what i'm doing is so i'm taking x as a scalar value which is equal to 5 and i'm creating y which is a random matrix with 4 rows and 4 columns and all the values will be less than 10 so i'll also print this y okay so now let's see how we can multiply these two matrices so uh, product so let's create a variable as product and let's store the multiplication product in this uh, particular variable so for this we are going to use the function np dot multiply okay so np dot multiply and uh, x comma y here x represents the scalar which is 5 and y represents the matrix so let's run this and uh, print this product print y or print product So now you can see here when 0 is multiplied by 5 we get 0 when 4 is multiplied by 5 we get to 20 6 into 5 is 30 7 into 5 is 35 and so on so this is how you can multiply a matrix by a scalar so whenever you are multiplying a scalar by a matrix all the elements in the matrix will be multiplied by that particular numerical value so this is how we can perform this particular operation in matrix okay so i'll just make this as bold so now let's discuss how we can multiply two matrix okay so two matrices 
So we have discussed this detail in our previous concept video on matrices uh, operations. So I'll just make a text here as multiplying two matrices. So if you are not aware or if you are not sure how this uh, matrix multiplication works, please go and watch the previous video. I have explained there detail on how this works and there is a condition for this. So I just go to this presentation which we, I have explained in the previous video. So the condition for a uh, matrix multiplication is that so you can see the rule here. The number of columns in the first matrix should be equal to the number of rows in the second matrix. So this is very important. In the case of addition, the shape should be exactly similar, but it is not the same. The number of columns in the columns in the first matrix and the number of rows in the second matrix should be similar. So you can just consider this example. Here you can see here we have two cross two matrix and two cross two matrix. So here the second value represents the number of columns and the first value represents the number of rows, right? So as per the rule, this value, this number of rows in the first matrix should be equal to this value, which represents the number of rows. Here the value, here the values are similar, right? Hence these two uh, matrix can be multiplied. So that's what I have mentioned here. And the resultant matrix will have the shape of the remaining values. So here we have this two and two, right? So this will be the shape of our remaining resultant matrix. Okay, so now let's check this for this matrix. So this is a three cross two matrix and this is also a three cross two matrix. If you check this rule here, here the number of columns in the first matrix is not equal to the number of rows in the second matrix. Here it is two and here it is three. So it is not equal. Hence we cannot perform matrix or, or matrix multiplication in, uh, between these two matrices. So this is the main rule when you are uh, dealing with matrix multiplication. And uh, this is uh, how matrix multiplication works. So if you are not aware, please, please go and watch this video. So this is very important on, uh, you know, how to understand uh, how this particular uh, multiplication works. And I'm not going to explain this now. I just uh, try to implement this because I have already explained this. So now let's see in Python how we can do this. So we cannot use this np.multiply function. So it will just do, uh, you know, element wise multiplication. So for this, we need to do another important uh, function using NumPy. So uh, Let's create two matrices or I'll just copy this from above. Okay. So let's copy this where we created random values, right? So let's create random values again, but I just want smaller values. I'll just take random values less than five. Okay. And uh, we know that the number of rows in the first column, sorry, the number of columns in the first matrix should be equal to the number of rows in the second matrix. That means this value should be equal to this value here both of them are three right so these two matrices can be multiplied and the resultant matrix will have the shape as three into four so three row and four column okay so these two values should be similar if these two values are similar then we get a resultant matrix of this shape okay so let's run this and uh, let's print matrix three and matrix four so print matrix three so this is the random matrix with all the values less than five and uh, let's print matrix 4 okay now uh, as it, it satisfies the condition we can go ahead and uh, you know multiply these two matrices for this we are going to use uh, another numpy function as i have told you earlier let's also name this as uh, product okay so product is equal to np dot dot so this dot function will give us the matrix multiplication that we want and inside this parenthesis, mention the two matrices that you want. So matrix 3 and matrix 4. So these are the two matrix that which for which I want to find the multiplication value, right? So I just print these values, print product. Okay, so this is the resultant I'm getting. So you can go ahead and check the shape of this product. Okay, so product dot shape. So when you check this, we can get the values 3 comma 4, which I have told you earlier. So we need the number of columns in the first matrix, which is 3 in this case, should be equal to the number of rows in the second matrix, which is 3. So these two matrices are compatible to do matrix multiplication. The resultant will have the uh, you know shape as 3 into 4, the remaining two shapes. So we got a matrix with the values as 3 and 4. And uh, you know you can cross check how this uh, you know values come. So uh, as I have told you earlier, I have explained in that video. And if you uh, perform the matrix operations manually based on uh, you know I have how I have explained you in this particular video, you will get these values as the resultant product of the two matrices. 
so what happens is this first row will be multiplied with this first column so this 4 will be multiplied with 3 and the 2 will be multiplied with this 2 and this 2 will be multiplied with this 1 okay and all these values will be uh, added and when you take the second so when you do that you will get the value as 18 so now let's take the second value as 12 so what happens is in this case this first row will be multiplied with the second column so 4 will be multiplied with 1 and uh, 2 will be added uh, or sorry 2 will be multiplied with this 2 and this 2 will be multiplied with this 2 and all the values will be added and you will get the value as 12 so similarly all the values will be calculated and this is how you can find the uh, uh, multiplication of two matrices okay so now let's check whether it is compatible for all the shapes so i copy this and paste it here we know that these two values should be similar right so here what i'll do is i'll just change this shape as 4 okay so here we can say that the number of columns in the first matrix which is 3 is not equal to the number of rows in the second matrix so this is not compatible right so i'll run this and uh, now i'll give this product is equal to np dot dot matrix 3 and matrix 4 okay so let's see whether we are getting now you can see here we are getting an error so the error is shapes 3 comma 4 and 4 comma 4 not aligned so 3 dimension 1 is not equal to dimension 0 so this is what i have told you so this 3 and uh, sorry this value and this value should be equal to do the you know multiplication here the two values are uh, not equal so that so that has been shown here as 3 is not equal to uh, 4 so this exclamatory mark and equal to represents not equal to right so we know that so that is what is given in the error so for carrying out the matrix uh, multiplication the important thing for us to note here is the number of uh, columns in the first matrix should be equal to the number of columns in this rows in the second matrix so in the last video and in this video i have repeated this line multiple times so you could have noticed that because this is very very important okay so this is how you can carry out matrix multiplication so there is another type of multiplication which we need to discuss so i just copy this and paste it here okay now we are going to perform another uh, multiplication but i'll just change the value as 3 comma 3 so now we are creating two matrices one is matrix 3 and matrix 4 now what we are going to do is uh, element wise matrix multiplication okay so we did multiplication okay so in the previous steps we did element wise addition and subtraction right so similarly we can do element wise multiplication as well so let's see how we can do that so previously i'll just make this bold okay so previously we have used this uh, np dot multiply right so i'll just go here okay so we use this np dot multiply for uh, multiplying a matrix by a scalar right so one second okay so we can use this uh, same function which is np dot multiply to do element wise multiplication so here we have two matrices you can just print this matrix 3 and matrix 4 okay so matrix 3 and i'll print this matrix 4 okay so now I am going to find element wise uh, multiplication or element wise product. So I will name this as product which is equal to um, np dot multiply. So the same function which we have used before. So np dot multiply matrix 3 and matrix 4. Okay. And let's print this. So print product. Okay, so this is not similar to this particular uh, case where we have, you know, this particular np dot dot is different. Here, this is not, uh, you know, element wise multiplication. So this multiplication concept is different. Whereas this is element wise multiplication where uh, this 3 and 4 will be multiplied uh, element wise. So this one will be multiplied with this one. 3 will be multiplied with this 0. So you can see the results here. So 1 into 2 which is equal to 2 and uh, 2 and this 2 will be multiplied which is 4 and uh, this mid value which is 3 will be multiplied with this mid value 2 which gives 6. So similarly all the values will be added uh, element wise and for this to happen both the matrices should have the same shape. So similar to addition and subtraction. So if you just copy this and uh, paste it here and if you just change any one shape here now 
this will give us an error if you just use this np dot multiply because we have different shape for uh, three and four. Okay, so this will show us an error. Okay, so the important thing to note here is for np dot multiply to uh, work well, both the matrices should have the same shape. So these are the main operations that we have discussed today. I'll just give you a quick recap in case you have missed something. So first we are importing the numpy library and this numpy library is used for making arrays okay and then we are creating two arrays two simple arrays and we have uh, named this arrays as a and b and we have used this a plus b uh, you know to find the sum of the two uh, matrices and the in matrix addition the important thing to note here is the shape of the two matrices which we are adding should be same okay and then we have uh, discussed about matrix subtraction so we have just changed the shape of the matrix and, and saw that we are getting an error and then we have discussed about matrix subtraction so it is uh, similar to a matrix addition in this case also we need same number of rows and columns in both the matrices and we have used this a minus b and in this case also we have used this np dot add right and in this case we have used this a minus b also and also this np dot subtract function and then we have used this np dot multiply function to multiply a scalar uh, to a matrix so we are multiplying a matrix y by a scalar x which value is y uh, which value is 5 okay so this is about multiplying a matrix by a scalar using this np dot multiply function and then we have seen how we can multiply two matrices okay so in this case the number of uh, columns in the first matrix should be equal to the number of rows in the second matrix and we have found the result of this particular matrix so we can cross check this and also finally we have seen how we can so for this we have used this np dot dot function right and finally we have seen how we can perform element wise matrix multiplication so these are the topics i wanted to cover today and i hope you have understood all the things covered here this fifth module is all about mathematics for machine learning so far in this mathematics module we have discussed about the topics on linear algebra such as vectors and matrices and in the upcoming videos we are going to discuss another important mathematics topic in machine learning which is statistics okay so in this video i'll explain you what is meant by statistics and what is the role or what is the importance of statistics in machine learning and what are the topics that we are going to cover in the upcoming uh, video so these are the things which we will discuss in today's video so in case you are watching my videos for the first time hi in this youtube channel i'm making a hands-on machine learning course with python and if you want to learn this course from the beginning you can go to the playlist section of my channel so there you will find videos module wise so you can start learning from the first module okay so with that being said let's get started with today's video so first of all let's try to answer this question what is meant by statistics okay so i'll try to give you a textbook definition for statistics so this is how the definition of statistics goes Statistics is the science concerned with developing and studying methods for collecting, analyzing, interpreting and presenting data. So, you know, this definition is self-explanatory. So, what we, what it is trying to convey is we use statistical methods to collect, analyze and interpret data. So, if I want to say this in simple terms, I would say that statistics is a tool that helps us to understand our data better. So, this is all about statistics. Now let's try to understand how statistics can help us to understand the data better, okay? So in our class 11 and class 12, we would have uh, learned the statistics in max, of course. So we would have been given some set of data and for this data, we would have been asked to find uh, the mean, standard deviation, other statistical measures, etc. Now let's try to understand this. So these are some statistical measures which we will try to find. So the first one is a range. So, you know, the second statistical measure can be mean and the third can be standard deviation. So, these are few statistical measures which we can find for a data set, okay? So, range is something that tells us what is the value in which, uh, you know, the data lies. Let's say that, uh, you know, we are considering height of uh, students in a class. So, so, let's say that there are about 50 students in that class and uh, we can find a range for uh, the height of the students in the class. So, we can say that the height of the students are in the range 160 centimeter to uh, you know maybe 175 centimeter or 180 centimeter so this tells us what is uh, the you know the extreme ends so what is the lower end and what is the higher end here in this case the lower end is 160 and the higher end is 180 right so this is the range in which the value lies or in which the data lies 
So this is one statistical measure which helps us to tell the nature of the data and then we have this mean data. So if you find this mean value of the height of the students in the class and uh, of the 50 students let's say that the average height is 170. So it means like it is just to generalize the overall data. So instead of just uh, you know looking at all the 50 data points we can just get one single value that tells us what is the average weight. So that is called as the mean and then we have this standard deviation. So standard deviation tells us how much the individual values deviate from the mean value or the average value. So these are some statistical measures and it will give us some understanding of the data. So it will give us, uh, you know, details about the magnitude of the data we have. So these are, you know, one aspect which helps us to understand the data better and analyze the data better. And then we have another aspect to it also. So there is a concept in statistics called as correlation. So, you know, in a data set, we will try to find correlation when it comes to machine learning as well. So in our uh, various machine learning projects, we have also tried to find the correlation. So let's consider this example. So I'll explain you this correlation with this example. So, you know, we have a data set which contains work experience of several people along with their salary. So what we can infer from here is we know that salary might, incre might increase if the if a person has a uh, higher work experience right you know if a person has 5 years of work experience he would get a particular salary and if a person has 10 year work experience it is more likely that he will get a uh, more salary right so in this case these two variables are positively correlated so i'll call this work experience and uh, salary both of them as variables okay so these variables are positively correlated because if one value increases the other value increases if work experience increases the salary also increases so hence it is you know positively correlated so this kind of correlation helps us to find the pattern or it helps us to find the relationship between various you know variables present in a data set so these are some statistical concepts which are very important for us so these are just a few examples and there are a lot more of them so this is just to you know get that basic understanding that statistics is a tool that helps us to understand the data better that helps us to find the relationships present in the data better okay so uh, with this understanding let's try to understand what is the role of statistics in machine learning so whenever we talk about machine learning the integral part to it is the data so in machine learning what we will do is we will train our machine learning model with loads of data and our model can find the patterns or it, it can find the relationship present in the data and this can be used for further analysis or further prediction say for example we are using a machine learning model to predict whether a person has diabetes or not in that case we will train uh, our model with diabetes data set which contains data of people with diabetes and people without diabetes so it can find the relationship between uh, you know these factors and it can make future prediction and it can also help us to make uh, you know uh, better analysis as well so this is how machine learning works if we have that uh, you know statistics knowledge so i have already explained you how statistics can be useful for us to get better understanding and better you know uh, interpretation of the data it becomes easier for us to carry out this machine learning processes so there are steps like you know choosing a model if you understand your data better and if you understand your problem statement better then choosing your model becomes easy so these are some aspects which are very helpful in machine learning if we have a better understanding of statistics and we have this machine learning models right so there are a lot of machine learning models and these models are built on top of statistics concepts so there is also another uh, concept called as statistical modeling which is you know very similar to machine learning uh, models so uh, in order to understand these models better we need to get a basic understanding and a deeper understanding of statistics as well so these are the importance of statistics when it comes to machine learning so i hope you have understood what are the things we have covered so far now let me explain you what are the topics of statistics we will cover in the upcoming uh, videos okay so in the next video, I will try to give you more details on statistics. So, you know, you know, uh, more understanding of what is meant by statistics and what are the various terminologies you, we use and what are the different types of uh, data we encounter. So those things will be covered in this video called as basics of statistics. And then we will discuss about the types of statistics. There are two main types of statistics called as descriptive statistics and inferential statistics and these two types are very important as well so we will discuss about them in detail uh, in, in that topic 
after that we will discuss about population and sample so what is meant by a population and how to you know get a sample from a population and those kind of things after that we will uh, discuss about another important topic so important topic central tendency so central tendencies as i have told you is a very important for us so it basically contains three values so central tendencies are represented by three values that are mean median and mode so we will understand what is meant by these values and where we can use them after that we will discuss about percentiles and dispersion so this is another statistical measures which is very you know interesting and important to learn and then we will try to implement this statistics concepts in python to get a better hands on uh, you know learning and hands on experience and then there are other topics such as uh, range sample variation uh, sample sample variance and standard deviation and uh, we have this correlation and causation and then we have this another important uh, concept called as hypothesis testing and finally let's have another uh, you know python session where we will try to uh, you know implement some more statistical concepts so these are the videos which we will uh, you know cover in the near future so i will be uploading three videos in in a week and uh, these this is the order which i am going to follow for this uh, statistics topic i may add few more topics so this is just uh, you know a tentative schedule or tentative uh, details video so i might add few more topics as well so i hope you have understood what are the things covered in this video and i hope you are interested to learn the concepts of statistics as well so that's it for this video here is all about mathematics for machine learning so far in this mathematics module we have uh, discussed about the topic on linear algebra for machine learning and now we have started with the topic on statistics so in today's video let's discuss about what is what are some basics of statistics and what are the different types of data we deal with in statistics and machine learning okay so in case you are watching my uh, videos for the first time hi in this youtube channel i'm making a hands on machine learning course with python and if you want to learn this course from the beginning i'll give the link for my machine learning course playlist so you can go to that playlist and uh, you can start uh, watching the videos from the beginning so that link will be provided in the description of this video okay so with that being said let's get started with this uh, video so this is the agenda for today's video first let's try to understand why we need statistics and i'll explain you this with a very interesting example and then let's try to understand what are the different applications of statistics and what are the different domains where we can apply this statistics and then let's discuss another important topic which is the different types of data we deal with in statistics and machine learning okay so first of all let's try to answer this question why we need statistics or what is the importance of statistics if someone ask me to give a simple statement on what is the need for statistics or what is the use of statistics i would tell that statistics is a tool that helps us to extract information and knowledge from data so let's say that we have a data and this statistical measures or this statistical techniques can help us to uh, you know find what is the significance of this data and what is the information the data has to tell so this is where we can use statistics and let's try to understand this with an example so every one of us are familiar with cricket right and let's ask this question on who is the best batsman in the world in the time period 2010 to 2020 okay so uh, if we try to answer this question let's say that uh, we have this data of all the batsmen who have played in this year uh, 2010 to 2020 and the all the number of runs they have scored for their respective teams so when you uh, you know use some statistical measures like average or mean you can find very interesting insights from this data so we you know cricket while we are watching it on television when a batsman comes into crease we would have seen some uh, you know uh, numbers such as their average strike rate etc so average is nothing but the number of runs a batsman can score in a match so let's say that uh, a batsman has an average of 90 so what that represents is let's say that uh, the batsman has played 10 matches and he has scored 900 runs so this average is calculated by dividing the total number of runs scored by him divided by the number of matches played by him so in this case it will be 900 divided by 10 so the average will be 90 so that means the batsman can score about 90 runs in each match so this is about the average of the batsman and we would have also seen uh, another measure called as strike rate right strike rate tells us how fast a batsman can score runs let's say that a batsman has a strike rate of 200 200 strike rate means the batsman can score about 20 runs while facing 10 balls if a batsman has a strike rate of 300 that means he can score about 30 runs by facing 10 balls so these are some important measures which tells us 
how much runs can a batsman score by you know taking that average value and how fast the batsman can score runs so we can take these measures to find who is the best batsman so you can find the number of matches played by him and uh, what is his average or what is the number of runs scored by the batsman uh, in each match and what is his strike rate and another parameter such as how many times he has taken his team to you no know, victory so these are some measures which we can you know take into consideration to find who is the best batsman in the world in this 10 years time period okay so in this we have uh, you know discussed about a measure called as average right so what is meant by this average so in statistics we often uh, you know deal with a measure called as mean right so mean is nothing but all the observation so summing up all the observation divided by the total number of observation so here is observation is nothing but the number of runs scored divided by the total number of observation which is the number of matches played by him so average is nothing but mean so it is actually one of the statistical measures which we deal with so in this case the data which we have here is the number of runs scored by different batsmen in the world and the information or the knowledge which we can get by applying statistics is who is the best batsman so this is how you can get different information and knowledge from data by applying statistics so this is a very simple example right so uh, day to day uh, example or you know we often watch cricket and uh, this is how we can apply statistics in our you know simple things now let's try to understand more complicated or more advanced applications of statistics so i would like to introduce you to a you know topic called a six sigma so if you have uh, went to an internship in a manufacturing company or manufacturing plant you have heard about this topic so this six sigma is nothing but a strategy to improve business processes or industrial processes let's say that um, there is a manufacturing plant that manufactures smartphones and in almost all the manufacturing uh, plants there are some strategies involved to improve their efficiency to improve their production rate and six sigma is one of those uh, strategy that helps companies to find uh, you know which places uh, are uh, you know can be improved in that business processes or in that uh, manufacturing processes and how we how they can efficiently improve that processes so this six sigma is one of those things which is completely relied on statistics so this is one uh, very interesting example and another domain which we can think of is businesses so a lot of businesses uses statistics for uh, you know getting insights about their customers about their products etc let's say that uh, there is a company that uh, manufactures a product and uh, they can use several statistical measures to find what is uh, the you know demand for that product so by this measures they can also find what is their sales forecast and other things so this will help them to you know uh, plan their marketing strategies and other things so businesses rely a lot on this strategic uh, statistical techniques to get better insights with the data they have and then we have this weather forecasting so everyone of us are familiar with this weather forecast right so what happens in weather forecast is uh, uh, the forecast company or the forecasting body will collect several informations on weather such as uh, the wind speed the amount of rainfall uh, what is the humidity temperature etc and all this uh, data are uh, you know goes through some complex statistical model that can you know give you the likelihood of whether there will be rain or not or what is the climate they can or what is the weather they can expect in a particular day so this is another example where statistics is used a lot and there is another interesting application which is clinical trial of medicines so when a new medicine is introduced or you know when a new vaccine is introduced that medicine has to go go through a lot of clinical trials so what happens in clinical trials is a test group will be chosen and this medicine will be administered to that test group to you know check uh, what is the success rate of that medicine and uh, whether people are facing any side effects or not or how many percentage of people are facing side effects and what are the different parameters to it and uh, all these things can be uh, measured by using statistical techniques there are a lot of statistical measures values that will uh, give us several informations and those informations can be used in uh, different fields so i have just given you four examples of this so you can also uh, you know research in google on what are the different applications of statistics and uh, what are the important insights you can get from statistics in all these different domains so i suggest you to go on and uh, research more on these topics and how statistics is exactly used in this topic so it will be a very good exercise for you so i hope you have understood what are the different applications of statistics that we can uh, you know uh, understand now let's see what are the different types of data we have in statistics and machine learning so the broad classification of the data which we have is categorical data and numerical data so what is meant by this categorical data 
so categorical data is nothing but they are represented in categories or classes so let's say that there is a data regarding the gender of a person in that case it tells the categories right whether the person is male or not so let's consider another example so we are considering the color of a ball so uh, the color can be red it can be blue or it can be green so these are nothing but categories or classes so this kind of uh, data is called as categorical data and there is another type of data called as numerical data so numerical data are nothing but numbers so let's say that uh, you know we have discussed about this weather, weather forecasting uh, application right so in weather forecasting we uh, measure the what is the temperature in that particular day or what is the rainfall uh, or what is the humidity so these are all numerical data right so these are the two broad classification of the data which are categorical data or numerical data and this categorical data can be classified into nominal data and ordinal data and numerical data can be classified into discrete data and continuous data. So these are uh, the classifications of data. Now let's try to understand about these uh, four uh, classifications. What is nominal data? So a nominal data is a classification of categorical variables that do not provide any quantitative value. Okay, so let's try to understand this. So I have already explained to you this example, right? So if we consider the gender of a person, it is example of a categorical data and we have male and female. So there is not any particular significance in this data. So we cannot tell that one gender is, you know, more significant than the other, right? So it is just, you know, some data and there is not much significance in both of this data. So this kind of data is called as nominal data. And you can also consider this uh, color example, color of a ball. So a ball can be red in color or it can be green in color or it can be yellow in color, right? So there is not that much significance that goes into these categories. And there is uh, this data called as ordinal data and ordinal data are the type of data in which the values follow a natural order. So this is also a categorical data, but the classes have significance to them. Let's say that we are conducting a review for a smartphone and the reviews are uh, whether the phone is good or it is uh, very good or it is very bad. Okay. So, you know, if bad represents that phone is not at all good, right? So it, it has some negative value to it. If we say that the phone is smartphone is good, that means it is, you know, it, it's in the average range. It is okay. And if we say that the phone is very good, that means it is very easy to use and it is, you know, very, uh, you know, uh, good to use and such kind of things, right? So here, this is also categorical data where we have three categories, whether the phone is bad or good or it is very good. So this is also categories, but there are significance to it, where uh, the, whether the phone is good or uh, bad or it is very good. But when you consider nominal data, there is not any significance in the categories uh, which we have. So as I have explained to you, when we take a uh, male or female, we cannot, uh, you know, uh, order it, right? But in the case of ordinal data, we can order it. So bad good and very good so there is some natural order to it and there is some significance to different classes we have so this is about nominal data and ordinal data and then we have discrete data and continuous data in the case of numerical data types so discrete data are the type of data that can only take certain values so certain value in the sense they cannot take some uh, you know mid values mid values in the sense decimal values so if we uh, consider the number of students in a class we can say that there are about 50 students in a class right but we cannot say that there are 50.5 students in a class you cannot say that uh, there are uh, 60.3 students in a class so we can just give our number uh, you know our integer type of values and not a decimal type of values and this kind of numerical data is called as discrete data and then we have this continuous data so continuous data can have almost any numerical value unlike discrete data they can have decimal values so you can consider the weight of an object so you can say that the weight of this particular object is 30.5 kilograms so here you can take decimal values so this is the difference between discrete data and continuous data so these are the main four classifications of the type of data which we deal with so the first type is nominal data where you know there are just categories and there are no order to these categories there is no significance to any categories and we treat all the categories as similar and then we have this ordinal data where there is some natural order to this data and there is some significance to each of these classes so these two comes under categorical data and then we have numerical data where in discrete data it cannot take any decimal values but it can take only discrete values uh, as uh, the example given in the number of students in a classroom where we can have only 50 students or 60 students not 50.5 or 16.5 students and then we have this continuous data where it can take decimal values like the weight of an object so these are the different types of data 
we can have in statistics and also in machine learning okay so i hope you have understood all the contents covered in this video so if you if you have any doubts please let me know in the comments it's all about mathematics for machine learning so today in this video we are going to discuss about two main important types of statistics so these two types of statistics are descriptive statistics and inferential statistics okay so in case you are watching my videos for the first time hi in this youtube channel i'm making a hands on machine learning course with python and if you want to learn this machine learning course from the beginning i'll give the link for my machine learning course playlist in the description of, of this video and also in the icards so you can check that out okay so with that being said let's get started with today's video so the two main important types of statistics are descriptive statistics and inferential statistics so these names are self-explanatory so descriptive means giving some descriptions giving some summarization to the data inferential statistics means finding some inferences from the data and finding some insights from the data okay so this is what stands for descriptive statistics and inferential statistics so where uh, we just try to describe the data better in a descriptive statistical approach whereas in the case of inferential statistical approach we try to get inferences about the data and we also try to predict uh, you know future cases so we try to make future predictions so that is about inferential statistics so this is the difference between descriptive and inferential statistics and now let's understand where we can use this kind of approaches okay so there are two main fields that uh, uses statistics and machine learning a lot okay so those two fields are data analysis and data science okay so what a data analyst do is get the data and do a lot of analysis on them so this analysis help them to understand the data better so you can consider this example so there is a company and they can hire a data analyst to uh, analyze their previous year's uh, sales and an analyst can go through all the sales data and find some interesting you know uh, insights from those data so he can he can go through it and find what are what is the total investment made by the company what is the profit made by them and what are the various uh, profit percentage and other things he can find from the data so in the case of descriptive statistics we use uh, some numerical measures on the data okay whereas what a data scientist used to do is he can use the data he, he can try to find several insights from the data or he can try to find the inferences from the data and based on these inferences he can suggest the management of the company of various strategies they can uh, take to increase their uh, you know profit percentage so this is an example of where we can use descriptive statistics and inferential statistics okay so uh, now let's try to understand these concepts in a more detailed way so if you want to uh, have a more definition based understanding of this descriptive statistics means descript descriptive statistics are used to describe the basic features of the data in the study they provide simple summaries about the sample and the measures okay so what we do in uh, descriptive statistics is find some numerical measures so i have given uh, this example here so these numerical measures can be a uh, mean of the data set or it can be um, median of the data set or it can be mode of the data set so these are some measures which tells you what is what kind of values are present in a data set and it, it basically summarizes the data so as the name suggests okay so what we do in inferential statistics is it takes data from a sample and makes inferences and predictions about the larger population from which the sample was drawn so what we do in inferential statistics is in a lot of the cases the population will be very large population in the sense the data set can be very large and in some cases we cannot go through the entire data so in that cases we choose some sampling techniques to get the sample from the population and we uh, you know analyze this sample to gain insights and inferences so th these insights can be used to make future predictions so this is the uh, you know difference between descriptive statistics and inferential statistics where in descriptive statistics we just uh, you know find some measures to summarize the data whereas in the case of inferential statistics we try to find the insights from the data so if you still have doubt on these topics it will be clear if you understand this with some interesting examples okay so in descriptive statistics there are two main important measures so as i have already told you in a descriptive statistics we generally deal with a numerical measures right so the two main important measures are the measure of central tendencies and the measure of variability okay so in central tendencies we measure the values such as mean median and mode so mean is nothing but the average of the data average value of the data and median and mode are you know similar to uh, you know mean but in a different way 
so i'll make separate video on what is meant by mean median and mode so it is not uh, the topic of importance in this video so just understand that we try to find the values of central tendencies so they are like the representation values of the entire data and uh, there is another measure called as uh, measure of variability so examples for this is range standard deviation variance so these values tells us how much uh, you know the data varies from the mean value so these are the two main important measures so what we need to understand here is so we just give some numerical value to the data that represents it better okay so i'll explain you this with an interesting example so you can think about gpa so what is this gpa so every one of us would have gone through this right so a student goes to college and he takes a lot of exams so let's say that he has uh, you have taken about uh, eight semester exams and there are uh, several subjects in each semester right so if we want a single value to measure the academic per, uh, you know academic performance of a student you can ask us gpa right so you know this gpa is a single value and this single value is a representation of the academic performance of the student in a center college life right so this is an example of descriptive statistics where we try to find a numerical value that represents the data better that describes the data better or it summarizes the data better so this is what we deal with in descriptive statistics and uh, now let's try to understand this in a more machine learning approach so how we can use this in a machine learning project so um, let's uh, get this descriptive statistics statistics of house price data so before just you know looking at this table let's uh, see this data set so this is boston house price data set so we have already made a video on boston house price prediction so i'll give the link for this project video in the description of this uh, video so you can go through that if you want more information about this uh, data set so i have given the details of the data set so it totally contains 14 features 14 features represent 14 columns and totally we have 506 entries 506 entries mean 506 different house values so what we do in this case is try to find the price of the houses based on several parameters okay so i'm not going to explain all the parameters here so if you want more detail you can go to that project video so i'll just explain you few measures so you can see here crim so this represents the crime rate happening in a area okay so this is the crime rate and if you uh, if you can see here this is uh, rm so rm represents the average number of rooms in uh, rooms present in a present in the house and you can see what is the tax uh, you know they generally pay and finally we have this price so this is in thousands of dollars so 24 represents 24 thousands of dollars so this is the examples of the sample of the data set so this data set contains about 5 or 6 entries so i have just given you the first four values okay so if we we want to apply some descriptive statistical approach or if we want to find some measures that represent that represents the data we find the measures such as the mean standard deviation minimum values percentiles etc okay so count represents how many values are there in each column okay so we know that there are about 5 or 6 values right so mean is nothing but the average value so the average crime rate value is about 3.61 and the standard deviation is 8.6 and this uh, value is given for each column okay and we have this minimum value and maximum value so when you subtract the maximum value and the minimum value you get get the range okay so it is an example of uh, the measure of variability right we also have the standard deviation here so this is how you can apply the descriptive statistics on a data set to understand the data better to understand the magnitude of the values in the data better so this is how you can apply descriptive statistics on a uh, uh, machine learning or data set or a data science data set okay so now let's try to understand inferential statistics with a similar example so we have already seen the definition for inferential statistics where uh, if the population is large we take uh, you know a sample of this population and we try to get some inferences from this data which helps us to make future prediction from this sample so this prediction made by the sample will be uh, you know correlated with the population as well okay so because the sample uh, represents the population right so you can see here so there is a population with various elements so we have a sample that represents the population better so you can see here there is a red color triangle here and there is a green color square here and there is a yellow color circle here so you can see here this sample contains all the different elements present in the population so what does this uh, represents is if we get a sample from a population uh, you know there shouldn't be any uh, uh, difference between it so the elements present in the population should be present in the sample as well we shouldn't miss any important details 
So there are several sampling techniques uh, there and how we can sample the data from a population. So I will also make a separate video on that topic. For now, just understand that, uh, you know, we just want to take a sample from the population because we cannot always uh, go through the entire data or the entire population. So we take the sample of the data. So if you want to, you know, analyze the data of the entire nation, people on the entire nation, we cannot take uh, the data from the entire people. So for that, we choose a sample that best represents the entire population. So once we take this, we do some analysis to get some inferences and insights from the data and uh, make some predictions. So in the previous slide, I have explained you how you can apply descriptive statistical approach on house price data, right? Now let's understand how we can apply some inferential techniques. So this is a correlation heat map of the house price data set. So the same data set that I have uh, explained you here. So for this data set, so this is the correlation map. So you can see the color uh, values here. So darker the color, the value is more. So we have the values from plus one all the way to minus 0.6. So if the value is more, if the value is positive, that means the two variables are positively correlated. So these are the columns that we have discussed. Okay. So we have columns here in the vertical uh, scale and also in the horizontal axis. Okay. So here we try to find the relationship between the variables. So variables are nothing but these columns. So we call this either variables or features. Okay. So what we try to do is find the relationship between them. If the value is positive, that means the two variables are positively correlated. If the value is negative, that means the two values are negatively correlated. Okay. So let's try to understand this. So you can see this crime column here, this crime variable here. And if you come all the way down here, this is price, right? So this vertical line is the value for price. And this uh, first horizontal line is for the crime rate. We know that if the crime rate for an area is huge, if it is more, people are not going to buy houses in that area, right? And you can see a negative value, a negative value of minus 0.4. That means crime rate and price of houses are negatively correlated. If uh, the crime rate is more, people are not going to buy houses in that area. And what happens is the house prices drop in that area, right? So we can say that crime rate and price are negatively correlated. So negative correlation means if one value increases, the other value decreases. So you, here you can say that if crime value increases, price value decreases, right? So these two variables, crime and price are negatively correlated. Now you can see the RM column here. Okay. So RM represents the num average number of rooms present in the house. So if the number of rooms is more, the house is going to be bigger and the price of the house is also going to be bigger, right? So you can see the here it has a positive value of 0 0.7. That means these two values are uh, positively correlated, the number of rooms and the price. So here you can say that uh, there is a positive correlation between a room and uh, the price of the house where if one value increases, which is RM, the other value, which is price also increases. So these are two kinds of correlation, which is positive correlation and negative correlation. So these are the inferences we can get from this data. So, you know, there are several techniques. So this is not just the only technique. So correlation is not the only concept in inferential statistics. There are a lot of techniques in inferential statistics, which we will use to get the insights from the data. So once we get these insights, we can also make future predictions using some analysis like regression analysis to find uh, what is the price of the houses can be in this case. So what we do is once we analyze the data, we can train our machine learning model or statistical model, which if you give all this data, it can predict what can be the price of the house. So this is the end result of this particular project. So this is how you can get inference from a data set and you can make future prediction. So that is about uh, descriptive statistics and inferential statistics where in descriptive statistics, we try to, uh, you know, describe the data and summarize the data based on some numerical measures, such as the measure of central frequency or the measure of variability. Whereas in the case of inferential statistics, we try to find the inferences and insights from the data and make future predictions. So I hope you have understood the things covered in this video. This fifth module is all about mathematics for machine learning. So far in this mathematics module, we have discussed about the concepts on linear algebra and we have started with statistics. And in today's video, we are going to discuss what are the different types of statistical studies and where we can use which type of study. Okay. So in case you are watching my videos for the first time, hi, in this YouTube channel, I'm making a hands on machine learning course with Python and I'll give the link for my machine learning course playlist in the description of this video. So you can check out that playlist if you want to start learning this course from the beginning. Okay. With that being said, let's get started with today's video. So there are three main types of statistical studies. They are sample study, 
observational study and experimental study okay so let's try to understand each of them and then uh, you know let's answer this question on when to use which kind of study sample study is a study which is carried out on a sample which represents the total population so what happens in a study is that sometimes we would have a very huge population of data so the data set would be very large say for example we need to find some parameter for a uh, entire nation so let's say that we want to find uh, you know the average income of a person in a country and we cannot go and ask the income of all the people in the country so in that case what we do is we will take a sample of that population that best represents that population so this sample is on which we are going to do all the statistical measures and techniques okay so this kind of study is called a sample study where we extract a sample from a population okay so this sample should represent the population in, a, in the best way okay so this is known as sample study and we use it in cases when the population is so huge there is another type of study called as observational study so observational study is a study where we simply collect and analyze data so we won't inject any changes we just observe the correlation in the data so this is about observational study where we just collect and analyze data and we don't uh, you know uh, infuse so many changes in the data so we just get the data and observe them and uh, we do not control uh, the data present in it so you know you understand what i'm saying is better if we uh, you know discuss about this experimental study but just uh, you know keep this in mind that in observational study we don't you know infuse any changes and we just try to find the correlation or the relationship between various variables or features in a data set so that is maybe observational study where we need to observe the data and analyze the data so these two studies the sample study and the observational study is useful in many cases but the results cannot be very accurate so the results cannot be very conclusive but in experimental study we control the experimental conditions so we can be assured of the quality of the data and we can get a very conclusive result so this is all about experimental study where this is a study in which conditions are controlled and manipulated by the experimenter so you know the data is collected from these experiments and uh, these experiments are controlled by the person who is doing that experiment and there is not any much ambiguity in the data okay so let's try to understand each of them with suitable example so that we can get a better understanding first of all uh, the sample study so we have already seen what is the definition for a sample study so let's consider this example so there is a population let's say there are about 100000 of people and for this 100000 people we want to find what is their average blood sugar level okay so in this case the population is so huge that we cannot go and ask their a blood sugar you know blood sugar level of all the people so in this case when the population is so huge what we do is we get the sample from this data set from this population that you know represent it in a better way but the magnitude is very small let's say in this 100000 uh, you know population we can take about 10000 samples or 20000 samples so it can be a good sample size and there are several methods on how to get this sample so we generally use random sampling techniques and uh, we need to make sure that uh, it represents well so there are a lot of techniques on the sampling so let's discuss it about in a separate video on how to get this sample so just uh, keep in mind here that we need to get a sample and it should be a good representation of the overall population say for example uh, if you want to uh, get this data for this 100000 people there can be people uh, in the age of 20s there can be people in the age of uh, 30s and also in the age of 60s right and the sample should contain the data of people in all the age range so we cannot have the sample uh, which only has people with age uh, less than 20 or less than 30 so we need uh, the data in all the age range right so these are some techniques that we need to make sure of so the sample should be a good representation and it is a good representation only if it contains all the elements so we can consider another example so there may be people who follow good diet habits and there can be people who follow good uh, exercise routine and there can also be people who doesn't follow these kind of things and in our sample we need all those kind of people's data people's data right because then only it is a good representation so in uh, in the case of sample study when the population is so huge we need to get a sample using some sampling techniques and we try to find the parameter so here the parameter or the observation which we want to make is the av average blood sugar level okay so this is about sample study so the next type of study is observational study and we have already discussed uh, the uh, definition so we just observe and uh, analyze the data and we try to find the correlation present in the data okay so here we cannot infuse any changes as i have told you we can just only observe the data and analyze the data okay so let's try to understand this so let's say that there is a population 
and uh, we want to find the relationship between the two parameters blood sugar level and physical activity so this observational study is very useful for you know useful in these cases where we need to find the relationship between the two variables so in this the two variables or the two features are the blood sugar level and physical activity okay so let's say that we have uh, the population size here is about 1000 people and 1000 is not very huge right so it is uh, it is not a very huge data set so we don't need to take any samples so we can take the entire population itself and let's say that uh, we are plotting this in a graph and we are taking a physical activity in the x axis and blood sugar level in the y axis now let's try to understand this so once you have the data data of blood sugar level and physical activity for all the people in this population you can plot that data in this graph let's say that you can take this point this particular point as the optimum blood sugar level and uh, you know logically if you think we can say that if a person has good amount of physical activity he or she uh, you know if uh, they do proper uh, exercises and they have a proper exercise routine they are more likely to be uh, healthy right and their uh, blood sugar level is going to be in optimum so let's try to plot this data in a graph and we may find this kind of uh, relationship so we are getting the plots like this and uh, this x axis represents as you know the physical activity and here you can see the blood sugar level so this represents uh, you know less physical activity and those people have a higher blood sugar level so if we go on and plot this data we may get a plot like this okay so here you can see that there are some outliers so this is an outlier where uh, a person has a uh, high amount of physical activity but they have high blood sugar level as well so here this person has a very less uh, physical activity but they have a very less blood sugar level optimum blood sugar level so there are some outliers in this data so let's not focus on them so we just focus on this particular data so what we are getting is this two data are negatively correlated so you can fit this data in a straight line right straight line with uh, this kind of a slope where uh, you know this uh, line starts from top left corner and goes all the way down to right bottom corner so you can draw a line here so i'll just take a sketch here and uh, let's try to you know fit this data in line so if the, if you fit this data in a straight line so you will uh, get a fit something like this right so what this basically tells us the two parameters which we have taken so the first parameter is blood sugar level and physical activity we can say that these two parameters are negatively correlated so this is the inference we are getting that means if a person has high physical activity then they are more likely to have less blood sugar level or optimum blood sugar level if they have a uh, very less physical activity i mean like if they have high physical activity less blood sugar and if they have very less physical activity or exercise they are going to have high blood sugar level so this is the inference we are getting and we call this negatively correlated so what is meant by this correlation so we call uh, two variables as negatively correlated if one value increases and the other value decreases okay so if there is an inverse relationship between them here you can see that physical activity and blood sugar level are inversely correlated right because if one value decreases or if one value increases the other value decreases and vice versa so these two parameters are negatively correlated if we have two parameters and if one value increases and also the other value also increases we can say that the two variables are positively correlated so that is about the two different types of correlation and we have this uh, you know outliers as well so here i mentioned you that we cannot make any changes in the data right so what is meant by this changes so we have a data set here and there can be people and this data there can be an ambiguity in the data so there can be people who have just given their uh, blood test to find the blood sugar level just after they have a breakfast or just after they have lunch and the people tend to have more sugar uh, level in their blood once they have a meal right and uh, this is not an optimum kind of data because we need data taken from people uh, you know almost in the same time so if uh, the data is uh, let's say that we are taking the data from people after they have uh, you know two hours after they have taken their breakfast so that would be a good time to check their blood sugar level but we cannot uh, you know infuse those kind of rules in this data set because we have already collected this data and in observational study we are just only observing the data and we don't have any control over the data right so this is about observational study we are just observing the data and we cannot control it and this is where experimental study comes into play where we have the control of uh, the experiment and there is no ambiguity in the data and there is no doubt in the data so what happens in experimental study is we create two groups of people okay so let's say that in the first group we have people following healthy food habits and doing regular exercises and in the second group we have people who have unhealthy food habits and doing you know very minimal exercises 
so these two groups of people are called as control groups and we observe these two groups of people let's say for a few months and uh, what we gain from this result is a conclusive result where we can tell that people in group 1 have optimum blood sugar level here there is no ambiguity because like all the blood sugar level can be taken from the people at the same time unlike in the previous case, case where we don't have the control for it this is an experimental study and we control the experiments right so we can control the time in which the blood sugar level has been taken and the other parameters as well to overlook whether the people are having uh, you know good food habits whether doing they are doing regular exercises or not so there is a good overlook on this data and this is one of the very accurate method to uh, carry out our experiment and carry out our analysis so this is about the three types of experimental study and we cannot tell that one type of study is better than the other type so we can never tell that in some cases we need to go with sample study because the population may be very huge in some cases we may need to uh, you know carry out observational because in uh, you cannot do experimental study in all the cases so that's not possible uh, and in some cases we need to experim do experimental study where uh, the areas are critical so you can think about you know these fields where uh, clinical trials of medicine so in the in those cases we cannot just uh, do observational study we need to do more of an experimental study where we have the accurate data okay so this is about the three types of statistical studies and i hope you have understood all the things covered in this video and this fifth module is all about mathematics for machine learning so far in this mathematics module we have discussed about the topics on linear algebra and then we have started with statistics and in today's video we are going to discuss one main important topic in statistics which is population and sample first of all let's try to understand what is meant by this population and sample and then let's discuss about what are the different techniques that we can use to derive a sample from a population so this is the agenda for today's video in case you are watching my videos for the first time hi in this youtube channel i'm making a hands on machine learning course with python and if you want to learn this machine learning course from the beginning, I'll give the link for my course playlist in the description of this video. So you can check that out. With that being said, let's get started with today's video. So in order to understand this population and sample, we need to understand what is meant by a sample study. So in my previous video, I have explained what are the three main types of statistical study that we have. So the first type of statistical study is a sample study. The second type is observational study and the third type is inferential study okay so what is a sample study so you can see the definition here so a sample study is a study which is carried out on a sample which represents the total population so let's try to understand this definition so we have a population so population is nothing but the entire data set and from this entire data set we are choosing a subset and this subset is called as a sample and uh, this sample represents the entire population and some studies are carried out on this particular sample so this is known as a sample study so why we need a sample why can't we uh, you know do the study on the entire population itself so this will be a question that may arise in your mind right so let's try to understand this with an example and that will answer this question let's say that we have a population so we have a data set so consider this as an entire population of a country and for this entire population, for all the people in the country, we want to find what is the average blood sugar level of people. Okay. So how we can how you can find the average blood sugar level? You can think about this. One thing which you can do is meet all the people in that particular country and take a blood test and find what is the blood sugar level, right? But this is not a practical approach. Practically, we can't do this because uh, you know the number of people in a country is very huge, right? So in this case, what we can do is in order to save time and work and other things, the more efficient way will be to find a sample from this population. So this sample will be derived from this population through some techniques and this sample now represents this population. And when you find the average blood sugar from this sample, you can use that result for this entire population itself. So the difference is that the sample is a very small set of data, whereas the population is a very huge set of data. Let's say that a country has a population of 1 million and we can get a sample of about uh, 100,000 and you can find the average blood sugar level of these 100,000 people and you can use this uh, result as the uh, you know value for this population itself. So this is known as a sample study and this is the difference between a population and a sample and whenever we are having a huge population which we cannot deal with in that cases we will derive a sample and this sample is nothing but the subset of this population which represented. 
So this is the difference and I hope you have understood what is the difference between population and sample. So with this understanding, let's discuss what are the different techniques that we can use to derive this sample. So there are four main types which we can use. So there are four main techniques which we can use to derive a sample. First one is simple random sampling. Second one is systematic sampling. Third, stratified random sampling. And fourth sampling technique is cluster sampling. Okay. So these are the four main sampling techniques. So these four kinds of techniques are called as probability sampling techniques. Okay. And there is another broad classification of uh, sampling techniques called as non probability sampling techniques. And in this video, we are going to discuss about only these four kinds, only the probability sampling techniques. So what is the difference between these two probability and non probability sampling? So in probability sampling, all the members of the population have an equal probability to, you know, to be selected as a sample. And uh, there is a randomness in sampling. So we will, you know, randomly select the data with some, uh, you know, requirements or some regulations. Whereas in non probability sampling, all the members doesn't have equal probability. So there are several factors that will be taken care of. So in this case, a person cannot uh, give an accurate measure of how a sample is uh, taken. So this is the difference between probability and non-probability sampling and uh, non-probability sampling, the data are not chosen randomly. So this is the difference between these two. And in this video, we will be discussing about only these four types because probability sampling techniques is the one which is generally used and which is more efficient. Okay. So now let's try to understand each of these four sampling techniques with appropriate examples and what are the pros and cons of each sampling techniques. Okay. So first of all, let's try to understand simple random sampling. So in simple random sampling, the sample is randomly picked from a larger population. Hence all the individual data points are as an equal probability to be selected as sample data. Okay. So this definition is self explanatory. Let's say that we have a population of about 10,000 data points. So we have a data set of about 10,000 data and in that we need a sample of only 1000 data points. So in that case, what we can do when it comes to random sampling is we randomly select 1000 data points. So there is no rules or regulations that need to be fulfilled in order to be selected as a sample. So you can choose randomly any 1000 elements. Okay. So this is called as a simple random sampling. One such example is employee survey in a company. So consider this example. Let's say that there is a very big uh, MNC company and there are about 1000 people working in that company. And this company's management want to, uh, you know, carry out some survey with their employees. And instead of going and asking to the uh, 1000 people, what they can do is they can randomly choose 100 employees and they can carry out this survey for this, uh, you know, 100 employees alone. So this is an example for random sampling and this will uh, save a lot of work, time and money, right? So this is how a simple random, you know, random sampling uh, works. Now let's try to understand what are the pros and cons we have. So the first pro or first advantage that we have is uh, no sample bias as we are not selecting uh, samples based on any uh, requirements, right? So uh, any data points can be chosen as a sample. So there is no bias that comes into play when it comes to random sampling. And as there is no bias, the sample will be random. So when you select the data points randomly from a sample, so there won't be any partiality that will be shown to the data points. So you can get a balanced sample. And the third advantage which you have is this type of sampling techniques is very easy, right? So anyone can randomly select 1000 data points. So you can just run a Python program to randomly select 100 data points from a data set which contains 1000 uh, data, right? So this is a very simple method and for this method, you don't need any uh, extra domain knowledge. So you just need to know how you can find the random uh, samples. So there is no uh, specific domain knowledge. Domain knowledge in the sense, if you are uh, having a medicine data, uh, data related to medicine field and if you want to find the random sample, it is not a requirement that you need to know about medicine, right? So the domain knowledge is not required when it comes to simple random sampling. And now let's discuss about what are the disadvantages we have. So the population size should be high. So this is one main requirement. So the population or the entire data set that we have should be high in the sense the number of data points should be huge. So you cannot have 100 data points in your population and you cannot choose 10 data points as your sample. So that won't be a good practice. So the population size should be high. And in that case, you can do random sampling. So this is a con because we 
cannot have a huge data set in all the cases in most of the cases we may also have a very small population so this is and in that cases we cannot use random sampling so that is one disadvantage and the other disadvantage is, is that it cannot represent the population well sometimes so this is uh, another disadvantage and you need to note one thing here so this is not this doesn't happen always so in most of the cases uh, the random sample that we get will almost represent the data but sometimes it can change so there is a probability for it so consider this example this employee survey example so a company is you know randomly choosing 100 employees out of their 1000 employees and they are carrying out their survey and they get some result out of the survey and after you know one year they are choosing different 100 people so these 100 people are not taken for the survey and different 100 people are randomly selected for the survey again and this result can be different so it can be different or it cannot be different so you know there are uh, you know prob probability for both the cases and in that case the population or the sample doesn't represent the population well right so this can happen sometimes so these are the pros and cons that we have in the case of simple random sampling so the second type of sampling that we have is systematic sampling so systematic in the sense the samples will be chosen in a systematic way so in systematic sampling the sample is picked from the population at regular intervals so this is meant by systematic where we use regular intervals to choose the sample and this type of sampling is carried out if the population is homogeneous and the data points are uniformly distributed so this is meant by uh, you know systematic sampling where uh, regular intervals we have some regular intervals so just see this example so it will make more sense selecting every 10th member from a population of 10000 so here the interval we have is 10 so we have a data set of about 10000 data points and we take every 10th data point 10th data points in the sense we will take the 10th data point 20th data point 30th data point 40th data point and so on okay so this type of sampling is known as systematic sampling and sometimes uh, this is better instead of random sampling when you have a homogeneous data homogeneous in the sense the data points doesn't differ much so they are almost similar so in that cases you can use a systematic sampling and when your data is uniformly distributed and there are there are not any uh, you know drastic changes in the data so when you have such kind of data you can use systematic sampling so now let's try to understand what are the pros and cons we have so the first uh, advantage is it is very quick and easy so there is not any complicated things that we need to do the one main thing which we need to do is choose the regular interval that we have so in this case the regular interval is 10 right so you can choose any interval based on your data and that is the one thing which we need to do and hence it is very quick and easy and less bias so this is a homogeneous data homogeneous data in the sense the data is very similar the data points are very similar and as a result there won't be any bias in the sample and there will be a u even distribution of data as, as it is uniformly distributed right so there won't be any drastic uh, changes in the sample as the data set itself is a homogeneous one homogeneous in the sense all the data points are almost similar so these are the advantages when it comes to systematic sampling and let's discuss about the cons or the disadvantages we have so data manipulation risk so what happens is there can be a statistician who is carrying out the systematic sampling and is choosing a regular interval of 10th member let's say that he wants a particular result okay so what he can do is he can just uh, access the data set and he can change the value for all the 10th member so in that case we have a very biased data right so there is a very huge risk of data manipulation where if the person who is curating the data the person curating the data knows the regular interval which we are choosing they can manipulate that particular interval values and it will be a very great risk and, and that particular study will be useless because that data is uh, you know uh, very biased okay so that is one disadvantages we have when it comes to systematic sampling uh, which is data manipulation so the second disadvantage which we have is it requires randomness in data so there shouldn't be any arrangement so as i have told you earlier um, if there is a pattern pattern in the sense if uh, the 10th member of the data set is similar let's say that all the 10th member in the data set is similar in that case the study will be you know it is also will be a difficult one because uh, in that case it won't be a good idea to carry out systematic sampling because all the data will be similar and all the 10th data point will be uh, sorry all the data 
will be different when it when we compare it to 10th member so there should be a randomness and there shouldn't be any a regular arrangement so you can uh, you know consider this one so we are having a data a data set of uh, people with diabetes and without diabetes and every 10th data point as people with uh, diabetes and other data are non-diabetic patients so when you choose an interval of 10 the sample you get will contain only the patient only the people with diabetes right so this is one pattern that we have in this case so in this case the pattern we have is at every 10th interval we have a data point of people with diabetes so this is one example and uh, so what I'm trying to explain you here is there shouldn't be an arrangement of the data and there shouldn't be any pattern in the data. There should be a randomness in the data. And if you have a randomness in your data and the data is homogeneous, in that case, the systematic sampling is a very good, uh, you know, technique to choose. And the third disadvantage we have is population should not have pattern. So it is, you know, uh, very similar to this. So I have put this request randomness in data because every data won't be random so some data we may have some arrangements so that is one disadvantage and some data may have patterns so if there are some patterns or arrangements in the data then it won't be a you know a good thing to do systematic sampling so these are the pros and cons when it comes to systematic sampling and the third type of sampling which we have is stratified random sampling okay so in stratified random sampling the population is subdivided into smaller groups called as strata and the samples are obtained randomly from all these strata okay so just understand one thing here we have a population and this population can be subdivided or it can be divided into multiple groups and these groups are called as strata and samples are randomly obtained from this uh, you know strata so you can see this example and it will make more sense so we are finding the smartphone sales in all the states in India. Okay, consider this example. So in this case, each state will be one strata and uh, we have data for each state, right? So how much cell phones has been sold in each states of India and each state will become a strata or group. So in that, what we will do is we will take all these states. So each of this uh, state become a strata and from all these strata, we will randomly select uh, data points. So let's say that we have uh, Maharashtra state. So we will randomly, uh, you know, take the data points from the state of Maharashtra. So we will take, ra we will randomly take the data points from Delhi and all the other states. So this is meant by stratified random sampling where we have different groups in our data and all these groups will be considered. So that is one main thing to note here. So we won't leave any groups. So we will consider all the groups. In this case, all the gro groups is nothing but the states. So we will consider all the groups and from each of these groups, we will uh, randomly collect some data. So hence it is called as a stratified random sampling and strata is nothing but the groups that we have. Okay, so this is meant by stratified random sampling. And now let's try to understand what are the pros and cons we have. So the first advantage we have here is it can find important characteristics in the population. So if you doesn't consider the groups, let's say that we are not considering different states and just we have the data for a smartphone sales in the entire India. So in that case, we may not find some important characteristics. So let's say that in this case, we are uh, dividing the data into different groups called as strata and we are carrying out our analysis. So in that case, we may get an insight that people from one state tends to buy more smartphone when compared to other states. So this is one main characteristics, right? So when you use this stratified random sampling, we can get some important characteristics based on the groups that we have. So this is one main advantage. And if you don't uh, group the data into different groups, then you can't find this characteristics. So that is the advantage of this one. And the second advantage is high precision can be found if the differences in the strata is I. So if the differences between the two groups is I, then we can find very good results or very good, uh, you know, precision. Precision in, precision in the sense, uh, we can find uh, better conclusive evidences for this study. So that is one main thing. So if the differences in two groups is very I, okay. So the disadvantage we have when it comes to stratified random sampling is that we cannot perform this stratified sampling on population that cannot be classified into groups. So there are data set which cannot be classified into groups. So in that cases, we cannot perform this stratified random sampling. And the second disadvantage we have is overlapping of data points. So one data point can be similar to one group and the other group as well. So this is called as overlapping data points where the data point has the characteristics of 
uh, two or more groups so in that case it will be a difficult thing to do if we have a lot of data points that are overlapping then we cannot uh, you know possibly do this stratified random sampling so these are the advantages and the disadvantages and uh, uh, that we have for stratified random sampling and the fourth and final type of sampling that we have uh, is cluster sampling so this is similar to stratified sampling but there is one main disadvantage sorry one main difference to it so in cluster sampling is carried out on population that has inherent groups inherent groups in the sense there will be natural groups and this population is subdivided into clusters and then random clusters are taken as sample so in the case of stratified sample all the strata is taken straight in the sense all the groups are taken whereas in the case of cluster sampling we won't take all the groups we will randomly select the groups so that's the difference so in stratified we will take all the groups and we will uh, select random samples from each of these groups but in this case we won't take all the groups so we will randomly select a few uh, groups and we will take all the data points from selected groups so this will be an one uh, you know uh, interesting example to consider this so in this case we are considering the smartphone sales in randomly selected states so in this stratified example we will take all the states of india and find the smartphone sales whereas in cluster sampling we will randomly select the states and then for those selected states we will find the smartphone sales so this is the difference between stratified and cluster sampling where in stratified all the groups are selected and from all these groups random values are taken whereas in cluster sampling groups are selected randomly and all the data points from selected groups are taken so this is the difference between cluster sampling and a stratified sampling so what are the advantages and disadvantages that we have so the first advantage in cluster sampling is that it requires only fewer resources so the resources that we need is very uh, less because let's consider this stratified uh, example stratified sampling example so we need the data from all the states of india right so one need to uh, one person needs to meet all the people sorry not all the people some um, uh, number of people from uh, all the states of india and the resources required for it is i right so the time money and uh, work that the person is putting is very huge but when it comes to uh, cluster sampling only a randomly selected state so we are not considering all the states but randomly selected states so the amount of work that the person needs to do here is very less so in that cases where you know where you don't want to uh, spend a lot of time and you want a very efficient result in that cases you can go with cluster sample and the resources that are required for this is very small okay so in a budget you know in a budget perspective cluster sampling is uh, better when compared to stratified sampling the other advantage that we have is reduced variability so as we have uh, you know selected states and uh, and uh, selected groups the elements in this particular groups will be almost similar so there won't be any variability variability in the sense differences in the data points and the other advantage is that it has the advantages of both random sampling and stratified sampling so we are randomly selecting the groups right so this has an inherent advantage from both random sampling technique and stratified sampling technique so that is one main advantage and the disadvantage of cluster sampling is that it cannot be performed on population without natural group so it is very similar to the one which are, which we have discussed before where uh, all the populations cannot be uh, grouped into different strata so in that cases we cannot use cluster samples when it doesn't contains inherent groups the second dis uh, disadvantage is also the same where uh, if we have overlapping data points then it will be a difficult thing to uh, implement cluster sampling and the third disadvantage which we have here is it cannot provide a general insight for the entire population so this is one main thing whereas in stratified sampling we are considering all the groups so in in the example which we have discussed we have uh, we are considering the data points for all the states in the country but in cluster sampling we are just selecting randomly uh, selected states so it won't be a uh, you know a good representation of the entire population but the advantage it have is uh, the resources you need so these are the pros and cons and based on these pros and cons and the and the objective that we that we have we choose any of these four sampling techniques okay and uh, i hope you have understood all the things that we have covered so far and you may get a question so why this is important why uh, this sampling techniques is important for a person who is learning machine learning so in machine learning we know that we are dealing with data right so we train our machine learning model with data so how you get this data a person who is curating this data 
can implement any of this sampling techniques to get this data right so yes this is very important to know how a sample is derived from a population so i hope you are clear with all the topics covered this module is about mathematics for machine learning so far in this mathematics module we have discussed about the topics on linear algebra then we have started with statistics and today we are going to discuss one of the most important topics in statistics which is central tendencies so central tendencies consist of three main parameters so these three parameters are mean median and mode so this is the agenda we have for today's video so first let's try to understand what is meant by this central tendency and what is meant by these three parameters and where do we use in machine learning okay so where we will use these three parameters in machine learning so this is the agenda for today's video so in case you are watching my channel for the first time hi in this youtube channel i am making a hands on machine learning course with python and if you want to learn this course from the beginning i will give the link for my course playlist in the description of this video so you can check that out with that being said let's get started with today's video <clears throat> so what is meant by this central tendency central tendency is a measure it is a value that represents the center point or typical value of a data set okay it is a value that summarizes the data okay so don't take the literal meaning of central value so think about like this so it is one value that represents your data okay so consider that you have a data set with 20 values and uh, let's say that you want to represent these 20 values with the help of only one value how this is possible so in that case you can use the measures of central tendency okay so the one interesting example which we all can relate is the gpa so in colleges we would have you know secured uh, some amount of gpa right so what is meant by this gpa so during our uh, academics in college we used to write a lot of exams and there will be a lot of subjects and we will get a grade for each of the subjects right and uh, gpa is a one value that summarizes the entire academic performance of a student right so it is a measure of central tendency so you know to be more precise it is a different form of a mean value okay so it is one value that represents the entire data so here the data we have here is the academic performance of a student okay so that is what is meant by a central tendency which is it, it is a summarizing value of the entire data or it is the central value of the data okay so there are three main types of central tendencies they are mean median and mode so these three values represents the measure of central tendency now let's try to understand each of these values with examples okay First of all, let's try to understand mean. So this is the definition of mean. Mean or arithmetic mean is the sum of values divided by the number of values. So mean, we can also call this as an average. So we all are familiar with mean, right? So it is nothing but the average value. So what we try, what we do to find the average value or mean value is that we take all the data and we add all these data and divide it by the number of data we have, okay? So let's try to understand this with uh, an example and also let's try to understand the formula for mean. So let's say that m is the mean value of a data and sigma represents summation. So summation of x. So x is the data points that we have. Data points in the sense if you have a, you know, a data set and there are 10 values in the data set. So each value is called as a data point. The individual data is called as a data point. Okay, So x represents each of those values. So summation of x means we, uh, we need to uh, add all those values. And the end represents the number of values okay so if you have a data set with 10 values so in that case n will be 10 so you will add all those values and divide it by uh, n so this is called as the arithmetic mean or you know a simply mean or it can also be called as the average value okay so <clears throat> let's consider this example these are the heights of five people so we have the heights in centimeter as uh, 160 centimeter 172 165 168 174 so a group of five people and let's say that we want one value that represents the height of these five people so a mean value or a central value so we can find this central value by using mean method so in this case we will uh, sum all the values or we will add all the values so so from 160 to 174 so we have five values and we add all the values and we divide it by uh, divided by five because we totally have five values right so that's the reason so in this case n is equal to 5 and the result which you get is 167.8 in this case so this is the mean value in this case so you just need to add all those values and divide it by the number of observation or number of data we have 
so this is all about mean value and then we have median value so the median is the middle value in the list of numbers to find the median the numbers have to be listed in numerical order from smallest to largest okay so this is about median so let's say that we have a data set and there are about nine values in the data set okay so in this case what we will do is to find the median we will try to arrange these nine values in order so what is the central value so the central value or middle value is nothing but the fifth value right so once you arrange so this is very important so you cannot take the data set as such you need to uh, arrange the data set in order from in a, an ascending order so when you arrange it uh, the fifth value become the middle value or the central value and that will be your median okay so let's try to understand this with a similar example so we have the you know same heights here which we have uh, which we add here but in a different order so in this case this is not in a ascending order right from smallest to largest whereas we have arranged this particular data heights of people in centimeter in an ascending order so 160 165 168 172 and 174 so we have arranged this in ascending order so try to find which is the middle value here so this totally contains five value and the middle value is the third value right so i have circled this in red circle so you can see here so this is the median value because it is the middle value in our small data set okay so there may be cases when we have even number of values so in this case we have uh, you know odd number of values so we have chosen this as the middle value but what you can do when you have even number of values so in this case we totally have uh, six values right so how you can find the median value so in this case what you have to do here is we choose the two central values so in this case the two central values are third value and the fourth value now we need to find the average of these two values or the mean of these two values so we need to add 168 and 172 and divide it by 2 so the answer which we get here is 170 and this will be our median so the median of this six data points so this is how you will find a median so the first thing which you need to note here is we need to arrange the data in ascending order here you can see that the data is in ascending order so without arranging the order or, you know without arranging the data we cannot find the median so it would be a you know a wrong approach so we arrange the data in ascending order and we find what is the middle value and uh, in the case of odd number of values so it is easy to find the middle value because we have only one value but when there are even number of data points we take uh, the two middle values and divide it by two and we will get the median and this may arise a question in your mind we already have a central value called as mean and why we need median so this will be a question right so the importance of median is mean cannot be a good measure in or in all cases so mean is a very good measure but it cannot be considered as the best measure in all the cases so just consider this example so here we have the values as 160 172 165 168 and 174 right let's say that we have another value as 190 centimeter let's say that there is another person who is very tall and uh, that will be our sixth data point or sixth observation so in that case if you find the mean your mean value will be very huge and uh, when you compare all the data points all the individual data points with the mean value there will be a very huge variation among them so in the case of outliers so this is an outlier right so all these values are almost in a similar kind of range so it is in 160 and 160s and uh, very few values are 172 if you have a value around 190 then uh, that is called as an outlier because other values are in a you know almost in a similar range but uh, the uh, one single value is in a more higher range in that cases when you have some outliers in your data your mean value will be affected drastically because of that outlier so whenever you have the outlier it is uh, best to arrange the data in order and find the median value so in that cases a median will be a good measure as the central value to represent your data so the main thing to note here is if there is a uniform distribution of data so there is not much you know difference in the range of the values you have in that case we you know try to find the mean and if you have outliers or if uh, one or two or very few values are uh, high or if the few values are very low in that case we try to find the median and median will be a best measure so this is the use of mean and median and the difference between them and finally we have this mode value right and the mode is the value that occurs most often if no number is no number in the list is repeated then there is no mode for the list 
So mode is a value that that has repeated so many times in a list. So let's consider this. So we have heights of uh, five people, and this you, and in this you can see which value has repeated many times. So we have one sixty, and one sixty has appeared two times in this particular data set or particular list, and we have only one one seventy two, one one sixty eight, and only one one seventy four. The value that is repeated most is one sixty, and in this case the mode will be one sixty. So this is meant by mode, and mode also has uh, you know very good importance when we are considering central tendencies. So that will be explained in the next slide. So please. Week and uh, now I hope you are clear and aware of what is meant by mean, median, and mode. So mean is the normal average value that we get by adding all the data points and dividing it by the total number of data points we have. And median is nothing but arranging the data points in order and finding which is the middle value. And mode, mode is nothing but the most number of repeated values. And if there are no repeated values, then we don't have mode. So there may be cases when the mean median and mode can be similar okay so it is not that always uh, mean median and mode should be different so that is not always the case so there will be cases when all these th all these uh, three values will be similar will be equal okay so that is you know actually very common so to have mean median and mode value to be similar so and this happens mostly in the normal distribution or uniform distribution okay so to this understanding now let's try to uh, you know uh, understand where we where we will use these uh, central tendency values when it comes to machine learning okay so the main application of these central tendencies in machine learning is in data pre processing so we know that data pre processing that we do in several machine learning projects and in uh, data science projects and data pre processing is all about processing our data before feeding it to our uh, machine learning model so we cannot feed the raw data to our machine learning model so we need to do some processing and this step is called as data pre-processing. And one main important step in data pre-processing is handling the missing values. So the data set contains missing values. A lot of the data set contains missing values and we cannot feed the data set which, which uh, misses some value to our machine learning model. So we need to handle this missing values. So we need to you know do some uh, operations on those missing values and replace them with suitable values before feeding it to a machine learning model. And this is where central tendencies are very helpful for us. So central tendencies are very useful in and handling the missing values in a data set. So this is the uh, main application of central tendencies when it comes to machine learning. So now let's try to understand where we can use or where we can replace the missing values with mean and where we can replace the values with median and where to replace the values with mode. So we have these three values, right? And there are specific cases where we need to choose each of these values, okay? First of all, let's try to understand where we can use mean value. So missing values in a data set can be replaced with mean value if the data is uniformly distributed. So if you have a normal distribution, and in uniform distribution means, uh, you know, almost all the data points are in a similar range. So there is not much, uh, you know, changes in the data. So they are almost in the same range as we have seen in the height example. So in that cases, uh, let's say that we have uh, a data set containing 500 data points and uh, it contains eight of 500 different peoples. And uh, let's say that about uh, 10 values or 20 values are missing from this particular data set. So in that case, what we will do is, so i is, uh, you know, you can consider i as a uniformly distributed value. So in most of the cases, the i will be almost similar for uh, different people, right? So there won't be a very huge change uh, between them. So the i can, the i value can range from 160 to, you know, maybe 190 or something like that, 180 maybe. So there is a particular range in which i of the people are generally, right? So in that cases, we have almost a uniform distribution or a symmetric distribution. In that case, we can replace those 20 missing values in the data set with mean value, okay? Now let's try to understand when we can replace the missing values with median value. So missing values in a data set can be replaced with median value if the data is skewed. So skewed in the sense, uh, you know, this is an example of a right skewed distribution where there is more number of data in one side. Okay, so this is not a normal distribution. So the data will be in one side. And uh, uh, let's say that there is, uh, uh, let's consider this. We are taking a data set with salaries of different people. Let's say that a person is making a uh, five lakhs per annum. Okay, and there are people who are making a uh, five lakhs, six lakhs, seven lakhs, etc. And there are very few people 
uh, who are making money of about uh, 20 lakhs per annum or uh, 25 lakhs per annum so those people with uh, 20 lakhs per annum and uh, 25 lakhs per annum will be in this particular uh, you know spot and the number of people earning that much will be slightly uh, less and the number of people earning in the range of 3 lakh 4 lakh and 5 lakh will be more and uh, this is the curve which you will get if you plot such kind of data so if you check the distribution of such kind of data so it will be a skewed distribution and if your data is a skewed distribution it won't be a proper way to use mean value so in that case we will be replacing the missing values with median value and then we have mode so mode also in missing values can be replaced with mode if the data is skewed if the data is skewed we can also use for mode values as well and the another main application of mode value is that if there are some missing values in the categorical column so categorical column in the sense they contains categories or classes so you can think about it like uh, the gender of a person or a color of a ball and something like that so they are just categories and not numerical values whereas we have discussed the numerical values in the case of mean and median and we cannot find uh, mean and median for categorical values we can find only the mode so mode is nothing but the most number of repeated values right so when categorical values are missing in a data set in most cases we use mode so these are the three uh, cases where we will use these central tendencies so this you know these are the details which i wanted to share with you uh, regarding the central tendencies in statistics and the central tendencies that are helpful in machine learning so i hope you have understood all the contents covered in this video this module is all about mathematics for machine learning so far in this mathematics module we have discussed several topics on linear algebra and then we have started with statistics in the previous video we have discussed what is meant by the measure of central tendencies and uh, what are the three central tendency measures such as mean median and mode and in this video we are going to discuss what is meant by the measure of variability and uh, the three parameters that comprises the measure of variability that are range variance and standard deviation this is the agenda for today's video in case you are watching my videos for the first time hi in this youtube channel i am making a hands on machine learning course with python and if you want to learn this machine learning course from the beginning i will give the link for the course playlist in the description of this video so you can check that out so with that being said let's get started with today's video measure of variability so in the you know central tendency video we have discussed that central tendency is a single value that represents our data right and measure of variability is something and it is also a value measure that gives us how the data is distributed in our data set or how the data is dispersed in the data set and uh, these informations are given by the measure of variability and there are three parameters or three uh, you know measures that contribute to this variability they are range variance and standard deviation so as i have told you earlier the important uh, usage of these three values are to find the distribution of our data so what is meant by this range so the range of a set of data or a data set so the range of a data set is the difference between the largest and the smallest value it can give a rough idea about the, about the distribution of a data set so range so in a data set uh, let's say that we have about 10 values in the 10 values we find uh, what is the maximum value and what is the minimum value and this will be the range so you can uh, tell this as maximum value to uh, minimum value let's say that uh, there is a data set with maximum value as 10 and minimum value as 2 so you can say that the range of this value is 2 to 10 okay so from 2 uh, all the way to 10 so this is the range or you can subtract the maximum value and uh, you know minimum value so this is how you can say the range of the data so it tells you how your data is distributed between this maximum value and minimum value so that is the meaning of range and then we have this variance variance is a measure of how each number in a set or how far each number in the set is from the mean and therefore from every other number in the data set so it is just find the distance between the mean value and each value in a data set or a group of values in a data set so we know we have already uh, discussed that mean is the central value so it is the representation or you know a typical value in a data set if uh, let's say that there are five people with uh, similar rights and we try to find the average uh, height and what happens in variance is we will try to find what is the variation of individual data points when compared to the mean value so that is called as variance okay so we try to measure how far the value is when compared to mean so this is called as variance of a data set okay 
and then we have standard deviation so standard deviation values actually obtained from variance and it is also a similar measure standard deviation is the square root of variance so we take square root of variance and that becomes a standard deviation value and standard deviation looks at how spread out a group of numbers is from a mean so okay so these are the definitions of range variance and standard deviation okay so let's try to understand their formulas as well so range is given by maximum value minus a minimum value so yeah so maximum value is minus minimum value and gives a estimation of uh, what is the distribution of our data and then we have this variance so variance is represented by the sigma square so this is the summation symbol summation symbol of this x represents uh, each data point so if our data set contains uh, 10 uh, data points and each data point is represented by x this capital x and this mu represents the mean of the entire population okay so uh, and n represents the number of data points in uh, the entire population and what we need to find here is we will take each data point and we will uh, you know subtract it from the mean of the data set and we will square it so and this entire summation so first you will take the first data point and you will subtract it with um, the mean value of the data set and you will square it and then you will take the second data point and you will subtract it with the mean value and square it and then third value will be subtracted with mean and square it so it will be so on and then once you get all those summation values you will divide it by the number of values present in the data set or the population okay so this is the formula for variance where x represents each data point value and the mu represents the population uh, mean okay so here you can see here we have a square so variance cannot have a negative value okay so it will always be positive because of this uh, square okay so there is one main thing to note here so you can see this plus n here so whenever we are finding the variance for a population we will use uh, this summation you know this variance symbol where the denominator will be n whenever we are finding the variance for a sample so in the previous videos we have discussed what is going to be a population and what is going to be a sample so whenever you are using a sample so the numerator will be the same whereas the denominator in the denominator you will divide it by the number of uh, data points in the sample minus one let's say that we have a population and there are about thousand values okay so when you are finding the variance of the sample let's say that uh, the sample has about 100 values so 1000 is the size of the population and 100 is the size of the sample so in that case you will the numerator remains the same for uh, the sample okay so sample variance so it is summation of each data point in the sample minus mean value of the sample divided by number of values in the sample minus one so the only change here is in population we will divide it by uh, total number of values whereas for sample variance it should be n minus 1 number of data points present in the sample minus 1 so that is the difference between uh, population variance and sample variance so that is one main thing that you need to take note of and it is very very important okay and then we have the standard deviation value which is just the square root of uh, you know variance so these are the three values where range is the maximum value minus minimum value and this is the formula for variance population variance and if it is a sample it should be a number of data points in the sample minus 1 and this is standard deviation value which is the square root of variance okay so now let's try to understand this with an example let's say that we have two sets of data okay so these are the two sets and uh, so in the first set we have the values as minus 5 0 5 10 and 15 and in the second set we have the values as 3 4 5 6 7 okay let's try to find the mean of each of these data set so in the first case when you add all these data points and divide it by the number of data we have the answer which you will get is 5 so this is the mean value of our data set okay so now let's try to find the mean of this particular data set and the mean of this particular data set will also be 5 and uh, this is very interesting right because like uh, these two sets of data are different but they have the same mean value and in the previous videos i have explained to you that mean value is the representation value or it is the summary value in this case uh, both these data sets have similar value similar mean value right so now can i say that these two data sets are similar so think about this for a minute so each of uh, these data sets each of these data sets contains the mean value whether they are similar or not and this is where the measure of variability comes into play so 
sometimes mean value doesn't give us much information but when you you know think about this uh, measure of variability it will tell us whether these two data sets are similar or different now let's try to find the range of these uh, data sets so we know that range uh, formula is maximum value minus minimum value here the range is uh, from minus 5 to plus 15 right and in the second uh, data set the range is from plus 3 to plus 7 and when you subtract the maximum value and minimum values the range you get is 20 and uh, for this particular example so the maximum minus minimum value is 4 so whenever the range value is more that means the distribution is quite high here the distribution is from minus 5 to 15 whereas here the range value is pretty small compared to this right so here the distribution is not that much high so the distribution is only between 3 to 7 which is a very small uh, range right so whenever the range value is more the distribution is also more now let's discuss another uh, variability measure which is variance so we have already discussed the variance formula right so you can also just show this in the slide where x represents the data point and uh, mu represents the mean value divided by the total number of uh, values and this should be squared okay so that's what we are doing here so we are taking each value so this is the first data point so we know that the mean value is 5 this first data point will be subtracted from, from 5 and it will be squared and similarly second value then third value then you know fourth and fifth value so all these values will be subtracted individually from the mean value and they will be squared okay and uh, all of these values after summation will be divided by the total number of values here the total population only contain five values so whenever we are containing you know when we are we are considering sample this value should be subtracted by one as i have told you earlier okay so the value of variance which you will get for this particular case is 50 and for this particular data set so it is just the same procedure each data point minus the mean value here the value which you will get for variance is 2 and it is very similar to range that whenever variance value is i that means there is a huge difference between each data point and the mean value of the data point okay whereas when the variance is small that means the data points are very close to each other and each data point is closer to the mean value here the variance is 50 and here the variance is 2 that means the values in this particular data set are very far or they are very different from the mean whereas here the variance is 2 which is a very small number and hence it is you know very close to the mean value and then we have the standard deviation value so standard deviation value is nothing but the square root of 50 so the square root of 50 is nothing but almost it's 7.1 and in this case the standard deviation is 1.4 so as you can see here this is also a measure uh, which tells us about the distribution of data and whenever the standard deviation is more that means uh, there is more variation in the data when compared to the mean and the other data points so these are the main insights that we get from here and there is another main thing that i wanted to tell you if all the values in the data set is similar let's say that all the values in the data set is 5 5 5 5 5 we have five uh, values of 5 in that case the variance will be 0 and the standard deviation will also be 0 so just think about this so if all the values are 5 the mean value will also be 5 so uh, when 5 is added 5 times you will get a 25 and 25 divided by 5 is 5 and uh, the first value is 5 minus 5 so it will all these values will be 5 minus 5 5 minus 5 5 minus 5 and so on so whenever all the data points in a data set is similar or equal in that case the variance and the standard deviation both of them will be zero uh, you know in any case so the insight which we are getting is variance and standard deviation can be zero or you know it can be positive but it cannot be a negative value because we are taking a square so that is one main thing which you need to take care of so from these values this variance and standard deviation value we can say that these two data sets are very different from each other even though they have a very equal mean like they have uh, equal mean right but they are very different and we can find that difference based on the measures of range variance and standard deviation so you know the measure of central tendencies and uh, measure of variability both of these measures helps us to understand our data better understand what is the magnitude and range that we have in our data so that is about the concepts of measure of variability and i hope you have understood all the things covered in this video statistics for machine learning and uh, the topic of discussion for today is percentiles and quantiles. First, let's try to understand what is the importance of percentiles and quantiles and then let's discuss about these topics in detail with suitable examples. Okay, so this is the agenda for today's video. In case you are watching my videos for the first time, I, in this YouTube channel, I'm making a hands-on machine learning course in Python. And if you want to learn this course from the beginning, I'll give the link for 
my course playlist in the description of this video so you can check that out okay so with that being said let's get started with today's video so what is the purpose of these measurements so where we are going to use these measurements such as percentiles and quantiles let's say that we have a data set and this data set is about the annual income of all the people in a city okay so this is the data data set we have and we need to do some data analysis on this particular data so one important step that we do when it comes to data analysis is to find the distribution of data points in a data set okay so we need to find the distribution so what can be the distribution in the case of this annual income data set we may be interested in finding how many people fall in the top 10 percentage so you know we are splitting the data based on the annual income so how many people fall in the top 10 percentage and how many people fall in the uh, bottom 10 percentage or in the you know top 20 percentage or 30 percentage so this is nothing but the di distribution of data points in a data set right so this is where the measurements such as percentiles and quantiles are very helpful okay so with this understanding let's try to understand what is meant by a percentile and what is meant by a quantile so First, let's try to understand percentile with a definition. So, percentile is a value on a scale of 100 that indicates the percent of distribution that is equal to or below it. So, this is the definition and it may be a little bit confusing for you to understand based on this definition. So, I'll explain you this with an example. So, what you need to understand here is, so percentile can have values from 0 to 100 and it tells how many values are below a particular data point. So, that is meant by a percentile. So, if you have appeared in some competitive exams, so you would have heard about this percentiles. So, they used to give the results based on the percentiles. So, let's consider this example. Let's say that there is a comp competitive exam and the student scores about uh, 40 percentile. So, 40 percentile means, the, you know, there are about 40 percentage of the people who have scored less marks than that student. Okay. So, let's say that uh, there are about 1 lakh students who have appeared for the exam. For that particular competitive exam and one student scored about uh, 40 percentile that means 40 percentage of the people have scored less than that particular student which means about uh, 39,999 students have scored less than him so that is meant by a percentile so it gives how many values are below a particular data point so this is meant by a percentile and now let's try to understand this with a more you know interesting example let's say that we have a data set which contains height of 15 people okay so each circle represents the height of a different people and totally we have 15 uh, people's height okay and let's say that the heights are arranged in order okay so it is arranged in ascending order so it is sorted and uh, we have a scale in centimeter okay so this particular line represents the value of height in centimeter and let's say that the height of the first person here is 160 centimeter and the height of the last person is 180 centimeter so this is the range and we have arranged all the heights in order okay so totally we have 15 values or 15 height values and the first value starts from 160 and this is the last value so the range is between 160 and 180 so here let's try to find the median of this data set okay so median is nothing but the middle value okay so once you arrange the data points in order we will try to find which is the middle value so in this the eighth value will become the middle value because left to it there will be seven values and right of this middle value there will be seven values so this will be our median so this red color data point is the median median of our data set and let's say that the height value for this particular person is 170 centimeter so this is about the data that we have now let's try to find the percentile uh, of this particular data. So if you take this particular median data point, it is 50th percentile. So 50th percentile means 50 percentage of the values in the data set are less than this value. So we are taking this data points and this is 50th percentile. That means uh, the other values are less than it. 50 percentage other values are less than this. So how you can find the percentile is take the number of values that are less than this and divide it by a uh, total number of values. So here there are about seven values so you can divide seven by 15 so that's how you can find the percentile so percentile is different from from percentage so that's very important to note so percentile tells us uh, how many values are less than less than a particular data point so let's take another data point so if you take this fourth data point 
we can calculate the percentile as how many data points are less than this. So there are three data points which are less than this particular data point. So it is three by 15. So when you divide it, you get 20th percentile. Okay. And uh, we can find the 80th percentile at this data points. So this is the 13th value. So 12 values are less than this. So the value of this particular data point is 80th percentile. So this is how uh, percentiles are also recorded in the case of competitive exam where if a person scores 90, 90th percentile that means 90 percentage of the people have scored less than that particular person so that is meant by percentiles so this will give you an idea of how the you know data point is distributed okay so now let's try to understand the other parameter which is quantile so quantile is a measure that tells how many values in a data set are above or below a certain limit it divides the number of the data set into equally sized subgroups. So, you know, percentiles or quantiles are similar to each other, but there is one significant difference. So, a quantile divides a group into equal subgroups, okay, whereas percentile can have any number of values. So, let's try to understand this with a similar example. So, again, we have the same data set which contains 8 of 15 people and we have uh, arranged these 8 values in ascending order, okay. And we have a scale in centimeter and the first value is 160 centimeter and the last person has a height of 180 centimeter and we have a median value, okay. And now let's try to find the quantile. So, this is the median value which is 170. So, you can see here we have uh, discussed that a quantile is something that divides the members of the data set into equally sized subgroups. So if you take this median, it will divide your data set into equally sized subgroups because left of this median, there will be seven values and right of this median, there will be seven values. So it is one, uh, you know, quantile. So this is a 0.5 or 50 percentage quantile. So sometimes we refer to quantiles in 0.5 or we may represent it in 50 percentage. So both of them are similar. So this median value represents 0.5 or 50 percentage quantile. Okay. So now we have this particular subgroup and there is another uh, subgroup here. Now this subgroups can also be divided into equally sized subgroups. So if you take this particular data point, it will divide this particular subgroups into two uh, subgroups again. So there will be three data points here and there will be three other data points here. So this will be uh, the subgroup for this case. And this is the 0.25 or 25th percentile quantile. And this will be our 0.75 or 75 percentage quantile. So the important thing to note here is a quantile will split the data into equally sized subgroups. So this is also is very helpful for us to understand how the data set is uh, distributed throughout. Okay. So this is the purpose and uh, uses of percentiles and quantiles. So in our project videos also, we have tried to find the percentiles of uh, the data set. So we used a function called as describe in pandas library. So when you run, uh, you know, data frame dot describe, it gives you various statistical measures, including the percentile values. So it will give you the 25th percentile value, 50th percentile value and 75th percentile value. So you can refer my uh, machine learning project videos. So if you want to know more about this, okay. So that is all about percentiles and quantiles. And I hope you have understood all the things covered in this video. And the topic of discussion for today is correlation and causation. So correlation and causation is a very interesting and a significant concept in statistics. And in this video, let's try to understand what is the importance of this correlation and causation in a machine learning project or in a data science project. And what is meant by this correlation and causation? Let's try to understand this in a more detailed way with suitable examples. So this is the agenda for today's video. So in case you are watching my videos for the first time, hi. In this YouTube channel, I'm making a hands on machine learning course with Python. And uh, if you want to learn this course from the beginning, I give the link for uh, the course playlist in the description of this video and you can check that out. With that being said, let's get started with today's video. So what is the importance of correlation and causation when it comes to machine learning? So let's try to understand the meaning of the word correlation. So what is meant by the word correlation? So correlated means something is related, right? So two things are related to each other. So that's when we say that the two things are correlated to each other, right? So where, where, where we can use this correlation in machine learning or data analysis? Let's try to understand this with an example. Let's say that we have a data set which contains prices of houses in a city. Okay. And we want to do some data analysis on this particular data set. So what is the analysis that we can do with this particular data set? One thing which we can do is find which factors affect the price of the house. So we can try to find which factors 
increase the price of a particular house and which factors reduce the price of a house so what we are basically trying to do is find the relationship between the features in a data set okay so i'll give you an example let's say that uh, let's try to understand which factors would affect the house price so one factor is the location where the house is situated let's say that uh, the house is situated in a more populated and more active part of the city then the price is obviously going to be more right in case if the house is situated in a, in more outskirts of the city then the price is not going to be that much the price will be lower so this is one factor that affects the house price and we can think about other uh, factors as well so if you think about the size of the house or the number of rooms in a house if there are more number of rooms or if the size of the house is more then the price is obviously going to be more right so these features or these parameters such as number of rooms and the location where the house is situated so these are called as features that are present in this particular house price data set and correlation will help us to find the relationship between the features in a data set okay so this is where we are going to use these concepts now let's try to understand about correlation and causation in a more detailed way with suitable examples so first let's try to understand about correlation so correlation is a measure that determines the extent to which two variables are related to each other in a data set so don't look at this second statement just uh, you know try to understand the first statement let's come to this uh, later so correlation is a measure so it is a numerical measure and what is this numerical measure is it will tell us the extent to which two variables are related to each other so two variables in the sense in the house examples that we have seen the price of the house is one variable and uh, the location where it is situated is another variable so correlation will tell us how you know up to what extent two variables are related to each other and there is another important thing which we need to you know take note of but it doesn't mean that one event is the cause of the other event so what we are trying to say here is two variables can be correlated to each other like for example one variable increases if the other variable increases or one variable may decrease if the other variable increase so these two variables are correlated but this doesn't mean one variable is the cause and the other variable is the effect so we cannot say that so one event does not cause the other event so they are just related to each other but one is not the cause for the other so this is what we need to be more aware of so there are two types of correlation one is positive correlation and the second one is negative correlation so what is meant by a positive correlation let's take two variables if two variables have a direct proportionality between them direct proportionality means if one value increases the other value also increases or if one value decreases the other value also decreases in that case the two values or the two variables are directly proportional to each other right so this kind of relationship or this kind of correlation is positive correlation where the two variables move in the same direction either they both increase or they both decrease okay so negative correlation is one in which if one value increases the other value will decrease or if one value decreases the other value increases so their movement is in opposite direction okay so this is the difference between positive correlation or negative correlation so you can say that positively correlated variables are directly proportional and negatively correlated variables are inversely proportional to each other okay so let's try to uh, understand this with our house example so we have two axes here and we are going to take two parameters one is the number of rooms so we are taking the number of rooms in the x axis and we are taking the house price in the y axis and we are going to plot the number of uh, rooms and house price and see what is the graph we are getting let's say that we have about 10 data points and each data points represents the number of rooms and house price okay so let's say that we get these 10 data points plotted in this graphs so the y axis represent the house price so here we can see a, a trend here that if the number of rooms increases the house price also increase right so you can fit this uh, data points in a straight line okay so now you can say that these two variables number of rooms is one variable and house price is another variable these two variables are positively correlated because as the number of rooms increases the house price also increases now let's try to understand negative correlation so again we have two axes and we are going to take two other variables one is crime rate and house price let's try to you know plot the crime rate that is happening in a city and what is the price of uh, the houses in that particular city and this is the plot which we get if we try to find the data you know if we try to plot the data points and now you can also see a trend here if the crime rate in a city increases the house price also you know 
decreases so if this crime rate increases house price decreases so this is the trend that we are getting for this imaginary problem okay so this is the difference between positive correlation and negative correlation where if one variable increases the other value or other variable increases in positive correlation and if one variable increases the other variable decreases as in negative correlation so now let's try to understand the second statement with these examples so what i have mentioned here is it does not mean that one event is the cause of the other event so what we are trying to do is or what we are trying to understand here is we cannot say that this number of rooms alone is the main reason why the house price is increasing so there may be another uh, you know hidden variables also so you can also think about uh, the a location where it is situated so we have already already discussed about it so if the price is situated or oh, sorry if the house is situated in in an outskirt of the city and even though it may contain many number of rooms the house price may not be more because it is not an active area right so there are maybe other variables that would affect the house price so we cannot say that this is the cause of this particular event here uh, one event or one variable is number of rooms and we cannot say that this is the cause for increase in house price so what we can say here is these two variables are correlated but we cannot say that one is the cause and the other is the effect okay so that's what we need to understand here in correlation we just try to find the relationship and we cannot say that these two are cause and effect pair okay so this takes us to the next concept which is causation so what is meant by this causation in statistics causation means that one event causes another event to occur thus there is a cause and effect relationship between the two variables in a data set so contrary to the correlation in causation we try to prove that two variables or two events are cause and effect pair if one event occurs the other event will occur okay if one event does not occur the other event won't occur so that is meant by causation so there is a causal relationship between the two variables so let's try to understand this with another example so let's compare the number of ice cream sales and uh, you know temperature of a particular day so we take the data points for several day and let's try to compare the ice cream sales and the average temperature of a particular day let's say that we are uh, taking two axes so one axis contains the average temperature in you know several days and the in y axis we have number of ice cream sales so let's try to plot the data points and let's say that we have 10 data points and this is how we get the plot so here you can see a direct proportionality between the two variables so what this means is if the average temperature increases people tend to buy more ice creams so let's say that we have uh, the data points for 10 different days and what is the inference that we are getting is if the temperature is more the ice cream sales is more so this is obvious that increase in temperature you know causing people to buy more ice creams so there is a cause and effect pair here so summer season causes more ice cream sales so this is the inference we are getting and since th there is a clear cause and effect relationship or cause and effect pair we can say that there is a causal relationship between them so this is the difference between correlation and causation where in correlation we say that two variables are related to each other two variables are correlated to each other whereas in causation we say that one event causes the other event to occur if there is not uh, if that event is not occurring the other event is not going to occur as well so this is the difference between correlation and causation so now i explain you or i'll show you where we have used this correlation in our machine learning project so we have dealt with several regression machine learning projects in our youtube channel and uh, one such example is this house price prediction so in this project we try to uh, use machine learning algorithm to find the house prices based on several parameters so these are the parameters that we add for our uh, prediction so the crime rate what is the zone it is in and other parameters so you can see this nox here so it is the you know pollution uh, measure so it is the nitrogen oxide measure and we have rm so this rm column represents the number of room and what is the average uh, age of the people who is uh, in that particular house and other parameters are there and finally we have this l stat so l stat represents the median house price value so this is our target variable our house price okay so here we try to find the correlation uh, heat map here so here i have used this corr function so this function is present in the pandas library and you can watch my house price prediction uh, video if you want to get more information on this so this corr function will try to find the correlation between all the features in the data set and then we will try to plot this correlation in a heat map so i i have already explained to you that correlation is a numerical value right so it is a measure so it is a value and we try to put this value in a heat map 
so what does this eat map uh, you know tells us so in this horizontal axis it contains all the parameters and the vertical axis also contains the contains various parameters that we have okay and this uh, bar represents the value of correlation so plus one means there is a dark color and this means that two variables are highly positively correlated that if one variable increases the other variable also increase and if the value is negative so here we have minus 0 0.6 and the color is light right so this means that two values are negatively correlated okay so now you can look at this heat map so i'll show this example so this is rm so rm represents the number of rooms in a particular house and this price so there is this price column sorry i told that l stat is the price so it is not the price so we have a other column called as price so this represents in thousand dollars so 24 means 24000 uh, us dollars okay so l stat is not the price now let's compare the number of rooms present in a house and the price of the house so if you just look at this value you will see that there is a 0 0.7 value so that means the two values are positively correlated that is they are highly positively correlated that means if the number of rooms increases in house the price of the house is also going to increase okay and let's try to look at this tax if the tax is more in that particular uh, for that particular house the price is negatively correlated so there is a negative correlation between tax and price whereas there is a positive correlation between number of rooms and price so what is the importance of finding this correlation so this will help us to select important features so not all the features in our data set are important so you can see here we have various features and finding this correlation will help us to find which uh, you know features are uh, related to the price and which features we can select for our prediction so then we can choose appropriate models for the prediction so this is the you know importance of finding this correlation uh, in a particular data set so that is all about correlation and causation and i hope you have understood all the things that are covered in this video which we have is hypothesis testing so in this video let's understand what is meant by an hypothesis and the two types of hypothesis that are null hypothesis and alternative hypothesis and then i'll explain you what is meant by hypothesis testing and then let's understand what is the importance of hypothesis testing in statistics as well as in machine learning so these are the topics which we will be covering in today's video with that being said, in case you are watching my videos for the first time, hi, in this YouTube channel, I'm making a hands-on machine learning course with Python. And if you want to learn this course from the beginning, I'll give the link for my course playlist in the description of this video and you can check that book. So let's get started with today's video. First, let's try to understand what is meant by an hypothesis. Hypothesis is an assumption that is made based on the observations of an experiment. So whenever we are carrying out a statistical experiment or a statistical study, we come to a conclusion or an inference. So we can call this also an assumption. So this is nothing but the hypothesis that we are giving based on the evidence. So here the evidence which we have is the data. Okay. So it is the result or inference. So hypothesis is the result or inference or the assumption that we are making based on our data. Okay. And we have two types of hypothesis. One is null hypothesis and the next one is alternative hypothesis so what is meant by these two types of hypothesis null hypothesis is the commonly accepted fact and uh, alternative hypothesis is something which is opposite to null hypothesis and it challenges the null hypothesis okay so let's say that there is a marketing company and they have two strategies to promote a product and they are carrying out some statistical based study to find which one is a better uh, means of strategy and they concluded that uh, strategy number one is more suitable for that particular product and this will be the null hypothesis because this particular uh, inference or this particular result has been accepted by everyone and let's say after a few days someone else came and they are carrying out more number of uh, you know experiments and they conclude that uh, strategy number two is more efficient and it becomes an alternative hypothesis now we can say that the two hypotheses are opposite to each other right so null hypothesis is, is the one which has previously been accepted by everyone and alternative hypothesis is one which challenges the previously accepted hypothesis okay so this is the difference between the two and i'll also explain you this with an interesting example so one example for null hypothesis which we can think of is 2000 years back ptolemy proposed that sun stars and other planets revolve around the earth okay so earth is the center of the universe and other planets sun and stars revolve around the earth so this kind of a model is called as a geocentric model because earth is considered to be at the center and uh, 
After that, people like Aryabhatta and Copernicus proposed that Earth and other planets revolve around the Sun. So, Sun is the central one and other planets on Earth revolve around the Sun. So, this model is called as an heliocentric model where Sun is the central, uh, you know, uh, object or and this is the one proposed by Ptolemy is called as a geocentric model because Earth is the one here. The model proposed by Ptolemy was accepted by a lot of people based on the data that they had at that time. And we know that this is strong, right? So this is the commonly accepted fact at that point and it is called as a null hypothesis. And people came and gave an alternative hypothesis and that's called as an heliocentric model. So this is meant by the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis. And the main thing which you need to note here is, so null hypothesis is the one which has been prevailing previously and the alternative hypothesis is the one which is challenging the null hypothesis. And uh, we carry out something called as hypothesis testing to find whether null hypothesis is true or alternative hypothesis is true. Okay, so that is the purpose of an hypothesis testing. So hypothesis is an assumption that is made based on the observation of an experiment which we have discussed. And hypothesis testing is a method carried out to test the assumptions made in the experiment. So we are going to carry out or we are going to test both the assumptions we have made. And this is nothing but hypothesis testing. Now let's try to understand this with a more suitable example. Let's say that there is a pharmaceutical company and this company makes drugs for headache. So they make two drugs for headache as drug A and drug B and these two are for headache. Okay and uh, they are carrying out some statistical study to find which drug is better whether drug a is better or whether drug a is more quicker in uh, curing a headache or drug b you know takes less time to cure a headache so which one is faster in action okay so that is something which we are, which they are going to test and uh, let's say that uh, they are having two groups of people so group one and group two and people in group 1 have been administered drug A if they have a dick and people in group 2 have been administered drug B if they have a dick. Okay. And let's say that there are about 5 people in each groups. And uh, so I'm just taking a small sample size. So this is just for an explanation purpose. And generally the sample size will be very huge in this case. So let's say that there are 5 people and first person took the drug A for his dick and it took about 12 minutes to recover from, from that uh, headache, okay? So these are the time taken by each individual uh, to get recovered from that particular headache. So first person took 12 minutes and the second person took 8 minutes, 13 minutes, 10 minutes and so on. So we have 5 people and the time taken by them to recover from that particular headache. And uh, the second group of people, this is the time taken by them. So what you can see here is, so the time taken by people in group A is very less when compared to uh, people in group uh, B. So the average time taken is 10 minutes in the case of people in group A when they took drug A uh, for an addict and uh, the average time taken in the case of drug B is 15 minutes. Okay. And the null hypothesis which we are getting here is drug A takes 10 minutes on an average to cure a dick and drug B takes 15 minutes on an average to cure, uh, you know, a dick. So the hypothesis which we are getting here is drug A is more quicker. Okay, so this will be a null hypothesis because let's say that uh, everyone accepted this hypothesis. Now, few days uh, have gone by and uh, people have made some changes to the formula of, of drug B. So some changes has been made on drug B to uh, make sure that it works better. And now uh, there is another hypothesis that has been given out. So the null hypothesis is the one which states that drug A is more quicker than drug B and we have the alternative hypothesis which states that drug B is more quicker than drug B, drug A. So we know that some changes have, has been uh, done to drug B. So we know that null hypothesis and alternative hypothesis are opposite to each other. So you can see here, here the drug A is the more quicker one and based on the alternative hypothesis, drug B is the more quicker one. And this is where several tests will be made to find which one is better. Okay, so what happens here is now several statistical experiments will be done with more number of people. So multiple studies will be carried out to check whether uh, the null hypothesis is true or the alternative hypothesis is true. So the outcome which you get for the hypothesis testing in any case, so it, just not for this case, for any case, what is the possible outcomes you will get is either you will reject the null hypothesis. So in this case, if you reject the null hypothesis, we can say that uh, drug B is more quicker. So we know that uh, null hypothesis states that drug A is more quicker. And if we reject the null, null hypothesis, that means drug B is more quicker. And the other possible outcome is we may fail to reject the null hypothesis. So, you know, these words are 
are important and this is how we generally state it either we reject the null hypothesis or we may fail to reject the null hypothesis so how may this you know how this can happen so in the case where uh, let's say that about 10 studies have been made separately and in almost uh, 8 out of 10 studies drug b is uh, you know drug b takes less time than drug a to cure an headache then that means the alternative hypothesis is true and the null hypothesis will be rejected and then let's say that uh, in other case out of the 10 uh, statistical experiments that we uh, do with both the drugs uh, you know 9 out of 10 times drug a takes less time this means we cannot reject the null hypothesis and this will stay true in that case drug a will be uh, you know more quicker than drug b so these are the two possible outcomes which you take in uh, which you will get in hypothesis testing so here the main things which we have to note here are uh, we know that null hypothesis is one which has been the commonly accepted assumption and there is another hypothesis called as an alternative hypothesis which challenges that null hypothesis so only one of them can be true in a particular case and to find that one we do hypothesis testing to find uh, which one is more validated so where this can be used in statistics in statistics everything is about getting some inference getting some understanding about the data right and uh, once you get that inference you cannot just uh, go out there and tell that this is the uh, finding and this is the true you know outcome so we need to test our outcome we need to validate our outcome and this is where the hypothesis testing comes into play and as machine learning is machine learning is dependent on statistics a lot we need to understand these concepts as well where in machine learning as well we make several uh, inferences and assumption based on our machine learning model the predictions made by our machine learning model and in that case as well we need to validate our assumption in lot of the cases not in all of the cases but in lot of the cases we need to do this testing to validate our results so that is all about hypothesis testing and i hope you have understood all the things covered in this video fifth module is all about mathematics for machine learning and so far in this mathematics module we have uh, discussed about several topics on linear algebra and statistics and now we are getting started with probability so probability is another important field of mathematics on which machine learning relies a lot so it becomes important for us to learn probability so that we can understand machine learning in a deeper way okay so in this video I'll explain you what is meant by probability and what is the importance of probability when it comes to machine learning and then let's uh, discuss what are the topics that I will be covering in the upcoming videos. So this is the agenda for today's video and before getting started in case you are watching my videos for the first time hi in this YouTube channel I'm making a hands on machine learning course with Python and if you want to learn this course from the beginning I'll give the link for my course playlist in the description of this video and you can check that out. So with that being said let's get started so first let's try to answer this question what is meant by probability so this is a simple definition that explains this probability is a branch of mathematics that deals with calculating the likelihood of a given event to occur okay so there is a event that is going to occur and we are going to find what is the likelihood that it would occur okay so we are going to represent this uh, possibility of this event in a numerical value and in most of the cases we will take random events so i'll give you an interesting example let's say that there is a cricket match that is going to happen tomorrow and your favorite batsman is uh, you know uh, going to participate in that match and i'm asking you you know what is the probability that he will score a century in tomorrow's match and you say that there is a 50 percentage chance that he might score a century in tomorrow's match so here you are giving a number as 50 percentage right so here there is a 50 percentage chance or a 50 percentage probability that he will score a century so in this case the event that we are considering here is the batsman scoring century and the likelihood he would score century is 50 percentage so this is an example of a probability okay so let's consider some more uh, you know uh, examples that we would have studied in our uh, high school so a very simple examples and these events are very random so consider rolling a dice so plural is dice and the singular form is die and uh, die has values from 1 to 6 right so when you roll a die you will get values as either 1 2 or all the way up to 6 so you will get uh, you know one value out of it from 1 to 6 so this is completely random right so in this case the event is getting a number uh, you know from 1 to 6 and in this case we will try to find the probability of getting a number so you may try to find the probability of getting 3 when you roll a die or 
getting uh, you know probability of getting a number 5 when you roll a die so this is one example which you can consider so another random event which we can think about is tossing a coin okay so these are standard examples when we when it comes to probability so when you toss a coin there, there are two possibilities you will either get a head or you will get a tail right so you can try to find the probability of uh, you know getting a head when you toss a coin or a probability of getting a tail when you toss a coin so this is another example and let's consider uh, you know one more example so let's say that a bag contains different colored balls so it contains yellow colored balls green colored balls blue and red colored balls okay so let's close our eyes and try to take a ball from this particular bag and what is the probability that you will find or you will pick a green colored ball so this is one example so in this case the event we are considering is picking a green colored ball and the likelihood may be some uh, you know numerical value so these are some examples of uh, probability where we will try to assign a value that represents the likelihood of an event to occur okay so with this understanding let's uh, you know try to uh, make more sense on what is the importance of probability when it comes to machine learning so what is machine learning what we do in machine learning so just answer this question so in machine learning we have data and we use this data and we use this data to train a machine learning model so we have a lot of uh, different machine learning models and this machine learning model will try to find the patterns or relationship that is present in this data and this patterns can be very helpful to you know predict future values so and the main aspect here in machine learning is the machine learning model right as we have discussed so this is an example of a logistic regression curve and we have a logistic regression model as well in machine learning let's say that we want to find whether a person has diabetes or not so consider this example and uh, we have a particular data set that gives uh, you know uh, blood sugar level of a person age of a person gender etc and whether they have diabetes or not and we train our logistic regression model on this particular data set and once you train this data set it can predict whether the person has diabetes or not okay so now what this model does is it actually tries to find the probability uh, what is the probability that a person will have diabetes or what is the probability that a person won't have diabetes so it's actually trying to find the probability so hence it is it becomes very important for us to learn probability because it makes more sense once we you know try to learn models and classification models rely a lot on probability because it's just predicting the probability of an event to occur in this case the event can be finding whether the person has diabetes or not okay and another main aspect of this is so there is one main concept in machine learning called as loss function so loss function will help us to find the distance between the predicted value and the original value okay so let's say that uh, we want to find the house price okay so we are going to predict the price of houses in a particular area and we use some machine learning model for this and here y cap represents the value predicted by our model and y i is the original value the true value of that particular house and let's say that we have about 10 values so n represents 10 and what we do is we try to find the difference between them so y i is the true value and y cap is the value predicted by our model so once you find the difference between uh, you know those values and for all those 10 uh, data points we will get a value and this represents the distance between the true value and the value predicted by our model and it is very helpful for us in model optimization so once you get this loss function based on that you can choose better optimization models so loss function depends on probability a lot so you know in the future in our course we will discuss a lot about this loss function so just uh, you know try to remember that loss function is something that uh, you know tells us the distance between the value predicted by our model and the true value so that's one main thing you need to take note of and it depends on probability and apart from this uh, as i have told you there is optimization of machine learning models and the model training and these are the aspects of machine learning where uh, we need to have a better understanding of probability because uh, several concepts of probability plays a very important role in them okay so this is the importance of probability when it comes to machine learning so now let's you know uh, discuss what are the topics that i will be covering in this particular module so first let's try to understand what are the basics of probability so i'll explain you you know probability in a more detailed way with some examples and then let's discuss what is meant by random variables and their types and uh, probability distribution so there are different distributions that we you know generally have and i'll explain you what are the distribution and what is the importance of them and maximum likelihood is another uh, you know important concept in probability 
and bias theorem so bias theorem is also one main thing which we need to you know understand very clearly and there is another concept in probability called as information theory and in information theory we have two uh, concepts uh, that are cross entropy and information gate so cross entropy is actually a loss function it is actually a type of loss function cross entropy so we will discuss about this so these are the eight topics that uh, we will be discuss discussing in the upcoming video so this is a tentative you know uh, topics so i may add few more topics as well so i hope you are uh, you know excited to learn probability and I, i hope you have understood all the things that we have covered in this video in this video let's understand some of the basic concepts of probability so what is meant by probability and how we can calculate the uh, probability value and such kind of things so once we have this understanding we can go on with the more advanced concepts of probability okay so this is the agenda for today's video so before getting started in case you are watching my videos for the first time hi in this youtube channel i am making a hands on machine learning course with python and if you want to learn this course from the beginning i'll give the link for my course playlist in the description of this video and you can check that out so let's get started with today's video so let's first first try to understand what is meant by probability and i have actually uh, you know explained this in the previous video but let me you know explain you this again so it can be a recap for you so probability is a branch of mathematics that deals with calculating the likelihood of a given event to occur so here there is an event so there is a event of interest for us and we are going to find what is the likelihood that this event would occur so this, we will just represent this in terms of a numerical value so i'll give you an example let's say that there is a cricket match that's going to happen tomorrow and your favorite batsman is going to play in that particular match and i'm asking you what is the chance that he will score a century in tomorrow's match and let's say that you are telling me that there is a 50 percentage chance that he will score century tomorrow so this is actually an example of probability so you are giving a 50 percentage probability that he will score a century in the tomorrow's game so in this case the event that we are uh, interested in here is uh, the batsman scoring a century and the likelihood that he will score a century is 50 percentage so this is a typical example of probability so let's try to understand with some examples so uh, rolling a die so rolling a die is a uh, typical example in probability so i'll ask you two questions in this case so first one is what is the probability of getting a number greater than 10 when we roll a die okay and the second question is what is the probability of getting a number less than 10 when we roll a die okay so we can just think about this in terms of percentage also so whichever is uh, you know simple to you so i'll just give you uh, you know two seconds so you can just think about this and try to answer this questions so the first question is what is the probability that the number will be greater than 10 when you roll a die so in this case the answer will be zero because there is no chance that we will get this value because a die contains values from 1 to 6 okay no values are greater than 10 right so all the values 1 to 6 are less than 10 so there is zero probability zero percentage probability that we will get a number that is greater than 10 whereas in this case there is a 100 percentage chance that we will get a number less than 10 because all the values 1 to 6 are less than 10 right so in this case the probability is 1 so we have a zero probability probability in the case of an impossible event so this is an impossible event right so in this case the event is getting a number greater than 10 in this case the event is getting a number less than 10 so in this case there is a zero percentage chance so this is an impossible event whereas this is an 100 percentage chance so this is a certain event so we are getting values as 0 and 1 and these are the two extremes so we can add one more point to this definition as the probability value lies between 0 and 1 okay so now let's try to analyze this value so what is this probability value and why it lies between 0 and 1 so we know that the probability value lies between 0 and 1 and let's take a scale okay so let's say that this represents a scale and the first value in this scale is 0 and the last value represents 1 okay so and i have already explained you that 0 represents an impossible event and 1 represents a certain event so impossible event means that event won't occur in any situation and certain event means it will occur all the time so we have discussed about the dice example as well so the likelihood of getting a number greater than 10 is impossible so its probability is 0 and uh, likelihood of getting a number less than 10 is 1 so it will occur all the time okay so these are the two extremes now all your probability value all your likelihood of even to occur will lie between 0 and 1 in all the cases so in any case you take the value will be between 0 and 1 because there is 
nothing less than impossible right so there is nothing beyond impossible and not, nothing that is greater than certain nothing that is greater than 100 percentage so you won't be having any negative values okay so all the values will be either zero or greater than zero and it won't be less than zero and, or uh, it won't be negative value and all the values will be within one okay and uh, in the middle we have the value as 0.5 so this is just half way right and this represents the half chance so when you toss a coin there is a 50 percentage chance of getting a head or getting a tail so that will be in this uh, you know middle line so this represents the half chance of 0.5 so this is exactly in the middle of these two values now we can also represent this 0 as 0 percentage so sometimes probability is represented in terms of percentage where a 0 we can represent as 0 percentage so 0.5 can be represented as 50 percentage and 1 can be represented as 100 percentage so okay so probability can also be represented in terms of a uh, fraction so 0.5 means 1 by 2 okay so in the case of uh, tossing a coin example as well so 1 by 2 isn't uh, you know uh, the probability value here the most uh, commonly used values is this one so the values between 0 and 1 but you know it's uh, you can note that we can use this values as well so here the main thing you need to note here is the probability value lies between 0 and 1 and 0 represents that there is no way that that event can occur so this it is an impossible event and one is a certain event so these are terminologies in uh, probability okay so zero represents zero percentage chance for a event to occur and one represents that a certain event will occur now uh, let's try to you know uh, consider some examples and try to find the probability value of those examples so how you can let's say we know that the value lies between zero and one right now there can be a question for you on how you can find this value how you can find the values either 0 or 1 or it is uh, 0 0.2 0 0.3 etc so there should be some way right of uh, calculating this value and that is what we are going to discuss now so probability of an event to occur is equal to number of ways an event can occur divided by total number of outcomes so when you substitute some values in this particular formula you will get the probability value so this is the formula so this may not make sense when you just uh, you know read it for the first time but i'll explain you with this example then it will make more sense so now we are considering tossing a coin example okay and what are the possible outcomes so we just have two outcomes one is uh, heads and tails so heads represents getting a head and t represents getting a tail now we need to find this number of ways an event can occur and total number of outcomes so in this case the total number of outcomes is only two so because we have only yet the tail right so p of h represents probability of getting yet now what is the ways it can occur so the number of ways an event can occur so in this case how many ways it can occur so there is only one way it can occur so when the coin lands on yet we can say that uh, we get a probability right so there is a uh, you know uh, the total number of outcomes in this case is 2 and number of ways it can occur is 1 there is just only one way when the uh, coin you know lands on it and the probability of getting uh, tails is 1 by 2 okay so they actually are both the both of them are same and we can say that the probability of getting it is 0 0.5 and in this case getting a tail is 0 0.5 as well so both are same now let's consider another example of rolling a die so in this case the possible outcomes are 1 2 3 4 5 6 so any numbers can we can get any uh, of these six numbers when you roll a die so now let's say what is the probability of finding uh, you know of getting five so number of ways an event can occur when you can get a five when you roll a die when uh, the upward face the face that is facing you when you roll a die is five right so there is only one chance in this case but in this case the total number of outcomes is six okay so whereas in the case of coin example the total number of outcomes is 2 so the denominator should contains the total number of outcomes and the numerator the number of ways and even can occur so it's only 1 uh, in this 6 so it's 1 by 6 and 1 by 6 represents 0 0.16 so in this case the probability of getting the value 5 when you roll a die is 0 0.6 and there is another even that can occur what is the probability that you will get an even number when you roll a die so actually there are three ways this event can occur so in this case the event is getting an even number and what is the number of ways so if you get a 2 it is an even number 4 is an even number and 6 is an even number so the number of ways you will get this event is 3 okay so you just uh, you know uh, note this formula so in this case the number of ways is 3 the three ways are getting 2 4 and 6 okay and hence it is 3 by 6 so 3 represents this number of ways an event that is number of times you can get even number divided by the total number of outcomes in this case the total number of outcomes is the same which is 6 and uh, when you calculate this the value which you will get is 0.5 
So the probability of getting a uh, five in this particular uh, rolling of one sing one uh, die is zero point one six, and getting an even number is point five. Okay, whereas in the case of uh, tossing a coin, uh, the probability of getting eight is one by two, and the probability of getting a tail is uh, also one by two. So there are also multiple, uh, you know, complex things which you can do here. So you can just consider about uh, tossing two coins at a time or three coins at a time, or you can also consider, uh, you know, rolling. Two days or three days or four days at a time, so it will give you you know more possibilities and more uh, you know different po you know probability values. So this is how you can find the probability of a particular event that can occur. And uh, that's it for this video. And I hope you have understood all the things that I have. Our topic we have for today is random variables. So in this video, let's discuss what is meant by a random variable and uh, what is the importance of random variables in probability with suitable examples and also the different types of random variables that we have so this is the agenda for today's video so before getting started in case you are watching my videos for the first time hi in this youtube channel i'm making a hands on machine learning course with python and if you want to learn this course from the beginning i'll give the link for my course playlist in the description of this video so do check that out with that being said let's get started with today's video so first of all, let's try to understand what is meant by a random variable in probability. So a random variable is a numerical description of the outcomes of random events. So there is another way of uh, you know explaining random variables. So it is a random variable maps the outcomes of random events to numerical values. Okay. So first, let's try to understand this uh, random events. Okay. So in probability, we often deal with events that are random. So for example, you can think about tossing a coin. So when you toss a coin, you may get a eight or you may get a tail and it is completely random, right? So or you can also consider rolling a dice. So when you roll a die, you can get any six values that it has. So it is also completely random. And that is all about probability. So in probability, we try to find what is you know most probable value that we may get based on some methods which we have already discussed so a random variable is something that assigns a numerical value to that random event so it would assign a you know numerical value for eggs when you toss a coin and it would assign a numerical value when you get a you know tail when you toss a coin so that is meant by a random variable where we try to assign a numerical value or a random uh, variable is something so one second so you can just uh, see this definition so it makes you know more uh, clear sense and it is very simple to understand so a random variable maps the outcomes of random events to numerical values so let's try to understand this with uh, some examples so the one we have already discussed so consider tossing a coin okay so let's say that x is a random variable so we uh, you know represent the random variable in this case by x so you can take any uh, you know uh, symbols like x or y anything you want let's say that x has some values so x has 0 and 1. So x can have two values. It's either 0 or 1. So it can take the value 0 when uh, it when you get a 8. Okay, so let's consider we are tossing a coin and when we get 8, so the value of x will be 1. And when we uh, you know get tail, the value will be 1. So what we are doing is we are assigning numerical values, right? So here x will be the random variable and 0 and 1 are the possible values that we are taking and the random event in this case here is getting a head or getting a tail okay so we have a random variable and we have a random event so this random variable assigns the numerical value that are 0 and 1 to this random event so now you can go through this definition and it would make sense okay so there are some random events that are happening and we want to assign some numerical value okay so this is about random variables and let's try to understand you know with you know few more examples and after that let's also see what are the applications of random variables okay so the first example is the one which we have discussed so x is equal to 0 if x and 1 is and x is equal to 1 if tail okay and let's consider another example let's say that y is equal to weight of a random person in a class so let's say that there are about 50 students in a class and we are going to randomly choose some student okay and uh, the weight of the random person in that class let it be y so in this case y is the random value so here there is a randomness because we are randomly choosing a person and uh, to find the probability of you know choosing a random person we can write as p of weight of a random person so this means probability of uh, you know weight of a random person in a class is less than 60 kg so this is the probability we are taking so in a class of 50 students we are randomly taking one student 
and uh, we are checking whether that person is uh, you know as a weight of less than 60 kg so this is an example of probability right so instead of writing this you can do a simple notation so you can represent this in a simple notation as p of y is less than 60 here we know that y is nothing but the weight of a random person in a class so this is one advantage of using random variables so it helps you to you know give some uh, numerical values to uh, random events and also it is helpful for writing you know more meaningful mathematical notations okay so here we can say that p of our probability of y is less than 60 where y is the weight of a random person in a class so you may think why we need to do this why we need to give numerical values to these random events so you know when you give this uh, there are several applications where it would be helpful for us to you know uh, take decisions to analyze which outcome is better for us which outcome is beneficial for us so let's consider some applications where this random variables can be used so turnover of a company in a given time period and price change of an asset over a given time period so these two examples are you know almost similar to each other let's say there is a company and uh, they are you know trying to find the probability of how much turnover they may make in a given time period so this time period can be one year or two year okay so in that time period they can assign some numerical values to the events so one event can be that they make uh, you know a 50 percentage more profit or there can also be a chance that they make a uh, 50 percentage less profit okay so they may assign values to this and when you analyze this based on this context it will help us to you know make better decisions and this is where random vari variables is very helpful okay so this example is very common when you uh, you know learn random variables so you will uh, come across a lot of this examples when you try to learn random variables where you assign zero for it and one for time okay so i hope you have understood what is meant by random variables now let's discuss what are the two types of random variables and before going into that i just wanted to uh, you know explain one more thing so this is very different from the variables that we see in algebra so in algebra we may say that x is equal to uh, you know or x plus y is equal to 3 so uh, what that means so i'll just take uh, you know i'll just represent this here so let's say that x is equal to so x is e or x plus 3 is equal to 5 okay so in this case we can find the value of x so if we subtract uh, you know 3 from 5 we get x is equal to 2 right so just tolerate with this handwriting i'm not used to this so this is an example of an algebraic uh, variable where x plus 3 is equal to 5 and when you solve this you can get x is equal to 2 here x is the unknown variable unknown value and you can solve this but this is very different or very you know very different when you compare this with random variables so what i wanted you to understand here is random variable is completely different from an algebraic variable okay so then let's uh, discuss about the types of random variables that we have so there are two main types of random variable they are discrete random variables and continuous random variables a discrete random variable is one that takes only discrete or distinct values okay so what is meant by this discrete or distinct value so the values are fixed so you can think about the coin toss that we have discussed uh, as of now so coin has only two sides it's either yet or or tail right so we don't have a third side so a coin has two fixed outcomes so a coin toss has two fixed outcomes and there is uh, you know none other than that okay so this is an example of a discrete or fixed value okay so this is an example of random variable so the one we have discussed and another example is let's say that we have a you know a bag and this bag contains uh, several balls okay so let's say that this bag contains about 20 balls and uh, the different colors uh, that bag contains are red blue and green okay so let's say that there are about uh, uh, five red colored balls five green colored balls and 10 blue colored balls so totally we have 20 balls and in this case the color of the ball is fixed right so in this case let's we can assign a random value for this or sorry random variable for this uh, as we have seen for uh, you know the point so you can say that zero is equal to red when uh, you know the uh, ball color is red or one when the ball color is blue and some other value say two if the ball color is green okay so you, you can assign any values basically so that is an example of a discrete variable where uh, the values are fixed and a continuous random variable is one that can take any value in a given range so the example which we have discussed which is weight of a random person in a class so weight of a person can be 60.5 it can be 60.3 or you know or 59.5 
So there is not any fixed values. So there is a range and the value can lie in that range. So it can take decimal values and it can be of uh, you know any value in that particular range. Whereas in the case of discrete values, the values are fixed or distinct or discrete. Okay. So that is the difference between discrete random variables and continuous random variables. So that is all about the random variables and its types. And I hope you have understood all the things covered in this video. And in this video, let's discuss what is meant by probability distribution for a random variable. Okay, so this is the topic we have for today. And in case you are watching my videos for the first time, hi, in this YouTube channel, I'm making a hands on machine learning course with Python. And if you want to learn this course from the beginning, I'll give the link for my course playlist in the description of this video and you can check that out. So with that being said, let's get started with today's video. So first of all, I'll give you a recap on random variables. So in the previous video, we have discussed in detail about uh, what is meant by a random variable with some examples. So I'll just give you a quick recap and then let's, uh, you know, discuss about probability distribution. So a random variable is a numerical description of the outcomes of random events. Okay. So there are several random events like tossing a coin or rolling a dice and we deal with probability for those random events. and Random variable is something where we assign some numerical value to those random events. Okay. So in other words, you can say that a random variable maps the outcomes of random events to numerical values. So the thing about random variables is we need to assign some numerical value to the random events that can happen. Okay. So let's consider this with an example. Let's uh, say that we are tossing a coin and uh, let's say that X is the random variable and we can say that x is equal to 1 or 0 and x is equal to 1 if uh, the coin lands on it. Okay, so if we get a yet, then the random uh, variable value will be 1 and if we get tail, then the random variable value will be 0. Okay, so here x is the random variable, 1 and 0 are the possible numerical values that we can have and uh, yet and tail are the random events that we are you know getting so you can have any values in this case so i have given one and zero and this is the general values that are taken for this particular coin toss example but you can take any values in this one okay so the thing which you need to note here is that we are having a random events and we are assigning some values to this uh, random events okay so this random variable is completely different from the algebraic variables that we would have you know learned so in algebra, we may have some equations like uh, x square is equal to x plus 5 or something like that. Okay. And uh, if you solve that particular equation, you will get the value of x and that x value won't change for that particular equation. But in the case of probability, when we consider random variable, the value of this random variable is completely dependent on these events. And we know that uh, the events are random. So the values will be random as well. Okay, so that is the difference between an algebraic variable and a random variable in probability. Okay, so now let's discuss what is meant by this probability distribution when it comes to a random variable. So the probability distribution for a random variable describes how the probabilities are distributed over the values of the random variable. So this is the formal definition and this means that we have different values for a random variable for a particular event and we try to, you know, uh, find out the values are distributed for these random values. So this may be a bit, uh, you know, uh, confusing if you just watch this uh, definition alone. Let's try to understand this with an example. So let's say that we are tossing three coins in this case. So and uh, let's say that X is the random variable in this case and X is nothing but the sum of number of hits when three coins are tossed. Okay, so we are tossing three coins. And if we get one coin as yet and the remaining two coins as tail, then the random, uh, you know, variable value will be one. If we get two yet, then the random variable value will be two. And if we get three yet, the random variable value will be three. And if we get all the, you know, coins as tail, then the random variable value will be zero because this is the one we are considering where random variable is the sum of the number of hits when three coins are tossed. Okay. Now, as I have told you before, the value of a random variable changes depending on the outcome that you get. Okay. So in this particular experiment, tossing three coins experiment, let's see what are the different possibilities we have. What are the different possible outcomes that we have? Okay. So we may get three hits when we toss three coins. So in that case, the random variable variable value would be three because, uh, you know, we are just adding the number of hits. So when you get three hits, the random variable value is three. 
and uh, the other possibility is that you can get all the three coin as tails and in that case the random value will be zero because the number of eights is zero in this case and you may also get two eights where the value will become two and you may get uh, again two eights but uh, you know this one is eights eights and tail and this one is eight tail and eight this is also two number of eights and we may also get one tail and two eights in a different you know order so this is also one possibility and the other possibility can be two tails and one yet and it can be a uh, yet tail and tail and um, this one is tail yet and yet so we are just adding the number of hits we are getting and this is nothing but our random variable so these are the different possible values that we can get for this random variable x okay so i hope you are clear uh, uh, you know up to this point so we are carrying out an experiment and this we are considering random variable as the sum of number of weights and these are the different values we are getting for uh, you know this particular experiment now we need to find how the values are distributed overall so these are the values of the random variable and now let's see what is the probability of these values so this is called as a probability distribution so we have all the uh, possibilities here and if we put this in a table, so generally probability distribution will be represented in a table and uh, this is how we can represent this. So x is nothing but the random variable which is the sum of the number of hits. So you can get 0 hits. So 0 hits means all the uh, you know coins are tails. So this particular outcome. So all the coins will be tails and uh, the you know 1 means there will be 1 head and 2 tails and 2 represent there will be 2 heads and uh, sorry this one. So there will be two tails and one net and two eights means uh, these two. So these three are the outcome where we will get two eights and uh, three eights is nothing but this one outcome. Okay. So these are the different random variables and we have on these are the probability of the random variables. So now the total number of outcomes we have is eight. Okay. So you can see here. So totally we have eight number of outcomes and if you want to find the probability for getting zero eights. So there is only one probability there is only one chance right so when you get all the coins uh, as tails this is the only one probability where you will get zero hits so it will be one divided by eight where one is the number of times you are getting in this particular experiment so only once we can get all the values as tails and divided by the total number of outcomes here the total number of outcomes is eight so it's one by eight and uh, if you consider getting only one eight so you can see here getting one head is there is three chances right so it can be tail tail eights or it can be eight tails tails and it can be tail, eight and tail. Okay, so these are the three possibilities. So the probability in this case will be three by eight, where three is the number of times we can get only one head and eight represents the total number of outcomes. And uh, again, we have uh, getting two eights. So these are the three possibilities, eight, eight and tail, eight, tail and eight, and tail, eight and eight. So these are the three possibilities where you will get two eights. And again, there are three chances out of eight. So it is three by eight. And finally, getting three eights. So there is only one possibility that is uh, getting all the three coins as eights. And out of these eight outcomes, in only one outcome, we can get all the coins as eight. So the probability is one by eight. Okay. So each value, so each value, one by eight, three by eight, three by eight, and one by eight. So each value represent a probability for getting zero. So the probability of getting a zero is one by eight, and probability for getting uh, one. Uh, one eight is three by eight and probability of getting two eights is three by eight and probability of getting three eights is also one by eight okay so this is the probability we are getting and if you just consider this in a decimal value so we can get that one by eight is nothing but 0 0.125 and three by eight is 0 0.375 so they are all similar okay so we know that the probability value ranges from zero to one so it cannot go uh, go beyond uh, zero so it cannot go to negative values and the probability values cannot be greater than one okay so these are the values that we get so this is how the probability is distributed so you can also you know consider the percentage of this particular uh, thing so what is the percentage of one in eight or three by eight so this is how we find the probability distribution for a random variable where uh, we have in this case there is another thing we can note that the probability of getting three eights and the probability of getting zero eights is the, is the same where it is one by uh, eight which is one in eight chance so the probability of getting uh, zero eights and three eights is same and also the probability of getting one eight and two eight is also same which is three by eight so this is another thing which we need to note so this is all about probability distribution and we may also call this as a discrete probability distribution okay so discrete means something that is uh, you know distinct something that for which the value is fixed 
in this case the values are fixed as either head or tail so there is nothing you know in between head and tail so you cannot get uh, both head and tail you cannot get half head and half, half tail right so these values are discrete because they are fixed there is no continuous values so these values are discrete and we can call this distribution as discrete probability distribution okay so this is all about random variables and uh, probability distribution of random variables and this is also another main important thing which we need to be aware of in probability okay so i hope you have understood all the things covered in this video in today's video we are going to discuss what is meant by a normal distribution and what is meant by skewness of data so this is a very simple concept yet we encounter this very often when it comes to data analysis so whenever we try to analyze the data we will try to find what is the distribution and normal distribution is one of those types which uh, we encounter very often okay so let's try to understand what is meant by this normal distribution and what is meant by skewness in this particular video so before getting started in case you are watching my videos for the first time hi in this youtube channel i am making a hands on machine learning course with python and if you want to learn this course from the beginning i'll give the link of my course playlist in the description of this video so you can check that out with that being said let's get started with today's video so first of all let's try to understand about normal distribution so a normal distribution is an arrangement of a data set in which most of the data points lie in the middle of the range and the rest taper off symmetrically towards either extreme okay so this is the formal definition of normal distribution so you can pause the video and you can go through this definition again so let's try to understand what uh, what is conveyed by this definition so we have a data set and uh, i would like to give you the difference between what is meant by a data set and what is meant by a data point let's say that there are 100 students in a class and we are measuring the height of all the 100 students in that particular class so height of all the 100 students is called as a data set and height of each individual student is called as a data point so data set represents the entire data and data point represents the individual data okay so that is the difference between them so a data set in this case contains 100 data points right okay so this is the difference between them now let's try to understand about this normal distribution so in this particular data set what happens is majority of the data points so most of the data points lie in the middle range so let's say that the height of the students so uh, sorry the height uh, ranges from 120 centimeter to 210 centimeter okay so most of the students tend to be in the middle range so let's say that the middle range of uh, student height is 160 centimeter to 170 centimeter and most of the students will tend to be in this average height and there will be less number of students who fall in this 120 uh, centimeter and there will be also less number of students who are in the range of uh, 200 centimeter okay so this kind of uh, distribution is called as a normal distribution so if i explain you this with this curve you it will make more sense okay so you can understand this better so we have height in the x-axis and probability in the y-axis now as i have uh, told you in the height example so let's say that this uh, particular point represents uh, height of maybe 120 centimeter and this particular end represents height of 210 centimeter okay so this curve represents the number of people we have okay so the number of people in that particular height range so y axis represents that so in this case you can see here the curve is uh, curve as a bump here so this means most number of people are in this particular height so in this height there are more number of people whereas in this two height ranges so in this left extreme and right extreme there are very less number of students with that particular height okay so this is an example of a normally distributed curve and uh, the y-axis represents probability the probability of finding a student in that particular height okay so we know that the probability value ranges from 0 and 1 so 0 is the minimum value that you can have for a probability and one represents the maximum value you can have for a probability okay and let's say that uh, this particular uh, point represents a probability of 0.8 let's say that the height in this case is 160 centimeter or uh, 165 centimeter okay so this point represents a height of 160 centimeter now uh, a probability of 0.8 represents we have a 80 percentage chance that we will find a student with height of 165 centimeter so this is what is represented by this probability so we have the value in the x-axis and we have the probability of finding that value in the y-axis. So this is how a normally distributed curve looks like. Okay. So a normally distributed curve or the normal distribution can also be called as a Gaussian distribution. Okay. So the other name for normal distribution is Gaussian distribution. 
and we may also call this uh, normal distribution as a bell shaped curve as you can see here this is in the shape of a bell right so this is an example of a uh, bell shaped curve and the other thing which you need to note here is this curve is symmetrical about its central axis so you can consider the central vertical axis and this curve is symmetrical about the uh, two other sides to the left side and the right side so this is all about normal distribution so the main thing which you need to note here is most of the data will be uh, situated in this middle range and uh, in the either of the two extremes left extreme and right extremes there will be less number of data points okay so that is what is represented by this uh, particular line so the rest taper off symmetrically towards either extreme so there is a taper in this curve right so there is a slant in either side where we have less number of values in either extremes and more number of values in the central region okay so that is all about normal distribution now let's try to understand what is meant by this skewness so a skewed data is completely different from a normally distributed data so we understood that what is meant by a normally distributed data now let's discuss about skewness so a data is considered skewed when the distribution curve appears distorted or skewed either to the left or to the right in a standard distribute in a statistical distribution okay so this is the definition of skewness we know that a normal distribution is symmetrical right a normal distribution curve is symmetrical whereas a skewed distribution curve uh, won't be symmetrical okay so there are two kinds of skewness one is negative skewness and uh, positive skewness so we can call this as negatively skewed and positively skewed okay so in this case you can see here in the case of negatively skewed uh, curve there will be a taper or a slant in the left side okay in the negative region so we know that in number system we take negative values in the left side and positive values in the right side here skew represents so the word skew represents the slant so here the slant is in the left side so hence it is called as a negatively skewed and in the case of a negatively skewed data we have more number of data in the right extreme in the positive region okay so in the case of positively skewed data the taper or the slant is in the right side and we have more number of data in the left side okay so in the case of negatively skewed we have more number of data in the right side whereas in the case of positively skewed we have more number of data in the left side so that is the difference between these two okay and the central one is the normal normally distributed data okay so which is symmetrical about the two axes so the other thing which we are going to discuss is mean median and mode so these are the three main important parameters right so this is called as central tendencies mean median mode so these values are called as central tendencies and we have discussed about what is meant by a mean median and mode in our uh, statistics video so i'll give the link for that video in the description of this video as well okay so you can check that out as well so mean represents the average value if there are 100 students in a class and we are measuring the height we sum up all the heights and divide it by 100 so it is nothing but the sum of all the values divided by total number of values and this value represents mean and median is nothing but the central value the middle value so in this case we try to order uh, you know we try to ascending order so we try to arrange the values in the ascending order and we try to find which is the middle value and that middle value is called as the median and mode is nothing but the most number of repeated values okay so that is the difference between mean median and mode so when it comes to a normal distribution so the mean median mode will be in the central region okay whereas when it comes to a negatively skewed uh, data the mode will be in the right side because we know that this is where uh, most number of data points are uh, situated right so the mode will be in the right hand side and median will be in the middle portion of the data the entire data and mean will be in the left side when it comes to a negatively skewed data and this will be completely opposite when it comes to a positively skewed data so the most number of data are present in the uh, left side so the mode will most probably in this particular region and we have median in this particular region so medium is nothing but the middle value and we have mean in this particular region so this is how the parameter looks for uh, these three kinds of distribution okay so you can think about the examples of uh, the skewed data as well so you can consider this example average income of people in different cities okay so let's say that uh, there is a city where more number of people tend to make more income okay so let's take income in the x-axis so uh, left side represents people with lower income and right side represents people with higher income so let's say that a there is a city in which people tend to make more income so it will be an example of a negatively skewed data because we have more number of data in this particular region so let's say that there is a city which is comparatively poorer and more number of people in that particular city 
makes very less income so in this case we have more number of data in this left side region so hence this is a positively skewed data so this is an example of a positive uh, skew and a negative skew okay so that is all about normal distribution and skewness and i hope you have understood all the things covered in this video machine learning and in today's video we are going to discuss what is meant by a Poisson distribution okay so this Poisson distribution is a very important concept that uh, we often encounter when it comes to data analysis and data science so in this video I'll, I'll give you a detailed explanation on this topic okay so before getting started in case you are watching my videos for the first time hi in this youtube channel i am making a hands on machine learning course with python and if you want to learn this course from the beginning i'll give the link of my course playlist in the description of this video you can check that out with that being said let's get started with today's video okay so first of all let's try to understand what is meant by this Poisson distribution okay so this is the formal definition of this kind of distribution so a Poisson distribution is a probability distribution that measures how many times an event is likely to occur within a, a specified period of time okay so there is a specific time period and there is some event that is happening and this event is happening repeatedly okay so let's say that we are taking a time duration of one hour and uh, let's say that an event is happening for 10 times in that one hour and this type of uh, event this type of distribution is called as a Poisson distribution so there is a specific time period and there is a specific event that happens for a a repeated number of time okay so this is called as a Poisson distribution so let's try to understand what is the significance of this what is the significance of understanding this distribution so Poisson distribution is used to understand independent events that occur at a constant rate within a given interval of time so this is very similar to this uh, above definition so what we are trying to explain here is so these kind of independent events so these can be random events and these random events occur at a constant rate the rate at which it happens is uh, you know uh, almost constant so in the previous example that i have given you the rate is 10 times per hour right so this understanding of rate is very helpful for us to plan for the future okay so this is the significance for it so it will make more sense once we understand the examples for this okay so let's consider some uh, you know interesting examples of Poisson distribution so first one can be number of accidents occurring in a city from 6 pm to 10 pm okay so let's take this particular time period 6 pm to 10 pm in the evening and this is a very active time period right so there will be a lot of vehicles that will be going and uh, we are trying to find how many number of uh, you know how many accidents occur in a city in this particular time period so let's say that there are about uh, 300 accidents happening in a city so if we have this information we can plan for the future so once we have this information so as i've told you we have a 300 accidents happening in this uh, particular four hours time period so what we will try to do is find the probability that uh, you know what is the probability that there will be 400 accidents occurring in a particular day or what is the probability that there will be only 200 accidents that is happening in a day so these are the different uh, questions we can uh, ask and the, this particular type of distribution will help us to understand them so as i've told you in this case we are uh, let's assume that uh, on an average there are about 300 accidents happening so the probability that uh, there will be a thousand accidents happening will be very less right so there is not like there is not going to be a thousand accidents happening so we can say that there is a very less probability for a uh, thousand accidents to occur and what is the probability that there will be you know 350 accidents happening in this particular time period in that city so the probability of this is uh, quite high right so the probability of uh, 350 accidents is more whereas the probability of a uh, thousand accidents is very less in this particular example so that is the important insight we can get from it and now uh, the other example we can think of is the number of patients arriving in an emergency room between 10 pm to 12 pm so this is another uh, typical example we take for Poisson distribution so in this case we try to you know um, find what an what in an average uh, you know number of patients that appear in an emergency room so once you have this information you can plan uh, the number of beds and other medical equipments that are, are required so this is the other uh, importance of person distribution so the other simple example you can think about is how many views does your blog gets in a day so in this uh, the time duration is one uh, day it's 24 hours and how many views we are getting okay so these are some example of person distribution and once we have this uh, numbers we can find what is the probability that an event occurs a specific number of time okay so we can find the probability of uh, different numbers as i have told 
told you so if there are about 300 accidents happening we will try to find the probability for different numbers so what is the probability that there will be 100 accidents what is the probability that there will be 250 accidents or what is the probability that there will be 500 accidents so we will try to find the probability of these different numbers okay so this is how poisson distribution works so now let's try to understand this mathematically so there is a particular formula for this to find the probability so this is it okay so here p of x so which means the probability of x is equal to e power minus lambda lambda in lambda power x and uh, divided by x factorial okay so this is the formula for poisson distribution here the x represents the number of times the event occurs okay so uh, as i have told you in the uh, previous slide that there can be uh, 100 accidents happening and there can be uh, 500 accidents happening so we are trying to find the probability of these different numbers so x can take any number of values so it can be 100 it can be 200 or anything okay and uh, lambda so lambda represents mean number of events so what is the normal average of events that is occurring so in the previous example i have told you that the mean number of accidents that occur is about 300 right so in this case lambda will be 300 and x can be any value so it can be 100 or 3 or 100 or 200 or 500 and lambda is the mean accident value which is 300 okay and we have the e e is nothing but the Euler's number and Euler's number is almost equal to 2.71828 so this is nothing but uh, the one which we take for natural logarithm rate right? so this is uh, the value of e okay so we have x which is the number of times the event occurs so we are trying to find the probability of x okay and we have uh, p of x is nothing but the probability of this uh, particular number of times and we have lambda which is the mean number of events that is uh, you know actually happening and x factorial we know what is a factorial so factorial of 5 is nothing but 5 into 4 into 3 into 2 into 1 so it is uh, the factorial of a number okay and e is nothing but oiless number so when you uh, plug the values in this particular formula you will get the probability for uh, the number of events okay so this is how we generally uh, make curves for Poisson distribution. So we have different types of curves for different values of lambda. We know that lambda represents the mean number of events. So let's say that there is a particular event happening and there is about, uh, you know, average number of event is 1. And uh, in this case, the second one is average number is 4 and in this case, it's 10. Okay, so this is how you will get a graph in this particular example. So this changes for different example actually. So in the y-axis, we have the probability of uh, you know x probability of the number of events and in the x-axis we have the number of times the event is happening so let's say that uh, so in this we have uh, 1 2 3 4 5 and up to 20 so let's say that uh, the event is happening for five times and we try to find the probability when the mean number is uh, you know four so let's take this example so let's say that uh, there are about four accidents happening in a you know in an area and uh, we try to find the probability that what is the probability that there will be five accidents happening okay so if you just try to find the probability with this particular uh, green line you will get the probability for it okay so similarly we'll get different curves for different values of lambda so this is one such example okay so this is how you can find the Poisson distribution so you can also take some examples and solve some problems regarding this Poisson distribution okay so uh, here the y-axis as i told you y-axis represents the probability and x-axis represents the uh, number of times the uh, event occurs so 5 means so let's take the x-axis is 5 that means the y-axis will be what is the probability that the event will occur 5 times so if we take uh, the x value as 10 and the y value will be what is the probability that the event will occur 10 times so you can also uh, you know understand this with in terms of uh, this particular formula so let's say let's say that we want to find the probability for x is equal to 10 so x is equal to 10 represents a event will occur 10 times in a particular time period so p of x will be what is the probability that the event occurs 10 times so you will get a probability value which will lie between 0 and 1 okay so this is all about Poisson distribution now let's try to understand where this can be useful when it comes to data science or data analysis so what is meant by data analysis oh, sorry what is meant by a data science data science is something uh, where we use uh, several statistical and machine learning models to derive insights from data so once we derive this insights it will be very helpful for several uh, reasons so when you have this insights you can make better business decis uh, decisions and the other informations as well so one such example which we can think of uh, when it comes to Poisson distribution in data science is uh, insurance companies so let's say that there is an insurance company and uh, they want to you know set insurance cost for their customers 
So what they can do is take a time period and find uh, what is the number of, so let's say that the time period is one year and uh, in this particular year, what is the number of uh, accidents that is happening? Okay, so let's, let's say that there are about 10,000 accidents happening in a year. Okay, so based on these number, they can find some uh, Poisson distribution and they can also find what is the probability that there will be a particular number of accidents as I have told you and based on this information, they can set, uh, you know, insurance prices, which is, you know, profitable for them. So this is one such example where we can uh, use Poisson distribution to understand the data better in the case of data science and data analysis use cases. Okay, so there are several other such examples. So you can also, you know, do more research on this particular topic. So that is all about Poisson distribution and I hope you have understood all the things covered in this video. The last module we discussed was on mathematics for machine learning and this sixth module is about training a machine learning model. So in this video, let's try to understand what is meant by a machine learning model and how does a machine learning model learns from the data. Okay, so this is the agenda we have for today's video. I'll also explain you what are the topics that will be covered in this particular module. Okay, so before getting started, in case you are watching my videos for the first time, hi, in this YouTube channel, I'm making a hands on machine learning course. And if you want to learn this course from the beginning, I'll give the link of my course playlist in the description of this video. You can check that out. With that being said, let's get started with today's video. So before learning about machine learning models, let's try to understand about machine learning. Okay. So whenever we talk about machine learning, there are two main things that comes to our mind. One is data and the another one is machine learning models. So these two are the main pillars of machine learning. So what is meant by machine learning? Machine learning is a technique that helps us to make intelligent machines. It helps them uh, to do intelligent tasks. So what we do in machine learning is we take a machine learning model and we feed a lots of data to this machine learning model so that it can learn from this data and it can make, uh, you know, intelligent decisions. I'll give you an example. Let's say that we want a system to see an image and tell whether the image represents a dog or a cat. In that case, what we will do is we will take a lot of data. In this case, the data will be images of dog and images of cat and we feed this uh, data to our machine learning model. Our machine learning model looks at this uh, images and it tries to find the pattern uh, between all the dogs and it will try to find the pattern between all the cats. And once it learns from these images, when you give a new image, it can tell you whether the image represents a dog or cat. This is how a machine learning uh, models work. This is how machine learning works. So we feed the data to our machine learning model and it learns from it. So you can think about Google Assistant. Google Assistant is also an application of machine learning and deep learning. So what happens in Google Assistant is the Google Assistant system is trained with a lot of speech data and uh, it learns from these uh, speech data. And whenever you say something, it understands what you are telling and it can give you a suitable response. And this is how uh, all of the machine learning applications works. With this understanding, let's try to understand what is meant by a machine learning model. So let's try to understand this from the very basics. Okay. So here we have a set of values. We have the values of X and uh, some values of Y. So totally we have five uh, set of values and the first row represents the X values and the second row represents Y value. Now the value of Y is related to the value of X. So we can call this Y value uh, as uh, independent variable. So Y is sorry, the Y is a dependent variable and X is an independent variable because the value of y depends on the value of x and uh, x doesn't depend on any value so x will be an independent variable y will be a dependent variable and we have uh, here that uh, if the value of x is 1 the value of y is 5 if value of uh, x is 2 the value of y is 7 and so on so we have five set of values now we need to find the relationship between y and x okay so if you can find the relationship between uh, these two variables you can clearly understand how a machine learning model works okay so this is the very basic of the machine learning models okay so let's try to solve this simple problem we want to find the relationship between them so how you can find the relationship between them how you can find a function or how you can find the equation that relates the two variables think about it so one way of doing this is to plot all these points in a graph okay so let's try to plot these uh, data so when you plot this you will get a graph something like this so we have x values in the x axis and y values in the y axis. Let's try to plot all these points. So first let's take 1 and 5. Here the x coordinate value will be x value 
and y coordinate value will be y value so 1 comma 5 if you plot 1 comma 5 this will be the point okay so we have the x axis value as 1 and y axis value as 5 so the second point represents the x axis value is 2 and the y axis value is uh, 7 so it's 2 comma 7 which we have here the third uh, data point is 3 comma 9 so it's given here 4 comma 11 and 5 comma 13 so this is how we are getting a plot now look at this plot what is you know the inference you can get from this so the one main thing that is obvious from this is if the value of x increases the value of y increases as well right so this is one main relation to them so they are directly proportional so if one value increases the other value also increases now we need to find this relation the exact relation so what we will do is let's try to join all these points so we can see here that all these points lie in a straight line right so we can join all these points in a straight line so if you can find the exact equation of this straight line it tells us the relationship between x and y okay so we are trying to find the equation of this line which tells us their relation so the general equation of a straight line is y is equal to mx plus c so we would have studied this in our high school so this is the equation of a line which says y is equal to mx plus c and uh, here x is the x axis value y is the y axis value and m represents the slope and c represents the intercept okay so for uh, different lines the value of uh, m will be different and the value of c will be different okay so i in the next slide i will explain you what is meant by the slope and intercept okay but just remember that m represents slope c represents intercept so if we can find what is the value of m and c we can find the relationship between x and y okay so let's try to do this so how we can find the value of m and c so we have a plot here we have a straight line and we know that the general equation is y is equal to mx plus c now let's try to find the value of m and c so how you can find this uh, value of m and c is you can use all these data points so this straight line we obtain this line from these data points right so we can also get the values of m and c from these data points as well let's see how we can do that so we have a plot so we have a straight line here and the equation of a straight line is y is equal to mx plus c and now we are going to find the values of m and c okay so let's take two points p1 and p2 let's take the second point and the third point so the second point which is 2 comma 7 represents the point p1 and the third point which is 3 comma 11 sorry 3 comma 9 represents the uh, point p2 okay so we are taking two consecutive points 2 comma 7 and 3 comma 9 okay so there is a formula to find the slope of a line so this is how you can find the slope of a line which is y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1 so you just need to take two data points so in this case we have taken uh, two data points a second and third data point so you can take any two data points uh, there is no condition that it should be consecutive so in this case we have taken two consecutive points which is second and third point but you can take second point and fourth point as well okay so in this case we have taken two points which is p1 and p2 here 2 represents the value of x1 and 7 represents the value of y1 so this is point p1 right so this represents x1 and y1 and a point p2 represents x2 and y2 so this is simple uh, you know uh, coordinate geometry so p1 is uh, uh, you can represent this p1 so i just write here so p1 can be written as this is nothing but so it's x1 and uh, y1 so it's x1 and y1 and uh, this uh, p2 will be x2 and y2 okay so it's x2 and uh, y2 okay so yeah the handwriting is horrible i know but you get the point right so 2 represents x1 and 7 represents y1 3 represents x2 and uh, 9 represents y2 if you plug these values in this uh, formula one second so i'll just remove this okay so if you plug the values of x1 x2 and y1 and y2 in this formula you will get the slope value okay so let's try to do this so y2 is 9 and y1 is 7 9 and 7 and x2 is uh, 3 and uh, x1 is 2 so when you solve this you will get the value as 2 so 9 minus 7 is 2 3 minus 2 is 1 so 2 by 1 which is equal to 2 so we get the value of slope as m is equal to 2 so the slope of this line is 2 and we can write that y is equal to 2x plus c okay now let's try to find the value of intercept intercept is nothing but c okay so how you can find the value of c is 
you can uh, take a particular point so you can take any points in this i'll take the fourth point so the fourth point is 4 comma 11 the x coordinate value is 4 and the y coordinate value is 11 and we have the equation of line here and we have also found the value of m is equal to 2 so you can write this equation as y is equal to 2x plus c because we found the value of m to be 2 right so you can put the value of 2 here so we get y is equal to 2x plus c now if you put the values of x and y in this equation in this case x is 4 and uh, y is 11 and let's try to uh, substitute the values of x and y here when you do that you will get 11 is equal to 2 into 4 plus c and when you solve this you will get c is equal to 3 so for this particular line the slope value is 2 and the intercept value is 3 okay so the one main thing which you need to understand here the one main thing which you need to understand about a line is different lines have different slopes and uh, different intercept values okay and for this particular line that we got from this data we got the slope as m is equal to 2 and c is equal to 3 now let's try to understand what is meant by this slope and intercept a slope tells you how slanting the line is how what is the orientation of the line so you get uh, this line to be oriented in at some angle right so in this case so what we shall do is okay i'll write the equation of the line in this particular uh, line so the equation of this line is y is equal to 2x plus 3 so the general equation will be y is equal to mx plus c and the value of m is equal to 2 and c is 3 so let's substitute it here and we can write this as y is equal to 2x plus 3 now let's join these two points so these two points are the ones which we took to find the value of slope right so the other way you can write slope as m is equal to dy by dx so this is a simple differential calculus so dy by dx so dy represents change of y so the change in value of y and dx represents change in value of x okay so what slope represents is for a change in value of x what is the change in value of y or in other words so in here in this case the first value is 2 and the second value is 3 if the x value changes by one unit how much does the y value change here the y value changes from 7 to 9 if uh, the inference that we can get here is if the x axis value if the x value changes by one unit the y axis value changed by two unit that's what we are getting here okay and this represents slope so this is all about slope so for a difference in x what is the difference in the value of y okay and for different slope values you will get different lines let's say that uh, we have uh, the slope as m is equal to 3 in that case you will get a line something like this so it will be you know uh, more you know this angle if you get uh, let's say that you have the slope as uh, m is equal to 1 so in that case your uh, line will be a horizontal line okay so for different values of slope you will get a different line orientation and uh, when we get m is equal to 2 for this particular slope this is the angle of the line this is the orientation of the line okay and uh, intercept so what is meant by this intercept so intercept represents the distance of this line from the origin so this particular point represents c so this point is nothing but 3 right so we have 2 and 4 here and this point is 3 and we have the intercept value as 3 here if you have the intercept value as 0 your line will start from 0 and if you have intercept value as 6 your line will start from uh, you know this point this uh, value 6 okay so yeah uh, you know changes the orientation of the line and c changes the position of the line okay so that is the difference between slope and intercept so these two are the two main parameters of a line so m and c are the parameters of the line and different uh, lines have different parameters and uh, let's try to understand what is the significance of this uh, line equation so this line equation is a function that relates x and y now we can say that y is equal to 2x plus 3 that means for if we take a value for x let's say that uh, the value of x is 2 and uh, if you substitute the value of 2 here you will get the value of corresponding y so this is just a function that relates x and y okay and for a given value of x we can find the corresponding value of y you can take any values now in the x-axis so let's say that we take the value 6 and if we plot the point here or if we substitute the value here so let's take the value of uh, 6 and if you put this in the place of x you will get uh, 2 into 6 which is 12 and 12 plus 3 15 so the sixth point will be 6 into 15 and you can do the same for uh, the seventh point if you take seventh point you can substitute the value of x as 7 
and 2 into 7 is 14, 14 plus 3 is 17. So it will be 7 comma 17. Okay. And this is how, uh, this is the importance of this line equation. So it gives you a relation. If you find this relation, you can take any values of x and you can deduce the values of y. And this is what we exactly do in machine learning. In machine learning, we take two set of values. We take some x value and we take some y value. How this can be? How can you take that in machine learning? I'll give you an example. Let's say that we want to use a machine learning model or a machine learning algorithm to find to predict the salary of a person based on their work experience. Okay, so we are taking the ex work experience in years. In that case, what we will do is we will take the work experience in x axis and we will take the salary in y axis and we will try to fit our machine learning model to this data. In this case, we fit the data to a straight line, right? In machine learning, we may use some other complex model. So machine learning is all about fitting this model to these data points so that you will get a relation, something like this. So you will get a, an equation like this. And once you have this equation, you give you can give any values. So you can uh, give any work experience value and your machine learning model can find your uh, salary. Okay, so this is how machine learning model works. So whenever you give a set of set of values of x, it can find the value of y. Before that, it needs to be trained in this data. So this fitting the machine learning model to the data points is called as machine learning model training. Okay, so I'll give you an example. So the project which we have did before in our uh, machine learning course. So this is the medical insurance cost prediction project. So in this uh, project, we tried to find uh, the medical insurance cost based on some certain parameters. So we took the parameters of age, sex, the gender of the person, their BMI, uh, if they have children or not, whether they are smoker or not, uh, what is their region and so on. And finally, we have the insurance charges. In this case, we have uh, totally six X values. So all these values from age and region represents the X values and charges represents the Y values, right? You can compare this to the graph which we have seen in the previous slide, okay? So X represents all these values, age, sex, BMI, children, smoker, region, etc. And charges represents Y value. Now we will try to fit a machine learning model to this X and Y, okay? So once we do all the data processing things, that is what we are trying to do here. So I'll just uh, go to the machine learning model training part. So this, uh, all these things are uh, data pre-processing. So you can watch that video as well. So now you can see here, we have taken a linear regression model. Linear regression is, is nothing but a normal line, the straight line which we have seen in the previous example. Now uh, we are loading this linear regression model to a variable and we are using the function fit. This fit is nothing but Fitting our, fitting our model to the data. So these two steps are very similar. So if we take this uh, previous slide, so first we plotted uh, the points and we try to fit the straight line to these data points, right? And that is what we are doing in this particular step. We are fitting the x-axis value. So this x-axis value is nothing but age, BMI, sex, etc. And y train value is the insurance cost. So we are trying to fit the linear regression, the line to this x-axis and y-axis. So once you you know, use this, you will get a relation. Okay. So that relation is nothing but a function. So you can see here, it is a function that relates X and Y. And if you give new value of uh, X, it can find the new value of Y. So in our example, in our medical insurance example, for a new example, if you give the value of uh, their age, if you uh, mention their gender, if you mention their BMI, our machine learning model can uh, predict what is their insurance cost would be. Okay, so this is how machine learning model works. So just think about it as plotting data points and fitting a curve. So it is just this. And the machine learning model training is completely based on this phenomenon. Okay, so this is very, very simple. So I hope you understood about machine learning model and this is how a model learns from the data and this is how it makes future prediction. So it tries to find a relation between the features and the target. Okay, so let's put this together. Let's uh, try to put all the things that we have learned in this uh, previous slides in a single definition. So, okay, so I'll just uh, carry out this first. So we can say that a machine learning model is a function that tries to find the relationship between the features and the target variable. So in our insurance uh, example, the features are nothing but the age, sex, BMI, children, smoker, region, etc. So totally we have six features and the target variable is nothing but the insurance cost. Okay. 
So the machine learning model is a function. So it is just a function that uh, relates the features and the target variable. So it tries to find the pattern in the data, understand the data and trains on the data. Based on this learning, a machine learning model makes prediction and recognizes patterns. Okay. So this is how a machine learning model works. And uh, just one more thing which I need to tell you. So here we have some set of uh, data points, right? And we cannot fit this data to a straight line. So in this case, what we can do is we can take some other model. So this is an example of a polynomial model and it is not a straight line. So the equation of a straight line is equal to y is equal to mx plus c. So instead of uh, m, they have given uh, here as b1 and instead of c, it is b0. But it is actually the same expression. And the equation of a polynomial curve is uh, something like this. Okay. So what I wanted to tell you here is we cannot have a linear relationship between the variables all the time. So in the example that we have considered, there is a linear relationship between them. If one value increases, the other value increases as well. So we can fit all the data in, in a straight line. But in this case, when the data is something like this, we cannot fit all this data in a straight line. So in that case, we take some other models. Similarly, in machine learning, we have uh, different complex models. Okay. So it is not just a straight line all the time. So we have different kinds of models. So some examples are logistic regression, support vector machines, k-means clustering, etc. Okay, so there are a lot of models. Logistic regression is one which takes a sigmoid curve. So you can see the shape here. It is uh, like a yes, right? And this shape is called as a sigmoid shape. And uh, this uh, kind of machine learning model is called as logistic regression. And we have also other models such as support vector machines, k-means clustering, etc. So this is all about machine learning models. And I hope you have understood all the things about a machine learning model and how does a machine learning model. And this sixth module is all about training machine learning models. So in this video, let's discuss what is meant by supervised learning and what are the different supervised learning models that we have in machine learning. Actually, we have discussed about this topic in our first module, which was on machine learning basics. But I thought that it would be a good idea to revise the topics on supervised learning and unsupervised learning as uh, the upcoming videos will be completely on uh, machine learning models okay so that a uh, deeper understanding on these topics will be very helpful for us as we move on with the other topics okay so let's get started with today's video so what is meant by supervised learning in supervised learning the machine learning algorithm learns from labeled data so the main thing to note about supervised learning is that we use labeled data set whereas in the case of uh, unsupervised learning we use unlabeled data so first of all let's try to understand what is meant by this labeled data okay Let's say that we want a machine learning model to see an image and predict whether the image represents an apple or a mango. Okay. So whenever we take a supervised learning approach, we will label this uh, data set. So all the images of apples will be labeled as uh, apples and all the images of mangoes will be labeled as mangoes. So you can also call this uh, process as annotations because we are annotating all the images. All these images will be annotated as apples and all these images will be annotated as mangoes. Okay. So we are giving the images and the corresponding label to our machine learning model. So once it gets the data, it tries to map the images and the labels. Okay. So it tries to find the patterns between the images. So for example, it can understand that if the image is almost in red color, if the fruit is in red color, then it may represent apple. If the fruit is in yellow color, then it may represent mangoes. So kind of it tries to find all the features and all the patterns in those images. And once it learns from it, when you give a new image, an unknown image, it can tell you whether that image represents an apple or a mango. So the main thing to note here is that we use labels. And this is why it's called as a supervised learning. Here we are you know supervising the machine so there is some supervision in terms of the labels okay so that's why it's called as a supervised learning and uh, there are two main types of supervised learning one is classification and the another one is regression okay so what is meant by this classification so classification is about predicting a class or a discrete values whereas regression is about predicting a quantity or continuous value so what is meant by this? So first of all, let's uh, discuss about classification. What is meant by this class or discrete value? Okay. So these values are fixed. So it's just like classifying uh, an object. So we can classify a person as male or female based on some features. We can uh, have some medical data and we can classify a person uh, based on whether they have diabetes or not. Okay. So that is basically classification. So true or false is actually a classification. So it is a class male or female. It is also a type of classification. So these are discrete values. So likewise, we try to classify data. 
whereas in the case of regression we try to predict some quantity or continuous values okay so it can be a decimal values it can be some numerical values say for example we are trying to predict the salary of a person based on their work experience or we are trying to uh, you know predict the age of a person based on some uh, features or else we can try to predict what is the price of a house based on the number of uh, rooms uh, it has and the square meters and such kind of things so those kind of problems are called as regression so you can think about this if uh, we want to predict whether a person has diabetes or not then it is a classification problem whereas if uh, let's say that we want to find what is the blood sugar level based on some data then it would be a regression because we are predicting whether a person has diabetes or not so this is a classification whereas in the case of blood sugar level we want an accurate number we want a continuous value hence it is an example of a regression so this is the example of a classification and regression and let's try to understand this with another example as well let's say that uh, we have images of dogs and cats and we want our machine learning model to find or to predict the new images as whether that image represents a dog or a cat so we feed these images to a machine learning model as this is supervised learning we will have labels so all the images of dogs will be labeled as dog and all the images of cat will be labeled as cat so the work that our machine learning model has to do is to tell whether the image represents a dog or cat here we have two classes the first class is dog and the second class we have is cat right so it will just try to predict that class or category okay so you can also think about this as category whereas in the case of regression we want to predict some number some value so think about this example let's say that we have the values of temperature and based on the uh, daily temperature we want to you know predict what will be the rainfall in centimeter so here we are predicting the centimeter so you know rainfall in centimeter which is some kind of value and we feed this data to our machine learning model and it will tell you what is the rainfall in centimeter which is a value a particular numerical value and hence this is an example of a regression problem okay so this is the difference between classification and regression so what are the important supervised learning models that we use regularly okay so let's try to understand that so these are some of the main classification algorithm that we use so the first one is logistic regression so this logistic regression is very useful for binomial classification so binomial classification is nothing but we just need to you know find two categories the example which we have seen dog or cat so we have only two categories so in the case of uh, binomial classification logistic regression is very useful and there is another important classifier uh, model called a support vector machine classifier so support vector uh, machine classifier tries to you know uh, build a hyperplane that separates the data and it classifies them so similarly we have other models such as decision tree k nearest neighbor random forest naive bias a classifier so these are some of the important classification models so in our upcoming uh, videos we will uh, discuss in detail about each of these uh, models okay so just try to uh, take note of uh, these algorithms or these models okay for this video we can dive it deeper in the upcoming videos and when we talk about regression so these are some of the regression models so linear regression lasso regression polynomial regression so linear regression means it's uh, just a line just a straight line and lasso regression and polynomial regression so polynomial regression means it can be a curve instead of a line it can be a curve similarly we have a support vector machine for classifier as well as for regressor as well similarly random forest can be used both for classification and the regressor only there will be some difference in their uh, you know code okay so some basic things will change between the models on how they approach uh, that particular data set so again we have bias in linear regression so we can use support vector machine and random forest uh, for both classification and regression so this is one thing which you need to take care of and uh, another thing which you need to uh, take note of here is logistic regression is called as a regression model but it can also be used for classification okay so in most of the uh, classification problems we will be using classification or uh, regression so in our uh, youtube channel we have also did about uh, 17 machine learning projects in that we did a lot of classification examples say for example we tried to classify whether a news is uh, a fake news or a real news using a logistic regression we also use a support vector machines for uh, different classifications like diabetes prediction or predicting whether uh, an object is a rock or a mine and so on so you can refer those projects as well where we have did about several classification and we have also did several regression problems such as uh, predicting the boston house price and also predicting the car price and insurance cost etc so these are examples of some regression problems okay so this is about supervised learning and supervised learning models and uh, in the next video i'll give you a recap on uh, unsupervised learning and unsupervised learning models now the module is all about training machine learning models 
So in this video, let's understand what is meant by unsupervised learning and what are the different types of unsupervised learning models that we have in machine learning. So actually we have discussed about this topic in our first module which was on machine learning basics but I thought that it would be a good time to have a revision about these topics as we are going to discuss in detail about uh, different machine learning models. Okay, so let's get started. First of all, let's try to understand about unsupervised learning. In unsupervised learning, the machine learning algorithm learns from unlabeled data. So the difference between supervised and unsupervised learning is that in the case of supervised learning, we use only labeled data. Okay, whereas in the case of unsupervised learning, we use unlabeled data. So let's try to understand unsupervised learning with an example. Let's say that we have a set of images of apples and mangoes and we want to group these images uh, based on their similarities. Say for example, we want to group all the images Sorry, the images of all the apple into one group and all the images of mangoes into another group. For this, we can use an unsupervised learning approach. And in this case, we won't label the data. We won't tell that this image represents apple or this image represents mangoes. Whereas in the case of supervised learning, we will tell that uh, this is an image, image of an apple and these three are images of mangoes. Whereas this is an unlabeled data. So we feed this unlabeled data to our unsupervised learning model. And this model can find the similarities between them and it can group the images based on their similarities. So the result which you get will be the two groups of images in this case. So you can expect all the apples to be grouped in one group and all the images of mangoes to be in the other group. Okay. So this is how unsupervised learning uh, model works. So with this understanding, uh, we need to understand one more thing that there are two main types of problems in unsupervised learning. One is clustering and the other type of approach we can take is association. So what is meant by that? So in clustering, clustering is an unsupervised learning task which involves grouping the similar data points. So this is the example which we have seen before in the case of apples and mangoes. So it tries to you know group or cluster the similar data points whereas in the case of association, association is an unsupervised task that is used to find the important relationship between the data points. Okay, so this is another uh, approach that we have in unsupervised learning where it is all about the relationship between similar data points. So let's try to understand about clustering and association separately with suitable example and then let's go to the uh, unsupervised learning models. So first of all let's uh, discuss about clustering. Let's say that there is a network company and this network company has their data about their customers so the data on how much call duration uh, do they have how much time they spend on their call duration and uh, how is their network usage. So this is the data the network company has and they want to use this data to find important uh, insights. So they hire a data scientist. So what we can do here is we can use an unsupervised learning approach to get some insights. So when you put this data to a machine learning model, so one possibility is that we can get two clusters. So what does this two clusters represent? We can say that uh, one cluster of people tend to use more uh, call duration. So they used to uh, use the voice call feature more whereas the other group of people tend to use the internet usage more. So what we can suggest the network company is that people who have high call duration. So for those people we can give uh, offers on internet usage and the people who have uh, high usage on the internet we can give them offers on the call durations by that we can you know improve the revenue of the company. So this is one such example of clusters where the customers are approved or the customers are clustered based on their behavioral patterns. Okay, so this is example of clustering and the second one is association. Okay, so let's consider this particular example. Let's say that there is a supermarket and there is a customer and this customer goes to the supermarket and buys bread, milk, fruits and wheat. Okay, so these are the things that the first customer buys and there is another customer who buys uh, you know bread, milk, rice and butter. Okay, so there is some similarities uh, between them. There are some similar uh, products bought by them and when a third customer goes when they buy bread we can say that uh, the person who tends to buy the uh, bread is more likely to buy milk because in the previous cases also we have seen that people who have uh, bought bread are more likely to buy milk as well. Okay, and that's how we can uh, suggest that this customer may like this. And this is how several recommendation system works. So we would have, uh, you know, we are used to Netflix and other OTT platforms and all those platforms used this these kind of machine learning models to recommend movies to their audiences, to their users. Say, let's say for example, there is a person who watches some movie uh, let's say uh, a movie A and then he watches movie B and there is some other person who is watching that particular movie A and this uh, 
Netflix system knows that this person is more likely to watch the movie which is recommended by them. So they try to find the relationship so that they can give better recommendation to their customers. So this is how association works. Okay. So this is the difference between clustering and association. And uh, these are the important unsupervised learning models that we generally use. So first one is K-means clustering. So in our uh, YouTube channel, we have uh, did a project using this K-means clustering about uh, customer segmentation. So you can check out my machine learning project list. I'll give the link of the machine learning project list in the description of this video. You can check that out. So in that, we try to group the customers based on their uh, spending patterns using K-means clustering algorithm. So in this, we just try to cl cluster the customers. And the other type of clustering algorithm is hierarchical clustering. And then we have this principal component analysis or shortly called as PCA. So PCA is also a very uh, widely used model in uh, machine learning. So the main advantage of uh, PCA is that let's say that we have a data set and this data set contains thousands of features. So we can use this principal component analysis method to reduce the features. So PCA will tell us which features are really important for us and which features we can consider. So that is the main application of principal component analysis. And a priori and ECLAT are examples of association algorithms. So we have discussed about association, right? So these are very helpful for uh, association problems. And these are the five main models that we have in unsupervised learning. So we'll be discussing about this, uh, these five models detail in the upcoming uh, videos, but just uh, take a note that these are the important unsupervised learning models that we have. Okay. So that's it for today's video. And I hope you have understood all the things that are covered in this particular video. Sixth module of our hands on machine learning course. And this sixth module is all about machine learning models and some important concepts related to it. So in today's video, we are going to understand how to choose the right machine learning model for a project. And this process is also called as model selection. And once we understand about this, we will be discussing about a technique called as cross validation, which is used to select models based on their accuracy. Okay. So these are the topics that we will be covering in today's video. So this is one of the most requested videos in my uh, topic. A lot of people have asked me why you have chosen this particular model for this project, why we can't use other models and such kind of questions. And this video is the answer for all those questions. So let's get started with this. And before that, in case you are watching my videos for the first time, I, in this YouTube channel, I'm making a hands on machine learning course. And if you want to learn this course from the beginning, I'll give the link of my course playlist in the description of this video. You can check that out. With that being said, let's get started with today's video. So what is meant by this model selection? Let's start with a formal definition. So model selection in machine learning is the process of choosing the best suited model for a particular problem. Selecting a model depends on various factors such as the data set, task and nature of the model. Okay, so this is about model selection. So we know that in machine learning, we have lots of models. Say, for example, we have a logistic regression model, which is an example of supervised machine learning model. And then we have K-means clustering, which is an example of uh, unsupervised learning model. And then we have a lot of uh, different types of neural networks, which comes under deep learning. So similarly, we have other models such as support vector machines, hierarchical clustering, random forest, etc. And now we need to decide which model to use in which product or which, uh, you know, project. So that question is answered by model selection. So we need to find the best model which is suited for a particular problem. Okay, so this step is called as model selection. And this depends on the data set that we have. Okay, so based on the data set that we have, we may need to uh, use different kinds of models and based on the task that we do. So task can be a classification task or a regression task. So classification task is nothing but classifying uh, something. So it can be like uh, predicting whether a person has a heart disease or not. Okay, so in that in this case, we are just predicting whether a person is having a heart disease or a person does not have heart disease. So we have two classes. So again, so this is called as a classification problem. And then we have a regression problem where uh, we try to find some value. So say, for example, we need to find uh, or we need to predict the house price. So price is nothing but a numerical value, right? So this type of problems is called as a regression problem. And then we have recommendation problems, etc. Okay, so recommendation is there, forecasting is there, etc. So depending on this task that we are doing, the models that we select also changes and also based on the nature of a particular model. So these are some factors on which uh, we choose the models that is best suited for a problem. OK, so this is about model selection. Now let's, uh, let's uh, try to understand how we can uh, choose the model based on the data that we have and based on the task that we are doing. OK, so 
first let's discuss about the type of data available so if we have different kinds of data we may need to choose specific models based on the data that we have okay so let's try to understand this so if we have an image or video data set in that case we use a cnn model so cnn stands for convolutional neural network so it is a deep learning model so it is a neural network okay so because convolutional neural networks works better with images and video data set uh, compared to other models so in that case we use a uh, cnn so it can be a uh, face recognition problem or it can be uh, predicting whether uh, image represents a cat or dog and such kind of things so in that cases we use a cnn and uh, when it comes to text data or speech data we use rnn and rnn stands for recurrent neural networks and these two are deep learning models so these kind of problems that involves a speech data and text data is also called as uh, time series uh, problems so and in that cases we use rnn because rnn uh, works better in those cases and when we have some simple uh, numerical data we use uh, simple machine learning models such as support vector machine models we can also use logistic regression decision trees etc okay so this is a thumb rule that we generally have in machine learning so in the case of image and videos we go with deep learning where we use cnn uh, models and when it comes to text data or speech data we use uh, recurrent neural networks also known as rnn and for simple numerical problems we can use these kind of models okay so now let's discuss how to choose the models based on the task that we do so when it comes to classification uh, task we may use a support vector machine model or a logistic regression or a decision tree okay so classification as i have said before we need to classify something so it can be like uh, as i have told you before uh, it can be like predicting whether a person has diabetes or not in this we are just classifying with two output variables okay so one is the person has diabetes and the second uh, outcome is the person does not have diabetes so this is an example of a classification task and uh, then we have regression where we try to find some value so it is like uh, predi predicting a car price based on uh, its uh, parameters few parameters so this is an example of a regression task where we find some numerical value and in that cases we may use a linear regression uh, random forest regression polynomial regression etc okay and uh, one main thing to note here is that uh, few models can be used for classification and regression as well okay for example support vector machine can be used for both classification and regression so you need to take note of that and then uh, we have clustering task okay clustering is like we try to group the data set based on the similarities so in our youtube channel we have uh, did a project on customer segmentation we where we tried to group customers based on their spending pattern so this is an example of a clustering task and in that cases we can use k means clustering model or hierarchical clustering model okay so this is a you know a gentle introduction of model selection so these are the different types of models you can use based on the type of data that we have and based on the task that we do okay now you may ask a question that uh, in classification we may use a uh, support vector machine or logistic regression or decision trees but how to choose the best model for a classification task you may ask that question okay so it depends on a various uh, parameters as well say for example uh, we use logistic regression when we have binary classification binary classification is when we have only two classes okay so in that case we use uh, logistic regression and uh, when it comes to svm there are also a few things related to it so we use a support vector machine model when the data is when the data set is uh, very small and there are no outliers in the data when there are a lot of outliers in the data support vector machine cannot uh, work well and it does not also work well when the data set is too large because uh, the processing time is more with a uh, support vector machine so it is very sensitive to noises or outliers so like this there are a lot of uh, parameters that we need to consider before choosing a particular model so in the upcoming videos we will discuss about all of these individual models and so in that uh, videos i will be explaining you the pros and cons so based on these pros and cons we need to choose the proper model which is uh, best suited for a particular problem okay so i cannot explain you all those things in this video so we need to understand about all these models before uh, going into that part okay so just uh, keep in mind that there are few parameters about uh, models that we need to take care of before selecting the model okay so but this is the general group so for image and videos we use cnn for text data and speech data we generally use rnn and for a simple numerical data we can go with machine learning models like svm logistic regression decision trees etc and for classification we kind of use these models and for regression we use some regression models and for clustering use k means clustering and hierarchical clustering okay so this is all about model selection now there is another topic which we need to discuss called as cross validation 
So let's say that we have two models. We have a support vector machine and logistic regression model, and we want to find which is uh, which model is best suited for a particular project. So in that case, we can use a process called as cross validation. Okay. So you have this cross validation function in the library called as sklearn as well in Python. Okay. So you can search as cross validation in sklearn. Okay. So I'll explain you how this cross validation works. So as I've told you. We are going to compare two models. One is support vector machine, and the other one is logistic regression. Okay, so we try to find which model has uh, the highest accuracy, and based on the accuracy of the model, we try to choose the best model for that particular project. Okay, so let's say that that we have uh, a data set. So let's say that we have a diabetes data set. So we have already did a project on our channel on diabetes prediction. So this data set, when when we use cross validation, so what happens is. It uh, iterates multiple times. So in this case, we have about five iterations, and this entire data set. So this complete data set is divided into five groups. Okay, so we are just uh, dividing the data set into five groups, and the first four groups are considered as the training data, and the fifth group is considered as the test data. Okay, so in machine learning, we split, we generally split the data into training data and testing data, and the machine learning model. trains on the training data and the machine learning model is evaluated on the test data okay so in this case we have uh, four groups of training data and one uh, group of test data and let's try to find the accuracy of the model let's say that uh, we have used all these training data okay so this four sets of training data to train our support vector machine model once it uh, trains we use this test data set to evaluate our model and we get a accuracy score so let's say that we get an accuracy score of 88% so 88% means out of 100 uh, predictions our model can predict uh, correctly for 88 uh, you know problems so that is the accuracy represents let's say that we are working on the uh, diabetes uh, data set so we want to predict whether a person has diabetes or not so when a model has 88 percentage accuracy it means our model can predict for 100 out of 100 times it can predict for 88 times correct value okay whether a person has diabetes or not so similarly in the next iteration what we will do is so we will again split our data set into five groups and this time a different group will be considered as the test data set and again we will uh, you know train the model with uh, the training data and this test data will be used for evaluation and let's say that the accuracy we get is 83 in this case and this process is repeated so in the third iteration we have this particular third uh, data set as the test data in the remaining data as test uh, training data and let's say the accuracy is 86 and for the fourth iteration the accuracy is 81 and the final iteration the accuracy is 84 okay so let's take the average of all these accuracies so when we take the average we get the accuracy as 84.4 percentage so the reason we are doing it we cannot uh, just take one accuracy so we need to just have multiple accuracy to have a proper value or have an accurate value so that's the reason we are iterating it again and again so this is the mean accuracy for support vector machine model now what we will do is let's try to uh, do the same for the logistic regression model as i have told you we are comparing uh, the accuracy scores of support vector machine and logistic regression so we are going to uh, you know do the same thing again so the only difference is we are using a logistic regression model in this case so let's say that in the first iteration the accuracy we get with the logistic regression is uh, 90% and for second iteration we get 88% and for third iteration uh, the accuracy is 86% and for fourth iteration let's say that uh, the accuracy is maybe 91% and uh, for fifth iteration the accuracy is 85% so this is just imaginary okay so i'm just giving you an example so this is uh, the accuracy we get for this diabetes prediction so uh, in the first case the for 100 values the model can predict correctly for about 90 values and in the second iteration it can predict correctly for 88 values and so on if you take the average accuracy for this particular logistic regression the average accuracy the mean accuracy here is 88 percentage okay now let's compare the accuracy of support vector machine and logistic regression model so we found in this particular data set the accuracy score for support vector machine model is 84.4 and the accuracy score for logistic regression is 88 percentage so based on this accuracy we can say that in this particular case the logistic regression is the best model for this particular problem okay and this changes based on the data set we have so we cannot get uh, this particular result in all the cases so, so it depends on the data set we have and the task that we have and so on as i have explained to you before okay so you this is how you can compare two models based on their accuracy i'll give you an example of how to implement this cross validation okay so you can just go to google and search cross validation or cross val score 
in sklearn okay so it will take you to the sklearn documentation where there will be this code snippet so the official documentation of sklearn there they have mentioned how to use this uh, cross validation score so in this in this case we are using this cross validation score to uh, do the prediction on the diabetes data set okay so we are just loading the diabetes data set from here from the sklearn so you can see, see here so from sklearn we are importing the data set and from this data set we are importing diabetes data so we are taking all the features in x and the target variable in y so target variable is nothing but whether the person has diabetes or not okay and we are using uh, two models here so one is uh, lasso regression and the other one is linear regression okay so and we try to find uh, the cross validation score so i'll give the link of this uh, cross validation document uh, documentation in the description of this video you can check that out so this is how you can uh, take a particular data set and you can uh, use multiple models to find the uh, accuracy score and compare them to choose the best model suited for that particular video okay so that's it for this video and i hope you have understood all the things covered in model selection and cross validation sixth module is all about machine learning models and some important concepts related to it so in today's video we are going to discuss about overfitting in machine learning so overfitting is one of the issues that we uh, come across in machine learning and machine learning projects so we need to you know uh, rectify this overfitting problem when we uh, face one okay so in this video let's try to understand what is meant by this overfitting and uh, what factors causes this overfitting and how we can prevent this overfitting from market okay so these are the topics that we will be covering in today's video so before getting started in case you are watching my videos for the first time Hi, in this YouTube channel, I'm making an answer on machine learning course. And if you want to learn this course from the beginning, I'll give the link of my course playlist in the description of this video. You can check that out. With that being said, let's get started with today's video. So what is meant by this overfitting? Overfitting refers to a model that models the training data too well. Overfitting happens when a model learns the detail and noises in the training data set to the extent that it negatively impacts the performance of the model. So this is the formal definition of overfitting. So first let's try to understand the first statement. So it models the training data too well. So the other way to uh, you know say this is the model overtrains on the training data. Okay. So what happens when it overtrains on the training data is that so this is the optimum uh, model okay so if we try to uh, fit a model or a curve to the data so this is a curve that we get so let's say that we have some uh, uh, variables in the x-axis and uh, the output variables in the y-axis so the predictor variable can be the features let's say that we want to uh, predict the salary of the person based on their work experience so in this case the work experience will be taken in the x-axis and uh, the salary that we can predict can be taken in the y-axis and we have some data points they say that uh, if a person has an experience of five years they may make a salary of about uh, you know six lakhs per annum or seven lakhs per annum something like that so this is the data set we have with x value and y value and we have uh, these many data points so the green color points represent the data points okay and we try to fit a curve into this uh, data points if uh, it is an optimal model it will uh, try to find a common trend in it so you can see a curve here so Whereas if a model is overfitted, you will get a curve something like this. So the curve will try to, uh, you know, join all the data points. So you will get an irregular curve, but this curve is actually kind of regular, right? So this is the difference between an optimal model and overfitting uh, model. So a overfitting model tries to model the data too well. So that's what it is, uh, you know, given in this particular statement. So modeling means it try to fit into all the data points. And when a model tries to fit into all the data points, we can, we cannot get a regular curve. So when, when we don't get a regular curve, we cannot make uh, good predictions out of it. But in this case, we have a generalized, uh, you know curve right so we have a generalized model a generalized function where in this case the function is not generalized so we have some uh, uh, rises and the dips in this curve and we cannot rely on this particular curve whereas uh, this curve is very optimal so the data points are uh, the data points in this particular graph and this graph is actually the same whereas the curve is uh, actually different okay so this is about overfitting where a model tries to overfit the data or overtrain on the data so this is one issue we face in machine learning so what happens in overfitting is that it tries to learn the details and noises in the training data noises can be outliers and uh, some data points that doesn't make sense okay so a good model tries to ignore these noises that are present in the data set okay so hence it tries to find a generalized value whereas when it is overfitted it tries to fit in all those uh, data points which can be noises okay so this is the difference between an optimal model and an overfitted model so now you may ask a question that how we can find whether our model has overfitted okay so 
one sign that the model has overfitted is you will get a high training data accuracy and a very low test data accuracy. So the accuracy on the training data will be very high and the accuracy on uh, test data will be very low. Okay. So in our uh, machine learning project, so this is why we try to find the accuracy score for both the training data and the test data as well. Okay. So if uh, the accuracy on both the training data and test data is the same, let's say that the accuracy on training data is uh, 85 percentage and the accuracy on the test data is 83 percentage, it's almost similar. In that case, we can say that the model is very optimal. If the training data accuracy is 95% uh, and the test data accuracy is like 30% or 40% then we say that the model is overfitted because it cannot find a proper uh, you know generalization and it cannot uh, perform well okay. So uh, this is why we split the data into training data and testing data and we try to find the accuracy for both the cases okay. So this is all about overfitting where a model tries to overlearn the data or it tries to fit to all the data points. So when a model tries to fit to all the data points it cannot give you a generalization and it cannot not be reliable to make predictions out of it okay so this is all about overfitting now let's try to understand this with an example let's say that we have a set of values x values and y values so the x values range from 1 to all the way to 10 and we have some y values and let's say that uh, y value is related to this x value so there is some function to it so you can also consider uh, this as the previous example we have considered so x may represent the number of years of experience and y may represent the salary of the person uh, he gets based on his work experience or something like that. So we have X which is the feature and we have Y which is uh, the target variable. So this is how we work in machine learning, right? So we take all the features as a X variable and all the uh, target, uh, sorry, uh, the target variable in the Y variable, okay? So let's try to plot these values in a graph. So this is the plot we get. So uh, the value for one, so when the, the coordinate for this first point is 1 comma 1.38 where the x coordinate is 1 and the y coordinate is 1.38 and if you take the second value the x coordinate is 2 so it is plotted in this particular line and the y coordinate is 101 so it is plotted here so similarly we are plotting for all the 10 points okay and now we need to find the trend in these points so we can say that uh, there is an increased uh, trend right so if x value increases y value also increases in this particular case but we don't know what is the relationship between them so let's try to fit these data points in uh, in a curve so this is also called as uh, overfitting sorry this particular uh, thing is called as curve fitting so we would have uh, studied about this curve fitting in our engineering and mathematics course so let's try to fit this in a proper curve so when your data has overfitted this is how your uh, curve looks so here you can see here we have uh, the data points almost lie in a straight line almost in a straight line whereas this particular data point uh, is somewhat odd right so everything lying almost a uh, straight line whereas this is a uh, kind of an outlier so we can call this data point as a noise so when you try to overfit the data uh, the model tries to fit to all the data points and there is not a common trend here so there is some uh, increase in the model so there is a peak here and there is again a dip and there is a, uh, again a peak and there is a dip and so on right so this is called as a overfitted model now let's see how a uh, proper fit or an optimal fit looks like so this is a good fit where we try to generalize the curve okay so there is a uh, this is actually not a straight line but it is more general when compared to this overfitted model so we can call this as a good fit and this uh, curve can be called as a overfitted model so this is what happens in machine learning when we have a overfitted model and a good fit uh, model okay so as i've told you before if your training data accuracy is more and your test data accuracy is very less then that means your model is overfitted okay so now let's understand what is the causes for uh, this particular overfitting problem and how we can solve this overfitting problem. So the one main thing which we can uh, think of of overfitting is less data. So when your data set does not contain many data points, so whenever you are having a very small data set, in that cases we have this, uh, uh, you know, thing where the model may overfit. So there is a high probability that your model will overfit if you have a smaller data set and the increased complexity of the model. So if your uh, complexity of the model is very more or if the complexity is high then your model is probably going to overfit. In this case let's say that uh, this will be a more complicated model. The complexity of the model will be uh, very huge. Okay so it will be a polynomial equation for this curve whereas in this case it is almost a sim uh, you know a simple model. Okay so it is very similar to a straight line equation whereas this particular model will be a complicated equation. So whenever you are having a more complex model then uh, your model is more probably uh, going to overfit okay say for example a linear regression is a very simple model so 
in some cases we can use a linear regression so we don't have to use uh, more complex models like uh, you know a deep neural network or something like that so whenever you are using a more complex model like a neural network for a simple problem then uh, it is most probably going to overfit but whenever you whenever you are using a simple uh, model then your model is not going to overfit okay so this is not for all the cases but it depends on the data set that we have the problem that we have if the problem statement is simple if the pro you know the data is as a linear relationship between them so in the previous example that we considered it is a linear uh, you know related problem say uh, the work experience and the salary if the work experience increases the person is going to get an increased salary so there is a linear relationship between them if one value increases the other value also increases so we can use a simple regression model in that case so if in that case we use a com complex models such as our neural networks we may face into the issue of overfitting okay so the first uh, thing which causes overfitting is less data and the second uh, reason which causes overfitting is more complex models and uh, more number of layers in the neural network so in a neural network we have an input layer and we have some hidden layers and finally we have the output layer in hidden layers we can have multiple layers okay and uh, if you have a several number of layers in this hidden layers then uh, there is a high chance that your neural network will overfit so in that cases we may tend to reduce the number of layers that we have in our uh, neural network model in that case our model will work fine so these are the three main causes that causes overfitting so one is having a smaller data set the second reason is having a very complex model and the third reason can be this is in the case of neural networks so whenever we are using a neural networks if we have a more number of layers then uh, we have an issue of overfitting okay now as we have understood what are the causes for overfitting now let's try to understand how we can prevent this overfitting from happening so one is using uh, more data so as we have uh, discussed here less data causes overfitting if you have a larger data set then the model is uh, you know ignores uh, outliers most of the time so it can understand the data better if it has more data so it is a very important uh, concept in machine learning and deep learning as well more the data you know uh, better the performance of the model is so if we have more data then uh, the chance that you will get overfitting is very less okay so this is how you can solve uh, the overfitting issue and uh, reduce the number of layers in the neural network as i have told you before increased the number of layers in the neural network will uh, cause overfitting and if you reduce the number of layers then uh, you you will get an optimal fit of a model and yearly stopping so yearly stopping is a technique that we use in machine learning so what happens in yearly stopping is that uh, in uh, machine learning we iterate the data multiple times so the model tries to uh, learn from the data multiple times and this is called as an iteration because it does the same thing again and again so when we do early stopping techniques the model tries to stop learning once it uh, you know overfits so when overfitting starts the model stops the training part and this is called as early stopping so by using this technique we can stop the model from learning if it tries to overfit okay and then we have a bias variance trade off so bias variance trade off is one of the most important topic that we have in machine learning and uh, this particular bias variance trade off technique is used to find the optimum model for a data set so this is one of the uh, model optimization technique so i cannot explain you in detail about bias variance trade off so we need a separate video on this particular topic so i'll be making a separate module called as uh, machine learning model optimization so in that video we will be discussing more about this early stopping bias variance rate of gradient descent etc so these are model optimization techniques so in that uh, video i'll be explaining to you in detail about these topics so uh, for now understand that uh, or keep in mind that bias variance rate of is uh, helpful to find the optimum model with a uh, data set okay so and then uh, using dropouts so dropouts is also another technique that is used in neural networks so this is not actually used much in machine learning but is used in deep learning in uh, neural networks so as i have told you before neural networks has multiple layers and each layer contains multiple neurons okay and uh, dropout is something that we use so if we use dropout some neurons will be uh, dropped out randomly some neurons will be turned off randomly and this stops uh, the problem of overfitting so if you have less number of neurons your model is uh, the complexity of the model reduces and thus the model won't overfit so these are the things that we can use to prevent a model from overfitting so the first is having a larger data set second is the reducing the number of layers in the neural network third one is really stopping where the model stops the training if it tries to overfit and then we have bias variance trade off which is very helpful to find the optimum model for a data set and then finally we have a dropouts where a few uh, neurons will be dropped out randomly from the neural network 
So these are the causes and uh, how to prevent this uh, causes in order to uh, prevent overfitting. Okay. So I hope you have understood all the contents that are covered in this video about overfitting and how to prevent overfitting. Sixth module is all about machine learning models and some important concepts related to it. So in the previous video, we have discussed about what is meant by overfitting and uh, what is the cause and uh, how we can prevent overfitting. And in this video, let's understand what is meant by underfitting in machine learning. So underfitting is an issue that we uh, generally face in machine learning. So it is an undesirable thing. So in this video, let's try to understand about this and how we can uh, you know, rectify this underfitting issue. So before getting started, in case you are watching my videos for the first time, hi, in this YouTube channel, I'm making a hands-on machine learning course. And if you want to learn this uh, course from the beginning, I'll give the link of my course playlist in the description of this video. You can check that out. With that being said, let's get started with today's video. So first of all, let's try to understand what is meant by this overfitting. So let's uh, start with a formal definition. Overfitting happens in machine learning when the model does not learn enough from the data. Underfitting occurs when a machine learning model cannot capture the underlying trend of the data. Okay, so the training that the model has on the data set is not enough. So what happens is it cannot find the trends uh, that are present in a particular data set. Okay, so this is the definition of underfitting. So it will make more sense if we understand this with a particular image. So this is how an optimal model uh, looks like and this is how an uh, underfit model looks like. So we have a data points. So the green color points represents the data points. So we have X axis and Y axis here. Let's say that uh, X axis represents the number of uh, years in work experience. Let's say that we want to find the uh, salary that a person may get based on their work experience. Okay, so in this case, we take the number of uh, years in the X axis and the salary uh, in the Y axis. Okay, and we are trying to plot the data here. So we have plotted the green color data points here and we want to fit a model to it. So this is how an optimal uh, model looks like. It tries to find the trend in it. So in this case, if you see there is an increase in uh, the X value with an increase in the Y value for a certain extent. After that, with the increase of X value, the Y value decreases. So that is what represented by this particular curve. And uh, this is an optimal model. So this is how an underfitting model looks like. So it does not find that particular uh, trend. So in this case, I have explained you what is the trend. So first the uh, Y value increases with increase of X and then it decreases. Whereas this underfitting model cannot find the trend. So it, you know, it uh, in this case, it just fits the data in a, a simple uh, line. So this is a linear regression model. So this is an example of an underfitting problem. So whenever a model cannot find the trend present in the data, so we call, call it, it does not uh, learn enough or the model is under trained and this problem is called as underfitting. So how you can find that your model is underfitted? One thing you can do is, uh, if you can check your training data accuracy. If the training data accuracy is very low, then it is a sign that your model is underfitted, okay? So in the case of overfitting, what happens is you will, you will have a very high training data accuracy, but uh, the accuracy of test data will be very low. Whereas in the case of underfitting, the accuracy on training data itself will be very low, okay? So this is uh, all meant by underfitting and uh, how you can find underfitting, okay? So I'll try to explain this with an example. Let's say that we have a set of values. So values of X and values of Y and uh, Y value depends on the value of X, okay? So if the value of uh, X is minus 10, then the value of X, Y is 100. If the value of uh, X is minus nine, then the value of Y is 81 and so on. Now let's try to plot all these uh, data points in a graph. So this is the plot that we are getting. So if you see here, this represents a parabola, right? So this is a, a parabola curve if you join all the data points. Now let's see what an underfitted model looks like. So this is how an underfitted model looks like. So it tries to fit the data in a line, but it is impossible to fit all these data points in a linear line, right? So you can change the orientation of this line, but uh, you won't get a proper fit. So because this is a parabolic relationship, but the model tries to fit in a, a simple line. So this is how a good fit looks like. So this is the good fit for this particular data point, which is a parabola, right? So this is all about underfitting where a model fails to uh, find the trend present in the data set and it cannot fit all the data points in a curve. Whereas a good fit tries to fit all the data points in a curve and we can find the trend. Here the uh, value first uh, decreases for a certain value of X and the value of uh, Y increases if the value of X increases. So compare the value of Y and X. So there is a decrease in the value of Y with the increase in the value of X. And after this particular point, the value of Y increases with the increase in value of X. So this is how a good fit looks like in this particular case. Okay. So this is all about underfitting. So now let's understand 
what are the things that causes underfitting and how we can rectify this underfitting problem. So choosing a wrong model. So in the previous case, we have to uh, choose a parabolic model. If we have chosen a linear model, it cannot fit this particular data, right? So choosing a particular model or a correct model is very important. So if you choose a wrong model, then that is one of the causes for underfitting. Having a less complex uh, model is another uh, example. So when you compare a parabola and a linear model, a linear model is a very simple model, whereas a parabola is a more complex model compared to a parabola. Right, so the complexity of parabola is more when compared to a line. So if you have a very less complex model, then there is a problem of underfitting and less variance and uh, I bias. So in the previous video, I have explained to you about uh, bias variance trade-off in a small way. So bias variance trade-off is something that tells us to, uh, you know, find the optimum model for a data set. So for that, we need to understand about variance and bias. So bias is nothing but the approximation that a model makes, uh, you know, uh, for a target function. So in machine learning, we have features and we have target and the machine learning model is something that finds the function that relates the features and the target. So feature is nothing but the X value and target is nothing but the Y value. Bias is about that uh, approximation function and variance is uh, how your model changes or how your function changes if you use a different training data. Okay, so this is about bias and variance. So if you have a less variance value and high bias value, then you will uh, run into this issue of underfitting. So we cannot go deeper into this particular topic because as I have told you in the previous video, we need a separate video for uh, bias variance and bias variance trade -off. So in that video, I'll explain you uh, in detail about this uh, bias and variance. But for now, just uh, make a note that uh, underfitting occurs when we have less variance and IE bias. Okay, so these are the causes for underfitting. Now let's see how we can prevent this underfitting issue. First is choosing the correct model appropriate for the problem. So in the example that we have seen, we have a parabolic relationship between the X value and the Y value. So in that case, if we choose a wrong model, such as a linear model, we cannot get a good fit. So choosing a correct model is very important for uh, you know rectifying the underfitting issue increasing the complexity of the model. So as we have seen, if we have a simple model, which is not suitable for a particular data set, so and, uh, then it causes underfitting. So we need to have a more complex model, which can uh, fit the data better. Okay, so the third thing which you can do is have more number of parameter to the model. Okay, so when you increase the parameters to the model, then the complexity of the model uh, increases. So if you think about uh, a line, a line has only two parameters, slope and uh, intercept. So we know that the equation of the line is, is uh, y is equal to mx plus c, where m and c are the parameters. Whereas if you take a polynomial equation, a polynomial equation may look something like this, y is equal to uh, a1x uh, square and uh, b2x2 square and so on. A polynomial term will be a more complex uh, equation and a parabola will be a more uh, complex equation. So if you increase the parameters of a model, then the complexity of the model also increases. So increasing the parameters is another uh, you know thing which you can do to prevent underfitting. And finally, using bias variance trade-off. So as I told you, bias variance trade-off is very helpful to find the optimum uh, model, which is very suited for a particular uh, data set. So these are the causes and uh, these are the things that we can use to prevent underfitting for a model. Okay, so that's it about underfitting and how you can rectify this issue. And I hope you have understood all the concepts covered in this video. And this sixth module is all about machine learning models. So far in this uh, module, we have discussed what is meant by a machine learning model and how does a machine learning model works, what are the different types of supervised learning and unsupervised learning models that we have in machine learning. And then we have discussed some important issues that we face while uh, training a machine learning model such as overfitting and underfitting. So in those videos of overfitting and underfitting, I mentioned that bias variance trade-off is something. So it is a technique that we can use in order to rectify this issue of overfitting and underfitting. So in this video, let's try to understand what is meant by this uh, bias variance trade-off and how we can use this particular method in order to prevent overfitting or underfitting. Okay. So this is the agenda of today's video. Before getting started, in case you are watching my videos for the first time, I in this YouTube channel, I'm making a hands-on machine learning course. And if you want to learn this course from the beginning, I'll give the link of my course playlist in the description of this video. So you can uh, check that out. With that being said, let's get started with today's video. So before going into bias variance trade-off, we need to understand what is meant by bias and what is meant by variance. Okay. 
So this is the formal definition of bias. Bias is the difference between the average prediction of our model and the correct value which we are trying to predict. Okay, so it is the difference between the two values. So what are these two values? The prediction made by our model and the actual value. So let's try to understand this with an example. Let's say that we are uh, making a machine learning model to predict the salary of a person given their experience. Let's say that the person has uh, four years of experience and the salary that they are uh, getting currently is about 30,000 rupees per month. And uh, let's say that we are uh, using this experience uh, data that is the number of years of experience which is four years in this case and we feed this to our machine learning model and let's say that our model has predicted that that person earns uh, a salary of about 28,000 rupees per month. Okay, so here in this case, the uh, value predicted by our model is 28,000 and the correct value or actual value is 30,000. So the difference between the two values is 2,000 rupees, right? And this difference between the predicted value and the correct value is called as bias. Okay, so it tells us what is the difference between those two uh, values. So let's try to understand this with this particular curve. So we have some data points. Okay, so this can be the similar example which we took. So let's say that we have the number of years of experience in the x-axis and the salary value in the y-axis and we are plotting the data. So let's say that this first point represents one year of experience. So the corresponding value in uh, x-axis, let's say that it represents one year and the corresponding y-axis value represents uh, maybe 20,000 rupees. So similarly, we have several data points and we need to find a model in order to fit to this particular data. So if you look at this data, we can say that there is a linear relationship between them. So, you know, there is a positive correlation between them. That is, if one value increases, the other value uh, also increases. That is, if the number of years of experience of a person increases, their salary also increases, right? So when you have such kind of relationship between x-axis and y-axis or the x-values and the y-values, you can fit the data by using a normal straight line. Okay, so what this line signifies is if you take this particular point, it represents maybe let's say that this particular point represents 10 years of experience. And if you take the corresponding value, let's say that the salary they are making is about 80,000 rupees. So this is how we, you know, uh, try to understand the data and the model which we are fitting. So this is a straight line, which means there is a linear relationship between them, where if one value increases, the other value also increases. Now, it is impossible to, uh, you know, draw a straight line which touches all these data points. So we try to, you know, uh, build a model that is close to all the data points, right? So, but it is impossible for this particular model to touch all these data points. So you cannot use a straight line for that purpose. You can use a curve which uh, goes through all these data points, but a straight line cannot do that. So uh, there is some distance between these data points and the model, right? So this uh, blue color line is called as the model. So this is an example of a linear model or linear regression. And we know that the equation of a line is y is equal to mx plus c, right? So that is the equation of this particular line. And if we try to find the distance between the data points and the model, we uh, get something like this, okay? So let's let this, uh, black color dotted lines represents the distance between the data point and the model and this particular distance is called as bias okay so now you can uh, read this definition again and it will make you you know it will make more sense to you so bias is nothing but the difference between the data points and the model the value predicted by the model and the correct value okay now what we are going to do is uh, we are going to change the training data. So here, the, let's say that we have uh, some set of training data and now we are changing the training data that we have. So this is one uh, set of data and this is another set of data. And now we are again trying to use a similar kind of model, a similar kind of straight line, which can, uh, you know, fit to this particular data point. And let's say that we are getting a, a line like this. So in both the cases, the data are different. But you can see here that the line is almost similar. So there can be a slight change in their slope and intercept. So in, in the equation of a line, uh, y is equal to mx plus c, m is the slope. Okay, so slope, if you change the slope, the orientation of the line uh, will, uh, you know, uh, change. And if you change the intercept, this distance will increase. So this uh, a distance from this origin zero to this particular point is called as intercept. So you can compare the intercept of these two lines and the slope of these two lines. So there is not much, you know, difference between them. So both of these lines are different because we are using different kind of data, but they are almost similar to each other. There is a huge bias in both cases. So there is bias. That is the distance between the data points and the model in this case, as well as this case. But there is not much variation to the model, right? So because these two models are very similar to each other. So there is a very less variation between them. So we call this variation as variance. So this particular case as, uh, you know, 
a very small, a very high bias and a very uh, low variance. So that is the inference that we are getting. So this is what we will uh, get when we are using a simple model like a, a straight line. Okay, so just uh, try to understand up to this point. So this is called as bias. And now we are going to understand about variance. So variance is the amount that the estimate of the target function will change if different training data was used. Okay, so let's try to understand this variance. So in this case, the target function or the model will change if your training data changes. But in the previous case, we have seen that there is not much change in the model or the target function. In this case, the target function is a straight line and in both the cases, they are almost similar. But, uh, you know, variance is something where there will be a, some amount of variation between them. So let's say that we uh, have the same data that we had in the previous case. So, you know, the red colored data points and then we will have the other uh, yellow colored data points. So in this case, let's use a more complex model. Okay, so a model a curve that can pass through all these data points. So you will get a curve like this. So, you know, there is not a general trend between them. So there is, uh, you know, this curve uh, increases suddenly and then decreases and so on, but it touches all the data points. Okay. And now when you change the data point, if you, you know, try to use a similar kind of curve, you won't get a similar curve. You will get a very different kind of curve. And we can say that there is a huge variation between them. So this is called as the variance between them. So variance is nothing but the amount, uh, the estimate of that particular amount of the target function will change. So there is a quite change between them, right? So we are measuring how much is this particular change. And uh, if the change is huge, we call this particular case, uh, it has high variance, okay? Whereas the previous case, both of these models is almost similar, even though we use a different kind of data. But in this case, there was huge bias. But in this particular case, we can say that there is zero bias because the model touches all the data points and there is no, uh, you know, distance between the data point and the model. Okay. So when you use a similar model, like a straight line, in most of the cases, you will have a very high bias, but there won't be any much variance in it. Okay. Whereas when you use a more complex model, the bias will be zero, but there will be a huge variance in them. Okay. So that is the one main inference, which we need to uh, understand here. Now let's try to understand how this uh, comes into play when uh, we have the problem of overfitting and underfitting and how we can, uh, you know, uh, adjust between the values of bias and variance to overcome this overfitting and underfitting. Let's try to understand this with an example. So we want to identify an appropriate model to predict the height of a person when their weight is given. Okay, so we need to find a suitable model for this purpose. And this model should predict the height of a person when we give uh, their weight. Okay, so this is the case that we have. And we need to analyze this and we need to find whether we need a simple linear model or we need a more complex curve. Okay, so that's what we are going to do in this particular case. Let's say that this is the data that we have. So we have a uh, weight in the x-axis and y, you know, height in the y-axis. And this is the data point that we have. If you want to fit this, fit, uh, you know, an optimized curve to this particular data, you will get a curve like this. So what this signifies is there is an increase in this curve. Okay. So the curve, uh, you know, slightly increases and there is a slightly, a slight decrease in the value. Okay. So what this means is when height increases, up to a certain point, the height also increases. But after a certain point, even though the weight increases, the height kind of decreases. This means the people are starting to get obese. Okay, so that is the one main inference that we are getting. So increase in, uh, you know, the height of the person, uh, height of different people increases with weight. But after a certain point, there will be no increase in height and they will be tend to, you know, become more obese. So this will be the optimum curve for uh, this particular data point. Now let's try to analyze this with a straight line and a more complex curve and see how this leads to overfitting and underfitting. Now let's uh, plot on training data. So we are taking one set of data and this is what happens when you uh, do underfitting and this is the case when it, you know, overfit. So underfitting is something where your model tends to uh, generalize the data. Okay. So if you fit this particular data point with a straight line, it means uh, whatever may be the case, if the weight of a person is more, their height will be more. So if the weight increases, the height also increases. But this is a very, uh, you know, uh, wrong inference or a wrong insight because we uh, discussed that after a certain point, even though the weight increases, the height doesn't increase. So this is a wrong uh, statement or, uh, you know, wrong insight when we use a linear model. And this is how a overfitted model looks like. So this particular case is uh, called as underfitting because the date, the model has underfitted the data. It doesn't find the pattern present in the data. Uh, the, and the pattern is nothing but the weight should, uh, the height should increase and then it should decrease. 
Now, when you go fit the data, the model tries to fit to all the data points and you won't get a generalized trend. Okay, so again, there is no trend in this. Here, there is an increasing trend, but in this case, there is no trend. So, there is a slight increase and then there is a decrease and so on. So, this particular case is called as overfitting. Now, we need to understand uh, what is the bias and variance when it comes to underfitting and what is the bias and variance for overfitting. Okay, so now let's try to uh, change the training data again as we have did before. So I'm changing the training data and this is the uh, overfitting and underfitting that I get. So this is the underfitting and we know that uh, when we are using a straight line or when we are using an underfitted model, there will be a high bias, but uh, there won't be any variation between them. So this particular model is very similar to this particular model. Okay, so they, are, they both are almost similar. But in the case of a overfitted model, when you use a very complex model, the variation between uh, the model will change if you change the uh, you know data training data so these are the different data so the red colored uh, circles represented a different data and yellow color circle represented a different data so in this case what we are understanding is when we are using underfitted model we are getting a very high bias but a very low variance because there is no change in the model but when we are uh, using a overfitted uh, model uh, more complex model you are uh, we are getting overfitting and in this case the bias is less but the variation is very uh, high so we can say that uh, whenever we are uh, dealing with underfitting there will be a very high bias and a low variance and in the case of overfitting there will be low bias and high variance and this is the important insight we are getting so what is a good model in this case a good model is something which does not underfit and which does not overfit so it should be in the middle part and we call that as an optimized model okay so we want we doesn't want our model to underfit or overfit and it should be in the middle so it, it should be an optimized model how we can do this is by adjusting the values of bias and variance okay so if you have a median value of this bias and variance then uh, we would get an optimized model okay so this particular curve represents this in a uh, better way. So this red color uh, curve represents the variance value. So this, uh, you know, this particular point represents low variance and this uh, point represents high variance and this represents uh, low bias and this uh, particular blue color line uh, represents high bias. And uh, now we have the error value here. Okay, so in this case, you can see here the error value is very less in this particular point, right? So this is the most optimized complexity of the model. So if you uh, take a straight line, the complexity of a straight line is very less so we can say that it is somewhere here and if you use a more complex curve if you use a curve uh, which has some uh, ups and downs in it then the complexity of the model is more so whenever you you are using a very less uh, complex model you will have a very high uh, bias but the variance won't be that much high and whenever you are using a more complex model the bias will be very less and the variance will be very more you know this is nothing but what we have discussed in the previous two slides so as we have discussed that uh, in the case of uh, overfitting so overfitting is like when you use a more complex model like a, a, a curve which increases or decreases so in that case we realize that the bias will be less and the variance will be more and this is in the case of underfitting so this particular part represents underfitting and this particular part represents overfitting and this is the more optimized uh, uh, part where we have uh, an optimized value or uh, almost uh, you know not high value of both bias and variance so there is some significant values but both of these values are not too much and they are not too less so we want something like this so this is the optimized part and we want our model to have something like this so this is called as bias variance trade-offs to trade off the values of bias and variance to get an optimized model okay so there are some techniques that we can use in order to uh, get this up uh, get this a uh, proper bias variance trade off okay so one thing which you can do is a good model selection so as we have discussed before when you use a very simple model it will lead to the problem of underfitting and when you uh, you know use a very complex model it will lead to the problem of overfitting so good model selection is a very important thing which we need to do uh, you know to rectify this so for a complex problem where there is no re linear relationship we may use a complex uh, model but when the relationship is linear we can use a simple linear model and something like that so you need to understand the data first you need to understand what is the relationship between the various features in that particular data and then you need to select your uh, model based on that you cannot use a single model in all the cases so that's one main thing which we need to understand here so when you use a proper model then you will have a proper values of bias and variance and the other method which you can use is regularization so this particular regularization is very helpful in order to prevent uh, overfitting so regular uh, regularization tries to reduce the values of coefficient 
let's say that we have a polynomial model so this is an example of a polynomial model so this uh, red color curve represents uh, the model or the curve and the equation for this particular model is uh, this y is equal to b0 plus b1 x1 plus b2 x1 squared here x1 and x, uh, x1 represents the feature let's say that x1 represents the years of experience of a person and y is uh, you know the salary they can get and b0 b1 b2 are the parameters of this particular model when you use the methods of regularization so there are different kinds of regularization methods which we will discuss later so when you do those regularization it tries to reduce the values of these uh, coefficients this b0 b1 and b2 etc so when you you know try to reduce the values of these coefficients the model will be more simple so the complexity of the model will be reduced and your model won't overfit so that is the process of regularization and the third third thing which you can do is dimensionality reduction so dimension is nothing but the features that we have in our data let's say that in our data we have a thousands of features and uh, if you have a very large number of features then uh, we say that it has a very huge dimension so having a, a high number of dimension will create a more complex model so we need to reduce this dimension for this we use uh, several techniques such as, uh, such as principal component analysis and something like that in order to find which uh, parameters or which features are very important for us and there is also another thing called as feature selection where we try to select the more important features that we need for a particular problem so when you do these kind of uh, optimization techniques and data processing techniques you will have a less complex model and uh, this will lead to a better bias bearing trade off and then you can use ensemble methods so if your model is you know uh, underfitting you can use ensemble methods so ensemble is something where we use two or three models together in order to get a better prediction okay so you may use uh, you know uh, multiple models together and this is called as ensemble so these are some techniques which you can use in order to implement this bias variance trade off so this particular module uh, will be uh, you know theoretical and conceptual so we will be dealing uh, about all these things in an hands on session later in python so i will be uh, you know making a separate module on uh, model optimization later and in that particular module i'll explain you in detail uh, you know in a hands on session in python on how to implement all these techniques okay so that's it about bias variance trade off and how you can implement bias variance trade off and i hope you have understood all the things covered in this video in the sixth module of our hands on machine learning course and this sixth module is all about machine learning models and some important concepts related to it so in today's video we are going to discuss what is meant by loss function so loss function is one of those most important and fundamental concepts that we have to learn in machine learning so in this video let's try to understand what is meant by this loss function how we can calculate this loss function and what is the importance of loss function when it comes to machine learning so this is the agenda for today's video before getting started in case you are watching my videos for the first time hi in this youtube channel i am making a hands on machine learning course and if you want to learn this course from the beginning i'll give the link of my course playlist in the description of this video you can check that out with that being said let's get started with today's video so what is meant by this loss function loss function measures how far an estimated value is from its true value so here we are taking two, uh, two values okay so one is uh, one is the true value or the actual value and the another one is estimated value let's say that we are using a machine learning model to predict the average blood sugar level in a person and uh, let's consider that the value predicted by our model is 160 uh, you know milligram and let's say that the actual value actual blood, uh, blood sugar level for that particular person is 160 mg here the estimated value or the predicted value is uh, 140 mg and the true value is 160 mg so there is a difference of 20 mg and this error of 20 is called as the loss okay and we are going to uh, you know find a function or a relation that you know calculate this particular loss value so the main purpose is to find how much distance is there between the estimated values and the true values so you can also consider this as the error made by our model okay so now let's try to understand what is the importance or what is the use of this loss function so loss function is helpful to determine which model performs better and which parameters are better let's say that there are two models let's say that there are uh, you know there is support vector machine and random forest uh, model so in machine learning we have uh, several kinds of model so in this particular case let's consider these two models support vector machine and random forest and we want to uh, you know find which model performs well in a particular case so in that situation what we do is we train both of these models with uh, this particular data set and we try to find the loss value for each of these model which model has uh, the lower loss value 
that model will make better prediction okay so no loss value means there is no distance between the estimated value and the true value or no there is no difference between the estimated value and the true value so the loss function should be less for a model for it to perform better okay so this is where loss function can be uh, helpful for us and also parameters uh, are better so to find which parameters are better so different uh, models are different parameters and even you can take a model like logistic regression and you can change the parameters so changing the parameters will change the prediction made by the model okay and we need to find which parameters are best suited for a particular data set again what you can do is you can uh, take a single model let's say that we can take a logistic regression model and we can uh, take two parameter values so one set of parameter values and the other set of parameters values and in each case we can find the loss value and uh, the model or the case in which the parameters uh, are better in that case the loss value will be very less so these are the important usefulness for loss function where we can uh, use this particular loss value to determine which model performs better and which parameters are suited for a particular data set okay so this is the formula for loss function yi minus uh, yi whole square and all these should be some uh, you know we need to summation all these values and divided by n okay so this is called as the square mean error so what we are doing here is yi means the uh, the true value true value or the actual value and yi cap is the estimated value or predicted value so we need to find the difference between these two values in all the cases let's say that we have 100 data points and we need to find or we need to predict the values for or all these 100 data points and each of these data points will have some error okay so all the predicted values will have some error so we need to find all those errors and divided by n in this case n is nothing but 100 the number of data points that we are taking okay so this is the formula for loss function and there are different types of loss function and important types are cross entropy loss squared error loss and kl divergence okay so these are the main uh, loss function types and in a later point of time we will be discussing about these uh, three things in a detailed way but in this video let's try to understand more about this loss function or how we can calculate this so uh, let's say that we have an x-axis and a y-axis and we are taking some data so this is the data set that we have and we have plotted uh, the values for x-axis and y-axis okay so now we need to find a model or a curve which can fit this uh, you know data set so it is not possible to draw a line or curve which can pass through all the data points so we can just uh, you know uh, draw a curve like this that can you know almost pass through all the points so this is the trend that we are seeing in this particular uh, line so the value doesn't increase much so when x value increases the y value doesn't increase much in the first case so it is almost uh, you know uh, the same and after a certain point the y value increases as the uh, x value increases so this is the trend that we are getting for this particular uh, data set so this is how the equation of this particular line may look like so this is not the exact equation i'm just giving you an example of how uh, the equation will be for a line like this or a curve like this so this is an example for a degree th degree 3 polynomial as you can see here we have x cube x, uh, x square and x okay so degree 4 polynomial will have uh, values as uh, x power 4 x power 3 x power 2 and x and a constant okay so this is an example of a degree 3 polynomial and this particular values are coefficients so the values before x cube x square and x so these values are coefficient values or you can also call these as uh, the parameters of the model okay so now uh, this is the model that we have found for this particular data point and now what we are going to do is let's say that there are three people and we ask this three people to uh, look at this particular data so we have this particular uh, blue circles as the data so what we are going to do is we are going to ask them to look at this data and to calculate and uh, find a curve which can better fit this particular data set okay so we know that the proper curve looks like this but those three people doesn't know this let's say let's see what can be the result of this particular experiment let's say that the first person finds the equation to be uh, this 0 0.000 so on 15 or 15 x cube plus 0 0.0042 x square and so on so this is the equation of the curve given by this particular person and we know that the equation for this particular curve is this okay and the equation given by the second person is this okay so y2 so let y1 be the equation given by this particular person and y2 be the uh, equation given by the second person 
and y3 is the equation given by third person okay so let's say that they have used some methods to find this or uh, to determine this equation and we know that the actual equation is this now what we can do is find uh, y1 value y2 value and y3 value so this is the x value and when you plug the values of x in this particular equation let's say that we get this y value okay so this is the x value and for this particular x value we get this y value so this is not exact number so i'm just giving you an example so i'm sure that if you plug the values of x in this particular equation you won't get this value so i'm just using this as a demonstration purpose let's understand this as uh, if we put the x values here we get the y value as this okay so we get this particular y value from this particular equation now we have y1, y2 and y3. When you put all those x values in this equation y1, you will get all these values like this. And for y2, this is the second equation and this is the values we get. And similarly, we have y3 and the equation of y3 is this third equation. Okay. Now we need to find out of these three models, which models perform better. Okay. So this equation is nothing but the equation of a curve. You can call a curve as a model. Okay. So what I'm going to do is find the loss function for all these three models. Now let's try to find the loss function for these models. So we know that the formula for loss function is this where we try to find the difference between the true value which is yi and uh, the predicted value which is yi cap. So we uh, then take the square of all these values individually and then we do a summation on this and then divided by uh, the total number of values okay so in this case we totally have five values so five x values and the corresponding y value y1 y2 value and etc okay so first of all let's try to find the loss value for y1 so this is how you can calculate this so we need to find the difference and square it and sum it overall so the y value which is the true value is 0 0.35 and the value predicted by our model the y1 model is 0 0.38 so we need to find the difference between 0 0.35 and 0 0.38. We are uh, squaring it because we need to neglect uh, the sign, sign conventions. So in this case, the error value is negative. So, but in the second case, the error value is positive. If you don't square the values and sum it uh, without uh, squaring it, so the positive error and the negative errors will cancel. So we don't want that. So we square the values in order to neglect that positive error and the negative error. Both positive error is also an error. Negative error is also an error. So we need to take in take both into consideration. So uh, we need to square these values. So when you square the values, those signs will go away. The negative signs will go away. And that is the reason. So here the true value is y and the predicted value is y1. Okay, so 0 0.35, which is the first value, first true value and the first predicted value is 0 0.35. So we are uh, finding the difference between them and squaring them. So the second true value is 0 0.48 and the predicted value is 0 0.45. Similarly, we are subtracting 0 0.55 and 0 0.59 and then the difference between 0 0.63 and 65 which we have done here and 72 and 75. Okay. So once we square all these values individually, we need to add all these values. So this is called as the summation part. And then we need to divide that particular value by n. So n is nothing but the total number of values. And in this case, the number of values we are taking is 5, right? So I'm dividing it by 5. And the loss value you will get will be 0 0.173 in this particular case. So this is the loss value for the model uh, y1. Okay, so we know that uh, there are three people and the... Uh, equation given by the first person is this which is y1 is equal to this, so on and uh, the loss function for this particular first model is uh, 0.173 as i have already told you low loss value means high accuracy so we want our loss value to be as close to zero so if the loss value is zero that means the true value and the predicted value are the same that means our model has 100 percentage accuracy but it won't be the case always. So you may get a loss value as uh, 1.5 or you may get a loss value as 2.3 or 3.3. So those loss values are very high and that means our model is not performing well. So loss function closer to zero means our model is performing well. And in this case, we get a loss value of about 0.173. Okay. So we want our loss value to be as close as to zero. So in machine learning, when we train our machine learning models, we try to uh, minimize this loss value and this is how optimization uh, techniques also work. So the several optimization techniques try to uh, reduce this uh, loss value based on the data set that we have and uh, and it is it is the basic principle on which works. A model should have uh, a minimum loss value 
so that it can make better prediction and it trains based on that particular parameter okay so that is all about loss function and now we can come to the first part which we have discussed before as we know that loss function measures how far an estimated value is from its true value now if you read this definition again you will get a better understanding as we have seen an example okay so we have discussed how we can find this uh, you know distance or difference between the estimated value and the true value using this particular formula and based on this we can find which model performs better so what you can do is use uh, the two models so we add three models and i have shown you how we can find uh, the loss value for this particular first model and similarly you can uh, find the loss values of the second model and the third model and find which model has a very low loss value okay so that loss uh, or that particular uh, model will be the best suited one and in this case all the three models are similar models so all these three models are uh, degree 3 polynomials so in this case we are just changing the parameters so that's why i have mentioned that it is helpful to determine which model performs well or which parameters are better so in this case we are just using a single model which is a third degree polynomial but we are taking different parameters values and we can find which uh, parameters values are best suited for this particular example okay so this is how loss function works and how you can find the loss function and these are some uh, important types of loss function which includes cross entropy loss squared error loss and kl divergence loss so squared error loss is nothing but the one which we have discussed so finding the difference and uh, squaring it and then dividing it by the average value okay so this is the example of uh, squared error loss so similarly we have cross entropy loss and kl divergence loss and we will be discussing discussing about these two topics in a later time as these two are more uh, advanced topics okay so that's it about loss function and i hope you have understood all the things covered in this particular video this sixth module is all about machine learning models and some important concepts related to it so in today's video we are going to understand what is meant by model evaluation and what is the importance of this model evaluation when it comes to machine learning okay so this is the agenda for today's video before getting started, in case you are watching my videos for the first time, I, in this YouTube channel, I am making a hands on machine learning course and if you want to learn this course from the beginning, I will give the link of my course playlist in the description of this video, you can check that out. With that being said, let's get started with today's video. So first of all, let's try to understand the workflow of a machine learning project. So the steps which we follow when we are uh, working on a machine learning project. So the first step would be to collect the data that we want. So the data set that we want differs based on the problem statement uh, that we have. Let's say that if we want to predict whether a person has diabetes or not, we need to train our machine learning model with diabetes data. And if you want to uh, uh, use machine learning in order to predict some house prices or car prices, you need to uh, you know find data related to it. So the first step will be finding this appropriate model. So once we have this model, we need to do some pre-processing on this data. So this step is called as data pre-processing. So the reason for this is the raw data cannot be fed to a machine learning model. So we need to process this data in order to make it suitable to feed to a machine learning model. So once we process the data, we often do some data analysis to find some insights from this data so that we can use the features better uh, for our machine learning model. So once we analyze the data as uh, we can get some important information about the data that we have, the next step will be to split our data set into training data and test data. Okay, so this is one of the most important steps where we split the entire data into two sets of data and we use this training data in order to train our machine learning model and we use our test data to evaluate our model to check how well our model is performing. Okay. So once we split this data, we will feed the training data to a machine learning model. So in this case, I have, uh, you know, uh, just used a XG boost regressor. So similarly, you can use any machine learning model. So, so you have a support vector machine model. So there is logistic regression. So there are a lot of different types of models and uh, we feed this training data to a machine learning model. So once we train our machine learning model, we will use the test data that we have split it to a uh, evaluation metric okay so this evaluation metric is used to find the performance of the model so it is used to uh, you know check how well our model is performing how many correct predictions our model is making and so on okay so this step is called as evaluation and it is one of the most fundamental steps that we need to do when we are working on machine learning so you cannot just train a machine learning model and you can use it to prediction so we cannot do that first of all we need to understand what is the accuracy of the model how well our model is performing only if the accuracy is good we can use the uh, you know particular model for our predictions so this step is called as evaluation so we need to understand one more thing here so we know that there are two main types of supervised learning so one is 
classification and regression right so each classification and regression so both of them have their separate evaluation metric so let's first of all try to understand about classification and regression so classification is about predicting a class or discrete value okay example male or female true or false so in this we are just classifying the data so it can be as i have told before it can be predicting whether a person has diabetes or not or it can be you know predicting whether a person has heart disease or not so in this case we are just predicting uh, 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 two or three classes okay so as you can see the example here so male or female so in this case we have uh, you know two uh, classes and true or false it is also class so we are just classifying the data and regression is something where we try to predict a quantity or a continuous value for example predicting the salary of a person based on their work experience or uh, you know predicting the age of a person or predicting the price of a product based on some features so this is called as regression so classification is about uh, you know classifying the data into different classes and regression is about finding a, a fixed value or some uh, you know continuous value so not a fixed value but a continuous value so this can be a decimal or any values so this is called as a regression and the evaluation uh, metric for classification is accuracy score so this is the most widely used uh, evaluation metric for classification and then for regression we have evaluation metrics such as mean absolute error mean squared error etc okay so in this video let's try to understand what about this uh, what is about this accuracy score and also we will understand about mean uh, squared error so different types of uh, you know uh, evaluation metrics are mean absolute error mean squared error etc and in this video let's understand about mean squared error so first of all let's try to understand about this accuracy score as i've told you accuracy score is used for uh, used as an evaluation metric for classification problems so this is the definition of an accuracy score so this is very very simple in classification accuracy score is the ratio of the number of correct predictions to the total number of input data points okay so we just need to find the ratio of the number of correct predi prediction so we uh, let's say that we have trained our machine learning model so once we train our machine learning model let's say that we are using this model to uh, predict a set of values so let's say that there are about 100 values and we are trying to predict this 100 values and out of this uh, let's say that our model has predicted correctly for 50 values and the, uh, in this case the total number of uh, data points that we have the total number of input data points we have is 100 and the number of correct predictions is 50 so if you take the the ratio it is 0 0.5 right so 0 0.5 means 50 percentage so this is called as the accuracy score so you can write the formula for accuracy score like this so accuracy score is equal to number of uh, correct predictions divided by total number of data points so if you just multiply this particular value by 100 you will get a percentage so if you just um, you know divide this number of correct predictions and total number of data points you will get a decimal value less than zero so if you multiply it with uh, you know 100 you will get the percentage of this accuracy score okay so this is just like finding a simple percentage so let's try to understand this with an example let's say that uh, we are predicting whether a person is diabetic or not okay so let's say that uh, we are using a machine learning model so this particular machine learning model is trained with diabetes data and now we are taking 150 data points so the total number of data points that we have for this particular testing so this is the test data so we train our machine learning model with the training data and we test or evaluate it with the test data so the total number of data points that we have in test data is let's say 150 so out of this 150 data points the model has uh, predicted correctly whether the person has diabetes or not for 128 data points so in this case the accuracy score will be 85.3 so if you just uh, plug in these values in this particular formula it will be 128 divided by 150 into 100 percentage okay so if you calculate it you will get an accuracy score of 85.3 percentage so this is how you can calculate the accuracy score of a model when it comes to classification okay so uh, this is the python uh, command or python uh, program which you can use in order to import the accuracy score function so we don't have to do this manually so we have a you know ready made function in order to uh, calculate this accuracy score and this is present in the sklearn library in python so you just need to uh, you know run this particular line from sklearn.metrics so sklearn is the library and in the sklearn library we have a module called as metrics so this metrics module contains all the evaluation metric that we need so from sklearn.metrics import accuracy score and this accuracy score is the function which is helpful to calculate this accuracy score okay so you can also check out my other machine learning projects so i have did several machine learning projects on classification as well as regression so in that i have explained you uh, and on on uh, you know how to find this accuracy score for a particular model okay so you can also check that machine learning projects i'll give the link for those project playlist in the description of this video so you can also check that out
Now let's try to understand about mean squared error. So as I've told you, the accuracy score is used for classification problems and the mean squared error and mean absolute errors are used for uh, regression problems. So mean squared error is one of the most important and most widely used uh, evaluation metrics when it comes to regression. So this is the definition of mean squared error. So mean squared error measures the average of the squares of the errors, that is the average squared difference between the estimated values and the actual values. Okay. So we can understand this definition better if we just look at this formula. Okay. So MSC represents mean squared error. So mean squared error is equal to 1 by n summation of yi minus yi cap whole square. Okay. So here we have two values. One is the estimated values. So estimated values is nothing but the uh, predicted value. And then we have this actual value. So actual value is the true value and estimated value is the one predicted by our model. So estimated value is yi cap and actual value is yi. Okay. So here what we do is we try to find the difference between the two values, the one predicted by the model and the true value. So we find this difference and we square this difference and uh, let's say we have 100 data points. So 100 test data points and we are finding uh, the predicted value for all these 100 data points. So we try to find the difference of the true value and estimated value for all these 100 data points and we will get some values. So we, we will just summation this all these difference uh, raised to the uh, power 2. Okay. So we just find the difference and uh, square this value individually for all these 100 data points and, di and we divide it by the total number of data points that we have. So in this case, the total number of data points that we have is 100. Okay. So uh, in, in our previous video where I explained about loss function, I have uh, explained you how you can find the mean squared loss. Uh, in machine learning. So that step is uh, actually similar to the mean squared error. So if you want to have a better understanding of this, you can uh, watch that video as well where I have clearly explained you how you can calculate this value. Okay. So uh, in that video, I uh, took an example and calculated the uh, mean square error or the loss value. So you can also check that out. So in this case, Let's say that we are uh, predicting the average blood sugar level. So in the previous classification problem, we uh, took an example where we tried to predict whether a person has diabetes or not. So this is uh, it is an example of a classification problem. Now let's say that we have a regression problem we, where we need to find the average blood sugar level of a person. In this case, this is not classification. We are just finding some actual value, some you know, some uh, uh, continuous value or some number. Okay, so which is an example of regression. Let's say that in this case, uh, there is a person and the average blood sugar level of that person is one, uh, 140 milligram per deciliter. Okay, so this is the true value. And let's say that we have uh, trained a machine learning model which can predict the blood sugar level. And this particular model has predicted the value to be 160 milligram per deciliter. So here you can see there is an error of 20 milligram. If you subtract these two values, so this is yi cap. Okay, so yi cap represents the predicted value. So I missed to, you know, uh, include it. So this is yi represents the actual value and yi cap is the predicted value. So you just need to plug in the uh, values here. So 140 minus 160. So we are squaring this value in order to neglect the, you know, sign convention. So if you, min you know, subtract 140 uh, minus 160, you will get an error value of minus 20. So we don't want these negative errors in our uh, evaluation metric. So if you just have uh, negative errors and positive errors, both of these errors will cancel out and we don't want that. It won't be a correct metric. So we need to uh, remove those signs. Hence we are squaring the error. So this is one data point. So let's say that we have about 100 data points as I've told before. So for these 100 people, we try to measure the uh, blood sugar level using this machine learning model and we compare these values the values predicted by our model with the values uh, which are the actual values or the true values and we subtract those uh, difference and we square them individually and uh, we do that summation and we finally divide it by the total number of values where the total number of values in this case is 100 okay so you will get some mean squared error value so this mean squared error value can be uh, 1.5, it can be 5.3, it can be 10 point, uh, no something, or it can be any values. So when your mean squared error value is less, that means your model is performing better. So there is no, uh, you know, fixed value where we can tell that if the value was uh, one, that mean squared error is good or something like that. So we cannot give a fixed number for a good value of mean squared error. If the value is less, then our model is performing better. If the value is zero, if the mean squared error value is zero, that means our model is making accurate predictions, but it is not possible in most of the cases. So the value that we get depends on the data set that we have, the problem we are solving. Let's say that we are predicting the blood sugar level of a person and we try to calculate uh, the mean squared error. And the overall mean squared error that we get is about 
uh, you know let's say that it's about uh, 10.5 so now we need to look at this magnitude of the data that we have so 140 milligram and 160 milligram so it is in the average value of about 150 milligram uh, per deciliter in this magnitude of 150 a difference or an error of 10 is kind of more so you can uh, you know uh, it's not very high but it's kind of uh, high right so this is a uh, high mean squared error value but if you get a mean squared error value of 5 or 4 in that case we have a very low mean squared error so very low mean squared error value represents we have a very good model let's consider another case and let's say that in this case we are trying to predict the price of a car and the price of the car can be uh, 5 lakhs 10 lakhs or 20 lakhs in this case let's say that we get a mean square error value of 100 or 200 okay so 100 or 200 rupees so when you think about the magnitude in this particular case the magnitude is in lakhs and when you uh, have values in lakhs you can have error values of hundreds or two hundreds which is very less compared to it so you cannot make a generalized statement of what is a good mean square error so we need to look at the magnitude of the data that we have and we need to compare it to get you know to understand what is a mean squared error so it depends on this particular value and the one thing which you need to note particularly here is that uh, lower mean square error value means that the model is performing better uh, so we want just uh, you know lower values so that is one main insight which we need to understand about so we are just taking the estimated values or the predicted values as y cap and the actual values as y a and we are just trying to find the difference between them and we are taking the square of it and we add all those data points and divide it by the total number of values so that is given in this definition where we try to find the average squared difference between the estimated values and the actual values so this is the python line which you can use in order to import mean squared error so from sklearn.matrix uh, sklearn import mean squared error so you can use this particular line in order to import this function where uh, we have this ready-made function as mean squared error to calculate this particular value and uh, you can also check out my uh, other regression machine learning projects so i have done several uh, regression machine learning projects like uh, house price predictions and the car price predictions etc so you can uh, watch those machine learning projects to understand how to implement this uh, squared error mean squared error and uh, things like that okay so that's it for this video and i hope you have understood clearly about uh, evaluation metrics in machine learning video i would like to explain you about two main important parameters that we have when it comes to training a machine learning model so these two parameters are model parameters and hyper parameters and understanding this will uh, really help us when we are dealing with individual models in detail so in the subsequent videos we will be discussing the intuition behind uh, the different types of model that we have and how we can build these models from scratch so it's a good idea to discuss about the parameters before going to that part so that is the idea behind this particular video. So let's get started. So as I've told you, the two main uh, types of parameters that we have in machine learning are model parameters and hyper parameters. So I'll give you the definition of these model parameters and hyper parameters. Model parameters are the parameters of the model that can be determined by training with training data. So these can be considered as internal parameters and the two important model parameters that we have are weights and biases okay so this is the definition of model parameters and the two model parameters are weights and bias now let's try to understand this definition so in my previous videos i have uh, made several uh, videos on the topic linear regression right and we know that the equation of a line is y is equal to mx plus c so i have written the same equation here i have just replaced m with w and b with sorry the c with b okay so y is equal to mx plus c is written as y is equal to wx plus b where m represents the slope and c represents the intercept so i have replaced m with w and c with b so it's actually the same thing now we know that uh, whenever we are training a model we will try to fit this particular model to the data that we have right say for example let's say that we want to build a model build a linear regression model that can predict the salary of a person based on their number of work experience so in this case y will be the salary of the person and the x will be uh, the number of years of experience for that particular person okay so what we will try to do is we will try to fit this data let's say that we have about 100 data points so we have a data of 100 different people regarding their number of years of experience and the salary that they are making so we will try to fit this particular data to a linear regression model linear regression is nothing but a simple straight line okay so in that case we will get a straight line with some parameters so it will be y is equal to mx plus c and uh, for that particular data we will get some slope value let's say that the slope value is uh, you know uh, 30 or something and we will get some intercept value let's say that intercept value is 3 or 4 something okay so these can be any values this slope and intercept value m and c value 
varies depending upon the data so it is it won't be a constant in all the cases so this particular values differ in all the cases based on the data that we have so in this equation as i have told you uh, the m is replaced by w so the slope is uh, replaced by weights and the intercept is uh, replaced by bias actually these are the same things so slope and weight represents the same thing and uh, intercept and bias uh, represent the same thing so i'll uh, tell you how this is and uh, now you can see this definition again so these are the parameters of the model that can be determined by training with the training data as i have uh, explained to you in this example so we, we will get this uh, slope value and intercept value after fitting the data to our model right so the model parameters are those which are obtained after training the data so hence these are considered as internal parameters because these are the parameters uh, within the model right so these are the parameters of the model so for a line the parameters the two parameters are slope and intercept or you can call this as weight and bias so these two will be the model parameters and we can call this as internal parameters. Now let's try to understand about the hyper parameters. Hyper parameters are the parameters whose values control the learning process. These are adjustable parameters used to obtain an optimal model and hence these are called as an external parameters. Now let's try to understand this particular definition. So whenever we are fitting uh, a set of data to a linear regression model, what we will do is we will try to iterate the process. We will try to uh, fit the data multiple times in order to get the best uh, values for the parameters. So in this case, we have the weight value and bias value, right? So we won't get the best values for this weight and bias. So there may be some errors. So error in the sense, uh, let's say that we uh, get a linear regression model with some value for weight and some value for bias. So this model cannot make better predictions. So in that case, what we will do is we will try to optimize the model to get a better accuracy score to make uh, better predictions. So in that case, what we will try to do is we will try to reiterate the model with that particular data. So we will try to fit the data again and again to the model until we get the best value for weights and biases, which can give you accurate prediction. So in that case, what we will do is we will try to uh, manipulate the values called as hyperparameters. So example of this hyperparameters are learning rate and the number of epochs. So every time you reiterate the data, what happens is we will try to change the values of weights and bias slightly. Okay, so we will try to give a slight variation to the weight and bias and we will try to uh, check the prediction of the model. Okay, if the model make a uh, good prediction, then we can say that it is accurate model. If the predictions are not proper, then it is not uh, very accurate, right? So there will be a particular change in the values of weights and biases in each iteration or each process that we do and uh, this change that we are giving is called as the learning rate okay and number of epochs number of epochs represents the number of time we are uh, training the model with that particular data let's say that we have about 10 iterations so we want uh, the model to go through the uh, data 10 times so in that case the number of epochs will be 10 uh, okay so this is about the learning rate and number of epochs where learning rate represents the amount of change that we are imparting to the parameter values and the number of epochs represents the number of iterations that we want so now you can see the definition again so hyper parameters are the parameters whose values control the learning process so learning process is fitting the data to the model and these are adjustable parameters because we can adjust the learning rate and the number of epochs so we can manually give the value for learning rate and number of epochs whereas we cannot give the values for this weights and biases the model has to determine the value of weights and biases depending on the data so that is the difference between model parameter and hyper parameters as i have told you it is used for finding an optimal model so an optimal model is something that make accurate predictions and better predictions so uh, this is the uh, use of hyper parameters and these are external parameters because they are not within the model so these are not the parameters of the model but we are giving separately so we are giving manually these uh, values of learning rate and number of epochs so these are the two different types of models that we have in model parameters sorry in machine learning models so one is model parameters which are the parameters of the model and then we have these hyper parameters which uh, you know which determines the learning process so how much change do you want to give to your weights and bias and how many number of iterations do you want to give to your model okay so these are the two main important parameters that we have and uh, you know apart from this learning rate and number of epochs we also have some other uh, hyper parameters but these two are the main things that we will uh, you know regularly use now let's try to understand about these uh, weights and bias and learning rates and number of epochs separately so weight so what is meant by the weight of a model so i am sure that if you are trying to learn machine learning for some time you would have uh, come across these words weight and bias but you may not have a clear understanding of these two terms now uh, let's try to understand uh, them and uh, these are very main important concepts when it comes to machine learning so weight weight is a value so weight decides how much influence 
the input will have on the output okay so just read this definition again and you can take a note of this so this is very important so in a data set we may have uh, you know several features so and you can have a target variable as well let's say that uh, let's consider this particular data set so in this i have given data regarding an applicant for a job let's say that uh, we are building a machine learning system that can predict whether a person can get a job or not based on some parameters based on some features so in this data set we have the name of the person the degree that they have their educational qualification and the college from which they have studied whether they know C programming and whether they know C++ or Python and what is the height of the person, what is the weight of the person and number of backlogs, whether they have any arrears or not. So this is the data that we have. So how many features do we have here? So one is name, degree, college, C, C++, Python. So seven, eight and nine. Okay, so totally we have nine uh, features in this particular data set. Okay, so each column represents one feature and the target variable will be whether the person will get a job or not. So one uh, type of uh, the target will be, yes, the person will get a job and the other type of the value which we can have is, no, the person will not get a job, okay? So that will be our target variable and these uh, nine column represents our features. Now, we need to find whether a person will get a job or not by analyzing this particular data. Now, all these columns are not important for us. Some columns are important, whereas some columns are not important. Now let's try to understand which uh, columns or which features are important for making this prediction. So let's try to understand these uh, columns individually. So first column is the name of the person. So now we can think logically. So the job offering that has been there is for the role of software engineer. Okay. And now let's try to see which columns are uh, important for us. First column is the name of the person. So if we think the name of the person has nothing to do with whether they will get a job or not, right? So the person can have any name and their name does not influence whether that person will get a job or not. So this particular column, this name column won't be that much important for us. So, or in other words, it won't be important at all. And the second column is the degree of the person. Uh, so the first person, the person A has studied a uh, bachelor of engineering and the second person has studied, uh, you know, master of engineering, maybe, uh, you know, in computer science or information technology. Third person has studied MCA and the fourth person has also studied BE. Now let's try to see whether the degree is important for that particular role. Yes, we know that the degree or the educational qualification of a person is very impo important to decide whether that person will get a job or not. So this second column will be very important for us. So this column is uh, required for our prediction and the college they studied. So, uh, you know, I just uh, named some colleges and we know that the college that they are studying will actually influence, uh, you know, whether they would get a job or not. If the person is from a, you know, high tier college, there is a high chance that that person will get a job that particular job so it is obvious right so this particular column is also essential and now we have the three programming languages so for a software engineer it's important for them to know programming languages right so these three columns will be will be important so whether a person knows c c plus plus and python so let's say that this tick green tick represents that the person knows c programming and x mark represents that that person does not know that particular programming so in this case all the four people uh, knows C programming and uh, two people doesn't know C++ and so on. Okay. So X represents the person who does not know that particular language. So these three columns are important for our prediction to determine whether the person will get a job or not. Okay. So these three columns are important. Now we have the height and weight column. So we can confidently say that the height and the weight of the person doesn't influence the that they are going to get the job, right? So it is not relevant to that particular use case. So the height and weight of a person does not, uh, you know, influence whether a person will get a software engineering job or not. So these two uh, columns are not required. And finally, the number of backlogs. So this is very important, right? If a person has more number of backlogs or if a person has more number of areas, then uh, it's most probably that he may not get a job. And if a person does not have any backlogs uh, at all, then uh, the chance or the percentage that that person will get a job is really high, right? So this will be a very important uh, feature for us. So out of these uh, nine features, we have uh, excluded the three features. One is the name, name column, height column and weight column and the remaining six features are important for us to determine whether the person has, uh, person can get a software engineering role or not. Now we need to give a numerical value to emphasize the importance of these columns. And this is where weights will help us, okay? So we will assign some particular numerical value to these columns. So when it comes to name, height and weight, we know that these columns are not important, right? So in this cases, we can give the value of zero to weight. 
okay for name height and weight we can give the weight value as zero and different columns have different weight values so each of these columns will have different weight values and it is not a common value so if there are about nine features you will have nine different weight values and uh, and this weight value is not constant for uh, different columns because we know that each column has separate uh, you know importance so uh, say for example the degree has a uh, high weightage and the college also has some weightage and this programming so these three columns as a high weightage when it when we compare it to degree and college and so on and number of backlogs this number of backlogs has a negative impact on the job of the person right if the person has uh, 10 backlogs then uh, we need to say that that person is not likely to get that job so in this case the weight will have a negative value so the positive columns or the positive features will have uh, positive weights so the desirable or the favorable columns will have the positive weight values the undesirable columns or uh, the undesirable columns in the sense is um, the number of arrears so it will have a negative uh, weight value so that is one main thing that you need to understand so positive weights means that is a you know a positive result and uh, negative weight means there will be a negative result if we have the high number of values in that particular column so that's one main important thing that you need to understand so weight is helpful for us to decide which column or which feature will influence the output here the output will be the whether the person will get a job or not okay so this is the importance of the weight of a model so this is nothing but the slope of the line that we are talking about so here i have told you right y is equal to w x plus b and this slope actually represents this uh, importance okay so in this case the example i have uh, taken is x represents the number of years of experience right so w will be the weight so how much this particular uh, column or feature will be helpful for us to predict the salary of the person so that is meant by the weight of the model okay so i hope everyone is clear uh, to this particular mark so as i've told you weight decides how much influence the input will have on the output so uh, the number of weights that we have is equal to the number of features that we have in a particular data set so let's say that y is equal to wx plus b so this is uh, the equation of a simple line okay so in this case we have only one feature which is x and we have the uh, output uh, variable as y so in this case uh, x represents the feature or the input variable and y can be the target or output variable and w can be the weight and b can be the bias so you can also call this w as a slope and b as the uh, intercept when it is a linear model when it is a simple line okay so in this case let's say that x represents the number of years of experience of a person and y represents the salary of the person now we may also have multiple features as i have told you right so in the previous slide i have told you uh, i have uh, you know uh, taken a, an example where we totally add about nine uh, individual features right so similarly you can have multiple features so in this case we just add only one feature and in some cases we will have multiple features so when you have multiple features the equation of your model will look something like this so y is equal to w1 into x1 plus w2 into x2 plus w3 into x3 plus b okay so x1 represents uh, it may represent the college from which they have studied and x2 represents whether the person knows uh, c programming or not and x3 represents the backlog of a person so this would be the equation when you have three different features so the number of weights will be equal to the number of features that you have and uh, bias will be a one single value okay so um, weight can be an array so if you consider w1 w2 w3 and so on all these weights can be considered as an array okay so whereas b will be a single value so you can you know include w1 w2 w3 together and you can call them as an array but b will be a single value bias will be a single value in this case so the one main thing that you take to no take a note of here is in the case of a simple line when you have a single feature you will have only one weight value or slope value and when there are uh, you know three different features you will have three different weight value okay and this weight value uh, represents how much importance this x1 has on the target variable y okay and x2 and w2 represents the how much importance does x2 have on the target variable y so if x1 represents let's say that x1 is the number of programming languages that a person know let's say that a person knows four programming languages so in that case w1 will be a positive value because it is a desirable character right so the number of programming languages and let's say that x3 represents the number of backlogs that a person have so more the backlogs of a person it is unlikely that he is going to get a job and hence we can say that w3 will be having a negative value so we can have both positive values and negative values for the weight uh, of the model so that's another main thing which you need to take note of so, so that's it about weights of the model now let's try to understand about the bias of the model
so you can call this bias as the offset value okay so the other name for bias is offset and bias is the offset value given to the model bias is used to shift the model in a particular direction and it is similar to a y intercept in a simple linear regression model and b is equal to y when all the feature values are zero okay so this is uh, you know a definition and a detailed description of bias and let's try to understand about what is meant by this bias so as i've told you it is an offset value of the model so uh, as you can see here both of these models have uh, some bias value which is b right and it is used to shift the model in some particular direction so i'll explain you what this exactly means and we can call this as y intercept so in my previous videos of linear regression i have uh, explained you what is meant by this uh, y intercept i'll also give the uh, you know link for my videos in the description where i have explained you about linear regression so if you have some doubts you can check that as well so this bias is similar to the y intercept that we have and b value will be equal to y when all the feature values are zero now let's try to understand this with an example so we know that the equation of a uh, line is y is equal to mx plus uh, c and uh, as you as you know i have replaced the slope value the m value with w and intercept value with uh, bias b right so x represents x value y represents y value w represents weight and b represents uh, bias so this will be a particular line for this particular line you will have a particular value for w and b if you take a different line so i'll just uh, you know draw a different line here so if you have a, a line like this this line so let's let's say that this is a straight line so this line will have a different uh, slope value different w value and different uh, intercept value and let's say that uh, we have a line like this so this particular line will have a different slope value again a different weight value okay so now what happens is so sometimes if you change the slope the orientation of the line will change okay so slope is nothing but dy by dx dy by dx in the sense when the x value changes by a particular unit what will be the change in the y value let's say that uh, here the x axis value is 2 and the x, uh, x axis value the second x axis value is 3 and if the x axis value changes from 2 to 3 what will be the change in the value of y so that is called as the slope of the line so we every one of us, of us knows this right so if you are not clear about this uh, watch kindly watch my linear regression uh, video so it will it would make uh, clear sense to you so as i have told you so slope is nothing but the change of value in y when x changes so if you change the slope of the line if you change the slope of the line your orientation of the line will change okay so if you change the uh, slope value you will get a line like this so let's say that we get a line like this so this line will have a different slope and this particular line will have a different slope and if you have a line like this this will have a different slope so changing the slope of the line or changing the weight of the line will change its orientation so that is called as the weight of the line and then we have the bias so bias is this particular region so what is the distance between this particular point from origin okay so in this case you can say that this particular value is 3 right so we have 2 and 4 as coordinates and uh, this particular line starts from this point and this represents the bias of the line so this is also called as the y intercept okay so whenever you change the slope of the line your orientation changes but you cannot change this particular position of the line here the line starts from 3 and no matter how you change your slope your uh, position of this particular line won't change so it will start from this point exactly 3 and if you want to change this particular uh, intercept value you need to change the value of c right so that is why we have this bias so if you change the bias value let's say that uh, we have a bias value as 6 so in that case what will happen is your line will start from this particular point and will be looking something like this okay and uh, the slope will be the same in uh, both the cases if you have the same value for w and if you have uh, the intercept value or the bias value as 4 your uh, line will changes sorry your line will start from this particular point so this is the importance of bias value so sometimes we need to uh, shift this particular line in the upward direction or lower direction so in case you have a uh, intercept value as 2 your line will start from here right so no matter what uh, you know no matter how much you change your slope your this particular point won't change so if you want to change this particular point from where your uh, line starts so in that case you need to change the bias value or intercept value so that is the importance of this bias okay so changing the values is uh, really impor important for us when it comes to machine learning as it is nothing but the optimization techniques to find the better uh, values so this is the importance of bias value so you can also uh, you know uh, easily find this intercept value so intercept value is nothing but 
uh, let's try to put the value as a zero for x okay so let's try to take this equation and let's put x value as zero so what will be the this equation when x is zero so w into x which is w into zero will be zero and y will be equal to b right so b is nothing but the value of y when x axis value is zero so now you can see this equation so let's try to take this particular point so let's try to find what is the coordinate of this point so this coordinate of this point is nothing but b 0 comma b right where 0 represents the x axis value and b represents the y axis value so i'll just write it here so this uh, particular point b represents 0 comma so 0 comma b or it's 0 comma 3 to be exact okay so i'm not good at writing so just uh, tolerate this so it's 0 comma b so this 0 comma b represents this slope of the range so you can also say in different words that bias is equal to y when x is equal to 0 okay so that's what i have given in this particular equation as you can see here b is equal to y when all the future values are 0 here future value is nothing but x right so that is all about uh, weights and bias so bias is the offset value that we give to our model so this is that particular offset value and uh, this bias value is used to, used to shift the model in a particular direction. So in this case, when it comes to a, a linear regression, it is helpful for us to shift the model in the upward direction or the downward direction. So we want our line above this uh, point or below this point and so on. And uh, there are models like sigmoid curve. So in, in, the, in that case, the sigmoid curve will be shifted in the left direction or the right direction when we change the bias value. So for a line, when we change the bias value, uh, your line will uh, move in the upward direction or lower direction okay so the line will shift in the upward direction or lower direction but when it comes to a sigmoid uh, curve your uh, curve will shift in the left direction or right direction when you change the bias value so that's a topic for discussion in a, some other video but just try to understand this when it comes to a linear regression the changing the bias value will uh, change the direction of the line sorry the this particular point in the upward direction or lower direction okay so that is all about bias so bias is the offset value and it is used to uh, you shift the direction of the model okay and it is similar to the y intercept so this is nothing but the y intercept y intercept in the sense what is the value of y when the value of x is zero so that's what i have given here so this is all about uh, the slope and intercept of the model or the weight or the bias of the model okay so these two parameters are hence called as the model parameters and this model parameters differs based on the data that we have if we use different uh, data then we will get different values for weights and biases okay so this is all about uh, model parameters and the next parameters that we have is hyperparameters as i have told you uh, the two hyperparameters that we have are uh, learning rate and number of epochs and uh, as i have mentioned earlier we will try to uh, reiterate the model with the data so we will try to fit the model uh, again and again with the data let's say that we have uh, 100 iterations so 100 iterations in the sense we want our model to go through the data 100 different time in order to find the best weight value and the best bias value so that our model can make better predictions okay and hyperparameters are helpful for optimizing the model optimization is nothing but a technique which is used to make better uh, model parameters so that we can make better prediction so now let's try to understand about the learning rate and the number of epochs so the learning rate is a tuning parameter in an optimization algorithm that determines the step size at each iteration while moving towards a minimum of a loss function so this is the definition of uh, learning rate so just look at the word tuning parameter and optimization algorithm so what happens is we need to change the values of weights and bias right in order to get a better value let's say that uh, this particular point represents the initial weight so we are starting from this initial weight and let's say that this initial weight w is not a good parameter so that uh, that particular weight value is not giving us good uh, good uh, prediction so that particular weight will have i loss function so if you don't know what is meant by a loss function i'll uh, i have already made a video on loss function i'll also give that particular video link in the description so do check that out as well so if a model is not performing well then it will have a very high loss function if a model is performing well if it is making accurate prediction in that case the loss function value will be very you know very low it will be zero and so on okay so high loss function value means uh, the model is uh, not working properly and low loss function value means the model is working properly so from this point we need to uh, reach to the this particular point where the loss function value is minimum okay so what we will do is we will uh, repeatedly change the weight value to see 
what will be the optimum parameters or what optimum parameter value or the weight value so that we can get a minimum loss function okay so the idea here is to minimize the loss function so j of w represents the loss function w represents the weight of the model so we need to change the weight of the model so that we get a minimum loss function so minimum loss function means accurate model right so we start from this particular point a particular initial value and we'll try to uh, change this value and so on so that we can reach this global minimum okay so global minimum is the point where the loss function value is minimum and uh, there is a change in the weight value right so this change in the weight value can be uh, let's say that the uh, weight value is uh, 10 okay so let's say that we have a linear regression model and this equation of this linear regression model is y is equal to 10x plus 3 where 10 represents the weight and the 3 represents the bias value now we need to repeatedly change this weight value let's say that uh, we change the uh, weight value by 1 in each step so this represents this one direction represents one step the next uh, direction symbol represents another step and so on so we need to come in this direction right so each step will uh, reduce your uh, value or you, it will reduce the value of our weight by one unit so if you start from 10 unit so each step you will take will reduce your value by one unit so the second iteration when you do your weight value will be 9 so that represents your uh, linear equation will be y is equal to 9x plus 3 and the next iteration again your uh, weight value will be reduced by one unit so in this case your linear regression uh, equation will be y is equal to 8x plus 3 and so on so in this case the change that you are giving your to your model is one unit right and this amount of change that you are giving is called as the learning rate so often we want to give that much learning rate so the learning rate that we will give will be in the range of 0.01 or 0.001 and so on and it completely depends on the data set that we have and it depends on the magnitude of the weight that we have so if you have a weight value uh, around 1000 in that case you cannot use a learning rate as 0.01 right so it would be very tedious in that case so it depends on the magnitude of the weight that you have and it depends on the data that you have so this is called as the learning rate so in each iteration we will try to change the weight value and we will try to see whether the loss function is reduced or not so the change that we are imparting to the weights is called as the learning rate so how much value or how much change in the value that we are giving to our parameters so now read this definition again so the learning rate is the tuning parameter in an optimization algorithm them so that determines the step size so step size is nothing but the change that we are imparting at each iteration while moving towards a minimum of a loss function so the minimum of a loss function represents the global minimum where the loss function is minimum so wherever whenever the loss function is minimum that means the model is making accurate prediction okay so this is an example of a gradient descent so this represents a gradient descent uh, algorithm and the gradient descent is an example of a optimization algorithm so in the upcoming videos we will discuss in detail about gradient descent and if you don't understand about gradient descent it's completely fine i'll make a separate video on this gradient descent and it is a very important concept in machine learning so in several models we use gradient descent as our uh, optimization model so it is very important for us and i'll uh, explain you clearly what is meant by this gradient descent for now try to understand that learning rate is the amount of the change that we are imparting to the model in each step of the training process okay so this represents the learning rate and now we have the number of epochs so number of epochs represents the number of times the model iterates over the entire data set okay so let's say that we have 100 iterations so in that case what we will do is in each 100 steps we will try to uh, change we will try to change the parameter value by some certain amount so in that case we will give some particular uh, learning rate value and uh, number of epochs is like the number of iterations so it is very simple the number of times you want your model to go through the data so this represents the number of epochs and you can give any values uh, for your epoch so you can give 100 iterations or you can give 1000 iterations and so on and it also depends on the uh, the data that we have and the model that we are choosing and so on okay so if you give a very high number of epochs there is high chance that your model will overfit and if you have a very low number of epochs then there is a chance of uh, underfitting so we need to find the optimum value of this number of epochs and learning rate and uh, not having a proper learning rate or the number of epochs will result in either underfitting or overfitting so we need to find a proper optimized value for learning rate and number of epochs and for this we use uh, some techniques called as gradient descent and so on okay so these two are called as the hyper parameters the learning rate and number of epochs so that is for this particular video so i hope you have understood about uh, the 
model parameters and the hyper parameters so it is the same slide that we had before so now you can see this or you can read this definition again and you will you would have gotten a better understanding so model parameters are the parameters of the model that can be determined by training with training data and these can be considered as internal parameters such as weights and bias okay so we know that once we train uh, the model with the data we will get this particular parameters and hyper parameter is outside the uh, outside the model so this hyper parameters are all about controlling the learning process right so we have a learning process where we will try to uh, optimize the values of weights and bias so this learning process is controlled by the hyper parameters values such as learning rate and number of epochs and these are very useful for finding an optimal model and hence these are called as an external parameters because they are not directly involved with the models whereas the model parameters are directly involved with the model and hyper parameters is just a controlling factor for the learning process so that's it about the two types of parameters that we have which are model parameters and hyper parameters and i, I hope you are clear with this and if you have any doubts please mention in the comments i'll try sixth module is all about training machine learning models so in today's video we are going to understand about one of the most important concepts in machine learning which is gradient descent since you have started learning machine learning you would have probably heard about this term gradient descent a million times and this obviously tells you uh, the amount of importance that gradient descent has when it comes to machine learning so in this video let's try to get a clear understanding of what is meant by gradient descent and how this is useful for us in machine learning so once we complete this video, from the next video onwards, we can dive deeper into the individual models in machine learning such as linear regression, logistic regression, etc. Okay, so this is the agenda for today's video. So before going deep into the gradient descent, I just need to give you a quick recap on certain concepts like weights, bias, learning rate, loss function, etc. Okay, because uh, once you understand these uh, smaller things, we can understand gradient descent clearly. So in my previous videos, I have explained to you about what is meant by a weight and what is meant by bias. And uh, if you are not sure, or sure about these terms, I'll give the link of this particular video in the video description. And uh, please check that video out before watching this particular video. So weight is nothing but weight decides how much influence the input will have on the output. Okay, so each model has their own weights and bias associated to it. So if you take a simple line, so let's say that we have a simple linear regression model. And in the case of linear regression, we just use a simple line as our model. And we know that the equation of a line is y is equal to mx plus c, right? So instead of writing y is equal to mx plus c, we can write uh, y is equal to wx plus b, where w represents the weight, or you can also call this as the slope, and b represents uh, the bias, or it represents the intercept. So they basically the same thing in a uh, linear linear regression model so x is the input feature and y is the output feature so the x can be the number of years of experience and y can be the salary of a person so in this case we will use a simple linear regression model to find the salary of a person based on their work experience so x will be the input feature so that's what i have mentioned here so x is the feature or input variable and y is the target or output variable which we want to find and uh, w represents the weight and b represents bias so we, when it is a line you can consider weight as the slope and bias as the intercept so this is the equation of a linear regression model y is equal to wx plus b and uh, different models have uh, their own weights and bias associated to it so if you see this particular equation this is the equation of a multiple linear regression so in this case instead of a line we will be using a plane in order to find this relationship between uh, y and different types of x that we have so in this case x1 may represent the number of years of experience of the person and x2 represents uh, the number of programming languages that a person knows and x3 represents uh, the college that a person has studied and y represents uh, you know maybe a person would get a job or not would get a software engineer job or not so something like that so x represents all these x represents the input features whereas y represents the target we want to find okay so in this case we want to find whether a person will get a job or not so in this case so as i have told you before this is a multiple linear regression because we have multiple features whereas in the case of simple linear regression we will be having only one feature and one target variable okay so in this case you can see here we have three weights w1 w2 w3 and we have only one bias okay so this is how the equation of a multiple linear regression uh, looks like so if you want a more deeper uh, explanation so you can watch that particular video so as i have told you i'll give it uh, in the video description so this is how uh, the equation of models look like look like and the bias so bias is the offset value given to the model and bias is used to shift the model in a particular direction it is similar to y intercept and b is equal to y when all the feature values are zero okay so uh, this is nothing but you can just consider uh, bias as 
the y intercept when it is a simple linear regression model so when the x value is equal to 0 so in that in that case this particular part will be 0 and in that case y will be equal to b so this will be the bias so bias is nothing but the value of y when uh, all the x values are 0 so you can also take this particular equation when all the values are fixed this x1 is 0 x2 is 0 and x3 is 0 in that case b will be equal to y because all this term will be uh, equal to 0 so this is some offset value that we need in order to shift our model to a particular direction so that we can get a better prediction using our model so this is all about weight and bias and this weight and bias are called as the model parameters so we can say that a model is an accurate model if it makes better predictions and a model makes better prediction if it has good parameter uh, values such as weight value and bias value if the weight value and the bias values are not proper then you won't get a proper uh, predictions for your model so you may get wrong predictions so that is the importance of uh, the model parameters weights and bias and then we have discussed about learning rate and the number of epochs as well in that particular video and learning rate is that so as i've told you we have this weight and biases and this weight and bias varies depending upon the data set that we have so different data set uh, if we uh, you know fit different data set to a particular uh, model that model will have different weights depending on the data set so in this case what we will do is this is not a single step process we will try to repeat this process iteratively so that we can get a better weight value and bias value so this particular uh, process will be repeated so when we try to fit the data to a model we will repeat this process again and again until we reach the best value for weight and bias okay and uh, so in each step we will try to change the value of weight and bias to get a better model so this change that we are imparting to these parameters is called as the learning rate so now see the definition of learning rate Learning rate is a tuning parameter in an optimization algorithm that determines the step size at each iteration while moving towards a minimum of a loss function. So just forget about this loss function. I'll explain you what is meant by this, but just uh, see this first part of the definition. So learning rate represents uh, the amount of change that we are imparting to the weights and bias or the model parameters. So that uh, amount of change is called as the learning rate and number of epochs. As I have told you, this is not a single step process and we will do this in a multiple uh, steps and the number of epochs represents the number of times we want our model to uh, go through the data again let's say that we want our model to uh, go through the data 100 times in that case the number of epochs will be 100 so this is all about learning rate and epochs and weights and bias and the third main thing which we need to discuss is the loss function so loss function is a value uh, you know it is a measure of how far an estimated value is from its true value so the best way to explain this is we find the loss function value to determine whether the model is performing well or not if the loss function value is i that means the model is not making better prediction so it is also helpful to determine which model performs better and which parameters are better so just look at this formula so it will make more sense so loss function is equal to 1 by n summation of y i minus y i a cap whole square so here y i represents the true value and y i cap represents the estimated value Let's say that we are, we are building a machine learning model and we want this particular machine learning model to measure the blood glucose level of a person based on some data. Okay. And YI represents the true value, the true glucose level value of a particular person. And YI cap represents the value predicted by our model. In order to check whether our model is making an accurate prediction, what we will do is we will try to find the difference between the true value and the values predicted by our model. So this uh, value, this values can also be called as estimated value and this yi can be called as true value. So we will subtract these two values, take square of them and we will uh, divide by the total number of data points we have. Let's say that in our data set we have 100 data points. That means we have the blood glucose level of 100 different people and we will try to predict for all these 100 people and we will try to find the difference between the value predicted by our model and the true value so this will give us the loss function i loss function means that uh, there is a huge difference between the true value and the value predicted by our model if the loss function value is very less that means our model is making accurate predictions or uh, the value predicted by our model is very close to the true uh, glucose level values so this is the importance of loss function and it is also very helpful to determine which uh, parameters are better and uh, for which parameters the model performs better so as i've told you if you don't have the best parameters such as weights and bias if the values of weights and bias are not proper you are most probably going to get a bad prediction and the difference between the true value and the predicted value will be huge so this loss function will tell us whether the model is performing well or not and whether uh, the parameters are suitable for us or not so these uh, this is all about loss function so i hope you are clear about uh, weights bias learning rate etc and with this understanding we can uh, you know try to understand about gradient descent now so 
Gradient descent is one of the model optimization techniques. So optimization means so it refers to determining the best parameters for a model such that the loss function of the model decreases as a result of which the model can predict more accurately. So let's try to understand this uh, definition. So be it any machine learning model or be it uh, deep learning models like neural networks. So all of these models have some parameters associated to it as some weight and bias associated to it. In order to make a better model, we need to find the best possible parameters. So a best possible parameter is one which has the minimum loss function. So as I explained to you in the previous slide minimum loss function means uh, you know accurate predictions so if a model has minimum loss function that means it has uh, better parameters right so better weights and uh, bias value and uh, finding this better weights and bias value is called as optimization so we will try to optimize our model to get the best parameters uh, or the best values for weights and bias so when you have that best parameter values your loss function will be very minimum and in that case your model will make accurate prediction so this is all about model optimization and for this we use a, an algorithm called as gradient descent so I'll try to explain this uh, for you with an example. Let's say that we have some data set. Let's say that X represents the number of rooms in a particular house and let Y represents the price of the house. So we can say that if the number of house in a uh, house, uh, sorry, the number of rooms in a price increases, the price of the house also increases. So there is a direct relationship between number of rooms and the price of the house. So higher number of uh, rooms represents a uh, higher price, right? So there is a linear represent linear relationship between them. So if X increases, Y also increases. Now, uh, for this particular purpose, we can use a simple linear regression for this particular data set because there is a linear relationship, right? So it's not like uh, the value first increases and decreases and so on. So in some cases, what happens is if the X increases, the Y will increase up to a certain extent. And after a particular point, even though the X increases, Y will uh, decrease. So in that case, we cannot use a linear relationship or we cannot use a linear regression model. But in this case, this is a linear regression. That means if X value increases, Y value also increases. So we can use a simple linear regression model. So let's try to fit this data to different lines uh, that are possible. So let's say that we want to use this particular line uh, in order to fit this data points to this line. So this is a simple linear regression model and this uh, line will have a particular slope value and intercept value associated to it. So you can call the slope as weight and intercept as bias. Okay. So if you want to write the equation of this particular red color line, you can write it as y is equal to w1x plus uh, b1. Okay, so this is similar to y is equal to mx plus uh, mx plus c, right, where m represents the slope and c represents intercept. So we can call this w1 and b1 as the parameters of the lines. So they, these parameters are nothing but the slope and intercept. So the slope and intercept of the line are called as the parameters of the line. So this is our line and we are trying to plot or we are, we are trying to fit the data to this particular line and then we, we got the equation of the line as y is equal to w1x plus b1. So this is the initial model that we are getting. Now if you see this particular uh, you know curve or particular line there is a large distance between this point and this line, right? So, but these four points are closer to this line, but uh, these uh, set of four points are not closer to this line. So we cannot say that this is an accurate model because all the data points are not closer to this particular line. So we will try to find the best line for this particular data set. So this is called as the best fit. If you get a best fit, your uh, data points will be closer to your line and these are called as the best parameters. And if you have the best parameters, you will have a minimum loss function. So that is our goal to have minimum loss function so that we can make better predictions. So now what we will do is we will try to change the values of weight and bias so that we can uh, get a line which can fit to all the data points as possible. So let's try to change this line. So let's say that we are having a line something like this. So in this case, this particular line is closer to these four points, but uh, the distance between these four points with this line is very huge, right? So this line doesn't fit with the below four points. So let's say that this uh, particular line has an equation of y is equal to w2x plus b2. So in the previous case, we have we have this line and the uh, parameters are w1 and b1, y is equal to w1x plus b1. And the second case, we have the equation of the line as y is equal to w2x plus b2. And we can say that both of these lines doesn't fit to the data well. And now let's, uh, you know, consider an, another line. So if you think this line, so this line is not very close to the data points, but it is almost close to all the data points, right? So in the previous cases, only four data points are closer to this line. So the first line and the second line, but 
this third uh, line is closer to all the data points. It is not as close as uh, this particular line, but it is closer to all the data points. So we can say that uh, this particular line has the best parameters as uh, W3 and B3. Let's say that the equation of this particular line is W3 and B3, and we can call this as the best uh, fit for our data. So this is how we will try to find the best model for the data set that we have. And uh, so we have optimized our model manually in this case, right? So we have manually looked at the data. We have uh, seen whether the distance between the data points on the line is huge or not. So we have manually find out of this uh, three lines, which line is the best fit. And uh, a machine learning model cannot do this, uh, you know, easily. So for this purpose, we are going to use a technique called as gradient descent and uh, this is where it is very helpful for us so it is very helpful for us to find the best parameters or the best weight value and the bias value so that we can make uh, you know better predictions so let's try to understand about what is meant by gradient descent and how gradient descent works so let's say that we have a curve so in the x-axis i'm taking the weight of the model and uh, in the y-axis i'm just taking the loss function value so loss function is nothing but as i have told you before it is the difference between the true value and the predicted value so if the loss function is i that means the model is not making good predictions or in other words the difference between the true value and the uh, estimated value is very huge if the loss function is very minimum if it is in this lower side of the y-axis it means the model is making better predictions because the difference between the true value and the predicted value is very small okay so that is the importance of loss function and in the x-axis we have weights so if you plot uh, the value of weights and the loss function so if you take different weight values and in each case if you try to find a loss function and you plot this uh, data you will get a u-shaped curve okay so that is one main thing you need to understand i'll, I'll tell you how you will get this uh, u-shaped curve but just uh, you know for now just uh, keep in mind that when you plot weight and loss function you will get a u-shaped curve so now let's say that uh, we are taking a random initial value for the weight so in machine learning what we will do is whenever we are trying to fit to the data we will assign random values to weight and biases or we will just give the value as zero for weight and biases so let's say that we are uh, initiating the uh, uh, random initial value so random initial value so we are initiating some uh, weight value and uh, for that particular weight value the loss function is at this particular point so i just uh, mark this so we are taking the weight value at this particular point and for this weight value the loss function is at this point okay so the loss function is at this point and this point represents higher loss function right because it is on the top part of the y-axis so if you take the weight value at this point let's say that the weight value is 5 okay so i'll just write this uh, weight value as 5 so weight is nothing but so as you can see here so y is equal to uh, w3x plus b3 so in this we are going to take different weight values so let's say that we are taking the initial weight value as 5 and for this particular weight value we are having a year loss function now what we will need to do is we want to find the value of the weight and for that particular weight value we want a minimum loss function and this particular point is called as global minimum so this particular point so global minimum is the point and at this global minimum if you take this particular weight so let's say that uh, this particular weight is uh, or else i'll just you know i'll just remove this so instead of writing uh, 5 i'll just write this as um okay so i'll write this as w1 okay so let's say that this is w1 and this global minimum is w3 so in the previous case we have discussed that uh, w1 is not a good model right because uh, the distance between the data points and the line is very huge and w3 is the best model because in this case the data points are close to the line so we can say that uh, if you take the parameter value as w1 or the weight value as w1 you will have a higher loss function because the model won't make better predictions as the data points and the line is not closer to each other but if you take this particular uh, weight w3 in that case you will have a minimum loss function okay so the loss function value will be minimum so if you just uh, draw draw a dotted line here so your loss function will be here so here we are getting the minimum loss function right so at this point you are having some uh, weight value and the weight value is nothing but w3 so this can be any value so this is the point we are interested in if you have the weight value at global minimum you will have a uh, minimum loss function and your model will make better predictions so our job is to find this uh, particular global minimum so what we will try to do is we will reiteratively 
change the value of weight set biases so that we can uh, find which uh, weight set biases as the uh, as the least loss function and that model will be considered as the better model so we will try to change this uh, weight value you know little by little so we will gradually change the weight value and bias value till we reach this particular global minimum so if you reach this particular point at this point the loss function value will be zero so let's say that we have w in the first case and uh, we are changing this uh, weight value by a small amount in that case we will uh, the loss function value will be decreased and so on so this process will be repeated again and again till we reach this point called as global minimum and at global minimum is a point where for this particular parameter value or the weight value your model will have the minimum loss function and we know that the loss function is the difference between the true value and the predicted value so this is the most desirable point for us so this is the weight value or the point which we need okay so gradient descent is all about starting from this random initial value and reaching this uh, global minimum point so this is where we are going to use gradient descent so if you start from the from the top part of the curve you will eventually reach this global minimum and uh, if you just start from this particular point let's say that uh, you have a weight value something here okay let's say that the weight value is here so here the weight is uh, quite high so let's say that the weight value is w10 so if you just start from zero 0, 1, 2, 3 and so on, the weight value increases when you go right off the x-axis. So if you start from this particular point, when you apply gradient descent, you are, uh, when we gradually change the weight values and so on, so you will eventually reach this global minimum as well, okay? So no matter where you start in this particular curve, so in this u-shaped curve, no matter where you start, you will eventually reach this global minimum if you use the formula of gradient descent. So this is in the importance of gradient descent. No matter where you start or no matter what the weight value and bias value you take, so eventually you will reach this global minimum and this global minimum is the point that we need. And at this global minimum, we have the minimum loss function and at this minimum loss function, the model will make accurate predictions. So this is why the gradient descent has a u-shaped curve. So because if you just start in that point, you will Will reach here if you start this point you will reach here so hence if you just take weight in the x-axis and loss function in the y-axis so if you plot the weight and the corresponding loss function for that particular weight so you will get a u-shaped curve like this okay so this is all about gradient descent so as i've told you there is a formula which we use to change this uh, weight value so as i've told you right so we will reiterate over the data and we will try to change the weight value again and again so that we reach that reach this point so there is a formula for this and uh, that particular formula is w is equal to w minus l into dw and b is equal to b minus l into dw where w represents weight and b represents bias l is the learning rate so as I've told you, learning rate is the amount of change that we are imparting to our uh, weights and bias, right? So I have uh, already explained you the definitions of learning rate. So it is the change that we are imparting to the weights and bias or our parameters. And DW is the partial derivative of loss function with respect to M. And DB is the partial derivative of loss function with respect to C. So this is the formula. So W is the initial weight we are taking. And uh, this particular W, w in the uh, left hand side represents the updated weight. So this is uh, the initial weight value and this W is the updated weight value. And this B represents the B in the right hand side represents the initial weight value. And this uh, B on the left hand side represents the updated weight value. So your updated weight is equal to initial weight minus learning rate into dw where dw is the partial derivative so we will try to find the partial derivative of loss function with respect to slope m so slope m so i just made a mistake here so instead of uh, slope m we should write so we are uh, taking instead of uh, m we are taking w right and instead of c we are taking b so they both are actually the same thing but let's let's use this notation so you won't use m and c in machine learning so we use w and b in machine learning so that's why i'm using this particular notation so we will try to uh, you know uh, differentiate loss function with respect to w and this particular differential is called as dw and we will try to find the partial derivative so we will, we will try to differentiate loss function with respect to b and this is called as db so and this is the formula for it w is equal to w minus l into dw and b is equal to b minus l into dw where w and b on the left hand side represents the updated uh, parameter values so while we are discussing about models so i'll explain you in detail how we will get this equation and how we can find this dw and db because this changes slightly for each model that we have so i'll explain you later uh, how this works okay so you just for now note this particular formula uh, in the later uh, in the upcoming videos i'll explain you how you can find this dw and db by using differential calculus okay so this is the formula that we use in order to 
start from this point and reach the global minimum part okay so i hope you are i hope everyone is clear up to this point so in this particular uh, graph we have taken only weight value and the loss function value right but a model has both weight value and the bias value and the three dimensional uh, diagram of uh, the gradient descent looks something like this so if you take this uh, you know in this particular axis if you take the loss function as uh, j and uh, one axis will be weight and the other axis will be b and this will be uh, you know the curve will look something like this so this is a u-shaped line or u-shaped curve and in three dimension your gradient descent model will look something like this and this point represents the global minimum so at this point you will have certain w value and b value so at this global minimum you will have some weight value and bias value and for this weight value and bias value the loss function value will be very less or it will be very minimum and this is the desirable point for us so this is how gradient uh, gradient descent looks in three dimension and this is how gradient descent looks in two dimension okay when you consider weight and this is for weight and bias and uh, the formula for gradient descent is this sorry the definition so gradient descent is an optimization algorithm used for minimizing the loss function in various machine learning algorithms so it is used for updating the parameters of the learning model and I hope uh, now this definition makes a sense so as I have told you our goal is to make better predictions our goal is to make uh, accurate uh, models or accurate predictions if you want to have accurate uh, models then in that case you will have minimum loss function so loss function is nothing but the difference between true value and predicted value so our goal is to minimize this loss function and for this we use gradient descent and how gradient descent works is it will try to update the parameters uh, of the learning model particular learning model by uh, using this particular formulas okay and this is how gradient descent works and the main uh, job of the gradient descent is to find the best parameters uh, that a model can have so that it can have minimum loss function if a model can have minimum loss function then it can make better uh, predictions or it can make accurate predictions so this is the important of importance of gradient descent and i hope everyone of you are clear about this and if you have any doubts please mention uh, in the comments and in the upcoming videos so let's uh, dive straight away into the linear regression model logistic regression model etc so we will try to understand the intuition behind this model and the mathematics behind the model and i'll also explain you how you can build these models from scratch a machine learning system that can predict whether a person has heart disease or not okay so this is the problem statement we have today so before getting into the hands on part i would like to explain you the procedure which we are going to follow for completing this project okay so this is the workflow which we will be following so it's very similar to the workflows which we have uh, seen before so the first step is to get the art data okay so this data set contains several health parameters which you know corresponds to uh, a person healthiness of the art okay so first we need this art data set so art this is data set so once we have this data set we need to process this data set okay so we cannot feed this raw data into our machine learning algorithm so we need to process this data set to make it fit and compatible for our machine learning algorithm to learn okay so once we process the data we need to split our data into training data and testing data okay so this is because we often train our machine learning algorithm with training data and we will evaluate our model we will evaluate the performance of our model using the test data okay so this is this part is called as train test split where we will split our original data set into training data and test data okay so once we do that we will feed our training data to our machine learning model in this case we are going to use a logistic regression model okay because this uh, particular use case is a binary classification so yeah, we are we are we are going to classify whether a person has a diseased art or not okay so this is a binary classification either yes or no kind of questions and in that binary classifications logistic regression model is you know very useful okay so it's the best model when it comes to binary classification once we train this uh, logistic regression model with our training data we will uh, do some evaluation on our model to check its performance so after that we will get a trained logistic regression model and to this model when we feed new data uh, our model can predict whether that person has art disease or not okay so this is what we are going to do in our art disease prediction project okay so i hope you understood the workflow of this uh, project so now let's get into the answer part of this video okay so we will be doing this project in python and we will be doing our python programming in google collaboratory so 
before getting started with this video i would like to give you a quick introduction to my youtube channel so this is my youtube channel so when you go to my channel so you can see this machine learning course curriculum video so in this video i have explained all the modules and the videos which i will be covering in my channel and in the description of this video you can download the course curriculum file so uh, uh, it contains all the video details okay so you can also go to this playlist so we have already completed about four modules in our uh, machine learning course the first module is on machine learning basics the second module is on all the python basics you need to learn about machine learning and the third is on important python libraries for machine learning so in this i have explained about numpy pandas matplotlib seaborn etc okay the fourth module is on data collection and processing so in this module i will be explain, explaining you about where to collect data how to collect data and what are the various pre-processing text that uh, you know tasks we need to do in a data cell and such kind of things so we also have a uh, machine learning project okay so we almost have about uh, nine machine learning projects so including this it will be 10 machine learning projects okay so do check the check out that videos as well so subscribe and stay tuned for more videos so you can go to this about section i have given the link for my hands on data science course so you can check that out i have also given the link for my linkedin account and telegram group and facebook group so join in those communities i will be uh, giving you notifications once i post new videos okay so so we will be doing this in Google Collaboratory. So if you are new to this Google Collaboratory, you can check out my uh, module two playlist. So here you can see it. So the Python basics for machine learning. So in this playlist, you can see the first video Google Collaboratory for Python. So in this, I have explained you how you can access Google Collaboratory and what are the various features of Google Collaboratory. OK, so with that being said, now let's get started with those art disease prediction uh, task. OK, so First, we need to get the data. Okay, so you can search in Google for art disease prediction data set. Okay, so you can see the first site here. So it says art disease UCA Kaggle. So we are going to download the data set from Kaggle. Okay, so this site contains all the information about the data set. Okay, so you can see here. So you can download the data set from here. So this is the download option and it gives uh, you know the sample of the data set we have and all the columns of this data set. OK, so totally we have 14 columns. So I'll just turn this to select all. So it will show the sample for all the columns. OK, so totally we have 14 columns and you can see what are these columns are. So we have the age of the person and the sex, the gender of the person and the chest pain type. So these are some medical information, the chest pain type, resting blood pressure, cholesterol level, uh, blood sugar level and those kind of things. So we also have this ST depression and ST segment. So this is based on the ECG uh, curves. OK, so you can search for this ECG. So you know you, you would have seen this in some movies in hospitals okay so where uh, there will be this, this monitors and there will be these kind of waves in the monitor so this represents the functioning of a person's heart okay so this is the uh, uh, wave how a typical wave looks for a healthy person's heart okay so if there is any change in this wave that means that person's heart is not performing well okay so it consists of this p q wave r s t and r s and t wave okay so and uh, this represents so we can also have this so you can see here so old peak st depression included by exercise relative to rest. so it uh, you know represents some abnormalities in this ecg curve and uh, you can also see this exercise induced uh, angina so angina means it's pain in the heart which is caused due to low blood in the heart when a person is exercising okay so these are the medical parameters we will be having and we the, we also have this target column okay so the last column is the target column okay so it contains the value as one or zero okay so zero represents that the person is healthy and one represents that the person has a art defect okay so we can see it here okay so it uh, you can see is here so the gold field refers to the presence of art disease in the patient okay so zero represents no presence so no art defect so other values represent the person has a defected art okay so this is the data set we have so you can download the data set from here so once you download it so we need to upload it to our google collaboratory okay so you can connect your google collaboratory environment from here and go to this files options from there you can upload your data set okay so you can give this upload option or you can right click here and it will ask you for upload okay so i have already uploaded my data set so it is named as art data.csv so i have renamed it to data.csv okay so this is the data set so you need to upload it so once you upload it we can continue with our work 
so the first step is to import the dependencies okay importing the dependencies just one second okay so dependency is nothing but the libraries and the functions which we need for our uh, machine learning projects okay so here we will import the library such as numpy pandas sklearn etc so this is the first step you do in every machine learning project you work on so first let's import the important or basic libraries numpy so import numpy as np and let's import pandas as pd and so i'll also explain you what is meant by these libraries i'll import sklearn dot model selection sorry so we need to give from sklearn so from sklearn so from this sklearn library i'm importing a specific function import train test split okay and then so as i have told you earlier we are going to use a logistic regression model so let's import the logistic regression model from sklearn dot linear model import logistic regression okay and finally we need to import the accuracy score from sklearn dot metrics import accuracy score okay so this numpy library is used to make some numpy arrays okay so arrays are like list in python okay so numpy arrays and pandas so pandas is uh, useful for creating data frame so data frame are nothing but a structured table so here we have the data in a csv file so csv represents comma separated values and it is odd uh, you know it's kind of hard to analyze the data when it is in a csv file so we need to put it in a more structured way and it is where uh, we use this pandas data frame okay so that's why we are importing pandas uh, library and we have we are importing this pandas library in a short form as pd okay so this is the general convention we use and then we are importing this train test split function so i have already explained to you that we need to split our original data into training and test data and uh, we are uh, you know importing this function from this sklearn model selection library then we are importing our logistic regression from sklearn.linear model and finally we are you know importing this accuracy score so this accuracy score is used to evaluate our model to check how well our model is performing okay so we have completed this particular cell you can press shift plus enter to run this cell and go to the next one okay so this will run this particular cell and uh, now the next step is data collection and uh, processing so we have already downloaded the data so data collection and processing okay so you can as i've told you you can go to this files option and upload the data so once you upload the data you can go to this options here so in that you can copy the path of this data set file okay so i'll copy this path and now i'm going to load this csv file to a pandas data frame okay so let's make a comment here loading the csv data to a pandas data frame so pandas data frame are nothing but structured tables so let's create or uh, let's declare a variable for this data frame so let's call this as art data okay so art data is equal to so we need to use this pandas function so pd dot read csv so this uh, read csv function will read a csv file and store it in a pandas data frame so you need to mention quotes here and inside the quotes we need to put the path of the data set file okay so let's run this so again press shift plus enter so this has uh, you know this runs this particular cell so now we will get a pandas data frame inside this r data okay so now you can see the sample of this data using some functions so i'll just make a comment here so now we are going to print first five rows of the data set okay so mention the data frame name which is art data set art data dot eight so this eight function will print the first five rows of the data frame so you can see the first five rows here so these are the rows which we have discussed and the last one is the target so we are going to you know predict this particular target uh, values okay so either zero or one so this is how you can print the first five rows of the data set so you can also print the last five rows of the data set so let me also show you how to do that print last five rows of the data set so again mention the data frame name which is yet sorry our data dot tail 
okay so this yet function will print the first five rows whereas this tail function will print the last five rows so you can see the last uh, five rows values in the last five rows and now let's see how many rows and columns are there in this uh, data set so i'm going to check the number of rows and columns in the data set so our data dot shape so let's run this so totally we have 303 rows and 14 columns so we have 14 columns and 303 values that means we have uh, 303 data points or uh, the data for 303 people with whether th these people have either our disease or not okay so it's uh, you know comparatively it's a very small data set so a typical machine learning uh, data set may even contain thousands or even lakhs of data and uh, this is a very uh, small data set and let's see what we can do with it so let's get some more information about the data set getting some info about the data so you can mention the data frame name our data dot info so this info will give some give us some information so you can see the total number of entries so there are 3 not 3 entries and 14 columns and we have all the columns here so there are totally 3 not 3 non null values so null values means they are missing values so 3 not 3 non null values means we don't have any missing values and this d type so this represents the data type okay so all the data types are uh, 64 bit integer except this old peak column so it is a floating point okay so that is also another method to check whether this data set contains missing values so checking for missing values our data dot is null dot sub okay so let's run this so it will give us the number of missing values in each column so as you can see here we don't have any missing values so we can use all the three not three uh, values so most in most cases there will be missing values in our data set so in that cases we can use the methods like imputation so i have already made a video on uh, uh, handling missing values using imputation so you can uh, access that video in module 4 playlist in my channel okay so in that i have explained to you how you can handle the missing values so in this uh, data set luckily we don't have any missing values so this is already processed data okay so now the next thing we can do is to analyze the data more so first let's get some statistical measure of the data statistical measures about the data so our data so i'm mentioning the data frame name dot describe so this describe function will give us the statistical measure such as mean standard deviation etc okay so you will see the statistical measure for all the columns so this count represents the number of uh, data points we have in each uh, column and this mean represents the mean value for all the columns and standard deviation is you know as you know the standard deviation and this is the minimum value for each column and uh, we also have the maximum value for each column and then we have this percentile values so these are not percentage but they are percentile so percentiles are nothing but so it says 25 percentile so it means 25 percentage of the values are less than this 47.5 value in age okay so 50 percentage of the value are less than 55 uh, you know age so that is meant by this percentile okay so it helps us to you know find some insights out of the data now let's see now this target value is distributed so as i have told you earlier zero represents that the person is uh, the person does not have any art defect whereas if the target is one that represents the person does have a art disease okay so let's see how many people are there for uh, you know with art disease and how many people does not have any art disease in this particular data set so checking the distribution of target variable so for this mention the data frame our data and in square bracket we need to mention the column name okay so you should you should mention the column name correctly so you can see here it uh, all the letters are in uh, you know small letters so you need to mention this here in quotes so our data uh, target dot value counts so this will tell us how many values are zero and how many uh, values are one okay 
so let's run this okay so series object value count so it's value counts so we need to include a yes okay so as you can see here totally we have out of the three not three values 160 people or 160 data points in that value have deceased uh, art or uh, defective art okay whereas 138 people does not have any art disease in this particular data set so what is the importance of finding this is we need to have an almost equal number of uh, distribution in the two classes so here the difference is not uh, you know very much so here the you know the distribution is almost even so there is not any problem with it if uh, you know uh, there are about 80 percentage of the values lie in one class and 20 percentage of the value lies in another class so it is a problem so in that cases we need to do some processing uh, but in this case it's not required because the distribution is almost almost similar okay so i'll just make a text here that one represents defective art and zero represents healthy art okay so we will predict this zero or one by analyzing the other data okay so the next step is splitting the features and target splitting the features and target so here the target is nothing but uh, it's the prediction of whether the person has art disease or not so it's either zero or one so this particular column is called as target column the other columns are called as features because we are going to use all these features uh, to predict this target okay so we will analyze uh, the age the sex of the person uh, their blood pressure and their chest pain and all the other things so these uh, columns act as features and by analyzing these features we are going to predict whether the person has a disease or not so hence these columns are called as features and this column is called as target so as you can see here this frame uh, this data frame contains uh, features and the target together and now we need to remove this target from this data frame and store it separately okay? Okay, so that's what we are we are going to do in this splitting the features and target so i'll create two variables as x and y so we shall store all the features in the variable x and let's store the target column in the variable y so i'll mention the data frame here art data dot drop so i'm going to drop the target column so mention the parameter as columns so columns is equal to target and axis is equal to 1 so whenever you are dropping a column you need to mention the axis is equal to 1 and if you are dropping a row from your data frame you need to mention the axis is equal to 0 okay so now we need to store this uh, target column in this y variable so at data <coughs> and target okay so let's run this so this will separate the data into features and targets. So let's print X and Y. So now you can see that it does not contain the target column. Okay, so when you print, so you can see here it has 13 columns now. So previously we had totally 14 columns. You can print Y now. So this Y contains the values of all the target columns. Okay, so it contains 1 and 0. So this is nothing but the target column. Okay, so now we need to feed uh, this X and Y to our machine learning algorithm. Okay, so before doing that, as I told you earlier, now we need to split our data into training data and test data. Okay, so we will split this X into training data and we will store the uh, corresponding labels or corresponding target for this training data separately and testing data separately. So let me show you how we are going to do that. So splitting the data into training data and test data okay so here so if you remember we have imported this train test split uh, function from sklearn.model selection so i am going to create four variables here x train x test and y train and y test okay so is equal to train test split 
and inside this we need to mention some parameters okay so what i'm doing is i'm split, uh, splitting this x into x train and x test okay so it means the features are separated as you know this x train contains the features of all the training data and the x test contain the features of all the test data and y train contains the target of all these features present in this x train and the y test contain the corresponding target for x test okay so that's where we are doing here so you need to mention x and y because we are splitting the x and y here and we need to mention some parameters so i'll mention this test size is equal to 0.2 test size it means like how many uh, you know how much percentage of the data you want as test data so 0.2 represents 20 percentage of the data so generally you can use either 10 percentage of data or 20 percentage of data as your test data here i'll mention 20 percentage of data and stratify okay so it's stratify is equal to y so what this stratify is so when you mention uh, stratify is equal to y it will split the data similarly as like uh, this x train and x test contain similar proportion of 1 and 0 as present in the original case so if you don't mention this stratify is equal to y there is a possibility that all the values in the x test may contain a 0 or all the values in this extreme may contain one so such kind of things okay so when you uh, mention stratify is equal to y these two classes which are either one or zero will be distributed in an even manner throughout your uh, training data and test data as it was present in your original data and next we need to mention the random state so random state is equal to let me put two so it is just to split the data in a specific way and when you are doing this code if you mention the random state is equal to 2, your data will be splitted in the same way as my data is splitting. Okay. So if you mention 3 or some other numbers, your data will be splitted in a different manner. So this is just to reproduce the code in the same way that I am doing. Okay. So let's put random state is equal to 2. So you can put any number you want. So I'll run this. Okay. So this will split our data into training data and test data. Now let's check the number of training data and test data we have. So I'm going to print the shape of x. So x shape. So x is nothing but our original data set and x train dot shape and x test dot shape. So x is the original data and x train is the training data and x test is the uh, you know testing data so let's run and see how many data points are there in each of this uh, you know arrays so as you can see here the original data set contains 3 not 3 values and our uh, 80 percentage of that data go to this x train which is 242 and 20 percentage of data which is 61 goes into the x test okay so we have successfully split our data into training data and test data so now the next step is to train our machine learning model so i make a text here model training okay so in this case we are using a logistic regression model because it is very useful for binary classification logistic regression model so you know it is named as logistic regression but it is also used for classification problems as well so we have imported this logistic regression from sklearn.linear model so now we are going to use this logistic regression function okay so I will declare a variable as model and in this variable we are going to load our logistic regression model logistic regression okay so you need to mention the parenthesis to mention I am loading one instance of logistic regression model to this uh, model variable so let's run this now we need to train our machine learning model so we are training the logistic regression model with training data okay so we can use the model dot fit function so this fit function will uh, try to fit x train and x test sorry x train and y train and uh, this is what a model learning means so i mentioned x train and y train so what happens is 
it will find the pattern or it will find the relationship between these features that are present in x train and the corresponding target okay so what happens is uh, it checks this uh, age sex and other parameters say if uh, there are a particular values then uh, that per person is said to be uh, as a defective art and if the values are different then that person is you know uh, does not have a defective art and this happens in a more elaborate way when you use this model dot feed function. So this machine learning model will try to find the relationship or pattern between the features and the target. So once we train this model, we can use this trained model to predict new values. So that's what uh, is our problem statement is. So let's run this. This will train our machine learning model. So this data set is a very small data set. So we add only 300 uh, data points. So hence it, you know, uh, it, it trains in a very short period of time. So if you are working on a deep learning uh, projects where uh, the data set may be, you know, containing uh, one lakh of data points or more than that, in such cases, the training may take a lot of time. Okay, so this is a small data set, so it doesn't take much time. So this is about training our model, model.fit. Now, we are going to evaluate our model on how well it is performing. So this step is model evaluation. And we are going to use accuracy score as our evaluation metric. Okay, so we have imported this accuracy score from sklearn.metrics library. Okay, so accuracy score is nothing but uh, the model will be asked to predict the target and this uh, predicted value will be compared with the original uh, target values. Okay, so if uh, the model has predicted about uh, 99 values are correct uh, you know let's say we are predicting for 100 values and for those 100 values the model has predicted correctly for 95 values in that case the accuracy score is 95 percentage if the model has predicted correctly for 60 values in that case the accuracy score is 60 percentage okay so that's what we are going to do and first let's find the accuracy on the training data accuracy on training data so I'll create the variable as x train prediction and we are going to you know we are going to give only the x train here so we have, we have, we have trained our model with x train and y train now, now I'm going to give this features alone this x train alone and I'm going to ask the model to predict this target value okay and I'm storing that target value in x train prediction and later I will compare this predicted value with the original values so mention model so this is the train logistic regression model now model dot predict so this predict function will help us to predict the target values so in that mention x train okay so i am storing this prediction in this x train prediction and i create a variable as training data accuracy okay so i am going to store the accuracy value in this particular variable and here we are going to use the accuracy score function so accuracy score and in that we need to mention um, x train prediction and y train okay so let's run this this will find the accuracy score and store it in training data accuracy now let's print it print accuracy on training data okay so i'm going to put it put this training data accuracy here okay so this will print our training data accuracy so accuracy uh, you know more than 75 percentage is somewhat good and here you can see here we are getting an accuracy score of uh, 85 percentage so 0.85 means 85 percentage that means out of 100 predictions our model can predict correctly for 85 values okay so you can also get more uh, accuracy score so in this case we are getting this 85 percentage because the data set we have is very small so we totally add only 303 values and in that 303 values we have used only 242 values for training so this is actually a good accuracy score and you can also get more if you use a, a larger data set okay so that's what you need to note here so here we have found the accuracy score for training data but we need to also find the accuracy score of test data okay so i'll just copy this we just need to change few things here now we are going to find the accuracy score on 
test data so x test prediction and here mention x test so if you remember we have uh, split the data into x train x test and y train and y test now i am going to find the target for this x test and compare the predicted values with this y test so this is the real target values for x test okay so x test now this is this becomes our test data accuracy and this will be x test prediction and y test okay so x test prediction model dot predict okay so now let's run this and let's also print the accuracy score for test data so accuracy on test data test data accuracy So as you can see here, here the accuracy score is almost 82 percentage and for a training data it is 85 percentage. So there is also another important thing to note here. So the accuracy score on the training data and test data should be almost uh, similar to each other. If there is a wide difference in them, if the accuracy score on training data is way too large and accuracy date, uh, you know, score on test data is very small, it means our model is overfitted. Okay, so that we don't want that. So in that case, what happens is our model uh, you know will uh, overlearn the data in this training data so we don't want that we want a generalized learning approach so uh, this problem is known as overfitting so in this uh, you know uh, use case we don't have overfitted model so in the future videos i uh, make up what is meant by this overfitting and how you can overcome this uh, overfitting problem okay so in this we don't have any overfitting issue so we get a good result of about 82 percentage okay so now we are in the last step of our uh, machine learning project. Now we are going to build a predictive system. Building a predictive system. So what happens is, if in this system, if you give the values, so all the feature values such as uh, the age of the person, their sex, the uh, chest pain value and all these features, the model should predict their target, okay, whether the person has a defective art or not, okay. So that's what we are going to do in this. Uh, predictive system okay so the first step is to get the input values so this input values are nothing but the features so i'll create uh, this dot tuple as input data so input data is equal to so let's fill this input data later so let's say for example i have this uh, data set file here so i'll open this in a notepad so let's take some random values okay so you can see here so the last value is represents the target and let's take this value okay so i'm going to copy this value but i won't take this uh, one so this is the target so given these values our model to predict that the target is one okay so one represents the person as a defective one so let's see whether our model is uh, predicting correctly so i'll put the value in this input data column so in this input data array now we need to do some processing on this data before we you know want to uh, make prediction on it so we need to change the input data to a numpy array so currently this is in a tuple data uh, type and we want to convert it to a numpy array because we need to do some processing like reshaping and it is easy to reshape a numpy array instead of you know a uh, tuple so I'll name this as input data as numpy array. Input data as numpy array, np dot as array. So this as array function will convert this data type into a numpy array and inside this mention input data. Okay, so input data and the next step is to reshape the array so the reshaping is to tell our machine learning model that i want to predict the target for only one uh, variable otherwise it, it thinks that we it, we are checking for uh, 242 values okay so we just need to mention that we need to we need to find the prediction for only one value and this is the re reason for reshaping it reshape the numpy array as we are predicting for 
only one instance okay so it's it's to tell our machine learning model that i'm just predicting for one uh, feature or oh, sorry uh, one data point so input data reshape is equal to np sorry we can mention this input data so input data as numpy array dot reshape and we need to give the shape as one comma minus one so this will reshape our array for one instance and uh, let's create a variable as prediction and let's store uh, the predicted value of the model in this prediction variable so as i have told you earlier we have used this model dot predict function to predict the values so we are going to use the same here so prediction is equal to model dot predict and i want to predict it for this input data reshape okay so these are nothing but the feature values that we have copied from our data set okay so input data reshaped so i'm also going to print the prediction so this prediction value will either have zero or one so zero represents that the person does not have any art defect and one represents the person have uh, art defect okay so you can see here we have copied the value for uh, the target one which means the person has art defect so let's see whether our model is predicting uh, one okay so let's run this so i have asked the asked here to print the prediction as well so let's run this so as you can see here our model predicted one so which means it is correct so it represents that the person has a art defect okay so this is how you can predict uh, for new values by just giving the feature but not telling the target okay so i'll also make a if condition here so let's make this if statement if the prediction so if prediction so if you can see here this is uh, you know printed in a uh, list format okay so we need to mention that if prediction 0 is equal to 0 in that case we need to print the person mm, does not have uh, our disease okay okay else so if the value is zero sorry okay so if uh, the value is one so we can mention it in else print that the person has our disease okay so what i'm doing is so this prediction will be uh, given in a list format so this is so this list list contains only one value right so that's what i'm mentioning it here so when you mention a list name and inside that if you mention zero it means the first value in that list okay so that's what i'm doing here so if the prediction value is zero in that case that person has not you know doesn't have any art disease so that's what i'm printing in the other case the value will be one in that case i want to print that the person has art disease so now let's run and see this so it says that uh, the prediction value is one and that means the person has a hard disease, right? Now let's also check this for uh, the target zero. So let's get another value. So these are one, let's see where the zero begins. Okay, so here we have a zero, which means that, uh, you know, for people who doesn't have any hard disease, I'll just copy uh, another value from here. So let's copy this particular value and I'm not copying the target, only the features and i'll paste this here so now this should give us the prediction value as zero and that the person does not have our disease okay so let's try this so as you can see here the label here or the target here is zero which means the person does not have any art disease so that's how you can make a predictive system that can predict the target given the features okay so i hope you have understood everything here so i'll just give you a quick recap of what we have done so we have the first step is importing the dependencies so we have imported some libraries and functions that we need for processing so we imported numpy pandas and we imported this train test split function logistic regression and accuracy score from sk library and we have downloaded the data set from Kaggle and we have loaded it 
to uh, from a csv file to a pandas data frame and we have seen how to print the first five rows and the last five rows in a data frame and we have also checked the number of rows and columns present in the data set and we have also seen some information about the data type and whether there are any missing values and we have also seen how we can check the number of missing values in each column and uh, we have found some statistical measures of the data set through this describe function then we have seen how many uh, you know values are there for the target one and for target zero and the one represents the person with a defective art and zero represents a person with a healthy art then we have split the features and target here that uh, features are uh, every column except the target and uh, we have stored all the features in the variable x and we have stored uh, the target values in the variable y so we have printed it printed x and y and then we have split our uh, data set into training data and test data and then we have loaded our logistic regression model to this model variable then we have trained our uh, logistic regression model using the split function and finally we have evaluated our model using this accuracy score and we we have seen that we get a, a somewhat good accuracy score here it's almost 85 percentage on training data and 82 percentage on test data and finally uh, the important part is on building a predictive system where when we give a value to this uh, particular input data column so our model can, can predict whether the person has uh, our disease or not so that's it for this video i hope you have understood this so do practice this coach and Okay, so what what is what I'm basically trying to do here is I'm going to get the original value original value for prices which is y train and the training data prediction I'm, and I'm going to plot that in a graph to see how close these values are. Okay, so how close our model is predicted. So for that we need to make a scatter plot. So plt dot scatter. So we have the scatter plot function in matplotlib. So plt dot scatter. We need to mention the two values which is y train and training data accuracy because I'm comparing those two values right the original uh, prices of houses and the price predicted by the model okay so plt dot scatter plt dot x label so this is just naming the x axis and y axis so plt dot x label let's label the x axis as actual prices actual price and let's label the y axis as y label this is the predicted price. So we will try to plot these two values and see the closeness between them. PLT dot title. Let's name this graph as actual price versus predicted price. PLT dot show. So this will print the graph. Okay, so we are plotting, plotting the scatter plot for y train, the original value and the predicted value. And I'm naming the x-axis as actual prices and y-axis as predicted prices. And we are naming the graph as actual price versus predicted price. So we will get a scatter plot. So as you can see here, this x-axis contains the actual price, which is y train and the y-axis contains the values predicted by the model, which is named as predicted price. So as you can see here, all these data points are very close to each other, which means the value predicted by our model which is in y-axis is very much similar to the actual prices of the houses given in the data set so this is how you can visualize the closeness between your uh, model's prediction and the original data point so this is our agenda for this video so we wanted to make a predictive system that works fine if we give a data and if we want to predict that house data sorry that price data okay so let's do a very quick recap to understand what we have done step by step okay so first of all we have imported the libraries so we have imported several libraries like pandas matplotlib so matplotlib is basically for uh, making plots and graphs and then we have got this sklm.datasets library for you know loading the data set file and then we have this uh, you know imported this training test train test split function to split our data into training and test data so and all those uh, importing the dependency step and is done in the first cell then we have loaded the boston house price data and stored it in the variable in the array called as house price data set okay so we have printed and checked this data and we have created a data frame and stored it in the variable as house price data frame so once we have did that 
we have included this target which is price value to this data frame and we have uh, seen the values for the first five rows and then we have found the shape of the data frame which is 506 rows and 14 columns then we have checked whether the data frame has any missing values and then we have uh, checked some statistical measures the mean value standard deviation etc for this data frame then we have uh, discussed about how we can find the correlation between various features through a uh, heat maps okay so then we have split the data set into the data and label right so after that we have split the data into training and test data with the help of train test split function so this is one of the main steps in this use case where we need to split the data set so we have took 20 percentage of the data as test data and next we have trained our xg boost regressor model by using this xgb regressor function so once we train the model with this fit function we have evaluated the model for both training data as well as for testing data so this is the prediction on test data and we have got very good uh, you know error values the error values is quite small which is very good and we have visualized how close the actual values and the predictive values is okay so this is how you can make a prediction system for house price with this boston house price data set okay so i hope you have understood all the things covered in this video so if you have any doubt you can mention it in the comments below
how we can build a loan status prediction system that can predict whether a person is eligible for a loan or not okay so we'll be using some machine learning algorithm for this purpose okay so before going into the video if you want to learn about data science you can check out my hands on data science course with python i have given the link for that course in the description of this video okay so let's get started with today's topic so first of all let's try to understand this problem statement better consider that there is a finance company that gives loan for people okay so before approving the loan so this company analyzes various credential of the person so there are several you know aspects like whether the person is educated or not whether he is graduated or not whether he is married or uh, he is a single person so there are several uh, you know parameters which that finance company looks okay so this company wants to automate this loan approval process so what happens is so the user or the person who wants the loan will fill an online application form and based on this information given by the user so we need to develop a machine learning system that can tell the company that this person is eligible for a loan or this person is not eligible for a loan so this is the problem statement and now let's see how we will approach this problem statement so this is the workflow for this first we need the data right so machine learning works by learning from the data so we need some data to tell the machine learning model that these people are eligible for uh, getting a loan so these parameters are important so these parameters can be their annual income so if their annual income is more they are more you know probably going to give the loan amount correctly to the bank or to the finance company so we need all those kinds of different data to analyze about this okay so once we have the data we need to process the data so data pre-processing is one of the important steps when we are working in machine learning so we cannot give the raw data to our machine learning model so we need to do some processing so in this case in this particular use case we will be doing several encoding which is a very interesting part which we haven't seen in the previous videos in this channel okay so that we will be doing in the data pre-processing part which will make the data to be more suitable for our machine learning algorithm so once we process the data we will split the data into training data and test data okay so this is because our machine learning model will be trained on the training data and it will be evaluated on the test data so this evaluation is basically to check how well our model is performing on a given data set okay so that is the reason so once we have split the data into train and test data we will feed this training data to our machine learning model so in this case we are going to use a support vector machine model which is a supervised learning model so in supervised learning model we will uh, give the data which has labels so in this case there are two labels so one is the loan will be approved and the other label is the loan will be rejected so these are two labels so as there are labels in the data set this is a supervised uh, learning problem and for this we will use a supervised learning machine learning model so one of the examples of supervised model is support vector machine model okay so once we train our support vector machine model so we will evaluate it based on our test data okay so it will tell us the accuracy score of our model which basically tells us how good our model is performing so after that we will have a trained support vector machine model so to this model when you give a new data when you give the new information about an user so this machine learning algorithm automatically tells whether the loan for that person is approved or rejected okay so it basically tells the eligibility of that person for that particular loan so this is the steps we will be following okay so while we are implementing this machine learning model i'll explain you the theory behind the support vector machine model okay so now let's get into the coding part okay So I'll be doing all the code in Google Collaboratory. So if you are not, you know, if you haven't used Google Collaboratory before, you can check out the video Google Collaboratory Basics. So the index of that video is 2.1. So you can check it in my YouTube channel. Okay. So in that I have explained you how you can access Google Collaboratory and various features of it. Okay. So now let's get started with today's code. So this is the data set we are going to use dataset.csv so it contains all this information so in some time I'll explain you all the features or all the variables present in this data set okay so I'll give the link for this data set file in the description of this video okay so first step is to import the dependencies dependencies are nothing but the libraries and the functions that we will be needing for this use case okay so I'll make a test text here importing the dependencies you can press shift plus enter to run the code 
now first let's import numpy import numpy as mp and import found as spd and let's also import c bond as sns okay so numpy is basically for making arrays so those arrays are called as numpy arrays and it is very useful for processing and pd so we are importing pandas library as pd so pandas is very useful for the data pre-processing part that i have told you so we have the data in this csv file right dataset.csv so we will load all these data to our pandas data frame so pandas data frames are nothing but they are more structured tables so it helps us to analyze the data better okay so we are importing pandas for it so cbone is a plotting library so it is very useful for plotting several kinds of graphs so we will do some data visualization also so for that purpose we will be you know importing c bonds and now let's import from sklearn dot model selection i am importing train test split so as i have told you earlier so we will be splitting our original data set into training data and test data so this is the function for a train test split okay now let's import the support vector machine model so we can do it from the sklearn library so from sklearn sklearn import svm okay so there are many people requesting me to build model from scratch so there is one thing we need to understand here so it is out of the scope of this particular video so the idea behind this video is to show you the implementation of a particular model in some use cases okay so i cannot you know build model from scratch in this particular video because it takes a lot of time so but we will definitely do that in the later modules in our machine learning course so as you know we are making a machine learning course in youtube so once we have completed all the the basics of machine learning i will be explaining you the math behind every model and we will also be building models from scratch and the thing is we cannot do that in this particular video so that's the reason so for this i'm importing the model from the scale and library itself but stay tuned if you want to learn more about the models and the mathematics behind them okay so we will definitely do that in a later point of time okay so i'm importing svm which means support vector machine from scale and from sklearn dot metrics let's import accuracy score so this accuracy score is used to evaluate our model so this tells how well our model is performing on a given data set okay so we have imported all the dependencies so let me run this so you can as i have told you earlier you can press shift plus enter so this will import all the libraries and the functions now this is the data collection and the data processing part so data collection and processing so in in a week or two i will be posting a module completely dedicated to data collection and data pre-processing where i will be explaining you on where you can get the data set and what are the different processing that we need to do on a data okay so that will be uploaded in a you know one week or in a two weeks time okay so data collection and processing so this data set i have downloaded it, uh, it from kaggle okay so this is the loan status data set now we need to uploaded it upload it to our pandas data frame okay so let me do that loading the data set to pandas data frame okay so let me create a variable as known data set so this is the variable to which we will be storing our pandas data frame so in order to read this csv file so there is a function called as read csv in pandas so let me copy this file path okay so you can go to this option menu here and you can copy the path so if you want to upload this library you can download it download it from the link that i will provide you in this video description and once you download it so it is a very small file so you can give this option which is upload to session storage is there right so when you press this 
a prompt will be given so from that you can upload a file from your computer or you can just right click here and just give upload so through that you can upload your data set to this particular collab session okay so i have copied the path of this data set file now let's use that read csv function so in loan data set is equal to pd dot read csv okay so read csv and i'll paste the path here okay so that path should be pasted in this inside this coach okay so let me run this this will load this data in the csv file to a pandas data frame okay so you can check the type of the variable here so type known data set so it will tell you that it is a data frame object so as you can see here it is a pandas core frame dot data frame so it is a data frame object okay now let's see the sample of this data okay so we can do that by printing the first five columns sorry first five rows of the data frame okay so loan data set dot yet so this yet is the function that prints the first five rows of the data set so as you can see here this is the sample of our data set so it has the first five columns so let me explain you all these columns what is meant by them so first we have this loan id so each row represents different user okay so this id represents one user and like that there are several users and this is their particular id number okay so this column gives the gender of that particular person and it gives the marital status whether they are married or not so we have yes or no as that okay so and then we have dependents the number of people dependent on them in that particular family so it is the number of dependent okay so zero means there are no dependents for them if one means there is one dependent so these dependents can be their uh, sons or daughters okay so then it's uh, this column gives the education whether they are graduated or they are not graduated so those kind of details so we need education details also okay and it gives whether the person is self-employed or not so and then we have the applicant income so what is their income in thousands thousands of dollars okay so such kind of things and then we have co-applicant income so the person you know their uh, spouse or other persons so that is meant by this co-applicant and that person's income is given in the co-applicant column and then the loan amount okay so this is the loan amount in thousands of dollars so it can be one twenty eight thousand dollars and such kind of things okay so nan represents these are missing values so in a moment we will see how we will deal with the missing values okay so this is the loan amount term 360 days means it's basically almost 12 months right so it is the loan amount so term the duration for which they are applying the loan so, okay and then there is this credit history okay so credit history basically means you know the their uh, credit score it's it's like the credit score so one represents it's meeting the guidelines of the company okay there will be zero uh, sorry the values like a zero so it means that uh, their credit history is not so good that means they have not uh, settled the loan properly for the loans they have brought before okay so one represents they have uh, paid all the bills correctly so that represents a credit history of one so there are only two values in it one or zero so one represents they have a very good credit history and zero means they don't have a very good credit history so if their credit history is one there is a good possibility that their loan will be approved okay and then we have property area so the property belonging to them is present in an urban area or a rural area there are also another values such as semi-urban areas okay such kind of things and then we have loan status so loan status is yes or no so y means yes and no n means no so if the label here is y which means yes that their loan is approved if n their loan is rejected so based on this data we will train our machine learning algorithm to tell that that these features are important features are nothing but these columns so if a person is married or if that person is educated there is a high chance that their loan will be approved right so if we think logically so those kind of things so we will feed the all these data and our machine learning model will learn from all these data and the relationship between these variables so that is the idea behind this okay so as we have seen the sample of this data frame let's see how many total values are there in this particular data set so I'm going to print the number of rows and column. So for all those who are new to Python, so if you include this hash before a line, 
so the python interpreter thinks that it is a comment or it is some text okay so if you want to write something or some description about your code you can include this hash and you can write that description okay so we are going to check the number of rows and columns so for that you need to mention the data frame name which is loan.dataset because we have named it as loan.dataset right so loan.dataset dot shape this shape function gives the number of rows and columns so totally we have 614 rows and 13 columns okay so that means 641 values for different 641 users okay so we have uh, data for 641 different people who have applied for loan and 13 uh, columns columns nothing but these features so gender marital status dependence education etc so that is the rows and columns in it so from this you can just understand that this is a very small data set so in our pre previous project we have uh, dealt with a data set which, uh, which has almost 20,000 data points so if you have a very large data set and it is uh, you know a clean data set the prediction is going to be very good so if the data set uh, you know size is less the accuracy will be quietly small for that particular model okay so we need more data to make accurate prediction so that is the idea okay so we got that there are 641 data points totally in this data set okay now let's get some statistical measures from a data set so statistical measures so you can do that by using the function so i'm mentioning the data frame names which is loan.dataset dot describe so this describe function gives several statistical measures like mean standard deviation percentile etc okay so it won't give for those categorical value so in this self-employed column column we have yes no all those things right all those won't be printed because we cannot uh, find the percentiles and mean value for uh, these text data we can only find for numerical data right so those columns which have text data or categorical data will be removed and we have the other numerical uh, columns such as the applicant income and co-applicant income loan amount etc okay so we have count which tells the number of values okay so you can see here there is only 592 out of the 614 that means these many number of values are missing okay so like that we have the mean value standard deviation value minimum value etc so percentile means if uh, the applicant income is 2877 which is the 25 percentile value means 25 percentage of people are having an income less than this particular value so that is percentile 50 means 50 percentage of people's income is less than this 3812 okay so that is meant by percentile and we also have the maximum value so this statistical measures are very helpful in data science applications and in you know in conditions where we need to understand more about the data set so that is why we are using this describe function which give all these statistical measures okay so once we get that now let's deal with the missing values so in this case we cannot do much about the missing values we can only remove these values so first of all let's count the number of missing values number of missing values in each column so it is always a good practice to describe your code so what you are basically trying to do so so whenever you are making a code always include a description or text about what you are trying to do okay now don't data set dot is null so this is null function finds the number of null values or missing values in a data set dot sum so this gives the number of items missing so i'll run this so as you can see here uh, we have printed all the columns and the number of missing values so as you can see the loan id column here so we have all these columns so in all these columns so we don't have any missing values in the id and there are 13 missing values in the gender column and the three values missing in the marriott Mary, uh, column so all these things okay so these many values are missing in our data set so not several values are missing in a particular uh, a data set say for example totally we have 614 columns so out of that only 13 13 values are missing right out of 614 so it is not a big of an issue so we can drop these missing values and in certain cases we will find the mean of the value and we will replace the missing value with the mean or other you know some uh, kind of values but we can't do that here because several uh, columns are categorical so it just says yes or no so we cannot find the mean between yes or no so that is why we are we cannot do that imputation method so the method of 
uh, replacing the missing values with mean values is called as imputation so we cannot do that here because we have several categorical column as yes or no okay so if we have numerical columns you, we can you know find the mean and replace the missing values with the mean of the entire data set okay so now let's try to drop all the missing values okay so dropping the missing values okay now loan data set so i want to drop the values from this so loan data set dot drop in a so n a basically represents not available so that is a missing values so drop in a means the missing values will be dropped so i am taking this loan data set uh, data frame and i am dropping the missing values and again i am storing all the values in loan data set okay so this data set does not contains any missing values so let me run this so you can just copy this code and now you can see whether there are any missing values as we have dropped all the missing values there are no missing values now in our uh, loan data set data frame okay so now we can do some more uh, visualization and analysis on this data frame okay now there is an interesting step that we will do so this is called as label encoding okay so what is this label encoding so we have the label values as y and n right so it is basically means yes or no so instead of having this alphabetical value so we can use numerical values such as uh, 1 for yes and uh, 0 for no so basically we will replace replace y with 1 and n with 0 so it is very easy for our processing okay so that's why we are doing it so we will do that now so i'm taking my loan data set loan data set i want to replace so for that you can use this replace function okay so what i want to do is take this particular column so i don't want to change any other column i want to take this loan status column and replace y and n so i will mention this loan status column here okay so in this curly brackets we need to mention the name of that particular column which is loan status okay so colon again i'm creating another thing called as so if it's n the value should be replaced by zero and uh, if the value is y it should be replaced by one okay so in place is equal to true so this is another parameter so in place is equal to true so that means i want to replace all those values so this is a dictionary data frame or this dictionary data type okay so in dictionary we will have a key and a value associated to it here the key is n and the value for that particular key which is n is zero okay so what i am doing is i am taking the loan status column which says yes or no or y and n so in that particular column i want to replace all the n with a zero and all the y with one okay so this is very helpful for our processing so there is another function in sklearn called as uh, encoding label encoding so you can use that function as well but here i am using the pandas function which is data frame dot replace okay so there are several methods of doing it and i am in this case i am using pandas uh, method okay so i will run this and now i will again print the number of uh, sorry i'll again print this first five columns okay now let's check this loan status column as you can see here the yes and no is replaced by zero and one okay so all the yes will be replaced by zero and all uh, the no sorry all the yes will be replaced by one and all the no will be replaced by zero so you can see one thing here so we don't have this first row which says y so we have the first row which is starting from zero which means no so basically what happened is so as we have this missing value in this loan amount column in the first row so when we drop the missing values 
if a row contains a missing value that entire row will be removed from the data frame means this first row has been removed because it contains a missing value which is a name okay so that's why we don't have this you can see the id here so it's ending in 1002 you can see the id here so it's not there okay so we are having the values from this second id because it since it has a missing value we have dropped it so if there is any missing value the entire row will be dropped okay so now uh, we have seen that all the yes and no has been replaced by 0 and 1 respectively okay so now what we will do is there is another column called as dependence right so i'll show you what's in there dependent column values so loan data set i want to print this particular column dependence in this column i want to see what are the different values are there so let me put value counts so what i'm trying to do is what are the different values and how many values are there totally so as we have discussed there are only two values in loan status which is yes or no and in property area we will be having the values such as rural urban and semi urban so you can uh, open this csv file in an excel excel uh, app and you can see all the values so this property area contains three classes which are rural urban and uh, semi urban and the credit history contains one and zero so likewise i want to see what are the values present in this particular dependent column so i'll run this so as you can see here so there are four different values so one is zero two one and three plus so zero means there are no dependents for that particular person who is applying for loan two means that person who is applying applying for loan has two dependent person so dependent person can be two sons or two daughters for them so one means one dependent person three plus means more than three person so the thing here is we cannot feed this three plus value to our model okay so this is not a very good data data type okay so what i want to do is i want to change this three plus to a general value of four okay so i want to have a particular value and not this plus or minus kind of things so what i want to do is replace all the three plus values with four okay so we will do the same thing we have done with the encoding label encoding part here okay so replacing the value of 3 plus to 4 okay so 3 plus it can also mean so 3 plus can mean 4 it can also mean 5 6 etc but i am taking a value as 4 okay so loan data set so it's basically the same replace function that we have used for the loan status column okay so loan data set is equal to loan data set dot replace so we want to replace some values as we want to replace 3 plus four so what i'm trying to do is i want to replace this 3 plus value by the value of 4 okay so you need to mention that in quotes because it will consider these two things are different so i want to replace this 3 plus value with 4 okay so i'll run this now i'll again print the number of values for dependent column so dependent value loan data set okay so dependence dot value counts as you can see here the 3 plus value will be replaced by 4 okay so we, this is a hectic process to have 
three plus years so there will be some mistakes in processing or uh, when our machine learning model is learning so i am uh, converting this three plus value to a numerical value or integer value of four okay so now what we will do is let's visualize this data okay so i'll create a text here called as data visualization so this data visualization is very useful for analyzing the data to find the relationship between various features or various columns in a data set okay so let's say for example we want to check whether this marital status whether the person is married or not is correlated with uh, a person get, getting a loan or we also want to check whether a person uh, graduated as an higher chance of getting a loan or not okay so all these kind of things can be analyzed with the help of data visualization okay so first let's check the education and the loan status loan status so education and loan status so i'm going to plot the values of uh, the education column and the loan status combined so i'll explain you once i have created this so for making this plot we will be using this seaborn library as i have told you earlier so two uh, python libraries are very useful for making graphs and plots so one is matplotlib and the another one is seaborn okay so in this case we are going to use a count plot that will count the number of values so i'll explain you once i complete this code so sns so we have imported the seaborn library as a short form as sns so sns dot count plot and there are several parameters we need to mention here so the important parameters are this x u etc let me include them so in the x uh, column sorry in the x label i want to have the education column and in u i want to have the loan status column and the data is nothing but the loan data set okay so basically what i am trying to do is i want to plot the education column and the loan status so you can see the column names so education and loan status so that is what i am mentioning here and i want to take the data from this loan data set data frame so that i am mentioning in this data parameter so these are nothing but the parameters so x is one parameter u is one parameter and data is one parameter so let me run this so this will give us a count plot so as you can see here blue color represents zero so if you remember properly zero means it represents n which is no okay so in the loan status zero means the person does not get a loan that means their loan will be rejected and one means the loan is approved which means yes so if the loan is approved the color is one if the loan is rejected the color is zero so as you can see here we have more orange color in the case of graduate and less blue color that means so the loan is approved if the person is graduated so in most of the cases but the number of uh, you know approvals for loan if the person is not graduated is less kind of less okay so as you can see here the number of uh, loans approved so orange represents number of loans approved right so the number of loans approved is greater for graduated people but the number of loans approved for non graduated people is less okay so compare these two columns sorry these two plots okay so we have more approvals if the person is graduated and we have less approvals if the person is not graduated so orange represents one which means the loan is approved so from this we get this inference that if a person is educated or if a person is graduated the company is giving loan for them in most of the cases okay so now so one second just give me a moment sorry i had a network issue okay so we have plotted for education and loan status now let's do it for marital status okay so now we want to do the same visualization for marital status and loan status so marital status tells whether a person is married or not okay so it is the same procedure so sns dot count plot so count plot in that the x will be married so married is the column we have 
here so as you can see here married and here the u will be the same so u is nothing but the loan status okay so the u is nothing but this particular value so it will be compared okay so that is what the u is here the we want the u to be loan status in both the cases okay so u and the data in this case is also the same which is loan data set okay so let's run this and see this so as you can see here so similarly we have uh, the orange color for the loan approved and blue color for loan rejected so if a person is married so if married column is yes which means if a person is married there is a high chance that their loan will be approved if a person is not married the number of approvals is kind of less so what can be the reason for this so if we think logically it can also mean that if a person is married both uh, the husband and the wife can contribute to settling that loan right so there is an high percentage or high chance of for that finance company to get the money back so that's the reason for high proportionality of loan approvals for married people so this this is one of the main inference so similarly you can compare all those values with other features such as self-employed so applicant income etc so those kind of things so you can also compare it for gender to see whether there is any uh, more approvals for any particular gender okay so this kind of visualization gives us a better idea about our data set okay so i'll just mention these two data visualization so you please check the same with the gender and the other columns so you just need to replace this x by uh, gender and other columns you want to check okay so as we have visualized some things now what we will do is so we want to separate our data set okay so before that what so there is another step we need to do so as you can see here several columns have values as text right so in the gender column we have male and female in the married we have yes and no and in education we have graduate and not graduate so as i have told you earlier if the value is in text format our model cannot understand it properly so we will convert all these text into numbers so let's say uh, it's given as married yes and no right so we will replace yes with one and no with zero we will replace graduate with one and not graduate with zero the same we did with labels okay so we need to convert all these columns which has text data to numerical values okay so let's do that so we want to convert categorical columns to numerical values categories are nothing but male and female graduate or not graduate those kind of categories to numerical values okay so it's the same replace procedure so as we have did before with the label thing okay so we have replaced the label right using this replace function so we are going to do the same procedure here loan data set dot replace so i want to take this married column so if in the married column okay if the value is no then it should be replaced with zero okay if the value is yes it should be replaced with one okay so you need to mention this colon here so we need to do this for all the columns with these categorical uh, values so for married we will replace no with a zero and yes with one and uh, gender in gender column let's say if the value is male let's replace it with one and if the value is female we will replace it with zero so these are the two labels so we need to do that for all the columns that are categories okay so 
so we have did this for married column and gender column so what are the other columns so we have the self-employed column so we need to replace this yes or no here so we will replace this self-employed column so self-employed So no is zero and yes is one. So numbers should not be enclosed in quotes, only the text or strings should be enclosed in quotes. Okay, so one and then we have so you can do it in the same line or you can just press enter so you can see the indentation here. Okay, so both are same. So you can do in the same line or in the next line. Okay, so we have did this for self-employed column. Next, we will do the same for the property area. So as I have told you earlier, property area. So property area is. So as I have told you earlier, there are three values: rural semi-urban and urban so for rural let's replace the value with a zero and for semi-urban let's replace the value as one and for urban let's replace the value as Two. okay so 0 1 2 so rural is given the label uh, 0 semi urban is given the value 1 and urban is given the value 2 so if you want to check what are the different values so let's say we want to check what are the different values present here so you can follow this same procedure okay so we have uh, found the values for dependence right so in this case you can replace this dependence with the property area name so that will give us the number of sorry the different types of values and the number of values for each case so for example uh, it will give rural semi urban and urban and the number of rural values and number of urban values and semi urban values so those kind of things okay so we have replaced the property area column so the other col column which is categorical is education so education is there are two values as i have as we have seen earlier so those two values are nothing but graduate and not graduate so if the value is graduate let's replace it with one and if the value is not graduate so not graduate so we need to replace it with zero okay and then we have so these are the categorical values so we have um, marital status column and we have the gender column and self-employed column property area and education okay so as we have did earlier we need to mention this in place which means we want to replace all those values so in place is equal to true so it basically means in the place of this graduate i want to put one so in the case of in the self-employed column in the case of no i want to in the place of no i want to put a zero so that is why we are mentioning this in place is equal to true okay so in place is equal to true so let me run this okay so i think we have did that correctly now let's check the sample of our data frame known data set dot yet as i have told you yet will print the first five rows so now you can see we, in the previous case we have the text values as male female graduate not graduate married yes or no so those kind of things are replaced by numerical values as labels 1 and 0 okay so for all these values so this is what we have did in this converting uh, the categorical columns to numerical values so this is one of the important pre-processing steps so in several data pre-processing of different data set we need to perform this uh, particular function to convert the text data or categorical data into numerical values now what we will do is we will separate all the data 
and we will separate the label so in this case the label is loan status right so when we are feeding it to our machine learning model so we need to feed the data separately and the corresponding label separately so here the label is nothing but the loan status which represents yes or no so zero means no one means yes so the loan is approved or not so that is the final variable required for us right so we need to separate all this data and label so let's do that and also another thing so we don't need this loan id column so this loan id is not useful for us so we need to drop this loan id column and this uh, label column so we will store this label column in a separate variable so separating the data and label okay so create a variable as x so in x i'll store all the values except uh, this label so all the data will be stored and this label will be removed and i'll create another variable y in which i will store all these label values okay so as i've told you earlier we don't need this loan id column at all so i'll take this loan data set and you can use the function drop so this will drop the columns or rows so i want to draw drop the columns so columns is equal to say if i want to drop up drop only one column i just can mention that columns is equal to so the column name i want to drop is loan id right but in this case i want to drop two columns loan id and loan status so what we need to do is we need to give a list here which contain the columns we want to remove so i want first i want to remove the loan id column so you can put a comma here and we can include the loan status column so we are creating a list with two values so first value is loan id and the second value is loan status so i want to remove both of these columns and we will mention the axis is equal to one okay so if you are removing a column from a data frame you will give the value for axis as one if you are removing a row you will give the value for axis as zero okay so as we are removing columns i am giving the value of axis as one and as i have told you earlier we need to store all these labels or loan status column into y okay so loan data set and i'll mention loan status so what i'm doing is sorry we need to have a square bracket here so i'm taking this loan data set i'm dropping the loan id column and loan status column and i'm storing all the data to this x and i'm taking this loan status column which is the label for our data set and i'm storing it in y okay so i'll run this now i'll print x and y print x and print y so now you can see that okay so there is some problem okay so there is some typing error print hmm. sorry i have used a caps here okay so as you can see here the loan id column is removed and the loan status is column is removed and this is y which contains uh, all the labels okay so as we have splitted it now so the next st uh, step is splitting our data set into training data and test data okay so i have mentioned you this in the workflow slide so we need to split as train test split so we need to split the data set as training data and test data okay so for this you can see that i have uploaded sorry i have imported a function called as train test split so this is the function we are going to use for this purpose so so we need to mention four variables so i'll explain what is these four variables so i'm taking x train x test y train and y test okay train test split okay so basically what i'm doing is i'm taking four variables so x train x test and y train y test so all the data of the training data will be stored in x train variable and the labels for this x train will be stored in y train variable so labels are nothing but this 0 and 1 for loan status 
so i want a particular value to be present in this test data okay so this will be our test data which we will use for evaluation so those data except the loan status which is the label so except the loan status all the data will be stored in x test for training data and the corresponding label for x test is stored in y test okay so basically we are splitting the data into training data and test data and in that in the training data we have data and label so y represents data and sorry x represent data and y represents label so that is the thing so i am using this train test split so in this we need to mention some parameters so you need to mention what is what is the original data from which you want to split so original data is nothing but x and y right so this is unsplitted data so we need to mention that inside the train test split function so i'll mention x comma y and i'll mention the test size so test size let's say is 0.1 so 0.1 means 10 percentage so i want uh, test data to be 10 percentage of the original data so 90 percentage of the data will be stored in x and 10 percentage of the data will be stored in uh, test data so basically we will take 10 percentage or 20 percentage data as test data okay so i have test size is equal to 1 and stratify is equal to y so this stratify is nothing but we want to stratify our data based on y which means if we don't mention this stratify uh, we can have i proportions of 0 in uh, train and we can have less proportions of 0 in the case of test data so we want this 0 and 1 this labels to be splitted almost equally so hence we are using this stratify parameter so that is the purpose of this stratify here and now we need to mention this random state so let me put random state as is equal to 2 so you can put any values you want in the case of random state so the use of this random state value is that so if you use a different integer value so if you let's say that if you are putting the random state value as 3 your data will be split in a different way so if you put the same value i am putting which is 2 your data and my data will be split in the same way okay so this is basically for reproducing the code exactly the same way okay so let's run this and let's check the shape of say print x dot shape and x train dot shape and x test dot shape okay so x is the original data set so originally we have 480 values and in the training data we have 432 values and the 10 percentage of it in the x test we have almost 48 values okay so we have splitted our data set into training data and test data so you can wonder that in initially we had almost 614 values but now we have only 480 values in the original value so that is because we have uh, dropped all the missing values right so those values has gone as missing values so totally we have 480 values so that is split into training and test data now we can train our machine learning model which is a support vector machine model okay so using this training data and we will evaluate it based on our test data which we have splitted now so let me put here training the model so we are going to use a support vector machine model support vector machine model so i'll create one second so let me create a variable as classifier so let's name it as classifier and i load this spm so as you can see i have imported spm from sklearn right so we need to use this function spm which is the support vector machine model so classifier is equal to svm dot svc so svc means support vector classifier so we are going to classify our data in this case so this is a classification problem where we need to split our data into uh, uh, into loan approved or rejected right so we are using a classifier model okay so the other type of model is a regression okay so here we need a classification and you need to mention the kernel as linear kernel okay so i am storing this support vector machine classifier to the variable called as classifier and here we need to train the data training the support 
vector machine model so we will use the function fit for training the model so use classifier so this classifier is now this support vector machine model so classifier for dot fit so this will train our model so fit you need to mention the data and the corresponding label so we need to train this with the training data right so mention x train and y train so y train is the label for the corresponding values in the x train so if you run this this will train the model so this will take some time to train the model so in that meantime let me explain you the theory behind the support vector machine model as i have told you earlier okay so this is the graphical representation of support vector machine model so you can see the important uh, terms marked here so there is a central line right called as hyperplane so and in the two sides we have two kinds of data one is one kind of data is uh, marked in yellow color and the other kind of data is marked in red color so you can think of this in the use case we are discussing now so let's say that yellow color represents the cases the class one which you know represents uh, loan status approved so all the data for loan status approved is marked in yellow color and all the values for which the loan is rejected is marked in red color so what happens is so this support vector machine model will try to fit this data uh, around an hyperplane okay so it will uh, try various fits and it will find an hyperplane okay so it won't you know have this you can see this support vectors here so support vectors as marked here so you can see this support vector so these support vectors must be as far from the hyperplane as possible okay so you can see the support vectors here so this is the support vectors for the first class this is for the second class so basically it will try to split the data and tries to find the distance between them so when you give a new data it checks in which kind of class the value is being fitted okay so the important work for our support vector machine model is to find this hyperplane based on the data we are training it okay so that is the important thing to note in the case of support vector machine model so in this it is only two dimension you we can have multi-dimension where we have three features so if you have three features so the data will be plotted in uh, 3d uh, view okay so in our case we have almost 11 columns or 11 features so the dimensionality increases if we have more columns so this is the basics on how the support vector machine model so basically it will find a hyperplane and uh, the support vectors are nothing but the data points that are close to the hyperplane okay so now let's see whether our model is trained or not okay so our model is trained and these are some parameters of our model now we can evaluate our model so now we can evaluate the accuracy score of our model so model evaluation so if the accuracy score is you know 70 75 or more than 75 then the evaluation is pretty good so the model performance is good uh, the accuracy score of 75 means in 100 cases the model is predicting correctly for 75 cases so that is uh, the accuracy score so let's see how we can find this accuracy score so accuracy score accuracy score on training data first of all let's find the accuracy on training data so i'll create a variable called as x train prediction so x train prediction is equal to classifier so if you remember properly this classifier is our support vector machine model which is trained using this fit function so classifier dot predict so you need to mention this x train so i am predicting the label values for this x train so you need to mention that here so what happens is our trained model will predict the values for all the x train values and give the label values as either 0 or 1 as we know 0 represents the loan is rejected and 1 represents the loan is approved okay now let's find the accuracy score training data accuracy okay so training data accuracy is equal to so if you remember remember we have imported the accuracy score function from uh, sklearn.metrics right so we will use this accuracy score function to find the accuracy on training data so accuracy score x train prediction 
so this will be compared with the original label which is white range so basically what i'm doing is i'm taking this extrain value so this extrain does not contain the label right so all the predicted label will be stored in the value called as extrain prediction so this is the values predicted by our model now we need to compare it with the original label the original label is nothing but white train right so we have splitted the y as y train which represents the label for extrain so we need to compare the values predicted by our model which is known as extrain prediction with the original labels which is y train okay so let me run this so this will get the accuracy score now let me print the accuracy score of the model so accuracy on training data okay so i want to print this training data accuracy so this accuracy score function will compare the values predicted by the model and the original values and it will store the score value in this training data accuracy variable so i'll paste it here if we print this we will get the accuracy score so as you can see here our accuracy score is 0.79 which means 79 percentage so we get an accuracy of 79.8 which is almost 80 percentage so the accuracy score is pretty good so you can get a more accuracy score if you have a very large data set okay so as i have told you earlier this is a very small model sorry a very small data set as we have only almost 500 data points so for a 500 data point data set 80 percent accuracy is very really good okay now we need to find the accuracy of test data so accuracy on training data is important but the accuracy on test data is way more important because our model does not see the values in y train sorry x test it does not know this test data right as i told you earlier we need to evaluate our model on test data so this is the test data which is x test so we will do the same procedure but we will just change a few things so in this case i have just predicted using the training data so that is not much important so but the accuracy score on test data is very important so i'll just change the variable names so test in this i'll mention test so x test represents the test data so we have splitted it using our test train test split function so test data accuracy And y test so x test represents our text test data and y test is the corresponding labels okay now let's print the accuracy on test data so i'll just change the names okay so let me print it so we are getting an accuracy score of 83.3 which is really good okay so let's try to understand what is the difference between this training data and test data okay so i have given this example in my previous videos as well so if you haven't watched this watch my previous video this is for you so let's say that a person is studying for a max exam okay so he will be solving the questions given in a textbook okay so once he goes for an exam let's say that examiner asks questions that are not in that book okay so this will test the person whether he has understood the concepts well or not okay so if he has a better understanding of the concepts he will answer correctly for the questions which are not in the book as well so it is the same case here so extrain means the problems present in the textbook and y test means those questions which are not present in the textbook because we have trained using this x train right so you can see this here so x train and y train so this is like the problem given in the test book sorry textbook and this test is nothing but the questions asked in an exam so this is the difference between the training data and test data and now you may ask as i have told you the accuracy score on test data is important than training data but why i am trying to print the accuracy score on training data so we need to note one point here so there is a concept called as overtraining in machine learning so overtraining means the model uh, you know trains more on the training data that it, it kind of understand the things differently so if you want to predict correctly um, how can i explain this okay so if you have a data which is similar to your training data then only your model can predict well 
okay so that means your model is over dependent on training data so that means basically our model does not train well or learn well okay so in that cases the accuracy score on training data will be very large and the accuracy score on test data is very less will be very less okay because the test data won't be similar to our training data so in that cases if the accuracy score on training data is let's say 80 the accuracy score on test data will be around 40 or 50 okay so the test data accuracy will be very less so this concept is called as overfitting so we need to uh, avoid overfitting as much as possible because it is not optimum for us so in this case as you can see here the accuracy score is not very much different so the accuracy score for uh, training data is 80 and for test data is it's 83 so we are almost it's it's almost equal right so our model has not overfitted okay so that is about this loan status prediction system now you can make a make a predictive system so let's say that so you can make a predictive system so i'm not going to do that now making a predictive system so in the previous videos i have explained you how you can do this so when you give a new value give the new values of all this uh, marital status gender dependence etc our model will predict whether that person will get a loan or not so i have already mentioned this method of how to make a predictive system in the videos in the previous uh, project videos such as uh, Mm, rock versus mind prediction and diabetes prediction so you can refer those videos you can refer the codes in that video and the procedure is very same okay so you can follow that same procedure and you can build a system that can predict whether the person is uh, the loan is approved or not given all those credentials okay so let it be the exercise for you okay so that's it for this video I hope you have understood everything we have covered here. So let me do a quick recap for this video. So first of all, we have imported all the dependencies, all the libraries we need. So we have imported NumPy, Pandas, Seabonds, uh, Train Test Split, SPM, Accuracy Score, etc. So NumPy will be very useful when you are uh, making that predictive system. Okay. So we have imported all this library. Then we in the data set. So we have loaded this data set to our Pandas data frame using this pd.read csv function then we have uh, printed the sample of our data frame using the set function and then we have found the number of rows and columns and using this describe function we have found various statistical measures of the data set then we have found the number of missing values in our data set and once we have found it we have dropped all the missing values and then we have replaced the uh, n with 0 and y with 1 in the case of loan status right so we have encoded our label so as you can see here this yes and no will be replaced as 1 and 0 and then we have replaced this 3 3 plus in the case of dependent column with 4 and then we have visualized the relationship between the data we have seen that people who are graduated have more chance of getting the loan approval and people who are married has a high chance of getting loan approval so again we have converted all the text data to labels as 0 and 1 in various columns so once we have done that we have split the data and label separately so after that we have split our original data set into training data and test data as x train and x test and the corresponding labels as y train and y test okay and then we have loaded our support vector machine model to this classifier variable and we have trained our model using this x train values and then we have evaluated our model with uh, both the training data and test data and we have found that the accuracy score are almost equal okay so i hope you have understood all the things covered here so do practice or do you know complete this code of making a predictive system so it is very easy so if you have any doubts you can refer the code of the previous videos as well so i hope you have understood everything